It's almost like hitting the reset button on your painting experience a little bit. I think law and just the stories can be genuinely pretty motivational. I will never be the best player in the world, just as I will never be a golden demon winner. The improvement that you're going to have got is massive compared to the amount of time it's taken. It's kind of like do the complete opposite of what everyone else tells you to do. Um, I had uh, a load of fun painting the uh, Warhammer Heroes Primaris captain um, in honour of uh, a very similar kind of pose to this artwork, which, uh, which yeah, I, I took it as quite a bit of inspiration. Um, yeah. Uh, I had quite a limited time frame, so I didn't do everything that I wanted to do on it. There were a few things I missed off, like the flames on the legs and some bits and bobs. But um, just, just the most important part of that iconic artwork, <laughs> hey, the hey, minor detail. Hey, the yellow fist and the half red thumb was done. Okay, so you're telling me that the half red thumb is more important than the flames? It's all about the little details, George. Well, it's not about the big details, is it? <laughs> In fairness, <laughs> that's, that's obvious. In fairness, like this is. I think we spoke about when we did like the story of Siege. Yeah. We spoke about like James's passion for still wanting to paint for the company and like um, us arguing about like whether that's like whether that can fit in and stuff. This model was the pinnacle of that. Like as yeah. soon as James saw the Warhammer Heroes Space Marine Captain, he was like a kid that had discovered Warhammer for the first time and just thought it was the coolest thing ever. He because I knew, about I, knew it. I knew it just fit the pose. It was like a reflection look of the pose. Obviously, the armament is a little bit different. He's got a bolt gun. He's got a plasma. But there's a bit of difference in armament. <laughs> there's but, just a few differences. But but, 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 he, but he was like so excited to paint this model, and eventually, um, eventually it came to it, and I was like, I think it just, it the, does just no one else is doing it, so you might as well do it. And I've never seen someone so excited. He was like a vulture swarming my office because I'd, I'd been I'd been here to film. The unboxing video. Yeah. It's like, have you filmed the unboxing video yet? Yeah. Have you filmed it? Yet? Can I take it over? Yeah. Can I start painting it? I told you, I had I had the plan for what I was going to do with it straight away. So I was like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was fun. Really good model to paint. Enjoyable. Um, I haven't painted any of the heroes models previously, so it was the first one I ever painted from those, like those line of miniatures. I know they come in like blue plastic. It's a little bit different. They are. They're Primaris this time, though. They're Primaris this time, yeah. But they're... Yeah, what is it? This is the fourth series? Yeah, you had the... First was Marines. just... First was, first was normal Firstborn. Then but Nurgle. But they were like slightly scaled. Scaled up yeah. a little bit. Then Nurgle. No, no, no. Nurgle was Series 3. I think Series 2 was so the Blood Angel Terminators. Terminators, yeah. And then then Nurgle, then these. So, yeah. Yeah, they're good. They're really fun, actually. There's some really good poses in there. Um, Like like the grenade one, the guy reloading, the sergeant model. Uh, Looks great. Were the, um, were the Terminators scaled up a little bit? I think so. I yeah, know. I think I think they I never were. saw them. I never or saw they, them, but they had I didn't tactical, know tactical rock base extensions, which made them a bit bigger. I think so. I remember with the first one, ones I painted a couple of them, and they definitely had like longer legs. They are a bit bigger. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are a bit bigger. Definitely. Um, yeah, but no, it was great. We really had fun. We've each nabbed one as well that we have you're going to paint one, aren't you? Are you painting one? You're having me on the podcast. Are you painting? <laughs> oh, I've got to do it now, haven't I? I thought you were. Yeah, no, I'm painting one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I haven't started painting it yet. So I've given painting. you two other things since you did that. I was like, can you paint this as well? Can you paint this as well? So fair enough if you don't get it done, but I've napped one as yeah, well. Yeah, no, I'm painting one. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward um, to them. They're quite cool. They're Maybe. good. They're good models. It's yeah. cool yeah. as well, because this time around, if you have the whole set, you get a kill team. Yeah, it's yeah actually, you don't even need the whole set. Do you not? It, I think it's any variation of six of them. I think, there's, there's, seven I think there's seven total. But a pack... A pack if you bought a whole retail pack, it's eight, I think. I'll take six captains, seven captains all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and from what I'm hearing, um, I'm, obviously I don't really move in the kill team circles anymore. I haven't played kill team in a long time, but from what, I'm, in the kill from what I'm hearing from the uh, from from the, those parts, it's quite a decent kill team that you get out of it as well, which is cool. It's not like one of these kind of gimmicky ones that like no one's actually going to use. Mm. It seems like a lot it. of people are working out if you know for also for the record the warhammer heroes not released in the uk yet either yeah so yeah. but because the rules are online now for each of the um you can models, just make them out, the you can get yourself yeah you can definitely you can get yourself a box of yeah, assault and people are people are kind of building their own um which i think is cool, cool as well that's it's really yeah. it's really good yeah it must look assault intercessors right and then it's yeah it's got eliminator in there i don't know there's uh, the, the, so the, the benefit to this kill team compared to others is that I think this is the only marine kill team that you can field that has a mixture of units right 
Um, so I think there's one, one's an eliminator, one's heavy intercessor. But there's nothing like soul, crazy ones. unique to the box that you couldn't try. You can, create. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a few. Obviously, the models are unique and and yeah, the poses, poses and stuff. Yeah. But the actual loadouts and stuff you could probably find in existing models and put them together. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was what do you know. That was one of the first like Warhammery things I done because when I first got into the hobby, Series One came out, and I think I already had like a box of. Do you remember they done those um, easy to build like Marines? Reavers and like intercessors, yeah. it was literally like a box of like three. Or yeah, 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 I, remember I think I'd done one of those, and I think I went back to the Warhammer shop to like get some more stuff. And they just come out with those Warhammer heroes. I was like, this, mm. this is brilliant, it's just like one model. Because to me, spent, I mean, still in part, but like to me at the time, spending like all my money on like a box of like 10 models was like crazy. I wanted like variety. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, oh, I could get like just one. Yeah, so. yeah, they're good. it's a cool idea. They are, good. Um, they are really good. Yeah, yeah, what else? What else? No, um, crate, crate 3D. Oh, the the uh, Evernight Battlegrounds thing that that Kickstarter launched this week. That's cool. We painted some models for that. Video went up earlier in the week. It's great. Um, models are amazing. It's. I remember getting them in, and because we're always a bit, not necessarily skeptical, but we're like you you you're always unsure when you get in resin models from a range that you've never seen before. Because it could go one of two ways. When right? you're when you're as privileged to see in GW Plastics day in day out. Mm. It does put you in a bubble of really high, crisp quality casts. So then to see some resin models straight out of the box that are that good is like is amazing. Yeah, we'll put like the the Kickstarter's live now. There's ten models initially released, yeah. seventy five mil scale, so a little bit bigger than definitely what I'm used to. I imagine what a lot of our listeners are used to. A little bit bigger. It's not um, the size of like a Primark, but. Uh, yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah, 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 kind bit, of, bit, kind bit of the bigger. Primark, a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. just okay. like the the yeah, maybe a little bit, a little bit. Bigger in terms of like overall size, like, mm. you know. yeah, yeah. 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 No, not yeah. Um, the models are fantastic. But right. yeah, I mean, Phil, we painted them like um, babe no, roofed it. Number one, absolutely. Babe number one, it. done an incredible job. But number two, it had nothing but positive things to say mm -hmm. about the quality of the models and everything. Um, yeah, seems like a cool. Cool little thing to watch out for. Do you want to just preface for the listeners sort of what it is? Um, so initially, the they designed this game and it's got all it, all of its lore and everything. Um, uh, but what they're doing is they're releasing these ten models, just as like collectors, um, as seconds. like collectors sets, effectively first mm -hmm. before the game comes out. And each of them are um, the kind of army leaders mm -hmm. for what is then going to go on to be the game. Um, but there's all sorts of different. It's like a, it's one of those things where like they've covered all the bases for whatever your vibe is, yeah. whatever you like to paint. One of the characters it's, it's there's there. probably got to take take your fancy. I think our both of ours favorite is the same. Yes, yeah, which is the, the, the lich guy. The uh, well, the is the first one you spoke about on the video. Yeah, hide black hide black chair. Yeah. Oh, I like I like the. the spider He's like the one. crouched like skull. Yeah, with, skeleton with the spear. Guy. Yeah, no, the yeah. the like Spider Queen lady. You like the Spider Queen? Spider Queen, yeah. I, I she's great. Feeling, I have a feeling that the Spider Queen one is going to be the most in, popular In part one. fairness, that is probably in part to Phil's amazing paint job. The colour scheme for that yeah, does it for me. It's a good colour scheme. Yeah. Colour scheme is a mega yeah. on that. But, so, um, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Like As I say, we're always not... It's just you never know what you're going to get with a new range of, of models. And it's cool to see, especially when you see one that's actually like really high quality. Really yeah. cool. The re the resin was fantastic. Like we've seen loads of resin over the years from all different places, from three D printed, like everything, like every type of like resin, whether it be three D printed or cast or whatever. And like out the box, out the pack, when we got them, these were like jaw droppingly good. Yeah, seventy five mil scale is so nice to work with as well. I've never really done like even within Warhammer, I've never really done many like big not, models. Primarchs, like, are, huge Primarchs are I've close. never painted a Primark. They're, they're, not, they're not 75. They're not 70. No, they're, they're close. They're, they're very close to an extent. But, Probably like but they're, 60. They're, they're, the, yeah. they're the closest you're going to get to like a 75 mil, I think. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, they're, 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 have you never painted like a, never painted like a, have you painted 75, like a bust or a figure no. or anything? I've no, never no, done no. a, never done a bust. I've it's never not done, my, um, it's not my bag, unfortunately. I, never uh, done, yeah. Uh, Never done even like a Primark in 40k. I've got my I've I've got my up. my uh, uh, Forge World Lion from the release at home still in its box. I didn't touch He's it. He's sleeping. He's sleeping. Yeah, he's sleeping. He yeah. hasn't woke up yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've done one bust and one 75 mil scale. They're both really fun. You enjoyed it, yeah. 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 
I should definitely do more. I, pro- I might pick up some of those. I was going to say, I could definitely be tempted to get that, the, the one that we like. My black one's amazing. It's cool. The cool pose model. is amazing. Oh, I literally love it. My, my problem now is, I've seen the one Phil painted. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look as good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah, but would highly recommend. I'll put the links and everything below. Yeah, but we had a real, real good opportunity to just paint some models, uh, you know, for the Kickstarter. And, and I said, Phil from the team, he, he he smashed it like Hulk with loads of refreshers on his mouth. So he's literally like absolutely amazing. Like he, just... <laughs> I don't know. He does I don't it. even know. I don't, I don't know even know it. that one. That yeah. one. Yeah, that come out of nowhere. Sh- sugar overload. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, he absolutely loves it. He was he was great. And see that Phil smashed it. So. So yeah, Brilliant. was it? Sorry, was it refreshers? Yeah, refreshers. Like the sweets. sweets. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's having a sugar, sugar, sugar rush, sugar rush. Yeah. Is the Hulk known for his like? He loves, I imagine he, if you he gave... loves he loves a sweet mate. What are you on about? Like, <laughs> I imagine if you classic gave... Hulk, classic Hulk trope. That Love I've seen sweets. him on the corner shop going in there. Yeah. You know, if you gave Hulk them like goodie bags that you used to get as a kid, as you live and that had all the refreshers and stuff in it, yeah, I reckon the Hulk would go mad. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah, would, fair you, would you also, when you got those goodie bags, just eat the refreshers and throw away those like chalk, like long? Anything, yeah, they chalk, were horrendous. Yeah, anything, like, anything chalk or like the things that used to be like, oh, it's a, it's a bracelet and you can eat that. I don't want that. Yeah, no, that I'll just, just ping that. That just became that a catapult. They used to just bite yeah, the half, half of it. Yeah, eat half of it. If it had, half, yeah. if it had <laughs> a string on it, you just eat half and then you just ping it yeah. at, at people. Um, but yeah, refreshers. Yeah. I don't know how we got onto that, but yeah, yeah. For, fresh, fresh S tier sweet. Yeah, it's good. It's top tier. It depends on your age bracket. I yeah. think if you're under twelve, it's an S tier sweet. I think uh, as you get older, I don't know if I could handle. No, nah, I couldn't. Now. Half my jaw would come off. With <laughs> that. My, my, my teeth I'm, would fall out. Apparently, I'm twelve. <laughs> When's the last yeah. time you had one? Be honest. When's yeah. the last time you had a refresher? Probably. Within the last six months, for sure. Don't lie. I'm give dead over. Serious. Come on, <laughs> so give over. Yeah. No, that's serious. <laughs> George, over George that. has been going to many parties with little goodie bags. Yeah, you don't get like leftover for Christmas. You get like given like loads of like sweets. And that's the, more uh, like and um, that's like celebrations. Yeah, that, isn't it? That's I don't know what like I don't know what Christmas party. Yeah, what yeah. Christmas party mix are you, you getting? Get, you get the like the big tub. Like you know, you get like a big tub of like all. Uh, oh, all I get what you mean. Stuff. You get the same one for like all the retro sweets. There's always refreshers in there. Yeah, fair play. Fair play. But no, I haven't. I haven't. I'll have to. I'll I'll hunt one out. I'll give it a go. Well, if you're in the comments, we're stick up for me because this is yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Right. Do you want to go? Speaking of, do you want to go through some viewers' comments? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. First one. Now, when I read the name for this, you might agree with me here, Joe. Does this look like a plant from a certain particular person in the room? If I was having a quick glance, I might think that was James. I just, like, I just like to carry out this. I do not have any fake accounts and dive into our own comments, leaving comments hopefully that get chosen to re- get read well, out. Well, what does the comments say? Well, J- James Otero might might not, but James Otron Otron Art. Okay, right. It's definitely not me. I feel like I, I feel like I have to defend it, but it's yeah. definitely not me. It says uh, this is this is in reference to the episode where we talked about the Tyranids. Yeah, I feel like lizard vibes. Are coming from hormigants and termigants having velociraptor style poses. Well, that's that, that seals it though, because there's no way that I think they're they're lizards. So, so I would not write that comment. Well, <laughs> it's true, yeah. so, like, <laughs> I think in, in fairness, I th- did it come up? I think maybe James said or something um, during the episode. Like, yeah, fair enough. Like some of those models, it, it does give the vibe, but overall, still bugs. I'll, they're, they're, bugs. I'll, uh, they're bugs until the end of time. I do appreciate that people are trying to stick up for you as we were like, don't, oh, no, no, episode, don't, don't, don't stick up for him. No, 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 it was okay. a real dice roll when I was watching the comments come out for the episode because I was like, this is going to go one of two ways. <laughs> the first two comments we got were like, obviously they're bugs. Yeah. And I was like, yes. I was like, that's it, it's over. But then they came through. They came through. Yeah, me. you got some support. Some people got some came support. Out I think work. it's fair on some of the models, but overall, they're bugs. They're bugs. Well, Bases and Bases says... Regular regular viewer, regular yeah, yeah. commenter. Yeah. Uh, this is in reference to the uh, <laughs> the film round that we did a couple oh, of weeks yeah, ago yeah. with fancast the movies. The golden rule is that any film or plot can be redone with the Muppets and one human lead. So maybe Perfect. the Horus Heresy with Jason Momoa as the Emperor. Amazing. That'd be incredible. And of I- course... Animal is Angron. <laughs> oh my god, that is incredible! So I've seen this before. I don't know why we didn't. I didn't think of this when we were doing it, but I've seen this before. Where people, um, there was a trend a little while ago about like 
on Twitter or something. Um, pick the next, like recast your favorite film, but the how Muppets. it would be for Muppets. And the best one that I saw someone come up with was that there should be a Knives Out sequel that is literally just, I don't know if you've seen Knives Out, but it, with just Daniel Craig as the human. Yeah. And then oh. the rest of it is Muppet, <laughs> like murder mystery Muppets with Daniel Craig as the, his character. I would watch out. that. I would watch that. I would watch oh, that. Brilliant. So that's yeah. such a good one. But yeah, that's a great one as well. Daniel Craig yeah. would be a great like lead human role in that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When well, he like, is, he's in. He's in. He's the, pretty much the lead role in both of Knives Out, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think George means like playing off of Muppets. Oh right, okay, well. fantastic. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. But like the uh, the using that within Warhammer and doing that and getting the Animal's <laughs> Anchor Jason, Animal Jason, Jason Momoa Jason Momoa <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant Animal's <laughs> Anchor is like is like perfect yeah like, I'm trying like, to imagine perfect. like some of the like tertiary lesser Muppet characters in like Space Marine Armor just their little head poking out yeah, yeah. like Rizzo the Rat just like yeah yeah yeah, just <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's a maybe we could do a full Muppets casting of of Warhammer down the line. That's a good one. Another game show there for you, George. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we should we should definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Neon Necromunda says, "I use a syringe to transfer paint from pots to droppers. Save so much hassle and paint loss, like the ones used for kids' medicine or baking." Cool. Neon Necromunda. You've missed the entire point <laughs> of what I was saying. Stop introducing third-party tools for your third-party tools. This is a chain reaction of like, all right, well, I want this paint isn't doing it for me, so I want to put it in a different type of paint. And then I've got to use a different type of tool to get it out of the different type of thing to put it in the different type of thing. St pour, snippers, lid, off, pour, <laughs> let it go. Let the one milliliter of paint go. I've, To be fair, I have used... The syringes thing. I think the the problem. Now you've got. Would clean... you have to thin? Would you have to thin the paint down? Presumably. I'd be interested to know if you have to thin the paint down. Let's say you don't. You've still got to clean the syringe out. Yeah, you still got a load of paint. Not maybe. if it's not if he's saying like little if you thin, cheapy. If you thin it down, oh, you'd have to use a disposable one. So now you've got to have a but dedicated. Yeah, but hang on, clear, clean it out. We just put water in it. But now that's an extra Flush step. Flush it out a few yeah, times. But you've got to do that every single time you're doing the. What yeah. if you've got like a collection of like 30 paints you want to put them all over? It's going to take ages. True, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do just pour them. So in right. hindsight, just use the pots that they come, the paints come with. Don't bother using Just pour pots. them straight up. Yeah. Yeah. I right. mean... Well, no, he's saying, he's saying don't do it at all. Don't, don't, oh, he's saying don't Let's do get it rid of all third party, third party nonsense. Let's just stick with the pots that the paint so comes James, with. So James somehow is going to wire this back around to it. So basically, just buy paints from 1991 this is, this is the argument I hear all the time that it's so difficult to put them in the dropper bottles there's just no point in doing it set up all of these little barriers for yourself so that you can you can basically give yourself an excuse for procrastinating and being lazy which is what I was getting at exactly. the other week yeah yeah I mean look whatever works for people if they like if they want to do that then do that don't get me wrong that would solve the problem of paint wastage well, do, doing the doing the, doing syringe the syringe thing things. but I'm, my, my argument is that that defeats the whole point of doing it in the first place, which is just being efficient and just odds are you're not going to get that tiny bit of paint out. True. True. I might give it a go. And then pass. The syringes? Yeah, yeah. I might give it a go. I'll pass. Just to see how much of a... I don't know. See how much more did you get, any, get out of it. Did you manage to get any of those Vallejo uh, dropper balls? No, I haven't looked yet. Well, I, I, you sent me a link to one, but um, yeah, I haven't got them yet. I haven't, really, I haven't got any paints to transfer. I'm not going to transfer from my rubbish dropper bottles to good dropper bottles. No, that would be madness. Do you know yeah. what? That would be so quite, I've got to wait till I buy a new paint. That would be quite easy though because they've already got the little tip on them. You <laughs> yeah. can just squeeze it straight out. Yeah. It's just like using a syringe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Circle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I would have, that would have been my process is pour it into a rubbish dropper bottle and then pour that into a good one. It's just like even a, more a series of funnels. You just want to get smaller and smaller. And yeah, start exactly. Like a so, tiny mill. So until I've got some new paint to pour, I don't really need them. Yeah, yeah but I, I what I'm hearing will. is you should buy some more paint. No. I can't, I, can't be, I can't be buying more paint. I don't need more I mean, paint. I'm never going to say no to more paint. So. Yeah, it's, you can't... It's, Two can't, extremes of the spectrum here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm getting the last little bit out before I even... Yeah. yeah. And James is buying more paint before he's even before taking he's even the plastic seal off of the, of the old one. Yeah. Yeah. For the same colour as well. <laughs> I'll just add. Can, it's not like he's got like loads of ranges. He's got like loads of the same paint. You can never have enough. <laughs> You can never okay, right. This is a bit of a long one. I'll read this one off. Uh, for me, the color plan stage comes before even buying the miniatures. I look at the model ranges 
and ones I like, I form ideas about the color schemes, or sometimes having an idea for a color scheme first, and then think about what range it would look good on. Buying models basically happens when I'm so in love with a color scheme or an idea that I have to see it implemented, but I don't write down pots of paint first. I don't think in terms of specific bottles or premixed colors. I just think about colors and techniques. When I do a test model, I work out an actual specific uh, color that the bottle comes in. I'm just going to write it down uh, after I've painted the first successful model, but I know before I've even bought the model what it looks like and what techniques I'm going to use to achieve it. I mean, we've that's, got a real, that, a real serial planning. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's that is, We're that never is gonna... a level of planning that I can get behind. Yeah, I, I like. Can get is that the lot. kind of organized fun that you like, Joe? That is the kind of organized fun that that I am here for. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, but, but I completely, but... I completely get what they're saying as well. Like, how often do you, like you when you saw that captain from the Warhammer Heroes? I knew what I was doing with it. Instantly, away. it was like, oh, and I'm going to paint. The armor like this i'm gonna do this this is like in your head even if you weren't writing it down hmm. that is kind of what i think that comes down to whether you actually how much you like the model and how much you, you how much you enjoy the model from looking at it before you even get your hands on it i think yeah i think some models say take time to brew like a good stew you know and it's just it's like okay <laughs> yeah, and that one rhymed <laughs> brew like a good stew yeah so yeah so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I get what you say though. Like it's, it's. Um, I, I think that is kind of what we, what we're getting at. Like that's like, I wish I could be that organized. Love it. If I did that with everything, normally I have to at least. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll sit down and be building the model, and then I'll, I'll start working out. Like, oh, I think that I does work because sometimes you notice things on the model that you won't see in a two D yeah, like two D render. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, that gets a double thumb up for that, that comment. Yeah, if you can have a plan before you've even walked out the shop with it, then you're laughing. I guess for me, the whole concept is kind of alien because I'll either, when I'm painting, it tends to be one of two things. I paint for myself, and in which case I quite enjoy doing box art painting, or it's a commission, in which case I've been told what colours to do. True, although not always. You're not always told you're what colours to do. Not yeah, always, it's... fair enough, but like generally speaking, there's like an idea behind it in my experience. Yeah. 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 I'll have to try that. I guess sometimes I'll see a model and it will like desperately make me want to paint it. But I can't ever say I've been in a situation where I've thought of a really cool color scheme that I want to try and then sort a model. That's quite an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah. Because there's a lot of color combos that I like, but I've never been like, hmm, what would that work well on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, quite well, a good way to tackle it. Yeah. Okay. Our main topic for the week. Mm -hmm. We've discussed this a little bit uh, internally. This is going to be the three essential pillars to improving at painting Warhammer faster. Mm -hmm. So everyone talks about how to improve and people often have, you know, you need to practice, you need to put in thousands of hours, you need to work on this technique, you need to do the other. What I want to know is what are the things that people can implement that they'll see the quickest jump in quality with, if you get what I mean. So what are some cheaper wins? What's going to, see the biggest jump the fastest what techniques can people implement to improve quicker rather than they know the the core basics of i've got to practice over time eventually i'll get there but what are some things i can start implementing to see results now do you want to go first james i can do yeah, yeah. uh i think a restricted color palette is quite good because when you when you are uh, have uh, wide access to a massive plethora of paints and things I think sometimes you half of the thought process behind stuff is over what paints you're choosing. Whereas if you just restrict the palette, so you're only focusing on working on those, your attention is more focused on the model than the color choices. You've already made a, quite a clear, concise. I'm using th these five, ten colors, whatever that, whatever it is, and that means that your attention is not going to be split as much onto all the myriad of colors that you would love to put on there or like to put on there or think could look good on there you just work with a restricted color palette i think that that helps hugely because it means you're going to be learning those restricted colors a lot quicker because you're using more of them on the miniature because you're not using alternate colors um i do think in a bit of a crazy offshoot if you if you uh, choose colors perhaps that you maybe haven't used a lot of previously uh, or used before that can sometimes help because you're learning that color at the same time as and like how it dilutes how it thins how it glazes you learn, learn all that stuff at the same time whilst being almost being forced to use it 
because you've restricted your color palette, if that makes sense. Um, now, maybe that's not perfect for army painting, but it's, it might be good for just doing a test model or just picking a model up that you like the look of. Like maybe if you play 40K quite a lot, picking an Age of Sigma model and going, here's 10 colors. I'm going to use these colors on this model. And I've maybe not used all of these colors before. I think that's a great experiment in itself to learn stuff and also improve yourself because you're outside your comfort zone. So. I suppose that's something you could scale as well because you could theoretically do that and like you said you could do it like right I'm going to paint one in just five colours Yeah, you could do that and then be like right now I'm going to do it again but with just three yeah, I mean, or now I'm going to do it again yeah, I mean, I mean? I've seen people that have done it with primary colours before where they, they try and paint the model with primary colours and they're only allowed to use those or mixes of the primary colours and, and that's always interesting when I don't necessarily like mean that. in terms of like number of paints you use just in terms of like how many core colors are going to be oh yeah, i get what you mean yeah no yeah yeah i mean yeah it's it, that's a good way of doing it as well like i think yeah if you if you it just puts you it puts you in a position where a lot of the choices are kind of predetermined and it means that you focus on the core thing you're doing more so mm. um, i like the idea of what you said about doing that with colors you don't use so often or you've got less experience with or yeah, maybe yeah. you struggle with if yeah that's like okay i'm not very good at painting yellow the I'm going to paint a yellow model. Yeah. And not only am I going to paint a yellow model, I'm going to paint it with only four or five paints. Yeah. Or yeah. Maybe only one other prime, one other complementary color. So, on the note of like the limited palettes and things like that, obviously, memes aside, yeah. you've painted a lot of red in your I mean, that's time. fair to say. Yeah. So, like, Joe with the hot takes. Do this you week. feel, <laughs> do you feel like, good color for hot? Obviously, you're more so you're more comfortable painting red. Right? I love does, red. Does everyone have that? Like, does I everyone so. have think, their go-to? I, I think you do like, discover the color that you really enjoy painting. Like, you know, I think you do. And you just get more comfortable with yeah, it. Yeah, I think I'm just going to say you called me out for being a child because I like refresher sweets. Meanwhile, you're like my favorite color is red. <laughs> red. Look, you're looking at me. I'm not. I'm not the my favorite color is red. <laughs> <person>. <laughs> yeah, I like sw swerve that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're looking like, at me then, yeah, digging me uh, out for it. Yeah, look, I. I it's just, do you know what it is? I just find it really enjoyable as a color to paint. And I think I've tried, I've done, I, I you remember I, when I done my warrior army, I banned myself from painting red for like a year nearly. I literally said, I'm not painting, but as in not using red, as in just using red as the main color for something. I literally had spent a year not painting red because I was like, okay, this is getting silly. Like it's, it's like I'm painting all the time now. Let's take a tolerance break. But so is it, yeah, <laughs> it is sounds, it? no, but the thing is when you are painting, when you are painting a lot of it, like it is, you know, and especially when you're painting armies and you're painting um, something that you're combining, being passionate about the color scheme and also you enjoy the color, it's, you do kind of like need to wean yourself off it and, and, and try other things because that's, that's what's going to help you to be, to get used to other colors and enjoy other colors, you know, like since, not doing it. Like, I think when I done my nights, like my um, golf racing team theme nights, I fell in love with the blue, the Mr. Hobby uh, turquoise that we. Oh, use. Mr. Hobby, that's Mr. a throwback. Mr. Yeah, Hobby, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, what, yeah. Episode three or something. I think so. Yeah. Big like, ups to our OG listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah like um, I love that uh, Mr. Hobby turquoise. We're gonna get like comments up. Like, Been here since Mr. Hobby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years from now, yeah. we'll be like, yeah. been listening to you guys since the Mr. Hobby days. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but I think that's the thing Like you do, you, you'll find something that you do. And I think when you do what I, was, what I suggested was, which is like use a restricted color palette and, and do maybe you just pick colors that obviously you need your, your standard, like, Oh, I need a, a black or I need a metallic or I need whatever. But then in and around that picking loads of uh, a selection of colors that you don't really use very often is a really good experiment for learning those colors and, and for, for seeing sort of like, it's almost like hitting the reset button on your painting experience a little bit because you're entering new territory with the way the paints behave finish all those kind of things so so yeah i i i i, I think it's a good exercise to, to do do you reckon that'll be harder with fewer colors or with fewer paints uh, what ranges or do you just mean colors in general just like generally um i think just do a limited set of paints so say to yourself right i'm going to paint this model with 10 paints and then just just see what you can do with it i think it's a good exercise and then as i said when you overlay that restriction with you're going to start naturally as well. If you've only got 10 paints, you're going to be like, right, well, this paint's got to start serving more than one purpose now. Well, yeah. yeah. If you throw in your ice yellow, but, one of your but, favorite yeah. picks, you could be like, right, well, now I'm going to use this to highlight. Well, exactly. But that's that. But you learn things like that about paint through doing exercises like that because what you would do inherently normally would be, right, I need this color to highlight this. So I'm just going to grab this color. Whereas when you've got that restriction, you're like, what can I use from these 10 paints to saturate that or to darken that or to give me something that i can use for that part of detail on the model i remember like the first time in terms of like using paints for things that 
for different purposes and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. Things that you maybe weren't told initially that it was used for or whatever. Um, I remember the first time I had sort of worked out or got told or whatever, obviously quite early on, like the, you can just, like most people, you don't have to use like a, a shade paint mm. to do a recess shade and things like that. Like I think doing that is going to help you naturally work out all those kind of things. Yeah, like, definitely. Oh, actually I can use this paint for that. It's just, it doesn't only have to be, we talk a lot about like using things, um, not as they were intended. So like yeah, when we yeah. talk about contrast paints a lot. Yeah, I it's said all, that on the Yeah, we're topics. always like, it's yeah. not what it's supposed to be used for, but it's really good for this. Like, it'll help you find those kind of things, I think, as well. Yeah. I think, again, like going back to real root basics, like adversity makes you grow and like it, it does, like especially within painting, because if you've got a restricted palette and a restricted set of colors that you're using when you're painting, you have to make choices to get to the result that you're thinking of for the model. So... Mm. So yeah, by restricting your colors and, and using colors potentially that you don't use as much or if at all, um, that can sometimes give you the experimentation whilst focusing your attention on, I've got to paint this model and I'm trying to paint it like this, but I've only got these things to, to use to get it to that finish point. Yeah, I think as well, even if you're like competent mixing colors, it's probably not the worst thing to brush up on. Like I'd, I personally don't think I would necessarily struggle with that, but it would probably still be a good exercise to practice because I do so much box art painting as you would know if you've tried it before, you've seen some GW recipes, it, that is like a wall of colors that you'll use. Like you, you might only paint something red, but you might use like eight reds. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's, like you say, if you're going back the other way, you're starting to think more about color values and saturation. And, I think yeah. it helps. I, th I think it helps you learn a lot of things. And I, I've got to say, like some of the best little swatches and things I've got in my painting journal at the back in the in, like my homemade index of colors and things I've mixed and made, I think some of those have been just through through either having a restricted palette or maybe running out of a color and needing to use pick something else and go, oh, I've not really used this before, but it's kind of like what I need. But let's see what happens if I put it into this and see mm. what it does to that. Um, I think it's like a different technique as well, isn't it? Because if you was like to go the other way and you're like, I'm just going to use premix colors, then you can like focus on just your brush technique and you haven't got to worry yeah, about this other thing exactly, you've got to think yeah. out of mixing paints. You can just focus on the minutiae of the brush stroke, whereas you could go the other way, like, okay, I've practiced a lot of brush strokes now. Let's focus on more theoretical color choices, this, that. Yeah, I always say it like, you know, a good painter is made up of technical skill, uh, which is obviously ability. Um, and and, you know, and that, uh, you've got to have a bit of, you've either got flair or you haven't when it comes to miniature painting. We well, don't want to be that something. guy who goes to the gym and just does bicep curls and leaves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no, I think, well, or on that note, I think it's like quite a good exercise to do to to get you more comfortable with um appreciating something you've learned even though like the finished article after that the finished model might not necessarily be the best model you've ever painted no no but no, like not. it gets you more comfortable with accepting that the improvement that you've made has been like knowledge and stuff and, and the yeah. experimentation you don't need a competition entry at the end of it to mean that you've learned a lot doing it kind of it, thing it, yeah like, like what, what, was, what i was gonna say was like a good painter is made up of several things, but like a good knowledge and command of paint is something that is not like a, it's not like flair. It's not like a natural talent. It's not like uh, experience over many years. It's like, it's, it's just, it's something that if you put the effort into learning your paints, their behaviors, their finished properties, you know, how they dilute all those kind of things. It gives you something which is a really good foundation to then make informed choices that help develop that ability, that flair, that skill, that, all that kind of stuff. That's, a good command. It's like going into a library and there being, for every subject, being one book on the shelf that you always instinctively pick up because that's the book that you know or that's the color that you know for, or that's the color you use for that thing. By un by learning your paint and the behavioral properties of different paints and the way they finish, the way they cover, all those kind of things, it's, it's, it's like going into that library where you've got 60 books on a shelf for a topic, if that makes sense. It just it really broadens your command of, of that massively. Um, and I think working in a restricted palette with colors that you don't use that much or if at all is a good way of really helping you develop that. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to accommodate for a variety of needs and budgets. Whether you want a centerpiece character for your army or a full-blown gaming force, we have what you need and we offer well above the industry standard in terms of painting quality and our service. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.com. 
www.septiclub.co.uk. And in the month of September, new clients can get 5% off of any commission using code SEPTEMBER5. Uh, so mine's one that I, I've actually kind of stolen from James. James, it's a bit of advice I got from James a little while ago. And I think for me, it's personally the most growth that I saw as a painter in a, in a short amount of time, which I think is obviously the, the point of where we're going in terms of improving faster. And I think the best thing about it is that you can do it at any point, like you can do it at any level of painting, which is if you, if you get like um, regular infantry set of models, um, so obviously Marines is probably the best one to pull from, especially if one of the things that you want to improve is straight lines and edge highlighting and stuff. That's yeah. going to be yeah. a lot of, I think a lot of what people want to improve is that like that's what we see on box art is those super sharp lines so just general cleanliness and exactly things. yeah so it's a good marines are a good way to do it and i think if you pick up an infantry box of marines say whether it's intercessors or make it a little bit more interesting and, and the ones that i would probably i'm actually going to recommend is maybe the new terminators yeah they're great um in a set of five um and painting them individually one at a time but really analyzing each one and yeah. getting feedback on it. I think by the end of that, um, if you're actually thinking about it, it goes back to the critical thinking thing that we had Boxy on and he was talking about. Um, if you literally have five of almost the same model um, and you're doing it in succession, taking notes of what you got wrong the first time or what you want to improve the la on the last time. Implementing it and implementing it each time by the end of painting five models that the improvement that you're going to have got is massive yeah. for the amount of compared to the amount of time it's taken if that makes sense like if you consider you've only painted five models but you looked at the first one and looked at the last one if you've done that properly i think anyone is going to be amazed at how much better the fifth one looks than the first one do you know what's funny i accidentally done that when i was painting for gd this year because yeah. i'd done a squad you black templars yeah my black templars yeah. and did in, them all individually in, yeah so i done them all individually in fairness i kind of knew this going in because i was like i could paint them all together but obviously i'm not going to benefit from that improvement of just the experience of i've painted this model before so part of why i chose the crusaders box was because you basically get the same sprue twice. So even though there's 10 models, you could build five. You could basically build a duplicate of each one, like one-to-one, -one, because the sprues are the same. Mm -hmm. And when I, I painted the first one, and I was tried my absolute hardest, and I was really happy with it. But by the time I'd painted the fifth, and I looked at it compared to the first one, the jump was massive. Mm. And I actually had to paint the first one again, because it was too, it's too much. Yeah, yeah. It, It's crazy. Like, really on paper, when you look at that, that's like saying you can paint five models and improve that much just by being mindful of that. It's it's self critiquing by it's, step. It's self critiquing yourself. And the thing is, is like it, it's almost like doing the high jump, isn't it? You know, like you you raise the bar every time you pass it, and then you think, right, well, I'm going to get over that the next time. And the thing is, is with miniature painting, you look at it and like you look at the Aquila. Okay, I've spilled over into this part of the feather bit here, or I've not cutting here sharply or whatever. Okay, I'm going to leave that one, but the next one I do next to it, I'm going to get, I am factually going to get that sharper than that one or that better painted or no washing that recess or whatever it is that you choose. And I think because you have that tangible previous and current, I think that's what makes you go, I've just got to trump that. I've just got to improve that. I've just got to do better than that, etc. And that's what I think it. the temptation is to, um, to paint variety. And that's what's going to get you better, which is going to get you better. It, that does like work. Painting, yeah. painting one of, of something and then jumping something that's completely different, you'll benefit from that as well. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can still do that. I think this suggestion is like such a small task in the grand scheme of things. If you're saying paint five models mm. with that in mind, you can take. You can do three if you wanted. Right. You'd, yeah. you'd see the benefit from free, literally. Yeah. Like it, it, it's. I just think it's a cool little exercise to give yourself economically as well. Like buying one box of ten intercessors or ten salt intercessors or ten whatever is a lesser or five terminators. Or five yeah. terminators is a lesser investment than buying a massive army. And then you start the army 
day one. And then the last model of the army that you finished on day 300 is, is ambitious. Is, <laughs> is, is, is like, is way better. Like uh, the other thing we, that, that, you, that we haven't really mentioned as well in that process is like sort of touching upon what you were saying about your black Templars as well is you do kind of like, not to get out the not the the Donnie Yen, but but to but you do get you do get in the you do get in the zone of 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 painting, and it reaches the point where you're warmed up, and your painting is your paint your lines are more consistent because your your hands warmed up or whatever. So, if you're focusing in in that way, and you let's just say you paint a uh, try and do depending on the speed and the quality you're trying to execute. But if you try and paint maybe even a one to one to have one model and then try and paint the second model the same day. Because your hand's going to be warmed up and your eyes dialed in with what you're looking at, number two is always going to be better than number one, typically. Mm. So, um, and anecdotally on that, do you find that there's also that massive curve where you're warmed up and you're getting really good, and then it's three a.m. and you're still painting for some reason, and then you look at it the next morning and you're like, "What was I doing?" Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I have to, I have to cut off at a certain point because I, I start as I like catch myself zoning out a little bit and then i'm like right even if this looks good now i know it's, it's, if i'm feeling like that i know whatever i'm doing is not gonna look good tomorrow morning so i'm gonna cut off there yeah I, i've been there like you, you when it's when you get that little that little wiggle on the straight line that you're painting you're like oh, okay i've lost it That's yeah it. yeah oh, it's time for sleep yeah yeah <laughs> you're like it's time for sleep the frustrating <laughs> thing is when you're really motivated and you really want to keep going and you're like almost like procrastinating because you want to keep painting mm. But you've so, got to, you've so got to cut high, it off because you've been going for 10 hours. <laughs> this is why painting before entry, the evening before, or the morning of, in my case, is really good because you're push, you're constantly pushing against the envelope. So. Some would say good, some would say I don't think. Yeah, no, I don't advocate that for anyone. I really don't. Um, yeah, but uh, but no, yeah, that that's... Yeah, that'd be mine. That was one of, the, one of the first things that James kind of recommended to me when I started working in the office. I was right. asking about improving my painting. It's right what you said, though, because like generally speaking when i was trying to think of my one for this topic instantly my brain was like paint variety stop painting space marines over and over again and we've spoken about that before and uh, look don't get me wrong i've i literally said that on this podcast i was mm. like i wish i stopped painting the same thing over and over again mm. but that is talking in a broader sense that was talking about me only painting space marines for the first six months of me painting this is uh, an exercise that you can do you can no, do it with any box. If you, if you chose one model and painted each model in a week and you know, you're done just after a month if you wanted to do five or, or whatever. So I, I not, still think the variety thing's valid and that is long-term definitely something you should do. But this is more of a, a contained exercise. The nice thing about your exercise as well is it still gets your army finished. You yeah, haven't got to like, yeah. this isn't like some rogue random project and be telling you to go out and buy something. It's like odds are in your space room army you've already got. Mm. 10 infantry or in your sister's army you've got sisters about or you know what what have you your yeah. termaguns in your nids army you've probably already got that core infantry unit yeah so you yeah. could quite literally take what you've probably got from your pile of shame or your ongoing army project and you're still actually contributing to something as well because you're still yeah. in your army painted i think the key to it you can do it with like more unique models and stuff as well but i do think the key to it is that each model in the five or the three or the ten or whatever are mostly the same that's why i think infantry units are the but i think even if you've it. done it with it's a bigger task isn't it because you could buy two of the exact same character model but if it's like a big ornate fancy character model it's like yeah you definitely would get a be get better painting one and then painting the other mm. but you're also probably going to be kind of fatigued because it's more literally do. the same thing as well and it's a big model and there's a lot of detail on it i don't necessarily know that you'd get the same and you're going to end up with two of the same character models unless you're going to like sell it exactly it's yeah yeah. I'd probably be even suggest being a bit more granular with it. You get loads of spare parts in, in all these boxes that, that we buy. If you get five bolt pistol arms. He's gonna say paint a space marine leg, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, paint paint the leg, <laughs> paint the leg. Paint 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 multiples of the same shape or same thing from the spares. Use like those. A leg. Like a leg, yeah. Yeah. You could use, yeah, you could use the, the spares as part of that. Because it's, I think I know there's I know there's reward for like oh I finished the model and I get that totally but yeah. let's just say you haven't got the investment to spend a week doing five models or two weeks doing five models or whatever it is I'd argue and advocate that maybe spray do up some shoulder pads spray some shoulder pads and try and paint the edges on the shoulder pad as neat as and as sharp as physically possible and then mm. take the first one do it better or on faces the second one. Or faces like yeah. or whatever, I think yeah. you can be that granular with it and you can dial it right down to that um, because it's all it's all going to teach you things 
like pressure management, control the brush, like layering, like how to do the where to place the highlights, etc. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna learn from doing that, even at that non full model level. Mm. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. my one for how to improve fastest. It might sound a bit counterintuitive or even provocative to some extent, but this is from personal experience. I wasted so much time. I think because with most things, like the way I am in my personality, if before I do something, I want to learn as much about it as possible. And for a lot of things, that's true, right? Like if you want to learn how to use some product or do some DIY thing, generally the operation is, I'm going to do loads of research, I'm going to learn how to do it properly, then I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. I think I applied that even while I was still, I think, we all love watching painting tutorials and like learning new techniques and stuff. Yeah. But I wasted so much time thinking that if I watched more videos or learned more or listened to more podcasts even, like going down that rabbit hole that it would pay off. But the reality was putting the time in on the brushes would have been more of a net benefit than watching some video on a very specific and rogue style of painting or how to edge highlight in this fashion or how to do grim dark or how to glaze using this method or two brush method or wet plane or whatever overwhelming yourself with knowledge i don't necessarily think is the way to go the proof, yeah. the proof is in the baking not the recipe is what you're saying basically yeah i mean it, it, it's like you you can definitely benefit from consuming all that stuff but you still have to do the thing exactly like that's the that's the the difficult part and you like, can't it's not just like theoretical knowledge that you have and it just magically lives in your brain it's like if you don't actually try and execute the thing and understand the fundamentals of what that video was talking about it's just kind of just wasted information on you if you get what i mean yeah, like no, if i, I watch a video on how to do this type of blending and then i just wander off and go about my day and i don't actually apply that i don't think that you're necessarily retaining that information or understanding what it is you've actually learned mm. so on the flip side your point could also be if you were gonna watch tutorials and listen to podcasts and things to for your own benefit actually try it make sure you mm have a full on interest of trying the things that you're learning yeah. so that you at least benefit from it maybe. Because I definitely get what you're saying and even outside of Warhammer with other stuff like with music and other things like I would just watch like so much stuff, get so much information. It's almost like I'm tricking myself into saying, well, yeah, the reason I can't do it is because I just haven't unlocked the, I haven't got the information yet. Yeah. I haven't got that final nugget of info. You need to do yet. a Trinity for Matrix and just download it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like, like it's like it's like I'm tricking myself. I do think thinking. you do like through like the osmosis of watching loads of videos. You do pick up on stuff. Oh, no, I'm not saying that won't yeah. make you improve. But I think I'm sure you've done it too. Where you've watched a video and you've just like given it a go. No, like done the opposite. Like forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just think uh, like it. Yeah, just not forgetting that you still have to do the thing. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the whole point of it, right? You still have to follow the tutorial to benefit from it really or you still have to set yourself a little challenge based on the conversation you're, you're listening to now or, or something like you're not ju only going to benefit from it just just from listening to it or consuming something it. something i like to do now is i'll have like tutorials and stuff on while i'm painting mm. so i can do one of two things i'm like i'm actually like i said the fundamental is you need to actually be spending time doing the thing like on the brushes that's what's going to build your technique up which I know it's sort of the opposite of what the point of this topic is, but like I said, like at the end of the day, these are there are long term things that you just can't get around. Yeah, yeah. But if you're watching a tutorial while you're painting, you can either quickly implement what they're talking about and just give it a quick go on like a scrap bit of plastic or even on the model you're working on. So you're just immediately putting it into practice, right? Or like I said, it's information that you're downloading into your brain, like you said, but you're still putting the time in, you're still putting the hours in. Yeah. Yeah. I think to be fair as well, I do think a lot of it, like, I don't really, maybe when I'm on, like, when I'm on lunch at work, I'll, I'll watch some painting related YouTube videos or something or podcasts. But in general, if I'm going to consume something to do with miniature painting, it will be while I'm miniature painting. Yeah. That's when I've run out of my, like, Love Island and stuff that I said I like <laughs> to watch just to have one in the background. Like, I think in because you it gets you in like the the zone. Yeah, like, no, I agree. Like, um, yeah. So I think in general, most people would be like we had when we asked about 
what people are doing while they're listening to this, almost everyone replied saying that they were doing it while they were listening while they were painting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe that's part of the key to it as well. Because at least they're still doing. They are painting. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's uh, they they're hopefully still going to be able to implement it. Um, maybe while they're hearing it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Question of the week time. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions for Question of the Week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the podcast, please leave it in the comments of the YouTube version of this video. And sometimes we put out an Instagram story on the at Siege Studios uh, page as well. This question is from Sam Casey 661 My question, if you were cast in the up-and-coming Warhammer series, who would you want to be cast as? I thought this was fun because we've done our who would we cast, cast other people. Yeah. Oh, this is... Uh, this is... I mean, we can't do obvious ones, right? Yeah, I can't say. You can't be like, oh, I want to be Sanguinius. Oh, oh I want to be I would not want to be that. We, we should oh, guess. Guys, do you what think, are you about? Why would I want to be him? He's do you dead. think he wants to be Sanguinius or Dante? No. Oh, yeah, you want to be Dante. Old or dead. Thanks for the choices, lads. <laughs> yeah, 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 great. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's a typecast. <laughs> yeah, we roll now. I'm so not that <laughs> old, but okay. I'm very young in the age of the Astartes, if that's the case. Um, uh, oh, do you know what? I think I would like to... Uh, to and this is controversial because they don't live very long, but like I think, given what I've just said, but um, but I think just from the perspective of a guardsman would be quite interesting because you know that you're damned, you know, you know that there's no hope, but it's just an interesting just story. Just to play like, basically you wish you were in like Starship Troopers or something. <laughs> <laughs> I preferably not like to fight Tyranids, but yeah, maybe like, I don't know. If, I don't know really that they're all so menacing and so bad the different uh, Xenos and Alien factions or Xenos and, and, and Chaos factions that, I don't really know. Um, we are talking about, we're talking about you being cast in a film. It's not method acting. You don't have to, you won't actually have to fight Tyrion. Yeah, I know. I, I have the sort of luck where if I was actually like fortunate enough to be cast in the movie, and they're like, it's great news, you're going to be guardsman. That, and they don't tell me until shooting day that like, I'm going to instantly die. I'm like yeah. the first on screen death. My role will be like nine seconds. Yeah, see, you know, quickest, quickest, quickest work time ever done. There you go. You can watch everyone else have fun then. Do you know what that reminds me of? Is that, have you seen that meme where he's like, oh, how's the war going for you? He's like, oh, I can't wait to go see my mum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I, the, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I would want to be, I would want to be like, um, like a pox walker or something. You know, like someone got to be like, what, like full prosthetic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to get like fully like, and I do want to be the one that, I even want to be a human. I want to get. I want to be a guardsman that gets turned into a pox walker. Oh, that's quite cool. So I get actually. to do both. That's quite cool. Yeah. So like, I get to. So then I get to have this like horrendous. You know, like in like Shaun of the Dead, where he's been like pulled apart. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like, that's what I want basically. Yeah. Like, because I, I remember. Do you remember when like um, The Walking Dead first came on TV? It might be before your time. I don't no, know. that's in my time. That's peak my time. Okay. Yeah. Um, good, good, so good like, for checking though, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I, well, I'm 12 to be fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned refreshers earlier. So yeah. I like, um, uh, to be honest, I have no idea what year it came out. It was like 2000. It was like around the 2010s. I remember it was must like, be. Yeah. Time. So, um, cause it was after breaking bad, I think. So breaking bad was 2008. I'm pretty sure. But anyway, so, um, there was a whole big thing. I remember of like 2010 people just wanting to be like, go for a day to be a zombie do you know what I mean oh, like I get cast that. for a yeah, day yeah. to be a zombie or like there'd be like a celebrity that was like yeah I got to go and be a zombie on The Walking Dead or something like that so I was, yeah I'd like to have that sort of vibe but maybe I'd be like a, cool, yeah. a, a guardsman that gets turned into a pox walker I think that'd be quite I feel cool from just a having fun on a movie set like angle I'd want I know what you're I'd want to be some sort of Xenos creature I want to be like as I thought you were going to say orc because that I, I, I was going to say yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah orc would be yeah, good orc actually, could be quite fun well. actually and you get painted green so you look like a yeah. not just that I want like the full like prosthetic the full gear yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I get yeah. to wear my West Ham shirt as there well that I want like massive like tusks I want to be like that I want like big old tusks coming out my face yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah that's a good one yeah. and I also want a really graphic death mm. I think that's a key like truly it's that's 40, a requirement. It's 40K. I, I yeah. Want, yeah, yeah, I'd want to, yeah, I'd want that in anything. Yeah. That yeah. I'd cast I don't want to be like, oh, I want to be Gilliman and I want to be the hero of the, yeah. the Imperium. No. Stood on by a Titan. No. Yeah. 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 Just like, yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd actually want it to be like that. I should have done this for my, uh, for my pitch for the Warhammer movie. Austin Powers. You know when he's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just a Titan just stamps <laughs> on you. Yeah. 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 I think, I wonder if, 
they expected our answers to be so like boring, <laughs> like not the exciting characters at all. I think that's on trend for us. I think they should yeah. know that based on the. Uh, yeah, we're not going to sit here and be like, yeah, I want to yeah. be Valdor, or I yeah. want to be the Emperor, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, I've thought of the merging of worlds. Oh God. I've already thought, I'm going to one up my uh, my pitch for a movie from last week. That was last episode, George. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. tying this in with the viewer comments, right? Yeah. Austin Powers. Yeah. As the Muppets. <laughs> as 40k. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm an Inquisitor. <laughs> you see where this is going, yeah, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that could work. Save it. That's good content. Save <laughs> yeah. it. Actually, I'll cut this bit out. I'll cut yeah, this yeah, bit out. Yeah. <laughs> Save it. Uh, Amazon, if you're listening. <laughs> Uh, hobby hacks, our closing tradition on the podcast where we share a little uh, hobby hack trick a for tip. you. I feel like the whole topic's been hobby hacks, really. Well, we're we're for the people, Joe. I know, I'm just saying, like we just, can't give them they enough. Should, they should be they should be they should feel happy about that. They've, I've been, got, they've been spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one based on a conversation that I had with James, Mr. Hobby Hero. How doing this how, hang on. How has this got turned around on me? It's yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a dig as well. Yeah, I know. This is a dig. So, if first, he mentions Mitobond, I'm, I'm walking <laughs> off set. No, no, no. Yeah. I can't let him say else. So, apparently, <laughs> this is the thing that people don't know. So, I feel like I should share it with the people. Okay. Might, might be in their best interest. I went to, uh, to James's gaff to, to paint with him for the first time, right? We do some airbrushing. And he's like, oh, oh spray, I know some, what he's say. spray some cleaner through it. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, I said, oh, where's your water? And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, do you not dilute your cleaner? And he's like, you don't have to dilute your cleaner. And I said, but have you not seen on the back of the bottle where it says Didn't read dilute it. 50-50 with water? <laughs> <laughs> don't read it. Apparently, I, and in fairness, I didn't know this at first either. You know, like the run of the mill, like Vallejo yeah. cleaner that everyone uses or even other brands, I'm pretty sure it's the same stuff. Dilute, dilute with water. Do you know what? I, 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 I didn't I, know that. I've never, ever, 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 ever seen anybody ever dilute it. No, I've, in, every, in every person that I know, every video I've seen, every I've never seen anybody. It's literally because of the design of the bottles, those 200 mil ones, or even the, the smaller 50, 100 mil, whatever they are. You just People just use it neat. Mm. So instinctively, for all these years, I've been using it neat. And I don't know. I I generally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dilute it down. Being, being honest, I just wouldn't. I just use it as. I it thought is. you were going to say, not from like that's how it's supposed to be used, but more of just like a cost saving. Both, thing. like you well, could. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the main reason yeah. I'm going to now do it. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of it. Do you know what's better as well? I don't know why I didn't do this, and maybe everyone else does this, and I'm just a complete idiot. But like, before you start cleaning it out, just spraying loads of water through the airbrush just to clean out like as much paint as possible. And then go with the cleaner, which is diluted with water straight into the cleaner cup. Cleans it fine. I've been doing it. I figured or, this out like two years ago. Or I've never had a clog or an issue with it not cleaning. It's mm. definitely supposed to be that put way. Put water in the airbrush first, fill up a little bit in there, and then pour some cleaner into it. So then you're diluting by using less of the cleaner that you pour the bottle into some water that's in the airbrush. That's just diluting it. Though. That's just that's exactly, exactly what I just exactly, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah that's, the, that's the, yeah, for anyone who didn't know what diluting it meant. <laughs> Just covering all bases. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for explaining <laughs> to the listeners what that means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, to be fair, I'd never done it. That's quite a good little tip, actually. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. I want to do that. Yeah. That's, just, that's just built Have in you, do now. Do you use the Viejo? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Look on the back of the bottle. Read the, read the fine print. That's a good tip. I, I, yeah, I've never done that. So I'm gonna, I'm yeah. Gonna that go. I won't be because I've just always done it that way and I'm used to using it that way and I didn't read the back of the bottle. Is that I like a flex? I, like, yeah. don't want to brag, but... Uh, no, I just, I, I just, I'm you, so used to, it's so just, used yeah, to the I've process. Al I've always done it as well, but I'm like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Obviously, well, I'm the thing is, that certain paints are more stubborn to like clean out the airbrush and stuff and I find that even even with it not diluted, sometimes you do need to really aggressively But it's a volume it. thing, right? Because this is why I spray loads of water through it before I even clean it at all. It, you're not going to like waste that much cleaner. Like, I, I presume as well, even if you don't want to be even if you're saying like, oh, I don't want to dilute it, it's you wouldn't like pour like loads of it in, would you? Like you wouldn't flush out the airbrush with like loads. Of, you'd be getting through cleaner like like there's no tomorrow. So I've I feel like feeling you're going to say, yeah, you do that. Yeah, I've done that. Probably he does do that. But if you're a normal person, you're probably trying to be a bit like sparing with your cleaning. But do you know what it is? It's because right? it's because ev again, everyone that I've seen use it and anyone that I've seen use it has never diluted it. So for me, it's like, well, that's just that's that's just what. Everybody A does or B, that's what... Even if you're not going to dilute it, I think, yeah, flushing it out with loads of water. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do use water. Just yeah, I've got one of those, um, uh, almost like a ketchup Like a dropper bottle. bottle. Ketchup. No, not a dropper bottle. Don't get your hopes up. 
the ketchup bottle, ketchup thing bottle with the, the with a big with a hose uh, on it, the hose on it. You just yeah, squeeze yeah. that, and it just that, that flushes yeah. out quite well. Um, good tip. It's a good tip. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Good turned on. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. The base rib thing. Can we? Can we chat about that? Yeah. Because yeah. there's, I imagine, I'm, seeing as George I'm is ready. Picked, I'm seeing ready. as George has picked the comments, I'm imagining there's not many base room comments. Um, because every I'm, comment... Oh, no, there are. Don't worry. <laughs> there are. It's fine. Every comment was absolutely cooking George for his ridiculous... It was a landslide defeat. Yeah. I was thinking I'm, like, oh, a bit of a contentious topic. You know, maybe some people will think black base room. Some people will think other... It was like 99%. No, George is wrong. Do you know what? You know what I, I was listening and I was driving while I was listening and I, I was angry that I wasn't here. <laughs> Basically, look, I've got to give it to you. Super humble to admit, humbling defeat, but you got smashed like a greenhouse. I'm not changing my opinion. I'm, dying, <laughs> you got I'm smashed happily dying like, on this hill. Smashed like a greenhouse. Yeah, that's, that's not my fault that everyone else is wrong. I don't know what to tell I, you. I will, I will say some of the comments I saw were actually worse than what you would say. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow people took it and made it worse. But yeah. a lot of people yeah. um, had the correct answer, which is obviously that black is the best base rim. I think you fundamentally misunderstood what a base rim is on a model. Yeah. And it's a frame. Yeah. It's not... Was the, the the, was, the, was the cutting inside a cake or something you're all about? <laughs> what are you on about? It's a frame. Look at the frames on the, the, the paintings. Paintings that we've got on the wall. They don't bleed into like They're not brown. The the surroundings of the of the artwork. Right. It's a frame. But, but look, we've got to give it to you. Your humble in defeat. And, and, I, and I and I I take my I'm not that I'm wearing a hat, Joe. Uh, <laughs> I, I take my hat off to you because I'm not because, because, because you took it like a champ. I'm gonna and say, I just want to say, Team Black Bass Rim, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Yes. There we go. I'm going to give you an insight into my brain, right? Last night, I was painting like a little personal project mm -hmm. and I did my normal steel lesion drab bass rim, right? And I literally went, you know what? I'm going to try it. Mm -hmm. And I painted a black bass rim and I hated it. And I instantly <laughs> sanded it down and painted it painted into steel lesion drab again. The ones that got me was there was comments where like, someone was like, my favorite comments are the ones that are like 90% right. And then there's just something they, they throw in, in there. They throw yeah. in there, and I'm like, well, mm, I don't know. Well, there was a few that was like um, explaining why George was wrong, which I was on board with. And then uh, they would <laughs> say, so like the best base room is black. And then they'd be like, or just leave it unpainted. And I'm like, well, you were so close. You're so close. I almost had it. But yeah. so far, don't yeah. leave it I will say, I would it. much rather a black base room than an unpainted base room. Like painted black rather yeah, yeah, than unpainted. Painted black, yeah. yeah, unpainted is, is not. Yeah, like unpainted. It. It's just going to look weird. There's got to be a cheeky little mention for everybody, all the OG fans out there for this Goblin Green. That came in a close second. <laughs> yeah, but a Goblin very Green, close, Goblin very close Green, second. Again, we've done the nostalgia talk. We've done that, and we've done the a any green that, that represents Goblin Green still counts. I just want to clarify. Right, my point was. I like the base rim to just match the basing. Yeah, so there yeah, is a time and a place for a black base rim. Like I will do a black base rim. It's not like if like the basing was all black, I was like, oh no, still legion drab. Like, yeah, I know that. I know that. But I think that is the thing that as soon as I got past that, like as soon as I stopped thinking, oh, it needs to blend in. Because like, it doesn't make sense that it blends it. Like what is it? So we actually had, I was talking to a client fairly recently who had, maybe you can put a picture up. It's the Hellbrecht, um, conversion with yep. the neck one on, on the yeah. base and um it's got some sculpting on the base mm -hmm. so obviously the um it's got sculpted texture on the base so the base rim obviously has to it sort of waves up and down to match the the sculpting and um the 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 way that i was trying to explain it was that like putting black there so putting black on the base rim or putting black on those the bits where the texture is coming off of the base. Mm -hmm. It signifies that that thing continues beyond the base. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It signifies the thing. If if you painted it the same color, it insinuates it that stops. it's actually there because yeah. you've painted something that color already, and that's what's actually there. So if you're painting the base room that color, it's like they're all standing on these little circle hills or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, it's like when you see those cross sections in books of things, they kind of fade out the bit that would be solid material. Yeah, but it's like, so, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, like um, yeah, it's to, it's to, it helps signify something that 
it continues. carries on beyond yeah, the yeah. bass and it's not actually part of the scene. And that is what the bass room is. And there was another really good example of this. I'm not sure if we'll be able to put a picture up of this. I'll have to ask Eric, but there it was a model that Eric did. I don't think he's entered it into anything or posted it anyway yet, but I know, anyway. um, yeah, it's got a perfect example of that where it's like a log that's supposed to be like a, a tree branch mm-hmm. that's coming off of a tree, but the tree isn't on the model. So it's like, it looks like it's floating effectively, but because the corner where it would join the tree is painted completely black, it signifies that it continues beyond yeah, yeah. the base circumference. And that is just one of many reasons <laughs> why black base room is better. Because if you painted it to match it, it sort of tells you that that thing is part of the, the piece, but if that makes sense. In, in relation, I am seriously considering next time I do bake a cake to put a layer of icing inside to see what it's like. <laughs> so, so. If you take away anything from that I conversation. I don't know how we possibly could have extrapolated that from what I said I about the see, cake thing. I just see the cake thing just made me laugh because as soon as I heard it, I was like, no, he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the uh, the new Necron Overlord? Whoa, whoa. Hang on a second. Hang on a sec. Before we before we go down this port, something quite special happened recently, George. And um, and at the moment i've been uh, i've been back to back teaching classes for the last couple of weeks so i was up at i was up at element uh, a couple of weeks ago and I, I know what this is and, <laughs> and then and then this weekend i've just taught a bad moon the weekend just gone and i've got another manchester class coming up soon um but um you know it's it's always great to meet people that that like sort of watch the podcast or that are no siege or that like what we do or whatever but i was absolutely blown away by one of the students on the uh, the manchester class because literally the first thing that they done when they came in complimented uh, about a couple of things about the podcast and how we've helped them with their painting and stuff but i was given something george oh i've got that i was given something for you and uh, and we and, and we wanted to to reveal it to you today live on the uh, oh on the on the, on the show um, i will just i will caveat james has wrapped this up the the, the, the right. listener did hey, hey, i'm quite up. proud of my my rapping skills yeah. i'll tell you what james no one, was no one goes without a christmas all right james okay was ecstatic so, at the thought of i don't think this is on camera probably but the thought of wrapping this up for you so this the, is wild. As the producer of the show, the fact that you've caught me off guard here is, yeah, is, uh, is yeah. wild and unsettling. Yeah. yeah. One thing, the other thing I will say is that I said to James, wait until we do the listener comments so uh-huh. that he can say, before we have a listener comment, we have a listener gift. Right. But he's jumped in way ahead of that. Too excited. Completely got that. He's way too excited. <laughs> the, minions, the Minions wrapping paper just had me, so I couldn't yeah. help it. In so, true James style. Yeah. So, All right. so yeah, so, so, uh, so you get to open that Whoa, now. Whoa, this is heavy. Yeah, you get to open that now live. And I'm just, just I'll be wa- interested to know if you could guess what it is. Actually, I don't it guess what it is. actually weighs a ton. For yeah, the audio that, listeners, I've been passed a... Uh, a Minions wrapped. A Minions wrapped gift of sorts. So a bit, a bit of a backstory while you're tackling the uh, fantastic wrapping on that parcel. Do you parcel. want to add, do I, do I... <laughs> <laughs> So, so one of the students, one of the students came up to me and we'll pick picture up because I, I took a photo, I took a photo with, uh, with, with him um, uh, on the class. He literally, the first thing, I've got to say two things. First things first, he was wearing a Blood Angels t-shirt so that gives him extra kudos. And secondly, the first, he gave me that straight away and said, you've got to give this to George. Brilliant. So a massive thank you to, to for the gift. I'm sure George is going to spend the rest of the year get, tremendous. getting through those. The um, rest of the year, the yeah, rest of the week. The rest man. of the week. <laughs> <laughs> but that is uh, 48 tubes or packets, whatever you want to call them, of refreshers. Uh, so um, as an industrial yeah, amount. Yeah, the, the, fact, the fact that all of this stemmed from one passing comment is still absolutely mind-blowing for me. But um, but uh, yeah. but yeah, enjoy. All right. I, I genuinely thought, because for just, so, just to pull the curtain back a little bit for everyone that know, doesn't know, I just smuggled that in under my jumper into this room. <laughs> you did room. a very good job. I was thinking, where the hell did this into come this from? Into this room. I put my jumper down. You've just felt how heavy that is. I put my jumper down <laughs> so awkwardly. And I was like, he's got to literally say, why are you carrying your jumper like that? Yeah. But you didn't see it. So I'm quite Well, quite thank you very much for the gift. That's, uh, that's yeah. very kind. Yeah, we'll put a photo yeah. up of uh, when I was given the amazing present for you. Um, but yeah, wild. he's just, uh, but he's a long time listener of the, of the podcast. Um, he, he does, uh, he goes out on fishing boats, like into the, the, the obviously the sea, and um, he listens to the podcast all the time. So, uh, so yeah, just a huge thank you. It's, it's, it's really, really kind. So of while I've to... lost all the support on the base rooms, the support for the refreshers is. It's gone through the stratosphere. Uh, it, yeah. It's bizarre. 
So it's like, one all in the grand scheme of the yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> What you got to do is you see that as a consolation prize for being wrong about black base. That's not a yeah. consolation so, prize so, because your prize for victory is absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like sweets that I like that I can start an argument about on the podcast so and then get hopefully down the line, yeah. Maybe we can start like... Don't say too many because I'll be coming back with a car from classes. True. For the sweets. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, oh, yeah. Let's try and think of like the heaviest things possible. I mean, they're pretty heavy. To make fair. as an in-joke so that when people then ultimately give those things to James to pass on to us, he has to carry them around. <laughs> yeah. Although the refresher is pretty heavy. Yeah. To be honest. That is, that is... 48 packs. I th- do you know what I thought? My only guess was when I was feeling through the packet, I was like, is this a bunch of batteries or something? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Yeah, very but, good. But yeah, what a wild there card. There you go. Oh, great way to kick off the show. Thank you very much. That's okay. Okay. Well, uh, with that segue then, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, transition out of that. <laughs> it's totally caught cool. off guard. The, uh, the new Necron Overlord uh, released from GW. Yeah. Pull, uh, up, uh, pull up the old images now. I am feeling this. It's mega. It is cool. Yeah, so is this mega. like, I'm not too too into the lore stuff. Is this guy like animating? Is he like appearing? Is that what all this effect is? In he, the, has a, he has a... Uh, what is the actual it's tra- I think it's called translocation I think is what it is translocation so, yeah. shroud is yeah. what that is it's really is. cool so it's similar thing to what you see on the what was the big Satan model uh, it, of kind of design. like that so in the new Warhammer Plus uh, Salamander kind of like short short sort of CGI story there's a there's a um, death mark that sort of like teleports around in that I don't want to spoil it for anyone obviously but um the effect of like the movement of him teleporting from one of it is very similar to that, the way yeah. it works. And um, it's just a really cool model. Like I, I, I literally want to paint one. I, I, yeah, I think it is, it is really cool. And it, it kind of, um, it's funny noting on, we mentioned, what was the, um, the Necron character that got revealed recently? The other one. Oh, the um, Imitech. Was it uh, Imitech. Imitech. Yeah. Yeah. So we were kind of, uh, well, I'm brought up how that was a bit more reserved than some of the other mm-hmm. Necron characters. And you might suspect that Imatech would have been like a big beefy one, but they've had quite a few big beefy ones over the mm. few years. Um, this is kind of back to being like another really interesting kind of unique one. I think there's not many models that look like that. Is I'm that? trying to work out like the scale of it from looking at it. I think it's on a 40. I it is on, just an overlord. It is, yeah. So yeah. it's not too big then. You yeah. can you can compare it to obviously the overlord that was in Indominus, I suppose. Potentially, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's obviously going to be a lot taller just because of like, if you look at it, if that is a 40 mil, which well, he's, I, he's basically on a little tactical rock. So it's still only, it's still the same thing. Um, obviously, he's separating a little bit in the middle. So he could be. I a think that's bit a brilliant taller. design. Like, I, I like. I've got to say this, like you see, there are models which like are really like cool looking. And then there are models which are just um, like amazing as in for design features. And like the thought process that's gone into it to have him kind of like separating and, and sort of like appearing or disappearing or whichever way he's going, I think it's great. So the design team have done a great job on that. Like it looks, it's really cool the way the effect of the swirl as well. And it's all in that sort of Necron block kind of like patterning as well, which is really awesome. Um, Quite yeah. interesting as well. I thought that they, um, they showed on the article that, it was originally teased on the in a rumor engine. engine two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you can tell the rumor engine image, which has been made black and white, is painted as well. Yeah. So it was still it was like fully there two yeah, years yeah. ago. But they've obviously waited for the codex things to to kick in and stuff. I think my favorite bit's the scepter because the scepter is actually appearing as well. It's like shifting into the thing as well, which is really cool. So not even the weapons one piece as well. It's just, oh yeah, I didn't even notice. It's really that. cool. Like the thought process behind it is is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like cut off in the middle. Of it's it. awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like there's shifting. a if you scroll down, there's another image where like a bit of a side on view. There you go. He's, he's in half as well. Yeah, yeah. His legs like not actually there, which isn't entirely apparent from the front until yeah, you sort exactly. Of yeah, angle yeah. it around, which is which is great. Well, it's not apparent from the front because he's been shrouded by his translocation shroud. <laughs> Thank you for for that. <laughs> Same from the back as well. Yeah, yeah. Can't really see it. So it's cool. It's hard to sell effects like that convincingly in 3D form, if you get what I mean. I think it's a com- I think they've done a good job. It's, it, the paint job as well with the blending on the swirl to insinuate the transition and the, the way it's moving also helps, obviously, because the thing is, I, I'd argue that's a part of the model that you kind of have to do some kind of tonal variance on to mm. show the movement. If it's a solid, if it's a solid color and you just paint it one color, then it just looks like it's part of the model that the effect helps helps with the actual what he's doing I think. yeah it perfectly yeah. sort of signifies this sort of like digital kind of thing as well yeah, just yeah, with yeah. The design cues of being like yeah pixels. what is that the big 
sort of metallic satan thing that I'm thinking of. The, uh, the shard of the dragon, isn't it? Oh, it's a, uh, it's the it's something along those lines. But they, they, when you look at that image, that's got a similar kind of digital disappearing, yeah, yeah. Um, thing. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a hard uh, effect to sell on a model design. I think I don't know people do like clear plastic. And yeah. clear, clear models and stuff sometimes to sell it. I don't think that really works. No, so it's that's great. a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Painted much this week, anyone? Mm, Joe, know. what's happening with this Been model you painted for the? Uh, so, the to be honest, as soon as I um, he's trying to get you back. As soon as stick. I missed the deadline, I was like, oh, I don't have to do it. Now. You read it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, well, I've been away. I've, I was obviously away last week. Um, and yeah, once once the deadline was missed, I was kind of like, oh, I'll just get to it when I can. So sorry about that. It will, but it'll happen at some point. We'll do the next Space Marine thing we do. We'll, we'll put it on that. We'll have to do like Ultramarines again in 2027 and then well, come full ep- circle. Well, episode did pretty well. So if we have to do it again, <laughs> then we have to do it again. Yeah. yeah. James, been uh, painting the courses, I suppose? Yeah, just been teaching. Some of the classes have been really good. Like um, the one, bad, well, both have been great. Like the Edmund one was really good. Um, but the the Bad Moon one as well. Like, I always love teaching at Bad Moon. It's uh, really good. If you're ever in London, um, and this is just... They're not paying us to do this. It's just me saying like, Bad Moon's a phenomenal, phenomenal venue. Um, good pizza. Good pizza. Pizza's amazing. Yeah. Go for, so the, pe- like go a, for the pizza. Stay in game. Um, was it like a gaming hall? Food so it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a really well presented kind of like really like high end looking shop as in all the product is on one wall. Loads of really clean gaming tables, like really nice cafe area at the front, uh, hence the name. Um, like it's just, yeah, it's just really good. Like Willem, he, he owns it. One of the owners, he's, he's really top, top guy as well. Um, yeah, I just always enjoy teaching there. It's always nice to, you always get a really good crowd, really good vibe. Um, and yeah, the pizza is amazing. So yeah. If you want to join any of our courses, you can of course go to uh, seedstudios.co.uk forward slash shop. Uh, we've got tickets on sale on there for 2024, I believe. Yeah, yeah just announced dates. all the 24 dates. 24 yeah. dates, yeah. yeah. We've got like, we've got like a new army painting class. Uh, we've got some sculpting classes and then both the EMCs are on there as well, the one and two. So, so yeah. that's the Essentials Masterclass. Essentials Masterclass one and the Essentials Masterclass two. So yeah, sure. Viewers' comments. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. do it. I think he's going to be a bit grueling for you, so I'm just going to pre. Uh, well, no, because he's picked them. Oh, actually, I'm yeah, telling you now, there is going to be none about yeah. base rooms. Well, I figured that if we just sit here and talk about base rooms, we're going to be here until the end of time. So, uh, related to the Necrons, though, actually, uh, Niall Richard Curran says, uh, "Have you used that fluoro green on uh, Necrons? Super curious. I haven't found a Gloria recipe I 100% like." Uh, I have used the fluo greens, the Vallejo ones that we mentioned on the last episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have used those on Necrons. I haven't used the green, uh, but I used the orange one, which looked great. It just happened to work with the scheme I was doing. Uh, but those are really, really good for, for models like that. I actually have the, um, obviously I listened to that last episode, and I have the box set, the little box. I think they're what you're talking about mm-hmm. um, of all of those colors. I can't remember. I think it got bought for me because it doesn't seem like, Something that I would have gone out and bought. I didn't even know they'd done a set. I just um, thought it was like individuals. Pre- if it's the same thing, um, um, what you're talking about is the same because I listened last week, so gotcha. I haven't actually seen what you what you were holding up. But um, yeah, I had like a, a it was like a box set of like six, I think, different um, like six different ones or something. I, think, I don't know. I don't know if you can get a fluoro. I'm not too sure. I, I'm I haven't seen it. This this is what I was talking about. Oh, okay, it's not those. Maybe I'm thinking. Maybe it's like a scale. Potentially, box. I thought you. I thought the fluoro scale seventy five, like flu, fluoro. Try searching that. See if I can real quick. Uh, I think like, they do have. I think they do have. It's like again, scale seventy five, like it's like a proper fluoro. I think they do have a fluoro. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's this. Yeah, it's this yeah, box. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. So it's very similar to what you were saying, basically. Yeah. I'm really sure they're similar. basically the same thing. It's just yeah. sort of the the concept more more so than a yeah, specific yeah, product, yeah. but. Yeah, because yeah. I always thought those Vallejo ones, the model colors, you can buy them individually. I I didn't realize, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, Necrons, anything like that with like loads of glowy stuff on it, it's perfect. Especially with a Necron, because it's not like a massive focal point of the model. It's just like these like glowy accents. I probably wouldn't use them on blades, no. but for like glowing eyes or like yeah. the like, orbs and I whatnot. Think, I think they're more suited personally to like more fantasy stuff, like magic and etheric kind of things. Like yeah. you can do it on librarians and stuff like that, maybe, or like the hand, like for the. Mm-hmm. For the it's almost any, anything that's magical. Not supposed to be solid. Does yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. Like, yeah, like, an, exactly like an orb or a flame or, or like whatever. a glow. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Mike Burt 5512 says uh, this is in regards to this ongoing thing that we've had where we're trying to come up with different month names. This, this is brilliant. This is better than any of the ones that already exist. This so was brilliant. We've been spitballing the ideas of like you've got March McCrag, you've got October, and we were trying to come up with some other ones. Yeah. And this is 
like so obvious and yet yeah. so genius. Uh, he says, I can't believe no one has said Tau September. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Perfect. Like, and I think I, I would say you don't have to paint Tau Sept, like the actual Sept. Sept. Just any of them. You can paint yeah. any Tau yeah. in that, but I think, that's, I think that's the first official one that we're now adding on. I think that's a we're, challenge we've got that we do. We've we, got to fill the calendar. I think we do Tau Sept Ember. Yeah, we do yeah, it. yeah, yeah. We've got to do it. Um, and when you say it, you have to pause really awkwardly like that. Yeah. yeah. Can Tau you also Sept, can you also do Ember. really you have to say that otherwise it that's, doesn't that's work. That's the way to do it. I think yeah. you should really also really unnecessarily hit the apostrophe. So it's Tau. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Tau Sept Ember. Sept Ember. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's I think the first. We, so we want to fill the rest of them. So yeah. if anyone's got any suggestions or if we want to come up with some, I think that's the first official. We just missed it, unfortunately. But, um, <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't. If someone get... wants to come up with one for. Uh, so we had Dark Angels December. Yeah, I was going to say I'm yeah. surprised you didn't. You didn't, you didn't go no, on that, that one. was really good actually because of the reasons given as well. What? Because the, the line is Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no the lines, but the line was. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, the line was Jesus. Died and came back to life. Yeah. 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 Um, I think. I think that. I was going to say no. The lion's Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, you're right. Yeah. Um, so I think that I think, was one of I the think, points they made. They said, like, it's got a, a guy with long hair and a beard. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Dark Angels December's official it's now. Pretty as good, well. yeah. I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, which need, which need, uh, need to fill the rest. Yeah. Need to fill the rest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't uh, think any of the ones that we came up with are good enough to stick around. I can't even I don't think we've heard any good ones. You, <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I, said, <laughs> you said Drukari December. We've already. No, that didn't work. You can't, didn't you work. can't do Drukari in December. They're not, they're not nice enough. Like, you could do um, December's a nice time of year come on what if you did uh, you did February and you did you like, Emper paint, Emperor's Children you have to paint Fabulous Bill you have to paint either Fabulous Bill or just Emperor's Children in yeah. general Fab I was going to say I, I was going to I was going to say Angels April we're pushing it but we've got no other substitutes so I'll have to take what I can get if, if someone wants to we've already gotten rid of George's Drukari one. So if someone wants to trump that for February, then we will we will do it. I was going to say Angels April. You have to paint any chapter that has the word Angels in the name. That's, yeah, that's, that's not a, a pun though. Name. Like you're you're the man yeah, of Jamesisms, yeah. and you've you've just not had a pun. It's yeah. alliteration. The pun, like, I think I've, been pretty, I've been pretty consistent for most weeks. All right, I'm gonna yeah, have a bit of time the, off. Here's the thing with it: the pun will always be the best one. Mm -hmm. The pun will always trump anything else we come up with. However, some months, such as Dark Angels December, you are going to have to just succumb to the fact that there isn't a correct pun. That's true. There. But yeah. the, the pun will always, if there's one that's a pun, it will always come first because yeah. it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's that's a general rule. So if anyone's got any they want to suggest, get me in the we can all we can all throw out, you know, um oh, well, ideas. I've got one. Angels <laughs> April, whatever. <laughs> March from a Crags actually March a really a good one. It is really good. good. That yeah, is a is really, really good one. Personally sponsored by Nick Baton. Yeah, that one. he loves that it. That is actually Absolutely a really good it. one. October's cool. It's a cool little pun. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think we need to have a think. We'll have to do that. We'll have to do like an official calendar. Yeah, and we can we can start it in um, twenty twenty four. We can start it in January. Maybe we could do a little update every every month. Can you imagine that having like a proper printout that you have in like your hobby room? Yeah, yeah. Just all these ridiculous names yeah. that we've come up with. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Jonathan Palermo, who's 6166, says, uh, talking about varnishes, uh, this is in regards to the whole airbrush first rattle can situation. Uh, talking about varnishes, the day I swore off can varnish and only varnishing with airbrushes was the day I was varnishing my full Death Watch army. I decided to paint the army in a style where I didn't just highlight the edges of the black armor, but larger highlights over the full panels of the Space Marine armor. Uh, anyway, I waited until I finished the entire army before I varnished. Big mistake. The entire army was ruined. Going to have to strip the whole lot. Oh, oh no. That's bad. That's a rough one, isn't it? That is savage. Varnish, like... Ugh, varnish does make me nervous, you know. It's worth it because it looks... Everything looks better after it. Hmm. But it does... It is one of the things where I'm like, what do I do? If, <laughs> if it, if do you, do you rattle can varnish or do you do... No, airbrush? no, I do... I, I Since I got the airbrush, I'm... I, I airbrush varnish. I haven't really ever had any issues, to be honest. I don't know. I've had a problem with airbrush varnish. Really. No, I, mean, no, I haven't. There wasn't like self-induced, like by either clogging up the airbrush because I didn't thin it when I was first doing it, or by like overspraying. But that's not really a fault of the product. That's yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest. I never really had an issue with rattle can varnish. 
either. I probably, like, I didn't, sh- I didn't, probably shook it enough. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah. I didn't, again, I probably didn't use it loads. I think there was quite a small window between me actually bothering to varnish with a rattle can and then eventually getting an airbrush anyway. There's a lot of variables um, at play with just using rattle cans in general as well, like we yeah. discussed before. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, just in regards to temperature, how well you shook the can, the list goes on. I think, yeah, it's definitely one of those things that like, unfortunately, even you can you can prep as much as you want and do everything right, but something can go wrong with varnish. Yeah. Okay, just just, just have a test, test, a test object. Do the test. I would definitely say yeah. like, if you're going to use a rattle can varnish and you've just painted an army like this, like learn from this mistake, varnish one model, like first. Mm. Check I didn't, you're happy I'd with even it. just say just have a test, a bit of plastic card or something painted in. Yeah, but even then, I wouldn't yeah. be like, oh, I'm going to test it on a bit of plastic card. Okay, time for the full army. Like, no, no, I get you know. it. But there's got to be that point of commitment though, where you go of right, course, okay, yeah. like you know. So. That's very true. That's kind of the upside of like doing the airbrush. You're kind of doing like one model or a squad at a time you yeah. can't really like That's, just because of the airbrush like you just can't hit that many models at once right yeah it's yeah. also just going to come with experience you'll suddenly be like yeah i trust this more now uh speaking about paints that we mentioned last week uh sash says uh tamia and mr hobby paints are acrylic but they are not water-based they're solvent based that's why they require different thinners and removers and why they need to be mixed with similar solvent based paints and not white water-based paints such as Citadel, Vallejo, Army Painter, etc. Yep. They go, I, the more I, you know. I was incorrect saying an amber white. I always get those confused. Yeah. But um, yeah, you just have to use a specific. I use Tamiya uh, XV, whatever it is, with the um, with Mr. The Tamiya Thinner. Yeah, yeah, the Tamiya Thinner for, for the Tamiya. I love the Tamiya stuff through the airbrush. Oh, it's so honest. good. It's really nice. Flat white is great. Hmm. I'm not dabbled with any of those. Yeah. It's very good. That's like a, a so whole, smooth. Like that's a whole category of product that I'm like afraid to dip into because it's all new, right? Because it comes in glass bottles, and you're like, no, that's different. Can't I've got like, to buy bottle. new thinners. I've got a whole new process for cleaning my brushes. Yeah. Got, everything is like starting fresh. But I mean, there's a reason that all the like scale model painters and whatnot. Like, it's definitely worth it. Very right? good. Yeah. They're, very, they're de- definitely worth it. Like really, really good. Yeah, maybe that's something I have to dab with. I have the same sort of um, apprehension with. Um, oils as well i'm same with that because it just seems like the thing with oils i've always maybe i haven't seen enough of what they can do and what people do with them and stuff like that and some of the stuff does look really good but i'm always like whatever you're getting out of it i feel like i'm just more comfortable achieving that with normal my issue with them is whenever i see one of those tutorials and this probably comes from a lack of understanding whenever i see one of those tutorials it's like right paint your model now wipe off all the paint you just put on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, surely the amount of time spent removing and cleaning up, and then inevitably there's always some sort of issue or yeah. like clean up after your clean up because your clean up wasn't good enough. Mm. And I feel like in that amount of time, I could have just recess shaded the whole model. Yeah, I, I, I see it as very much like if you're trying to walk out the front door of the house, you go through the back garden, over the back fence, round the block <laughs> into the front. Like, you know, like the amount of time you're going to spend, the amount of time you're going to spend with cotton buds or Q-tips or cotton, whatever it is, you're taking that stuff off with a brush or whatever. Like just and then like thinning it down, getting know, just, just, out, just, and then like suffocating to death in your painting room because you've been inhaling methylated yeah. spirits for the last 45 minutes. Literally, if you want shadow or to pin shade. Well, now you're selling it to me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want James shadow. with his undiluted uh, cleaner, it's thinner, probably yeah. not yeah. going yeah. to feel a thing. Yeah. yeah. If you want to put shadow or some uh, or, or, or like tone an area or tone a recess, just put the paint in the shadow and control it. Like you don't need to... Ex- cover it in stuff and then spend an hour taking it all off and then you get a bleed somewhere or whatever. Like, there must, just, but there must honestly, be like, like something else. Something to it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. For me, wants- it's more It's more like, well, I haven't perfected the other thing yet, so I'm just going to keep trying that. Sure. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to keep yeah. working on that. Yeah. I, mean, look, I always see it in the speed painting context as well, which is why I kind of don't like the idea of it because of all the cleanup and stuff, like I said. But I don't see a lot of high-end display painters using them. Maybe that's just my ignorance showing through. Except in the context of like free-handed, like flat surfaces, we need like maybe more of a working time. I think if you like, could be, like you, are you, I've been to like uh, SMC, like in, in in Belgium, I think it is. I can't remember now, but I've been to SMC before. You see a lot of like um, uh, scale model stuff, and it's all a lot of it is oils and stuff. It has a hundred percent has a place, and it has a way of doing it. But I just think like uh, my my comments is that more just because it's in the European scene, it's more popular. No, it's just the that... type of competition that right, it okay. is, and like SMC, like their painting competition. It's very it's very different to like Golden Demon or like other painting competitions. But like um, I think that it, it's 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 a great way of painting using them. My comments and, and personal opinion on it is purely down to the fact like if you're trying to do a process orientated and paint an army quickly, for example, whatever. 
that's that's the reason why I think just put the shadow where it needs to go rather than using oils and then wiping it all off and like that. You, having said that, you can gloss it and then still pin shave with oils. That's fine. It's that, but that it's isn't that the same as just putting a that's what I mean. Yeah, you know, like it's you yeah. know, feel but, free to uh, comment it below. Roast us in the comments. Yeah, okay. and, and maybe I'll we'll have to give it a go. To be honest, just out of like pure curiosity. Well, yeah, 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 just yeah, so I definitely. can put it to bed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, no, Stillgar says I'm surprised that James is very keen on the jump pack intercessors. Uh, this is in regards to the Christmas boxes that we were speaking about last week. Uh, being old guard like myself, I would expect that he too would hate the new jump pack and ankle thruster models. Personally, I think the old school jump packs on regular assault intercessors look a million times better, but still way worse than the previous box of Vanguard veterans. What say you, James? That's a very, very good question. Uh, no, I do, I do like so I'm, all cards. I love the old jump pack like style. I think it's great. Um, I used to love the fact that you could have the the harness straps across the front of the chest as well. I think that detail is quite cool. Whereas new ones look like they're mag locked on, which is quite cool as well. I, I'm actually, I'm going to throw a wild card in there. I actually like the single thruster variant that the Gazan Guard have actually. Because like your assault troops, you know, if 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 a single thruster one that the Sand Guard... Is that like where the jetpack's in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like if that can lift a Marine in full or night. Uh, all night armor off the ground then you solid gold you don't need you don't need <laughs> you don't need the giant double double thruster one and the thing is especially when you're in combat like you know if you're an assault troop you don't want this bulky gear very on wide you. aren't they yeah yeah you don't want this that, I like the sleek yeah, that's why I, I just prefer yeah I, uh, and, I, and I'm going to throw an even worse wild card out there I don't put the wings on the on the sand guard like imagine being in combat with your mates yeah combat with your mates yeah. as we all are at some well, point well, in the day yeah. you're in combat with your mates you're, 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 you're you know when you're there Joe and you're just chilling out yeah, with you your mates you're in combat I've never, never <laughs> yeah you're swinging even yeah. been in like a fight or something I've never been like yeah I was in combat the other day <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're swinging your blade at Scar main round and oh I, bu I bumped into Gary's wing you know like yeah. it's just like oh, so I just took the wings off it's literally tight tight fitting like uh, uh, so single wait, thruster the, jump the pack the Sangard I'm like feeling like I'm having like a Sangard have got these decorative wings on the side yeah, of the jump pack yeah but do they have the, the single thruster in the middle of the wings then yeah 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 it's oh, a okay. single pack yeah like it's the best it's, it's my favourite style jump I think I think correct me if I'm wrong I think it's the Mark IV Maximus uh, pattern jump pack um because in 30k they've got the yeah the, the, all the assault got mark got for, all yeah, the mark yeah. four assault marines have got the those packs as standard i think i was thinking of like a sanguinor which also has he's got I, he's got that's what he's got yeah but then the wings yeah. are like way bigger, bigger. yeah yeah. so i was yeah. like well i was then i was trying to remember like oh do all the sanguinary guard have like those massive wings but yeah they don't yeah they're like so i don't, I don't have those on my sand guard i like them looking sleek like with a single pack you know no bumping into gary while you're swinging your blade around yeah you know, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, I like all the pack designs and going on the new ones. I think the new ones are really good. The ankle thrusters is quite cool, actually. I, I like the ankle I, thrusters. I actually do like them. I think they're quite cool. I think, I didn't even notice them at first, actually. So this... I, I didn't notice them on the, I noticed them when I'd done the captain. Yeah. Because he's got them, but I don't, I don't, I think that the, the normal assault marines have got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah they have. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. No, I think not I... the assault marines without a jump pack. They don't have them. The assault marines, the assault, Sorry, assault, the assault intercessors, intercessors don't have them. Don't have them. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But the, the the assault intercessors with jump packs do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Still getting used to that name. Still getting used. To, they're <laughs> still assault marines. They're still assault marines. It's, it's jump, marines. jump pack intercessors. Um, yeah, I think the where that commenter went wrong was assuming that James wouldn't just absolutely love anything space marine or blood angel related regardless of whether he prefers the old one I still I, I like both does that go back to your they were almost completely right until the last minute the yeah, yeah 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 that's like 90% right 90% yeah but then you realise you're talking to James who's the biggest space marine blood angel fan you could be yeah. I don't think much is going to turn him against it to be yeah. honest yeah. just pure just, excitement just to prove how much of a fan he was right he got he got all fussy earlier when we were setting up the set we've got the white dwarfs behind us and James threw a bit of a hissy because he didn't have the Blood Angels one behind him. So there was shirt. no hissy. I, I, the one behind you is my very first white dwarf. But you wearing a Blood Angel shirt? Um, I might be, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're getting close. Hey, to, and I, I want to actually touch on something. Wait, wait, wait. How many of those t-shirts do you own? Uh, is it like Spongebob where he goes in like the, the wardrobe in the morning and he's just got like a whole row of Blood Angel shirts? I have a few in different colours. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but even in the same colours? I've got two in red, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. That's but, what I mean. Like that's a, like... It's actually brilliant because it's like, I think a lot of people would, as this comment may be insinuated, like, oh, you know, as a, as a big Blood Angel fan, as a fan of the old school stuff, I would expect you to not like this. 
But James is just so excited about all of it. And, and I'm going to, we haven't mentioned the comment. He's like, you had me at Space Marines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I <laughs> with, love it. With, I can't remember for love nor money the, na- the name of the person. So I'm really sorry for not remembering your account name. But we will get it on the screen or whatever. We'll go back and have a look. But someone mentioned, obviously, touching back on the earlier part of the conversation, a time, a time of year. December is actually the Sanguinala, which is the which is the festival season in the Warhammer Forty Thousand universe. Uh, which when is I the, read that comment, I thought the, they was making that up. No, the well, sangu- that's a real thing. Sanguinala is a really a real forty k law time of year, which is a celebration, and it's the, it's a celebration. It's basically, Christmas. It's basically yeah. It's basically it's a celebration of Sanguinius' sacrifice, basically. So so that's oh, it's Easter. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. Um, yeah so, so it's Blood Angels Christmas. It's not like Warhammer Christmas. Well, we've got a new run in for uh, for April then. So yeah, could that be April or would that I don't be know. December? I don't know. I, I don't actually know from the book. From the book, well, it's going to be well, Easter. It's got to be in April. Well, potentially, yeah. Angels, suppose, yeah. angels. Well, you said Christmas. Why is it Christmas? Well, no. What I'm saying is that the comments <laughs> are sacrificing. The, the comments are mentioned that oh, it's, maybe coming, it's, up, it's coming up to Sanguinala. So, with that in mind, you'll be seeing a bit maybe, more. A bit more maybe, a bit maybe, maybe Sanguinala could be could be Easter then. Could be April. Potentially, yeah. I don't know. Let us know in the comments. When do you think it is? Do you think it's do you that's think it's better than it being April a, or Angels, Angels April or something? Yeah, yeah. I bet he's. Uh, I bet he's collected over the years all of those like Warhammer Christmas ornaments. I bet your tree is just absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I he's don't. got Sanguinius at the top. I have no. I have no Warhammer Christmas decorations at all whatsoever. But that's a good idea though. Like, <laughs> but no. And, and I just want to say, I just, I just fundamentally don't believe. He just that. hangs <laughs> pots of blood, blood red, red off yeah. his tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, used ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, but you're saying about the white wolf. So that white dwarf behind you, funny it just enough. It's a sanguinor at the top of the tree. Like yeah. a, a, a hey, look, one. It, it looked good at the top of a tree. It's got the wings and everything. It's a bit small. But, uh, hmm. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the, so the white dwarf behind you is my very first ever white dwarf that I got. So that is the very first one. And then, yeah, like, I just was like, oh, look, Fur- Furioso. So I just stick that one there. Mm. Yeah. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Seed Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army. We offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. So topic for this week, uh, as a studio who paint in the, the box art, heavy metal style, and me and James have a particular affinity and personal Love. unhealthy obsession with trying to replicate the, uh, the box art painting style, we get asked a lot about how, how you do emulate that and how we paint in the way that we paint. And I thought it'd be interesting to sort of break down some of the techniques and the nuanced specifics of what a box art painting style is. And if you're someone who's already like doing the basics, like your edge highlights and your TMMs, and you're doing things in that style already, but you're realizing it doesn't quite look like the box art, I want to go into more than just like color choice and speak about sort of the specific yeah, yeah. five points of what you can do to make it look more like the one on the box. Uh, so the first one I've listed here, we mean James curated a little bit of a list earlier today. Uh, the first one that we thought of is you'll often see uh, in the style that we paint is it's quite often a good idea to start with a base coat that is a 50-50 mix of your shadow color and your highlight color. And that gives you this sort of smoother transition when you do start glazing in your shadows and your highlights. This gives you sort of this natural blended smoothness kind of works really well it, it helps with refinement quite a bit because then the the jumps between the colors are closer together which means those incremental little changes that you make don't make such a drastic impact on the surface of the model so like if you are pulling shadow to the bottom of a shoulder pad and let's just say you've uh you've mixed a bit of a darker red in when you do that glaze of the darker red to create the shadow it just helps helps work better with that i find as well that when you're doing the the glazing stage it's much much easier to avoid that staining that you sometimes get. You know, sometimes like you'll thin down a glaze mm. and you're like really thin it down. And you're like, I'm going to do this like, you know, 20 passes, whatever. And you put that first one on and just instantly there's this like mark, mark of yeah. like where it's clearly been wet. Yeah. As soon as you, you kind of touched on that on an episode previously, and I never really thought about it like that. And as soon as you said that, I was like, that makes perfect sense. And I think I might... I, I I would definitely look to try and implement that in my own painting now just to save those. But I, like, I think in the context of the previous conversation was we were talking about the, um, potentially the Sons of Horus yeah, yeah. thing, which is um, the, the recipe, which um, you've, uh, I quote you at saying it's a bit of a nightmare, I think. It is paint. a nightmare, yeah. Um, 
So, and that's got a lot of mixes in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we were talking about. And on the face of it, without knowing why those things are being done, it can look like, an what unnecessary, are you doing a rap for? Yeah. Like, it's like James you, said about like going out the back door and over the fence and whatever, just to get yeah, to one Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you're just being like, yeah. like you know, well, difficult for the sake of it or to like show off or something. But even in the explanation that you just said, which is like, if you uh, mix in your shadow color and your highlight color and coming up with a, a base tone for that, obviously that then limits you a little bit to what your base tone ends up looking like. Um, because ordinarily I think people are used to, I like this color in this part. That's what my base color is going to be. And then I've got this and then I've got this. I think people uh, hear base color and they don't think of it as foundation. They think of it as this is what it's going to look what like it's when it's be. finished. Yeah. 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 Um, but then I think potentially the reason you end up with those insane mixes that we're talking about, where it's like three parts, one thing, oh, one part, another thing, one part, another thing is getting that flexibility back to choose the exact color that was that the Castellans of the Rift model that I spoke about on the Ultra yeah, yeah. that was a three color mix and it was in it wasn't one to one to one it was like three to three to two or something like yeah. that yeah and I think as soon as I understood that and and then going off that point you were just saying is that like that is what gets that flexibility back and it actually gives you more flexibility mm -hmm. than if you were just picking a color off the shelf that you like because as much as like that ultramarine model was, you look at the recipe and you're like, this is ridiculous. Like, what is the point? But when you start doing that glazing stage, it goes on just so, so, so smooth. And when you are thinning it all the way down, it gives you exactly what I want, which is I almost can't even notice that I did it. Because when you're really, really thinning down a glaze and you're going to build it up and you want to have a real big jump in color, like a lot of contrast, but a very smooth transition, that happens naturally from building it up like 20, 30 glazes. And they dry very quick. So it's not like the end of the world to do that. But that's very, very hard to do when initially from the first pass, I can see a stain. That's when you start. I feel like that's where people's um, natural draw to like things like wet blending comes from is because you can just very quickly have that transition. You can sketch it quite quick. But yeah, but it's uncontrolled. First, that's the problem with, with wet blending, in my opinion. Like you, you, if you're working colors incrementally through glazes or if you're doing like thin, uh, thin, filter layers or tint layers and you're sketching colors in place in individual colors incrementally you end up with a, a typically more control of obviously where the pigment's being deposited and how you're using it um but i think specifically with the point about obviously doing those half and halves and things like that the, the paint that you're then shading with has a behavioral characteristic and chemical composi composition very similar to the colors that are on there already so combining that the chemical side the the, the, the pigment side and all that the, the behavioral nature of that paint that individual paint because all paint has different personalities when you combine that with with um i like these are personalities though. they do yeah, they yeah. do i i i paint does paint does yeah, yeah. No, in, that's in, a great in, description like yeah. they do have in individual personalities like even within the same branch of of of, of paint range like but base base paints take mephist and red and, and abaddon black abaddon's super satin and mephiston's matte in finish like they they're, they're both base paints but they behave totally differently it's like going to someone's house at Christmas and meeting a family for the first time and expecting them all to be the same. No, they're not, they're not going to be like the kid will be climbing up the Christmas tree. The dad will be watching the footy or the mum will be watching for whatever. Kids blah, blah. climbing up the Christmas tree. Yeah. As, you as, in, as, in, as in the personalities of the, of the, of the, no, of the one Christmas day either. So to, oh, for two on those. Well, anyway, yeah, you got the idea. All right. Okay. But, um, I think that's why though, like going back to my point, that's why people want to wet blend because mm -hmm. I think it comes from like this bad experience of like doing glazes and realizing it stains and it's a nightmare and they don't want to thin it down to like, yeah. a crazy degree. They say like, oh, I can get this like really quick result that's like basically the same and it's much smoother, which I agree with in principle. Yeah, yeah. But if you want that like box art look or refi just refinement in general, like the, like the other thing as well is like when you are doing blending, like you should always finish a push or pull stroke within the same color of the brush or that you got on the brush. Because the thing is, if you move the brush and let's just say you're going from, you're going from black to Mephist and red, if I've got a thin translucent layer and it's Mephist and red that I've got on the brush, if I do a push stroke from the black uh, from the red that I've got on the brush into the black. Well, when I lift the brush off, it's going to deposit and create a watermark. So you're saying like paint in the direction of the color that you're using. trying to go to. Yeah. So yeah. if I've got my fist and red on the brush and I'm going from black to my fist and red, then what I'll do is I'll start the thin layer and apply less pressure in the black area and put, do the push stroke into the fist and red. Mm -hmm. And then when you lift the brush off, my fist and red is going to leave a little bit on the, on the fist and red area. And what's going to happen when it dries? Well, it dries my fist and red. So there's no difference. Mm -hmm. So you're mitigating watermarks and, and things as you're moving just by choice of movement of the brush. 
that, that that's one of the things is when when you combine that that thought process and approach to blending with um with uh the color mixing that we're saying those properties and characteristics of the paint being closer to the inherent paint that's on the model and by doing the brush in that manner you completely eradicate the worry of creating the brush strokes and the brush marks um so yeah uh the next one i've got here which is the the multiple stages of edge highlights and this is the thing that blew my mind like the most a long like a long time ago when i started this everyone starts out and they do like an edge they they start practicing edge highlighting right which we're all familiar with i'm sure and you start doing that single edge highlight and then at some point i was like i'm a genius i've sussed out that they do this chunky stage highlight as we like to call it and the thin stage highlight which i think everyone who's delved into box art painting might possibly be familiar with if you aren't already that seems like the next step right and i thought that i like sussed it out once i'd started doing that and then when I started like being exposed to it a bit more like around here and speaking with myself, James, or whatever, and going further down this rabbit hole, when I realized that there's actually like, in some cases, like six, seven, eight stages of edge highlights, which are like, just off the bat, you might understand what that means. But that was like the biggest jump I went from like box art approximate to like actually starting to make my models look like the ones on the box. And it's basically this concept of when you're doing your edge highlights, you're building up these layers of color and you're almost doing these like, blends that aren't blends because you have these such subtle jumps because they're so refined in, exactly yeah but basically this is the concept that within your edge highlight like within that stage towards like a corner or an edge you'll start building and blending in even lighter shades so often on a box art model you'll see that chunky stage that i've just spoke about and then that thinner edge stage which i think a lot of people know you might often see a third stage within that where the previous stage was actually just acting as sort of an almost base color to make the uh, the pigment properties of that lighter color like blend in smoother. So you know some paints have like poorer coverage than others. This is the sort of like overlapping of, it seems like the previous stage was a bit pointless because you're covering it up again, but it actually is giving you like more vibrancy. Kind of like I spoke about when um, you're using like fluoro paints, you want to do them over white because they don't have, you're not reaching the full potential of the paint. Then within that, you'll start seeing, okay, on a corner, in towards the corner, like you said, James, like brushing in the direction that you want to go in, you'll start seeing Okay, in the corner, it starts getting even brighter to signify that that's like a sharp edge. And then within that, there might be an even brighter one. And then you might see these like tiny dots on the end. And when you start, we've spoken about this before on the podcast, myself especially, of when you start blowing up images like on the GW, uh, the GW website and like actually studying these models and you actually really pixel people or if you like going to Photoshop and you start doing like the eyedropper tool and looking at the colors, when you actually really study them for like a significant amount of time, you realize what that starts to mean of like eight layers of edge highlights, for example. It's not always been that way. So, so like the, the chunky and the multiple thin stages towards the light point, it, 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 they've not always done chunky. Like it's, I don't know the time frame specific, but there was a, there was a change from the traditional one edge highlight as in the, the, the edge highlight, but that along that edge highlight, you have multiple stages to the bright point or whatever. And then obviously chunky, I, the chunky kind of highlight. And it's really to show that color is radiating to that edge, if that makes sense. So you have the bank, the, the armor color, the, the first stage, chunky highlight, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And it's just so that the eye, draw, it helps the eye draw to the to the edge, if that makes sense. It shows that radiation of light or, or hitting that, that tonal color on the armor. So you're saying, so at one point, the standard box art way of doing things would have been, it's still only one edge. As in one, you edge everything, but like, along but those the, edges. But along those edges is different tones on like to the a lighter point. area or a darker area. Or yeah, I don't like know that. the time frame. Like I, like I, what, me when I first started painting and I started looking at box art images and going right, I really want to paint like that. Obviously, back then I wasn't sitting on Photoshop. I didn't have the eye drop at all. I didn't know. So I, I from my memory and from my knowledge of as, as a child painting and looking, getting a box of, of Games Workshop models and going, I want to paint my models like that. I want to be as good as that. I want to paint it as good as that. Or I say, good. I'm not. I want to get there at some point in my life and I'm nowhere near there. Just want to throw that out there and caveat it. Um, but like, uh, I only ever noticed a single highlight stage as in where the highlight was placed and along that highlight. So take a shoulder pad, you've got the brightest point here at the top and you've got that edge that runs on the trim. The color would increase in vibrancy and brightness to the lot, to that point along that edge rather than have... It's within the same dimension. Yeah, within yeah. the same dimension. So you wouldn't have like a chunky... Rather and then, than coming in from the surface to the edge. To the edge, yeah. yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't have that. And, uh, Whereas you know, now you've basically got it on both, got both. planes. You've got like no, horizontal got, and vertical correct. Yeah, yeah. gradients. Yeah, which which 100%, like when you see it and you go, oh yeah, actually that, that really makes total sense because it's it, 
obviously that on a 28 mil model like you know you see those you see those stages because obviously it's to force the eye and show the eye the way that that's that's lit um but in real life you look at something when light's hitting it you don't see all the stages of color vibrancy changing to the edge if that makes sense or to that bright highlight on the edge. you don't see that but it just helps define the model and define the details really well um yeah i do think it's an interesting thing to bring up oh in real life when you look at something xyz because like when comparing to box art because the biggest thing i always struggled with with being as in love with the box art style as you two are i still obviously it looks fantastic um but the biggest thing is the the lack of realism and i think when we get into it we're going to mention some of our favorite heavy metal paint jobs in, in a little bit and when we get into my one i'll kind of explain a little bit more about why i like it but I think the thing I always struggled with was like when, where to pull from real world reference and where not to when it comes to the heavy metal box art style, because obviously an, a sharp edge on absolutely everything isn't realistic. There's no strong light source there. It's to make the model look good. It's to make sure you can see every part of the model. So I always struggled with like, what bits are you pulling from? real I think it's a life high... and what bits aren't you and i think that mostly comes down to the edges or just the highlighting in general no i, I, I think it's a hybrid like yes you, you, you're exactly right like you know everything doesn't have a glowing perfect edge but i think there's a, a really good hybrid of like of of that style to make things look amazing and show every bit of detail and also an overlay of real world onto it as well like liquid in vials like rust and, and chipping and all those kind of stuff or like you know subtle tonal variants and gradients on shoulder pads and things like that, where where light would naturally hit and follow the volume and things like that you do you do 100 have that um but it is that hybrid of both those things it's the it's at the end of the day that paint job is what sells that model and it's what makes that model look amazing in the box that makes people like myself when i was a kid or whatever fall in love with that and go wow i want to paint like that you know um so it's doing its job but at the same time it's it's nice to see the development of it over the years from from second all the way from second edition through to where we are now where you've got that double angle of, of variance on the models you've got it's along like the more edge. of a hybrid with realism than it ever has been yeah i would I, i'd say that i mean you, we've all seen that like you know so even some of the new ultramarine models from like um from i think leviathan and have got like i've got like little bits of spattering and chipping in like, maybe, and maybe with them. like dark imperium or indomitus they really started to go in on the indomitus went pretty hard indomitus was yeah wasn't. dark imperium was really clean like they were they, they, more they, they like, were really clean oh yeah and then and then yeah, no, uh, Indominus. Indominus they, was the one they, they started They doing went the heavy yeah. on weathering and, and glazed volumes and stuff like that. And I, I do like to see that with the box art stuff personally because it's like, like I say, I always struggle to get fully on board with... I think this also might come down to the, the not being as nostalgic for the 90s stuff. Because mm -hmm. like looking at... like That that one is definitely... It's just like solid colours, sharp edges, like yeah. incredible work, obviously. But like yeah. it's that that style and it's progressing in a more realism way in air quotes, I guess. Well, that's something you just touched on was, was the glazing thing. So one of the things that I sort of touched on earlier was seeing base paints as foundations rather than this is the, either the mid, not even the mid tone, like it's, it's your starting point. Right. And what you'll see with, this is kind of one of those things that I feel like every metal kind of pick and choose between. Like if you look at, not even just within a time frame within just like any given release. Like maybe it's just due to time or just a particular style, how they're feeling. Um, you'll see a lot of what we spoke about with indomitus of glazing shadows on flat surfaces. So basically whenever there's a flat surface, it's rare that you would see it just as one flat color with an edge. Sometimes you see that on some of the box arts, like especially with squads and things, but especially on characters and especially of late, you will see that there is massive transitions and like huge amounts of contrast in glazing shadows down so particularly on like a leg panel of like uh like new primaris star armor you'll see towards the bottom of for example an ultramarine there's a much much darker blue like almost black glazed all the way down the panel I, th I think it's added a lot to the models. I think like it's so back in the day, like in second edition, like black panel lining was like very prominent on, on, on models as in like you would literally panel line all the panels with black to show that deep shadow, that show that shadow in it. Obviously that high contrast to the brighter colors just really made all those schemes stand out massively. I think it's really good that as, as, as time has progressed and as obviously the, the style of painting for box art has adapted and evolved and in, improved um, and obviously quite considerably from where it was back in the day. 
like um you know those those shadows and that sort of darkening of the of the shadows has has really become way more refined and and just it really adds so much more to the models which I think is is, is great. I don't think it's just so much a shadow thing as such of it is like a visual interest. Like it won't even always it does, yeah. be this it won't always a, necessarily be to show off a shadow. It would just be to show much more visual interest. This is kind of what I'm saying again, but like a different point is that like the glazing of shadows is like a thing to make it look more realistic, but they're using it in a non-realistic way. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Like they're glazing shadows onto flat panels that wouldn't look like that, but it's to make the model look better. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that it's just like one of those things where it's like, it does initially, I think I'm maybe me personally you need to settle on exactly what, what part of the scale between the, the box art and the realism like that, I want, fast that I want to be on? Because I find it difficult to get like super, super excited about things where I'm like, but it wouldn't look like that. <laughs> it yeah. wouldn't look like it, that. Do you know what? It's a really hard task and I've got to take my hat off. Like it, it really is a hard task to do both of two sides of the coin. One, paint the models in a way that sells the model as best as physically possible. But also as an artist and as a painter where you know a volume is lit a certain way or light would interact a certain way or it wouldn't interact a certain way painting it in a way that does the core purpose of the paint job, which is to paint the model extremely well and also have it as a marketing asset, but at the same time, do it in a way which emulates the style of, of the team, but also as well, take into account, you're juggling so many different things. Oh yeah, there. it's, like, like, it's know, an like, impossible task to land on one definitive thing. Um, My point of the analysis on like the shadow stuff though was you'll especially notice this if you speak to anyone who's like not familiar with like miniature painting is at a glance when it's done really well and it is like that kind of more realistic sort of pull, it doesn't immediately hit you that it's painted detail, which is why I say you need to like study the photos, right? Because if you look at a marine and you see that it's like darker in the shadows and it's so smooth, like it's not a visible like brush transition, at a glance, if you're not like super familiar with painting in that style, you might just think like, oh, that's the lighting of the photo. But yeah. everything on that model is intentionally put there. Yeah. And yeah. it's a crazy attention to detail. Yeah. I think one of the things that, just going back around a second, I know we've got some more points to get to, but going back around to when you were saying about um, blowing the images up and really looking at them and stuff, I think I mentioned on a way older episode, like one of the original three or four episodes that we did, because um, we'd just been to Warhammer Fest. Yeah. And at Warhammer Fest, they had the display for iPhone. the real size of certain models. So there's like, go and measure yourself against the Terminator. Oh, do you mean oh, that right. massive oh, okay. Terminator statue that was... Not the there. statue, it's on a it flat was on a wall. Oh, okay. And it was just the box art images on a huge thing as life size. So it was like... Gotcha. The box I don't think I saw art, that there. It was the box wall. art... Well, it was as you walked in, it was oh, behind you. Behind so right. unless you turn around. But the best thing about it um, was it went all the way up to show you how tall a Primark was and they used the lion and it was the box art lion image blown up. Oh, so you're looking at a nine foot you're photo. You're looking at a nine <laughs> foot photo of the box art and you could see if you really wanted to, I mean, it looked incredible it's still. still like it's amazing, insane yeah. how good it looked, that blown up. But if you could start to analyze it way easier and spot like, okay, there's a highlight there, there's a highlight there. Um, and looking at that was really eye opening to like get at to, there's only so much you can do with like zooming in on your phone and stuff. You well, know it's also I mean? like down to a few variables, like one, the quality of the image and two, like the resolution. Exactly. Of the so if they're, blow, if they're yeah. blowing an image up to nine feet tall or whatever, then it's that they're using the highest possible quality thing. And it yeah. looked fine. Like it looked good. You could see everything. Um, and it was really interesting to get to look at a paint, a, a box art paint job that blown up. You're never going to get a screen that big that you can look at it on at home. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, yeah, it was, it was great. Really helpful as well. Like there was, I remember there was a, one of the, I think it was, what, was it either a Stern Guard model or there was a model that had a scroll on a shin. And like, I think it was like ones from the, um, from the, the box. Oh, the, until, Abaddon was on there as well, though, wasn't it? I had a Baddon on Abaddon there. might have been on sure. there. I can't remember, yeah. But it was either Baddon or Gullivan. too busy looking at the lion. I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> it's like in awe. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank God they didn't have a blood angel, though, because James would have never come out. I'd still yeah. be there now. Like, I'd, still, I'd be following the thing as they take it out. He'd um, have been like, yeah, cutting that out and bringing it, bringing it back. I do, you know not, when, like, I do not carry sharp implements <laughs> with me. All right. You know when you're um, at a, like, a, like a shopping mall or something, there's like the tannoy comes on for like some lost child. That would have been us looking for James. Yeah. He would have been like, you know, you get the people go to the cinema and like 
they've got a poster out this for a film from like three yeah, years yeah. ago and they're like you can do anything with that and they give it to you sometimes yeah, yeah. it'll be like at the end of the weekend you can do anything with that I'm, I'm, gonna, I... I'm gonna segue into a little story that does actually fit quite well with that I went oh, to one gosh. of the Horus Heresy weekenders and they came to the end of oh, it oh I know this story yeah. and that what well, didn't even come into my yeah, head so, and I know this yeah, and so, I well, I've got to, a feeling I know where this is going I went yeah, to, I went to yeah. one of the Horus Heresy weekenders um and uh, I don't think the event staff wanted to take all the roller banners home at the end of the stuff and they were selling them. I might have bought um, a certain Primark roller banner uh, at that event and put that home. So yeah. It was like when they had revealed the Sanguinius model. So he's got like the roller. It used to be up in the office. Yeah. Like it was like, it's the Sanguinius. Um, like it's just like, you know, like we have the roller yeah, banners. Yeah. yeah. Um, just like for the stand where you could go and see it. James has got one of them. I weren't going to miss out. Do you know on anyone Jay-Z? else in the world that's like? Do you know what? It, it, you know what? it actually really helped me when I was painting my one because I just rolled that up and had a look at that one close up. Again, yeah, it's like a blown up image. Exactly. Isn't it? That's exactly what it was. Yeah. That is basically the exact story that I just told. Us like, wouldn't it be ridiculous if that <laughs> happened? <laughs> Fact and happened. I knew it happened that yeah. I forgot. Yeah, but yeah, um, that goes back to you say like having it big blown up. Like what I like to do just by default whenever I'm painting, especially if I'm painting my model to look like a box art one if I'm like copying one I'll get the highest res photo I can get from either the GW website or uh, somehow, sometimes Warhammer community have better photos but yeah screenshot on my iPad zoom in like all the way in on like as small of a like micromanaged section at a time just to do that visually like I feel like that's probably the most successful thing unless you want to go to a heresy weekender and buy a poster <laughs> uh, that's probably as close as you can get one of the things as well like to paint like the box art is Every single detail on a model, because the box art is painted to, I guess, like sell the model, like you said, Joe, and like show off every single sculpted detail on it. Sometimes it's not actually apparent what something is unless you look at that like reference. Now, I remember James's big thing is like all these like lenses and whatnot that I didn't even know existed on like some of these models. Like, you know, like on the back of, um, back of like a jump pack, like there's like little circles on the side, which I always thought was like, oh, this like little metal thing. Apparently that's a lens. Bolters. To be fair, the, I, the one thing I'll say on because when James talks about things that he's opinionated on, yeah, there are he facts can, on he can he can be very convincing, pa- very very passionate about certain. He can things. be very passionate and yeah. make it sound like a fact. Uh-huh. But there's certain things specifically with the lenses where, although I agree with James when he says it looks better if that thing's a lens, mm-hmm. it looks better if the thing on the end of a gun is a lens. When you look at the box art, sometimes those they, sometimes they are, they are the case. sometimes like, they are. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, 100%. The, the buttons and things on a gun, yeah, it looks better if you paint them like lenses. Mm-hmm. But when you actually look at artwork... Or just as lit or, up, like, not, yeah, not yeah. lenses, but I get what you not mean. Not like lenses, but like yeah. a... So it looks like a button so or something. Power, it so like it's, it's got, got power, power running Yeah, it looks it, like it's yeah. got something on it. Yeah. It's the visual interest thing again. Um, it adds a visual interest, but... It's not necessarily wrong not to, because when you look at no, the no. box art, a lot it's not of the a case time, of being wrong. It's just that attitude of like, if you start skimping on the small details, everything else starts to fall apart. It's one of those things where it, it's kind of this all or nothing of like, it seems so insignificant to paint that most people wouldn't bother. But when you've got 20 insignificant things that most people don't bother to paint and you've done all of them, all of a sudden your model looks like a massive step up. I, I, think, yeah, yeah. I think the thing is though, like, and I think the reason why, again, the whole thing with like lenses and details and bits and bobs, like the artwork and it, it is, the art, some artwork has stuff painted like that, some artwork doesn't and obviously blah, blah. But the whole purpose of the box art model is to sell the model and to show the model off really well. In the same respect of there are certain things, like I always see, and I say this to anyone, I, speak to anyone, I see 40K very much as like science fiction, historical modeling, which is a weird oxymoron, but I'll explain what I mean. Like, the law and narrative overlays on top of the paintwork and the sculpting of the, de- the sculpting of the models, uh, uh, things that you can directly correlate and go, right, I'm going to take this from the law and narrative and put it onto and paint it onto the model to add that law and narrative onto the there's model. There's definitely a, a similarity in terms of, I think it's where Warhammer specifically is unique with when it comes to science fiction is that because of the not the law. background is so vast, like yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so much information. Yeah. Um, that is that is there that you can almost treat it like historical 
modeling that's, because that's it's the like, way that I look at it. There's almost the same amount of well, there is, of, yeah, of a fictional version. There's almost it's, the same amount of information. It's, it's, fictional, but it's, just it's fictional, fictional history. That's what it is. Well, it's not fictional. It just hasn't happened yet. Yes, yeah, okay. It might yeah. happen. Yeah, it might happen. It's it might be. History I don't want in the future. to be real. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want Tyrion to be real. <laughs> uh, okay, but but the thing he keeps on bringing out, up. Of, out of everything in Warhammer, you wouldn't want to be real. Tyrion, they will eat the whole galaxy eventually. Yeah, I'd rather that than be like just do that and then I'm gone rather than like oh I'm being like tortured by Nurgle James has been watching <laughs> do you know what I mean James has been watching too much Starship Troopers I think the, the yeah. only thing I will say is like going, just touching upon the, the actual box art models again like you know the thing is is that if you do start doing all those little details and bits and bobs visually as a product that you're selling it, it, it can almost become a bit intimidating for someone to paint it so there has to be enough painted on the model that, painted extremely well that looks phenomenal to sell the model to make people pick it up and get that warm feeling of like wow these are amazing but at the same time as a painter approaching looking at it and going oh do i have to really do that 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 like i understand totally why I that's not it, done it, as it's well on, it's specifically on it's a good point actually because it's specifically more restricted on models that you would expect new people to the hobby to buy exactly so like yeah. intercessors like we're talking about the lenses aren't necessarily all done on the guns and stuff but i'm even talking about in artwork and stuff they're not always no well, glowing that's the, or whatever that's the thing yeah but um but then when you do get to a character model mm -hmm. sometimes it'll be like these insane little vials and things they'll be like a done cable like, that you didn't even know was like a cable yeah, yeah. exactly so with and the, it's not just painted it's painted and highlighted and highlighted again and highlighted again and shaded and recess shape. Yeah. So I think there is um there is more of that on models that they maybe don't necessarily expect people to buy first. Sure. When you look at the more infantry and stuff, they obviously hold back on certain things. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's probably I, an element as well of like I'm sure they've got deadlines to hit. And I'm sure oh, they've of course, got yeah, of course so, they have, yeah. so it's I'm I'm sure there's also an element of yeah, in an ideal world, they would. I think that's potentially like. Obviously, we don't know. No one knows unless you're there. But I think that's potentially actually the most impressive thing about the heavy metal paint jobs is that I can only imagine how short some of these deadlines are, and they end up looking like that. Mm -hmm. Like that. That's what something that probably doesn't even get mentioned, and that is that adds a whole. Uh, obviously, we deal with um, loads of different painters painting to different levels, all high levels. Yeah. But um, so we have some uh, experience with how long certain, certain level of paint job should take. And I can only imagine how, how important it is for them to be able to do that quickly, which yeah. blows my mind that someone can do something that looks like that quickly. The, the, the like, real super impressive thing for me is that they're painting obviously in advance. So you're, you're painting stuff that's not due to come out obviously for whatever time frame, whatever. But even still with the grace of that, lead time in front they're still up they're still at 11 trying to get well, it something done. that i glossed you know on I mean? in like a previous episode was like, to your point they've got no reference like they're kind of making it the model no. like was just made like there's yeah. no box art to copy there's no like i, I presume there's some con like chat with the designers and whatnot but like it's how do, when i sit and think like oh what color should this be i look at the box i look at the box <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, it's like it's 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 that fine balance of um of of feasibility for someone picking it up, but at the same time, from the painter's perspective, painting it and doing the, the model. Paint perspective, I love it when that gets yeah. doing doing. doing I, it's never on purpose. Yeah, it's never on purpose. It just I always happens. just chuck it in off the cuff, and it don't mean to. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but like it's it's yeah, it's kind of like it's that fine balance of the two, making a really good marketing asset and really good box art miniature, and at the same time making it enjoyable to paint for the team member in a time restricted deadline, but at the same time adding on the bits, which make that model the thing when you look at it for the first time, you're like, I need that model, mm. uh, you know, and I want to paint it. So, so yeah, big news tickets are now on sale for the siege studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to seedstudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon.
Uh, final one I've got here on my list to touch on is something that I neglected for probably far too long in my painting, and that is highlighting metallics. Oh, I hate it. I've been, I've, I've said it on a few times on here. I just, it stresses me out, highlighting metallics. Why is that? It's just that this seems like just, um, we're talking true metallic. Sure. Yeah. yeah true metallic metal. Yeah. Just seems like we've, we've spoke about the different paint consistencies and stuff like that. And it just doing the, there's two parts to it. Actually doing the edge highlights with metallics, I just find really difficult to mm -hmm. get the right paint consistency. But then the second thing is what I'm been banging on about this entire episode is like it having a metallic puts like a more realistic light on that area because it's like it's gonna have it's gonna yeah so and then we do the glazing into the shadows still on, on metallics but then we're also putting an edge on it which it's not gonna exactly look like that it's like this half realism half not thing again that i think i always struggle with um throwing realism out the window just for a second like the reason i guess i never thought about it because like you've kind of got that natural like reflection right because it's a reflective surface like it's got it looks like metals so you're like why would i highlight it that doesn't make sense mm. but i didn't realize the value it has on particularly on like weapon cases and things like that whenever there's like a really sharp edge i'm not talking so much about like when you've got like little trinkets and bits but like say you've got a shoulder pad trim and it's for example gold having a really really sharp defined highlight edge on it makes it look like a sharp edge if you mm. get what i mean rather yeah. than it's like you know when you look at like an apple product like a macbook or something you feel like if you touch the edge it would like cut your finger yeah, almost because yeah. it's just so precise it gives it that like crispness yeah and i neglected it for the longest time because it just like it, it kind of seems like a contradiction doesn't it like oh, okay paint it a metallic surface and then paint it as if it was paint it doesn't seem to make sense mm. but like regardless of your opinions like that in terms of trying to make your model look like the box like there are much in a similar way that there are with the other edge highlights like metallics are treated very much in the same way by the heavy metal team maybe not so much in the sense of like a chunky and a thin but kind of like james said where you've got this like just one horizontal plane like edge and there'll be brighter corners picked out that's something that again i didn't really realize from studying so much because it looks like it should look when it's done right in the sense of when a photo is taken of a model and you see that the bolt casing has this like sharp edge on it you just think that that's like the lighting or yeah. that's just what it would look like anyway because you kind of do have this natural edge-ish highlight when you've got a really nice uh, metallic paint that's got like a it, it looks like metal so like yeah. just light plays with it I think that's probably the thing where it's like if you don't do it perfectly you end up looking at it and just going I should have just left it <laughs> should have just left it base coated because it's yeah. going to reflect everything anyway kind of thing so I, I, I love I love metallics I've got a little bit of experience painting metallics on, with certain golden armored warriors um yeah. i absolutely love painting true metallic metal um and i've loved it for a long long time because uh, and i'm not i'm nowhere near the best but i i'd like to think from the multiple models i've painted with it i've got a little bit of experience in in knowing to kind of like where to shade and what tones and things but i still still do think the best thing for painting true metallics and making them look good is literally looking at go on Google images and just search like gold ring or copper pipe or like silver lamppost or whatever, blah, blah, just find stuff that's, that's a real image of metal refracting light and look at the shapes and then paint on your model where the bright points are, uh, leave the pot, paint it bright and then start shading the bits that shadow would naturally hit on those shapes, like the sphere, the cylinder, the cube or whatever, blah, blah. Um, I mean, obviously if you're trying to like emulate like the box art look, the best place I would say to start probably would be the box art, the box art yeah, model, yeah, right? Yeah. But I understand what you're saying, and you can like how to basically yeah, yeah. how to naturally light and paint at the bright mids and darks and shadows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, on on metallic objects would be would be to do that. You're quite right. Obviously, box art's a really good way of doing it. One of the things I would say as well, number mm. one, some people don't, especially if they're new, don't necessarily always realise some areas of the box art are non-metallic metal, and sometimes sure. it's true metallics. Yeah. Um, I'd say non-metallic is. It's rarer. Pretty rare. It's way rarer. My, but it my, does mod, my model, we were speaking about this earlier, but my model for in a minute or in a bit, my model has got a section on it, which you look at it and you just think it's metallic. It's so well done. Mm. And I think there is actually a case for, I can't remember if this is definitely on the box art or not, but the, is it the like Lucidian Star, Star Striders or something, the kill team? Mm -hmm. 
I'm pretty sure they have both NMM There's and a few models True that Metallics. have both. I think as well, some of the Primaris librarians have that bit on their sword painted the in filigree. Like NMM. Yeah, the filigree. Yeah. I'm pretty sure even the Leviathan um, he did, I think. Terminator Ch- uh, librarian uh, has on the axe NMM, but the rest of the model is TMM. Yeah. The, th- the thing that you've got to balance, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, because obviously you paint the metallic on the model, you paint areas of the model metallic. So you look at that and go, well, that's metallic. And then if you you know what NMM is and you look at it and you see it on the model, they kind of conflict because it's like, well, they're the same material, but they're painted very differently, if that makes sense. I think the, the way to really make it work if you're going to do it is to glaze the metallics, the true metallics, so that they look the same way that the non-metallic metal parts blend. So in that way, at least there's parity between the, the visual finish on both, if that makes sense. If you just don't bother, if you just put metallic on, pin shade it, wash it, and then you just put a quick edge on it, and don't do any kind of tonal variance or like lighting it or whatever, blah, blah. And then you do properly blended NMM with like crisp highlights and dot highlight and all that kind of stuff. They kind of conflict and they're sending different messages to the, the person perceiving it. I don't um, personally love doing both. Like, I think you I would, stick, I would stick much with rather one. do one or another, yeah, like stick. being honest. It's a bit of a fringe case when there's both. There's very, very few models that I can think of in the thousands of yeah. heavy metal jobs that do that. And there's very, very few NMM jobs kicking around other than anyway, like maybe yeah. Dante. I think but. what I was getting at was, so the I think the metallics on the box art in general, if you get rid, ignore the NMM stuff for now, metallics in general, I think there's a bigger scope of difference on how they're done between each model yep. than any other thing. Like most of the power armor is painted the same. We've spoke about, they go through phases of, are they glazed it more this time yeah. or whatever. It's basically plus or minus glazing, but they've done the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas like the metallics can look wildly different from one model to another. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes it might be a bit like, you might have to do some digging to yeah, find yeah. the one that you actually want to copy or, yeah. If you, even if it, you don't, you might not necessarily want to do it the the style that it's done on the box art of the model that you're painting. But there might be another box art model that has a style of metallics so that you're like, oh, that's kind of more what I want to do. I, th- I think, it, like specifically on the Elysian side, though, what you talk about, I think the way you kind of can bend the raw of either not going sticking to one path. I think, that, like for example, so if you've got metallic guns, you paint them obviously metallics. You do all the metallic side of stuff. But I think on their tunics, the filigree or the edge is supposed to represent like golden weave if that makes sense like a golden right. like uh, woven like that's the bit that's NMM. yeah so I think doing it for that because that's like it's a different material it's not actually metallic it's like a golden thread or something like so I think that kind of kind of it works obviously because it's it's not metal that it's, makes sense I didn't yeah. really think of it like that before yeah that's yeah. the way that I look at it it's like right well uh, obviously the bit on the librarian uh, power axe is a bit different I suppose but like but um, but that's kind of the, where I think the rule would work quite well because you can still do metallics and everything. But then like, if you want to make the, the, the on an officer's jacket, like the, 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 whatever, the, you know, part of it, this detailed metallic weave, you could then do it that way and it would look still golden, but not metal. If that makes sense. Yeah. I understand. What you mean. Yeah. yeah. So let's just round out this list then. So just, just to touch on all those points quickly and just do a little roundup. Um, so we had the color mix in your base coats. So starting off with like a 50, 50 mix, for example, of your shade and your, uh, your highlight for your base mix or your foundation color, if you will. I was going to say, yeah, within that point, the big thing to take is the, the, the notion of a foundation color exactly. not being your final color kind of thing. Yep. Uh, we've had the multiple stage of edge highlights, so not just your chunky and your thin, but going across that plane as well, like talking about multiple layers, up all the way up to the corners. Uh, highlighting metallics, which we just talked about. Uh, make sure you're doing that. Uh, glazing gradients on flat surfaces, just for more visual interest. And uh, painting all of the little details, like little cables and lenses and any little greeblies and bits and bobs on there. Yeah. Cool. Should we talk about, uh, I think we all just wanted to quickly fire off like one of our favorite sort of heavy metal paint jobs mm. and uh, just talk about why we like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, James, do you want to kick off so that we can interrupt you when you inevitably go on for far too long? Yeah. Um, so other than the second ed box art, um, my favorite, one of my favorite models ever produced by Games Workshop is the, uh, the Captain Tycho model. One of my favorite models. Obviously, it's a Blood Angel. Sorry for anyone who's sick of me talking about them. But shocked. But um, I'll, I'll vouch for you here is that we, we went through a couple of different ones, and originally you wasn't going to pick a Blood yeah, Angel. Yeah, I wasn't going to. But for reasons uh, we couldn't we couldn't like find enough pictures of it or whatever. So. Yeah. So mine is uh, is the original Captain Tycho model. It's probably one of my one of my favorite sculpts. One of my favorite models. Um, the way that the model came about through a game, and then they created the model. I think it's just a really cool cool story for the actual model. Um, 
But the secondary iteration of the paint job that Joe, who used to be on the heavy metal team, who's now on the design team, painted, um, I think it's one of my favorite Games Workshop non-metallic metal uh, paint jobs ever. Like, and the, the the attention on that model, given how big that model actually is, and it's, it's actually a really, compared to obviously all the Prime RS models now, it is tiny. So some of the transitions and some of the blends and some of the, the little details on that model that Joe actually painted are literally incredible. Like, obviously, you, there's been lots of really cool NMM paint jobs by Daz, by quite a few different people on the heavy metal team, Aiden on the Gulliman, et cetera, blah, blah. This is my favorite. This jumps out to me immediately as being much less stylized and much more realism. Yeah. Look NMM. At, look at the chest, the bloom on the chest. Like, yeah. you know. Because that looks to me like that could just be like the reflection of a light above the model that was taking the photo, which yeah. I guess is like the point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I love? And on the uh, gun, the uh, we were talking about doing like the little lenses and stuff like that. And the, there's like two little blue kind of buttons, buttons on yeah. the gun and then the light from that reflecting onto the just sort of a bit of glow it's yeah. just so subtle look in the perfect. backpack so behind his head there's like some little cables and lights all the and little lights and things and stuff yeah, in there, like, yeah. And that's on one of the og backpacks that detail in there is absolutely minute like those backpacks are tiny i i struggle to do that even with on like the primaris models they've got those like little cables and buttons sort of yeah, on I can't the even make the details out by the yeah. time I've like primed it and stuff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no this 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 is like for me this is probably my favourite heavy metal paint job ever I mean um, fair play starting off with a winner there Joe what's uh, what's your pick here uh, I've gone more modern yeah I've gone more modern and uh, there but I love it, this one look, I'll be honest I forgot so, how good this looks it so, is yeah. such a good model so I, number one I wanted to pick something that was a bit of a like a not an underdog but maybe one that doesn't immediately come to mind um, all I remember when the when the, it's the it's the new Dark Strider Tao character Tao 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 um, and all I remember when this I haven't taken this much notice of oh my god look at the paint job from a model reveal since this like the, I, it just stuck out to me so much um and i think there's a couple of things you can go on about like the tiny detail if you look at the lens over his eye it's like this cross hatch the cross hatch pattern on that lens is absolutely insane uh it's so tiny um, I remember James painted out one of this and he was trying to replicate that and was going on about how unbelievably difficult that the must The craziest have been. part of that to me is not that they've painted a cross-hatched pattern on it. It's that the grid is like six by six. It's yeah. not like it's not two tiny. lines. Yeah. yeah, it is. Um, that, when I, I'm so jump in, but that, when I painted it and I saw this, I saw the, obviously saw the, you see the box art first and I was like, oh wow, that was awesome. That detail is amazing. The, 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 the almost like Vegeta Dragon Ball Z, like power reader <laughs> thing, whatever it is. Like it. Tower models are small as well. Like, yeah. like, they're that, already it small. Is, it is tiny and he's in a haunched like, pose as well. So like it is tiny, the model. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to definitely have to try and get any, as close as I can to that. And then I saw it, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, yeah, there's, um, I think this for me, we've we've spoken about previously on uh, we were talking about grim dark painting and how it doesn't grim dark painting style doesn't have to be oh it's caked in weathering powder oh it's caked in oil washes or whatever it's just got dirt all over it to me this is a grim dark looking paint job because it's a more realistic kind of subdued like even just when you were flipping between those images then you went from that Tyco model to this it just looks so much like more subtle and dark yeah because it just it the spectrum that I was talking about between the heavy metal style if you're cranking that up to only being heavy metal and it's everything's a flat panel and it's edged to realism for whatever reason, this one for me just fits perfectly wherever I would want that to land on the spectrum. Like, it's not super vibrant edges. It's really subtle. Um, there's some more little hints towards like a realistic feel in there. And then on top of that, it's the technical ability of the things like the crosshatch and how sharp some of those highlights are. I, I um, love the, the overall colour scheme. The desaturated red, the yellow and the blue. It's, it's like all the just really, yeah. yeah, it's like darker yeah. and desaturated, which is why, I mean, the, the blue of the skin stands out so much. It looks so good because it's surrounded by all these like really dull colours. Um, 
yeah, I just love it. I think I, that was a, 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 that is one where I'm like, I think that hits the, the bit on the spectrum that I would want it to hit. It's, it's very good. Very good. Uh, okay, finally to round out, my pick is uh, is the opposite end of the spectrum rather than the tiny model. Uh, mine's a massive one. Uh, Keeper of Secrets. This for me, not only because the model is like mental, and it's like one of my favorite GW models of all time, but there's so much texture on this model. And I think the the biggest thing for me in terms of like technique that blew me away is this like, the sort of like tights on the leg. They're painted in such a way that it's like, still the like really refined sharp heavy metal style that you expect but it like reads as sheer fabric if you, you get can what I mean. you can yeah, tell yeah. it's a fabric over something else yeah like you can see where the skin is like prominent and touching it most and it's like the fabric is taut you can see more skin through it if you get what i mean yeah there's a there's a luminef model that has like a veil over, over the face, the face. Yeah. that's the same kind of same thing and i'm thing. like absolutely insane but this goes back to what you said about the like treading realism with Hundred percent yeah. thing, um, and also like the cloth textures on the back are just like classic, like super sharp heavy metal style, and the skin is also like. I was going to say that's my favorite. One of my favorite things about this model is the skin. I think the skin is absolutely phenomenal. Like I, the the saturated, really pale, pallid kind of tones uh, and coldness. It makes the coldness of that skin, in my mind, makes the model look more more menacing. I absolutely love it. Like mm. absolutely, it's love so it. hard as well to do that in a way that looks pale but still has room to highlight it mm. but it doesn't have this like it's one of the more softer transitions like it's not this like crazy like harsh defined edge mm. like i'd say the jump between the darker shadow and the mid-tone is quite subtle and the jump in the highlights again is like equally quite subtle but even just the things like around the neck like the purple tones in the shadows like to bring out like all the sort of musculature and yeah not sure what you call that like in in the neck it, it's wild wild piece if you're a fan of the podcast and want to support the show, then what better way than with our exclusive Siege Studios merchandise? We have a bunch of high quality apparel available, as well as an assortment of painting accessories and equipment to help you while you paint. Head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop to order now. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments on YouTube. Or if you're one of the audio listeners on Spotify, Apple, any of those platforms, uh, you can reply to our story, which we like to do once a week on Instagram at Siege Studios. Question this week is from White Gold Miniatures, who says, do you guys ever suffer from painter's block? And if so, how do you overcome it? All the time. <laughs> All the time. I think um I think this is like way more common in smaller doses than people think. I think you think of like painter's block as being this like catastrophic, like I can't pick up a model, but I think everyone has this in like micro amounts, like to some yeah. degree. I, I think uh, look, not like regularly. Ev- not everyone <laughs> is probably gonna agree with this or want to I mean not as much as they didn't agree with George's base room thing, but no, they're not gonna agree with this as much or or at least want to acknowledge this but i think the answer is that you just have to let it let it do its thing no, and, I agree. and it'll I come actually back. Agree with you. if you're not doing it for work if this isn't your job um and you are having to push through because it's your job if you're doing this for fun and for a hobby or even for a competition or whatever you're gonna just have to wait it out because you'll get the bug again and you'll do your best painting when you're motivated. If you're sitting there forcing yourself to do it, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be producing very good work. So. Even when I don't have like a block per se, when I do take a break, like unintentionally because like life gets in the way or if I go away for a few days or on holiday, what have you, when I come back, I realize not necessarily that I was feeling it, but like you feel, we've spoken about it before, like you feel so much more refreshed and more hyped for it. Mm. And I kind of feel that like, it's not, the end of the world, like taking a few weeks, even a couple of months off. Like at the end of the day, if it is like you said, like your hobby, like it's supposed to bring you value. You should, it shouldn't feel like you're doing it because sure. you have to. Honestly, like when I realized that, not just about painting, but about anything that I felt like I should be doing. Oh, I should be playing guitar more. Oh, I should be, do- I shouldn't be playing PlayStation because I should be doing painting instead or whatever. Um, and I started to just realize, oh, actually, no, I, sh- I should only be doing those things that I do for fun if I want to and it's going to benefit me. So if you're, I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
recommend pushing through unless again it does change when it, if it's your job and you you're trying to get that through but um but yeah i think being a bit more forgiving of yourself maybe probably the the best answer probably not the answer anyone wants i don't know how to solve it i think it's the right it just answer sort of solves itself. i think it's the right answer it's not and it not only just it solves itself but like it's okay like to not be painting like i don't, don't see it as like the end of the world it's like oh my god i've got this painting spot like what am i going to do it's like don't do anything yeah like if you're not enjoying painting don't paint yeah netflix this will always be there on. for you yeah there's loads of stuff to everyone do. also takes like people take like year-long gaps like yeah. it's always going to be there for you to pick back up it's not something that like expires do you know what i mean like a few of your paints might dry up but yeah your models aren't gonna you know explode it's not like this thing that you're giving up if you're not painting for a couple of weeks or a couple of months yeah trust me when you make yourself so busy that finding time to paint is hard you will be chomping at the bit to get back on the brushes because you hear that what you need to do is loads of chores and yeah. make yourself miserable do loads of boring <laughs> stuff so that when you think that painting is going to be boring, it doesn't seem as boring. You thought painting was bad? Have you tried yeah. doing the washing up? Have you tried doing stuff? Yeah. Ugh. I, I genuinely mean just make yourself busy with other things and like completely attention and focused, distract yourself from painting to not think about it. Like um, obviously like I do a lot of stuff for Siege and for work that's not painting. Um, and I am hungrier than ever to paint all the time because I just I'm surrounded by it I talk about it all day like we I, I see it every day I felt like, that from like, going from commission like, painting full time to painting like in the evenings yeah that's been the same like, thing for me like I, 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 I am literally like yeah like that's why I fight so hard when we get models that I'm like I am painting that model like, because, <laughs> I think, I, because I'm like I'm like the, the captain being one of them I was like literally like no, I am I, because I'm like I want to paint, I, I, and that, I think that's the thing. Like, if you're midway through a project and you get it, then I like fresh eyes is also really important. Like, leave it a day, like that helps massively. Like, if you're if you're really stuck on a project, then and you but you still have an inkling to paint, then maybe just pick a non a model so dissimilar from what you're doing that also helps. But if you're if you're no matter what you pick up, it's something that you're. I don't want to do this. I really can't put, I don't want to put the time in or put the effort in or whatever. Then, then as, as I said, like just take a complete U-turn on it and step away from painting for a period of time. I know you said about a year. I would say a year's a bit I'm long. obviously no, being no, no, I know that. I know that, yeah. but I know that. But I'm no, just but saying I think like, it's the point of like, again, for people that view it as a hobby, it's not weird for someone to fall out of a hobby for a year. No, totally. No, no, I get it. that. Like, yeah. In the grand scheme of things as well, like five years time, you won't think of that like one year as being like a big deal. Exactly. No, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, to James's point, I think, you know, fresh eyes, leaving it a day, whatever. If you, if you're forcing yourself to paint something and you, and you realize, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not really up for this right now. <laughs> yeah. You will 100% thank yourself for putting it down and not just, going through it and, and pushing through it. Um, Trust me, painting. But paint. I think it, it also, it cycles back around to the motivation stuff we've spoken about a lot. I think ways to get inspired about um, uh, painting and, and just, you know, listening to stuff like this or listening to painting phase or watching YouTube channels. Like that gets me into, or seeing certain models, like we get certain models through here and that, it, that gets me You could also like paint. dip into everyone says like this hobby is sort of three hobbies, the the painting, the law and the gaming. Yeah. You could segue into just, if you're going to feel guilty about like packing it in, mm. you could segue into one of those other things. So like yeah. you could get maybe your hobby now for the next couple of weeks could be my hobby is reading a book. Yeah. Like yeah. one of the heresy novels. Well, like, and, yeah. and by the way, either of those other things, maybe law, you know, and reading and books and stuff more than the other, uh, more than gaming, but either of those other things have an avenue to improve your painting mm -hmm. long term. So if you learn more law, you get more attached to certain characters and things. That's going to benefit your painting because you're going to want to paint those characters. You want to come back when to I it. Listen if to you get really into gaming, you're going to want to get back to painting because you want to get your stuff great, ready great for your game. On the, table, yeah. the yeah. reason I started my Sons of Horus army was because I was listening to the Horus Heresy novels. And I had previously like no interest in basically any other fa like Space Marine chapter other than uh, Blood Angels. And I was also like super not into the idea of like chaos marines or like trait marines, whatever. I listened to those books and it like you proper about them, inspired yeah. me. Yeah. It's funny, like I, I've spoke previously about how I've always struggled to like fall in love with one of the factions or one of the stories or whatever. Obviously, I haven't read them all. I'm sure there's one out there that I would hear and be like, oh, that's amazing. Um, but I was watching the Lawmasters thing and watched the Abaddon one. And I was like, 
Oh, that is cool, actually, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like that's like have Black Legion stuff is first, cool. Have you listened to the first few um, Horace Harrison novels? I I think I did, um, w- which is almost like a, a rite of passage. I think I did the first like hour and said, oh, "Yeah, right. I'm gonna do it." All oh, right, <laughs> and then just did because those first four books are basically like an enclosed story, mm. and it follows the Sons of Horus and about I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I tried. I, I do like an audio book, and I. I I can follow them quite well, but I tried quite early on in getting into Warhammer again, or at least seriously getting into Warhammer. And I found it very difficult to follow who was who and these names that I wasn't familiar with and, you know, what was, what was going on. So maybe, maybe I'll go back to it. But um, yeah, that was one of the things I struggled with. Um, Cause I really early on tried picking up one of the books and I couldn't really wrap my head around it. Cause like there was just so much, expected like baseline level of knowledge that I didn't have and then revisiting those books um I think it was last year like with much more knowledge it was just yeah. a lot more um digestible I guess yeah I think for me as well between like law masters and, and other stuff I think the um uh Lutin yeah. Lutin stuff has Lutin stuff done more m- the most for me with appreciating the law and different little stories and things um yeah yeah so there you go there's a quite a lot big answer about that yeah uh, hobby hacks. This is our closing little tradition uh, where we share a hobby hack with you. Hopefully, you can uh, implement into your hobby. Uh, mine is we've spoken to death, right, about the homemade wet palette thing, which I'm not going to get into, right, because it's hobby hacks, right? I would just stay and caveat that if you are someone who is using a wet palette, like a pre manufactured one, like any one of them, you know the ones, ditch the paper it comes with or the packs of paper that you buy and just get a roll of baking paper from the supermarket cut up to the same size. It will work wonders for you. The paper is much more absorbent. It's much easier to work with. It's a nice slick surface. It will make big gains for you without having to go down this whole avenue of buying Tupperware. I'm going to go one step further. Uh The thing that I use, and I haven't had to restock it for a long time, I got like a a, um, multi-pack thing of pre-cut sheets of that of um baking paper not it wasn't for uh wet palettes i think they're like a3 um sheets right um off of amazon and when i cut them in half they're pretty much the perfect size for my tupperware right. um that I, I, for whatever reason the fact i think maybe that they're stored just flat already they're not rolled up I've just had better lift. But yeah, I've had yeah. better, better luck. See, when I them. pre-cut mine from the baking paper. I you put, then just flatten I them put, all out. I flatten them all out and I put them in like a plastic sleeve. Funny enough, I put them in the sleeve that the original pallet paper came in. <laughs> and I store them in there. And because they're like sat flat and I cut like a whole roll at a time. So it lasts me like six months. Yeah. Like, so you're kind of the same thing. The, it's, yeah. It, yeah. The, them rolling up isn't really a factor anymore. Yeah. I think... Yeah, I never really did that. But then I got the, I haven't, I haven't had to buy any for ages. It was like a massive, it was like a tenner. Yeah. It was like a massive amount of uh, sheets of yeah. paper. There you go. Yeah. Well, my thoughts on, on, on wet they're, palettes. They're very well documented. I won't but, comment. I won't but, even but, let James but, answer. But all, all, I will add on one thing, which is, is that all that matters TK is that- TK Maxx or something. No, I'm, not st- I'm not spouting any of that today. All I'm going to literally just say is that all that matters is that the paint behaves in a way on that palette that you can that you can quantify. I said because there are certain behavioural characteristics on baking sheet which no other paper that I've used or tried, be it a preordained manufactured one or be it a, a, another type of wet palette paper, or whatever. Um, they don't. Nothing ever behaves the way that it does on on that baking sheet because of the way that it, it is. Um, so I think you, you should definitely try it, see how the paint behaves on there, and then. And then go and make a decision, basically. I think because I used like a pre-manufactured one, it comes with all the sheets. So I thought, like, why on earth would I bother using baking paper? Yeah, like yeah. I've already got all this paper, but like well, it behaves so differently. Of course, it does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Right then, James. Let's get started with uh with this week's topic, which is uh talking about color theory this week. Yeah. So, uh, does color theory matter? <sighs> yeah, hundred percent. I think it does. I think um. It, I think it's a really crucial part of, of painting miniatures. I th- it's like, the best way for me to explain it is it's like, it, it really makes painting a lot easier by having an understanding of it. The ability to choose a color that you know is going to work with the inherent color that you're using, it does help to just 
build a, a scheme or build like a, an overall sort of like fi- finished result with a miniature really it really helps with that um you don't necessarily have to have like uh, color theory is such a such an in-depth uh, topic with loads of different types of color relationships and loads of different types of um uh, of things which are involved within it like you know but i think there's a core competency understanding what contrasting and what harmonious colors are i think that gives any painter the ability to make informed choices when it comes to colors mm. I, I think sometimes if you if you don't have a, a, a minimal understanding of it i think not so much uh the actual sort of what you end up with as a finished result because at the end of the day it's painting miniatures is oh, if you want to have two colors next to each other you can do that's fine um but i think just just for having an understanding of it so that it makes the choosing of the colors that you're using easier and i think that's the thing where you're going to save time and i think that's where you're going to be be better off by having an understanding we've all been there we've been painting a miniature and we're like oh i don't really know what color to use on this because it's this color having that minimal understanding of color theory that allows you to go well this color works with it or this color is a, is a harmony to the complement and it will still work because it harmonizes with what the complementary color is of this object's opposing color that just helps massively to then just make choices so much easier for you as a painter. Mm. I think it's something that I've like kind of glossed over a bit, not really like intentionally, but beyond the like sort of general abstract understanding of like, you know, opposing colors and the primary colors and whatnot. It's not really something yeah. that I've, I, I don't want to like sit and do homework when I'm doing no, no, I get that. I, mean? I get that. Um, for me, it's never really felt like much of a roadblock either though. No, no, I agree. I, I, I you know, and, and some, some people will go all their lives painting and just choosing colors, or whatever, and not really use it at all whatsoever. But for, for, and again, there are loads of different color relationships out there. So you've obviously the, the, the a triadic relationship is the obvious one is the triangular shape one on there with, with where like and primary colors is a really good example, obviously red, blue, and, and, and yellow. Um, but I think the other thing to, to bear in mind as well is that by having an understanding of it, it just means that when, when you, when you do have that color scheme that you're a bit unsure of, you, you don't necessarily have to spend so much time just, I mean, an hour about stuff and you can pick with confidence because you know, it's going to work. Mm. Um, and also I would say that I think that, that color schemes that do have uh, a very minimal understanding of color theory behind them, they do tend to be a bit work better on the models as well. And they yeah. do, the models do look a bit, I don't want to use the word natural. That's not really the way to me to explain it, but they do, they just do look like they work i think that's one of the, the the best way for me to explain it um sometimes when you when you throw caution to the wind and don't don't use sort of color theory to an extent or when you just haphazardly put colors on in the vain hope that they're going to work together that's when sometimes maybe a bit of frustration which leads to other things that we've spoken yeah. about comes in um i think with me i've kind of like any, any sort of color theory knowledge that i have i think it's kind of been learned on accident because it's not so much a, like when i sit down and i'm like painting the cloth i'm like oh what color is going to perfectly complement it I don't think for me it's as much a like I whip out my color wheel and I think about it because I like I said I don't really have that complex of an understanding of it. No, but I think through experience I kind of just naturally know based yeah, on yeah. the paints that I have what yeah. ones will work together. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I, I like again. I'm not sitting here from a point of understanding every iota of color theory. But no, I, of course, believe, yeah, me, yeah. believe me, like you know, there's still loads that I that I would need to spend ages looking into and researching and understanding. And, and I, I, I really work with when choosing colors, I really work with that, that sort of harmonious and also complementary use of color. They're the, that that's like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to it. And again, there's analogous, there's the triadic, there's loads of different, different types of color relationships and, and, and sort of like uh, thing that you can use. But, um, but really just understanding that if I use this color, the opposite color on the color wheel is this, mm. and the color to the left or right of it is the harmonious color of that contrasting color. So, and, and that's helped with loads of decisions through, through my painting over the years, because it just gives me that point of origin and going, right, okay, well, I've painted a cloth a neutral color, which is this, the armor color is this color. So I could shade theoretically the armor with this, or I could shade the cloth with this, and it'll work with that armor color because it's a harmonious or complementary color. Having that minimal understanding of the vast topic that is color theory just i find just gives your models a bit of a leg up and also as well just gives you a bit more and it's it's confidence you know we've all been there in their early, early days you know painting where we're unsure what paint, paint to pick up or what to use or whatever it really does help with that um, well as someone who's like uh maybe looking to start a new army and they don't have that understanding as someone who sees a lot of projects obviously with siege where do you think that people go wrong the most when trying to pick a color scheme for their army? I think the planning of any project is probably one of the most important things and color choices, I would say, is a, a very big percentage of that within within planning a project or planning an army. 
Um, I think one of the things to to that people where people go wrong is that they have their favorite colors and they just go right. I just want to paint the army in my favorite colors and not considering that this color, although albeit not your favorite color, might work better with this based on color theory. Hmm. Um, there's no reason. Again, I don't. I don't want to sound like the, the the miniature painting police here. You can put on. You can put on <laughs> like you could put on whatever colors you want on your miniatures. That's perfectly fine. But I think for the minimal amount of investment it takes to understand that very brief uh, brief overview of color theory it will just help you hugely as a painter and i think some of the biggest areas where people do go wrong is that they do just pick their favorite colors because it's their favorite color and they'll put two colors together and then wonder why it doesn't the model doesn't inherently look as good um the other thing i would say is that like sometimes people picking colors that are, that are very very close to each other as well and it, and then and, and what happens is the like you need contrast is really important on miniatures um, because it gives them a weight of depth, it gives them that 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 look that you need to just just pick out all those tiny little details on the model. If it's a very close palette or the colours are very very close to each other, you 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 kind of disregard a lot of the little details. Yeah, and things it becomes hard to model. pull off that because the silhouette is uh, much more blended. I suppose it's harder to see the details if you've got like a green model with green cloth. Yeah, and then the gun's green. Yeah, it's... I mean if, if you're going for if you're going for a camouflage model, that'd be perfect. Yeah, but, I guess so. But, yeah. But, but but like I I personally wouldn't advocate that, and I would I would personally uh, I I'm a big fan of a painting journal and planning projects and planning colors and all those kind of things, and I think that when you overlay that preparation and planning with a bit of understanding of color theory, it's going to just you're you're going to be a lot more happier and confident with what you paint, and also the execution that you have at the fin at the end of the process. Um, it, like you don't need to sit there for three years studying from from Tibetan monks how to do color theory. You don't you don't need to do that. Like you could you could spend ages like you know learning color theory like you know in depth everything. And then what will happen is you'll start looking at everyone's models and realizing that the color theory doesn't work or whatever the case may be, which just becomes really nitpicky and it's not fun, you know. Um, but but what I what I would say is that like just just being able to just have an understanding of it is going to hugely benefit you as a painter um so let's go back to the planning a color scheme thing then. so say say you're new to the color theory idea or you're just looking for some inspiration right yeah. so you're planning out your army project and you're sat there thinking let's pick an example because it's the common one space marines right i've got my primaris army they're all built they're all primed i'm ready to go yeah. hmm, what color am i going to pick do you think that this is a time to go like oh, i'm going to go really rich in the law or i'm going to look at a load of box art or i'm going to look at a load of real life references there's a lot of different things at play there. Like if you like law, then undoubtedly you'll probably pick a chapter that already exists. If you're more of a competitive game, you'll probably pick one army that that you just make a color scheme up so you can use whatever rules you like. Um, I'm a big fan of of both of those avenues. There's not really a wrong or right at all whatsoever. Uh, I would possibly say that for me, law is like when it's got such a weight of burden, obviously all this law and, and all these different things that go on in the narrative. It seems a little bit of a shame to to overlook that when it comes to these models. In my mind, like if if someone invests just as much effort into the paint job as they do law, I think you get a better better model in the end of it. If, yeah. if that makes sense. There's kind of some exceptions to that though, because I I personally don't like it when people go like really hard on criticizing people because they didn't technically no. get the correct color of no. red stripe on the third. No, I I, I I agree. There's a little no. bit. There's a little bit of there's a, there's a line. Like, yeah, yeah, like you, you know, know, if your your third company marking is the wrong color because you thought it complemented it more nicely, I don't think you should be crucified. No, but. no, yeah, definitely. That's not that's not the the outcome that anyone would want. But like, but but I I, I do agree completely. I think that you know, when starting out the planning of the project, pick a pick an armor color that you or pick a in when I say armor color, pick a main color. I think is the thing that. We, that, that I should the best way to explain it pick a main color that number one you're really happy with because you're going to have to spend ages painting it yeah. yeah um and whether you're using brushes or whether you're using airbrushes or whatever you're using to apply that main color you've got to be happy with what you put on the model in the first place and then my next point of call would be picking a color which does help define that model with detail by contrasting the main color as best as possible and I would argue that the the the, the best place to start would be to pick something that through color theory hmm. works well that's nothing to say that like you could go i want a yellow armored model and then i want green accents there's nothing wrong with that but for me i would probably go yeah if i was going yellow i'd either go red blue or potentially purple because it's a harmonious color of red or i'd go maybe like other colors that are harmonious to any of the those uh, those contrasting colors that i i just think that that would give you a better starting point than 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 just uh so maybe that's the compromise then is like 
pick your one color that you definitely want, like your favorite color, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then maybe that's where you start dipping into the color theory without going too crazy with it is, okay, this is my favorite color. I'm happy with this one. We're going to be like super strict on that, but let's start accessorizing around it. That is definitely, that's the best way to put it, accessorizing. And, and the other thing I'd just say, like, obviously we're talking about color theory in this episode, but the one thing to also bear in mind is also neutral colors. Hmm. So your whites, your greys, you, you may be like different tones like that, black as well. Like you, even just the saturated desa- colors, really. even desaturated yeah. colors. Like you can add those to, you can add those to the models and use those and it will not take away from the main color, but it will also just give uh, a very good scheme because it doesn't clash too much. Yeah. I think like that, that's something else also to bear in mind. That's why I like Marines a lot, you know, is because it's like you can kind of, do what you want in the sense of yeah, yeah. if you've got like talk your basic like primaris intercess or your tactical ring whatever yeah you can literally paint the whole thing one color and then after that what if they really got like some eye lenses and like maybe a couple of buttons there's not a lot going on there's not loads no or you could be like i want this split color scheme because they've got like <laughs> you know the left arm's blue and the right arm's red or whatever yeah yeah or maybe it's a fancier model and they've got loads of cloth it's a character they've got all these different uh power weapons and yep. you can go, kind of go mental with all the colors and that i think that's where people probably see more roadblocks is like i think probably depending on the army or the mon- the miniatures that you're painting is i could see that being a potential roadblock for people because obviously if you've got some busier models let's say mm-hmm. with way more parts and like you're saying you don't want it to all be the same color yeah now you've kind of got a lot of choices to make because it might be a miniature where there's like in terms of uh, surface area might be equal parts three or four colors yeah, I, I think that's one of the things. And then it's also deciding what color you're going to use on those certain parts because there's loads of variables in place. Like you could choose, uh, I don't know, you could choose, like let's just take obviously the the, the Hawk Lords that we've done for, for Leviathan. Like you could take that. We obviously chose purple as the armor color because that's the color that the Hawk Lords are. But then there's different avenues that you can go down. You can go red, you can go yellow, or you can go uh, you can go blue, like teal, like a cyan well, we color. We kind of went for a blue sort of, Bluish black tones, didn't we, on the yeah. bolt casings? Yeah, on the bolt casings, the lenses, all those different parts. You know, so so you, there's various different options for you to then choose and use on 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 the project. But as long as as long as you have a, a minimal understanding of it, it's gonna what what you should see it as is a complement to what your your choice is. I think that's one of the things that really really does help. Like, it's not this big scary thing that. You, you should be afraid of learning a little bit of because all it's going to ever do is just make the choosing process for, for painting miniatures 10 times easier for you. Mm. Like it, it's almost like, it's almost like it, it lays out the steps that you need to take along the process of completing the miniature by having, by having some choices, which are, you can still got the option of going this color, or this color, or this color, or this color, or maybe I'll do a little bit of this color. The one thing I would also advocate as well and just touch upon is, um, it's percentage of, of color. So even within, let's just take ultramarines as an example. Okay. They're a triadic color scheme of yellow, blue, or they're a triadic primary color, uh, primary color set. So basically your yellow, your red, and your blue within that, like the percentage of each color used is very different from each other. So you'd look at it and be like, right. Okay. Well, the blue is like 80%, the yellow or gold, which it is now is like is 10% and the red is like, oh my God, maybe 15% for the yellow or gold. And then 5% is the red, if that makes sense. So like that, that you can within that, and this is where it does get a bit more, bit more difficult is that within that relationship that you've chosen of colors, you can then determine the percentages used and based upon the percentage of each color used, each of those, you could get three, four different schemes that all use the same relationship and colors, but they in, in they all look incrementally massively different because of how much color of each color you've used. So you shouldn't just think, oh, well, if I choose this relationship of these three colors, all my models are going to look the same. You could do loads of little things and the percentages use, used, the percentage used of each color would make each scheme or thing very variable within that and that's something else to also consider as well and that's before you add in neutral tones as well like your blacks well, and you whites. say about neutral zones but i think something we also have kind of glossed over as well is like a temperature difference so like you've got warm colors and cool colors and you could, that's that's a massive opportunity for contrast of course it is yeah on your miniatures yeah. as well um obviously within that you know you i'd say that's actually probably one of the more beginner friendly accessible areas of it like rather than like whipping out your color wheel and going crazy it's like <laughs> you you've got if even if you wanted something that was like similar colors, you can go for like a very cool blue versus a very warm, rich blue. Yeah, that that would be a great way to do that. It. That helps massively as well. And and just to, you know, if you've never looked at a color a color wheel before, then it is divided into cool and warm colors on on one side and the other, and it does give you that understanding of it. But as a tool, it's just something that you should have in front of you to to look at and just 
have a look at as you're working or you can flip it over you, it's got some of got really good dials on that you can move and you can basically see how colors interplay with each other based on the movement of the dial which is quite good also um but yeah you're quite right the, the use of the use of temperature on models is also you know and i think temperature also determines the overall viable feel of a model as well and when you combine that with choosing colors i think it gives you a very good opportunity to to um to sort of make some really informed choices when it comes to creating miniatures just a quick one, we wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard in both quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And in the month of August, new clients can get 5% off any commission by using the code AUGUST5. Back to the show. Let's integrate question of the week with this topic i think let's do it uh, so our question of the week this week is starting out as a painter how do you stop yourself from swapping approach constantly i think you've got a fine balance there of when you start out every the, the whole world of miniature painting and miniatures is this big not scary but this really exciting thing where you get to pick up models and practice with them and try different things you've got all these colors and things that you're going to be like putting on models um i think a way to stop stop sort of jumping around too much is to possibly just try and do a different stylistic approach per miniature that you paint when you first start out all right that's a good idea because what that will do for you is it will mean that you focus on one project completed fruition uh, and then that way when you do change to something else you go right well i've seen this model online as a, a most people invert in inevitably do um, and it's painted in this style i don't know how that's done i'm going to try and do that on this model and then you go all in on that execution um, to try and either emulate or just to try and learn that specific thing. We always say like different styles of painting should be more like different languages. That's the way to sort of best way to explain it. Um, you, you shouldn't be restricted to just painting one way. You might have a preferred way of painting like myself and yourself that we obviously like the box art style. Um, but there's nothing wrong with learning a more, uh, visible brushstroke style or a bit more of a of a desaturated, maybe even like Blanchett's or like a grim dark style or something like that. You should, all of these things are strings to a bow to make you a better painter. But you know, for, for, for the question at hand, I think one of the things to do is just by keeping a style on the project, completing it, and whether the, that project is a single character or an army or uh, a couple of miniatures from a war band or something like that, that would be a really good way to make sure that you, that you, stick within what you're trying to execute what and then when you do jump to something else you can completely like hit the reset button and it's a fresh palette and a fresh way of actually doing those things yeah i think jumping miniature does help or jumping project and style at the same time does also help i think my issue with this question is kind of that it implies that that's necessarily a bad thing because it i think to some people like jump change in approach is kind of a virtue because i think a lot of people get stuck in this rut of like i'm always painting the same thing or i'm always painting the same style i'm looking for inspiration to branch out yeah yeah but i think that actually as a beginner having access to such a variety of things is a good thing because ultimately at the end of the day if you keep on trying this stuff constantly that to me implies that if you're swapping what you're doing a lot you may be not happy with that thing that you're doing or the, the approach for that and that means that you haven't necessarily found that pocket that you sit in yet so i think that trying lots of things is actually a really great thing and i think the attitude that you have in the minute might actually be the best thing for you it, because if you're getting bored of of what you're stuck in you might that might lead you down the path of like uh, not being satisfied from the hobby, not getting from it what you want, and just ultimately being unsatisfied, I don't think is a good thing because you're probably going to end up quitting after a while. Yeah, there is that. And and I think if you're painting the same style all the time or if you're doing things in the same approach all the time, you might get burnout out a lot quicker as well. Mm. Whereas by by painting and trying different things and trying to emulate different things or to try, maybe doing something that isn't texturized and then doing something that is texturized or um you know maybe something that is a bit more weathered and something that is very clean by changing up all those different things it's just going to keep it like variety is the spice of life at the end of the day and you are gonna you are gonna be able to just learn more i think in a, an earlier point i think that's a lot a mistake that some painters do make is that they they just focus on one specific way of executing something and a lot of the skills that other styles require to execute them they aren't learned because you don't go near them at all whatsoever. And they then they, 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 they transform into this fear of doing them because you think you're going to make a mistake or something like that. I think when you first start out, it should be the most exciting time for you as a painter. And even if you're painting for loads of years and you've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, that jump outside your comfort zone to do something which is a little bit different than maybe, I think that's going to help you hugely. I think you shouldn't restrict yourself. If you restrict yourself, 
you might get very, very good at that stylistic execution or that style of painting or that way of doing something. There's nothing wrong with that, but that shouldn't be all that you aspire to be in my mind. I think you should be constantly trying to absorb different ways of doing stuff. And to, so then you, they're, they're all little tools so that as you're painting, you can use them to, to, to decide upon different ways of finishing a model or rendering a model, if you follow me. And I think that that's something that is actually very good when you first start out. You should be soup like a sponge. And just I think this is a great problem to have because ultimately, like I, what I'm always suggesting to people who are struggling with, with burnout is, or not, not just burnout, but like they want to improve, yeah. is to try different things. So I think that ultimately, like you're, you're actually in the best spot you're ever going to be. It is, yeah. When you, when, you first, when you first get into this, I mean, obviously everyone gets excited and buys way more models than they need to start off with. But like... um when you first start out this, it should be the most fun time for you because you just you just have so much, you've got this brand new world of, of, of all different things to execute and to try and do and to try and copy or to emulate or to paint or whatever. It, it should be the, the first year of painting should be the most, you, should, you shouldn't decide your style within the first year of painting no, in my mind. No, certainly opinion. not. I think, I think you, you should experiment and try loads of things because once, you, once you've tried all those things, you can go, well, do you know what? Look, I tried that. The model came out okay, but I, I really prefer doing this. Like, but if you didn't, if you didn't do that other execution and you just done this single thing always, uh, you know, I'm very guilty of painting red a lot, you know, and that's why I've, 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 imagine I've why. <laughs> yeah, I've spent a lot of, a lot of, I've, I've had to consciously say to myself over like many, many times, like, look, you know, I'm not going to paint anything with that color or for that army for a long time because I, I know I, I enjoy it. I know it's what I like massively, but it doesn't help me become a better painter which is why having things which are different and when you approach it would be a different model let alone applying a different stylistic execution to it um i think this shows like the fear that beginners have that they're gonna like do it wrong yeah definitely yeah but but there's nothing there's, there isn't anything wrong with just picking a model up and just doing something if you want to if you want to dry brush it slap chop it edge highlight it box art it like you know I, you should be trying all these things so then it gives you the skills in those different areas it just it just gives you a wealth of knowledge as a painter. But the, the, the fear is, oh, I'm going to make a mistake, and you're really not. Like, there's nothing detrimental that's going to happen, and you can strip the model if you make a mistake. I think for someone listening who, like I said, is maybe like stuck in a bit of a rut or maybe a rhythm of always painting in the same way, I think this question is kind of proof that the grass is always greener, right? Like, it is, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, but that is the case. Like, you know, um, yeah, if you just 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 experiment and try, try different things, you'll you'll massively, massively learn the most within that that experimentation that you do uh, and and color theory should be this best friend that's there to guide you along that experimentation if you if you study a little bit of it enough to make informed choices which i think is really what color theory should be used for uh, rather than criticizing or critiquing stuff you know in a factual manner just because at the end of the day it's art and if you want to put x color next to x color there's nothing inherently yeah. wrong with that how far into like painting did you start to think about it a bit more consciously probably probably more when it came to competition painting mm. i think because um obviously when 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 you enter a competition the, the people that are judging it have a, an understanding of that uh a great a much greater understanding of it maybe that, that, than i've got and um but understanding those minimal basic things Again, it just makes those all those things I've said earlier in the episode like easier. But that's where for me it became really important is when I wanted to improve my painting to a level whereby I can enter competitions with confidence that, uh, that, that what I've submitted is the best thing that I can do. You can paint a model perfectly, like seamlessly, like as close to whatever style you're executing or the best rendition or whatever it is you painted. And if you're entering it in a competition and the color theory is, is potentially off, then it really boils down to personal bias or you might have a, one judge that's down to personal bias and you might have a judge that is so on the line about color theory that the model is discredited because of that. Hmm. So really, unfortunately, it does sound like a little bit of a tick box, a box ticking exercise, but it is a box that you should try and tick if you're entering stuff like that. Um, there's all manner of crazy relationships that work that you don't have to stick to the direct complement relationship. And that's where having a better understanding of some of the more difficult relationships or more non, non well-known relationships is, is beneficial for you. Um, but it, that's where for me, it really became important. Again, it's, it should sit as a best friend. It's your right hand man that's there to help you when, when, when painting. Mm. That's what Mine was kind of a similar thing actually. Cause like when I, I, I have a very, very rudimentary like understanding of color theory. Like let that come through first. Yeah, when I say I, what, I'm exactly the same. So before I say it. what I'm about to say. So for me, when I came to doing my GD entry, mm -hmm. I chose black Templars. Yeah. They're black models, right? Yeah. So 
We've got to find some color somewhere. They have red weapons. Yep. Me being the absolute color theory genius that I am went, well, I'm going to do the base in green. Yeah. I'm going to do the grass. <laughs> green is the opposite of red. Yeah. And that, that, I think that should just outline like how simple and how small of a afterthought it can kind it, of but be it really for people. Is, it really is that. that like, it doesn't need to be like the, that. You, you, you shouldn't see color theory as this, oh, it's a super difficult thing. Like, it should just be, right, okay, well, I've used this color. This color is directly, uh, again, this is a very rudimentary reduced kind of like without spending four years in Tibet learning color theory. Like this is a very much like very much a reduced thing. Like you should literally just go, right, this is the opposite color. If I'm doing the gun casings this color, it might be good to do some of the buttons this color because then they'll make each other stand out and contrast greatly better or it might complement it because it harmonizes. And that that is really where the understanding, I think that's the, like, unless you're wanting to really invest 300 hours into a model and paint it for competition or just paint a model as best as physically possible with that mindset in place. Um, you don't really need to cross that line too much of once you have that rudimentary understanding. I agree. I think, I think, I think that's the thing. It, sh- it should just be a benefit, not, not a, a full exercise. You know, um, I think that's one of the important things with color theory. We said we was going to have artwork on the walls. And then James apparently took that as opportunity in free there's, reign to just make this the Blood Angels podcast. There's literally a, a Dark Angels artwork. I can see it from here. I know I said I wanted to be able to see it when I was sitting down. That's why it's I there. meant I wanted it up here. No. And um, that was the original plan. James took one look at it. And now I've ended up with these two behind me. Denied. Good artwork, to be fair. Iconic artwork and worthy of the walls. If you're listening, I suppose just head to YouTube quick. Yeah. And uh, you'll get to see the new studio. Yeah. For the audio listeners, we're on a new set. We've got a few uh, a few new changes, actually, for the podcast. We mm-hmm. have all been listening to your comments, so thank you, everyone, for giving us your feedback. A few new things. We've got some new segments, new set, obviously, and we've heard you. We are making the episodes longer now. Yeah. So, there yeah. was only so much we could... I kept I kept replying to people and being like, you know, we will when we can, and da, da, da. but yeah, it seemed that's what people wanted, so... Give it a test. Yep. yep. And please, obviously, do let us know if you have any thoughts or suggestions for future episodes. And without further ado, our topic today. Bit of a show and tell this week. These are the three paints that you could not live without. Looks like you've got a few more than three there, George. I'm not going to lie. I've got five. Spoilers. I might have five. I basically, I wasn't sure this morning. I was like, I'm going to bring these. I'm still a bit undecided of which ones have, have really hit the top three. And then Joe was like, well, you could do those as one because they're technically all related. So it's my fault. It's my fault that you brought in too many Well, and we had to stick them all in the episode. If James is going to come at me for it, then I'm definitely going to bust a load of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. Three paints we couldn't live without. So we're going to go around. We've got a bit of a show and tell, like I said. And uh, these aren't like obviously a, a diehard list, but these are paints that specifically for us have a, have a frequent uh, appearance on our on Frequent our paint usage. Work. Yeah. I think in terms of maybe it's uh, more like, like I said, when, when I proposed this to you guys last week, I was like, these are the ones that you probably couldn't substitute for something else. It's not like a, oh, I really like this color. It's like yeah. this paint specifically. Yeah. So you're not picking it just because you like the color. No, I know. It's that's not just correct? that. Correct? No. Uh, yeah. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually, no, sorry. I do actually want to say I've accidentally already seen James's. Yeah. Um, and were well, you predicted you but, thought, but you know me well enough i wanted predicted. to i wanted to predict them on air yeah but i've accidentally now already seen them and i don't yeah. want to fake it but my prediction was correct yeah i did want I, to put that I, out there and i want the credit for it <laughs> my prediction was correct. i felt like i didn't even really need to ask we could have like i felt like we could have picked these for each other almost yeah, you're diminishing my achievement there a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. go on james what have you got for us so uh First I'm, one. First I'm going to go with the first one. So I'm not going to go with the obvious one. That is in the, in the three. But <laughs> but I'm going to go with the first one, which is uh, which is Vallejo seven zero nine five zero black. It's probably in my mind the best black paint in the market. Like it literally. I'm going to put it on the stack of stack of white dwarfs. So yeah, you we'll can, build up over can, there. Yeah. Don't so ruin it though. That's an oldie. I know. I didn't scratch it. It's fine. Uh, the, 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 the reason why look, all painters need a good black paint, um, there's loads on the market. I think for the one that this trumped, which is hard to get, uh, which is the original chaos black in the pots, chaos black used to be super matte in finish, um, used to cover like tarmac as well. So this is the, this is the closest. Cover like tarmac. It does. Yeah. This is, this is literally, (laughs) this is literally the. 
best black paint, in my opinion. And I want to say that, like, obviously, you're watching this, and whether you take away from this one paint that you're going to try out, or whether you take out, you know, all the paints from this uh, and, and try using them, that's totally on you. But I think a staple paint in the painter's repertoire of, of selection should be a good black. And Vallejo 70.950 is, or as we call it, 950 black, is probably the best, in our opinion. Um, our opinion, he's throwing yeah. us all in. Yeah, huh? he's you, you, love a bit, you love a bit of 9.5, I don't like. I don't I mind mean, a bit of 9.5. I am, I am inclined to agree. Yeah. So he's right on that one. Yeah, but. He's, there, there, there are other matte blacks and things on the market, but I think um, I think just generally the performance of this one, the way it dilutes on the palette, the way it covers, um, and and the, the quality of the matte finish that it does give as well, I think is very, very, very good. Um, yeah, I, I've... I've Big fan of it, and I'll always try and recommend it to people when they ask me for a good black. Unless you've got pots and pots of cast black kicking around, this is. The is it just the coverage thing for you specifically? Co it's just the coverage and the the strength of the pigment as well. Like the amount, obviously, model color being a very uh, dense sort of uh, range of, of Vallejo having a lots and lots of pigmentation in them. You don't often find many, in my opinion, from try and loads. You don't often find many model colors that that don't have loads of pigment in them. And for a black to be as strong as this, especially when you're doing like uh, glazing or even sort of blending, etc., using black, this is the one to go to because it gives you the, the sheer volume of pigment in the paint gives you such a scope of um, such a scope of ability to, to 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 dilute the paint down. It can go all the way from a really really subtle subtle tint glaze all the way through to just a really solid base coat. It, and you've got between those two points, you've got a massive scope of, of dilution that you can use those incremental dilutions as different tools for. Um, so yeah, so I think I think personally, yeah, nine five zero is 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 the one. My, uh, my gripe with nine five zero, right? Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> I think I like nine five zero. I use nine five zero a lot. It's very matte though. Like it's very matte. I think that's what I like about it. It's called it's called varnish. You can just varnish. I think off. I think for me, like probably no, no, don't varnish. No, I'm saying enjoy if you want, the if you, if you wanted like a satin, more satin or glossy finish, you can just do that afterwards. Yeah, but just enjoy the. That's what I was going to say though, because like if I'm if I'm doing it as like a, as an accent part of the model or like mixing it in whatever, that's fine. Yeah, but when I'm doing like a black model, it's like I've now got a whole like varnishing process. I feel like. Well, yeah, but that or... that's that goes down to. I mean, when I say it's like for blocking in black areas and stuff like that, obviously if you're gonna if you're gonna base coat a model and you don't want it matte, then go for like chaos black spray can with a hair dryer I have a nice satin sheen once it's dried or there's other blacks on the market that give you a satin finish obviously Abaddon uh, a lot of people say that Abaddon doesn't cover as well or whatever but um, if you want a satin if you want to represent leather on a model with black Abaddon black Why is amazing Why is Abaddon such a controversial black? I don't know if it's controversial I, 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 I hear either people like oh yeah it's it's absolutely fine or I hear people like saying it's think, awful I think it's it, it is the the finish of it. I think I think a lot of people are probably wanting it to be a bit more matte or expecting it to be a bit more matte than it is. Mm. But I don't know. I never. I haven't used. Is it Corvus Black? The other black. Corvus Black's black a yeah. bit like. Uh, it's is that gray? Matte? It's or? a bit. Gray. It's, a, it's not as. Oh, it's black not like as... pure black. No, no it's, it's like not, a little no, bit lighter. No. So it's like a first. Yeah, you you. It's a highlight. It's a highlight stage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't oh. say you could use it even as a chunky. To be fair, to be honest, on chaos black, I think it's a, a little bit still too dark to use as that. So it's still, I'm, still like. A... I'm actually pretty sure that they use that for the towel on the suit on the box art. Potentially, okay. yeah. I, I know. I'm, I think Scam Black Dinges. See, color, sometimes anyway, I but... prefer that if I'm going to actually be base coating something black. Almost the reason I actually like nine five zero and why it's so matte is because if I was base coating something black and it was like satin or glossy yeah when it's so hard to actually pick out the details and stuff when i'm painting even with my magnifiers <laughs> um before you say anything um so the the way like how matte that is mixed with also priming now with the color forge matte black a lot of the time that's they work quite well, well together oh well. they are like Mesh, so yeah, well. yeah. Work, so that well. for me yeah. makes it a lot easier to paint if I'm base coating anything black. I'll go straight with with nine five zero. Yeah, no, but I, I also there's a lot of brands where I haven't actually tried it. It's mostly trying GW stuff first and it not being matte enough, and then stumbling upon that. So, Joe, what you got? What's your first? My turn. Yeah. First, I got them stashed behind the white. I even even I didn't know you guys had them stashed. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna go with. I've dropper bottled these. Uh, but I did them before George gave me the hookup for the good bottles. So I'm my taking credit. Quite bad. I'm taking credit. I'm going to go for. I also drop a bottle, uh, a shade paint, which I probably wouldn't actually bother um, now. But oh, correct, yeah. correct choice. Um, but that shade paint is Athonian camo shade, which seems like probably like a bit of an unassuming 
choice that wouldn't really stick out as, as someone. Oh, is it on the table? I can not see it. Oh. <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. Um, so basically, I, I think this is the one of the only shade paints that I've not managed to replicate the effect better with either thinning down a normal paint yeah. or some of the new contrast paints. For whatever reason it is, someone who paints a lot of green, whether it's like orcs or dark angels or whatever, um, and likes a bit of the grittier look More dark in, look. in some of those recesses. Yeah. Um, it just like, I'm not slapping it over the whole panels or anything like that, um, but it's quite, it feels quite versatile because you can use it on like green skin, like I'm saying in the yeah, recesses, yeah. or you could use it on armor, or you can put it over um, like basin that isn't necessarily green to give it a bit of a green, dirty, hue kind of thing yeah, yeah um you put it over metals before it works really nice over metals i've never really done it with metals but yeah, yeah i imagine it'll kind of give it a nice little grimy looking uh maybe for like nurgle stuff it could be quite it's really good. it's really good but it's just always one of the it's the only shade paint now that i'm still using and haven't really replaced with either a base paint or a contrast or something like that um so I just wanted to encourage people to not forget about it as they move on from shade paints. And, and is that one of the old that. ones as well? It is one of the old ones, yeah. Have it's, you tried the new? Uh, I haven't tried the new formula. I had a few of the old ones kind of backed up. I don't mind so. the new formula. Yeah, yeah new formula is good. Yeah. Is it more it's satin? More like then in terms of finish, it, it behaves more like a contrast. Yeah, yeah, like for sure. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, whether it's old or new one, they both they both still finish. Very similar in the way mm. that they do finish them. The, the, I think the only new formula shade that I've actually used is Nolan Oil, um, which is actually quite good, I think, for... It's better now for metallics than it used to be. It's not as say. potent. Yeah, I would say it just... It just looks... I don't know if you use it correctly and don't slap it on too much of it, it, it looks a little bit nicer. But, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried the new, uh, new formula camo shade. Well, yet. speaking of Nolan Oil over metallics... Yeah. Don't worry. I've got your two in one over here. Because <laughs> uh, my pick is Scale Color or Scale 75 Metal and Alchemy. That's black metal. What a color. Put that on the White Dwarf stack for you. What a color. First of all, right, I'm going to go on a bit of a, a bit of a preach here about Scale 75 because they're, they're kind of new to me. I haven't, I've been turned onto these by the team. So first of all, with all their metallics, right, the pigment is like, or not just the pigment, but like the microflex in all of their metallics is so finely ground. It's literally like paint with like liquid metal. It's mad. Like even I would imagine under your magnifiers, Joe, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to see all those little flecks of uh, of mica flake in there. So love them for that, which also means that they thin down nice, and you can use them for glazing and highlight and whatever. But pinning that that color is basically a lead belch with no oil wash replacement in one coat. I'm saying that hot take. Black metal over black. If you're careful with it, one coat you can do it. Yeah, it is very, very good. I think the scale metallics are the closest to the, in my opinion, to the old GW metallics, like the, the like bolt gun metal um, and chain mail and stuff like that. Just not in, in hues and stuff, because they, back in the day, there they weren't as many sort of spectrums of color. But for the... There weren't as many. <laughs> I love that as the idea of like, back back when the world was black yeah. and white. Yeah. No, no, what I mean is they when just... When TVs didn't... changed, that's when, <laughs> that's when yeah. the world changed as well. That yeah. wasn't technology on the TV, that was just how the but world... All it is is you didn't get as many choices of, of metallic hue uh, back then. But you, but um, they are very similar in the in the in how refined the, the flex are in them. Um, uh, and they're the closest I've found from like, current existing paints to them and i think that they they like you're quite right they paint perform like so well like i'm a huge fan of the um, dwarven elven uh golds they're just they're just mega yeah. shadowing yeah <laughs> shadowing yeah yeah so they're, they're absolutely mega but yeah black metal is amazing um it's really good actually because sometimes you'll put like black I, actually it's incidental that we've got 950 here because i'll put 950 into uh like lead belcher or before this is before like iron warriors was around or any of those colors um, I put 950 into my silver to make a darker version of it, uh, darker than bolt gun or darker than lead belcher, for example. So, yeah, but it is, it is absolutely mega as a colour. Okay, well, uh, ascending beyond that. This is using, your trinity one. This, this, is your this, trinity. Is, this is, in my opinion, the holy trinity, right? Of metallics. So you've got the black metal. Yeah. I've got here heavy metal. Yeah. That's a brighter silver. Yeah. And I've got Viking gold, which, in my opinion, is the gold of choice. So... These three, as a trifecta, I feel like you can paint any silver 
or gold on any model using just those three and mixing of those yeah, three. Yeah, between the three. Those yeah. paints mix so well together. And because the pigment is ground so fine and the microflex is ground so fine, they glaze like a dream. Yeah. I'm, so these are, all three of these are scale 75. Yeah, they're yeah, in the they same range. Metal yeah. and alchemy. Yeah, and alchemy range. set. Yeah, it's great. And that's the one thing for those, for those who are watching that, that maybe aren't familiar with uh, with scale paints. They come in really good sets of eight. So you, I think it's eight paints that come in a set, but oh, it's eight, eight or ten. I can't remember exactly. But you can buy them individually as well. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You can buy them individually, but the, you get them in a specific set that's tailored for doing specific tasks. So, for example, like uh, metallics or brighter colors, etc., etc., etc. They do loads of like flesh set. They've got a metallic set. They've got like a fantasy set. So they're really, really good. Um, but I, I've, I've, do you know what? I've not really used the Viking Gold too much. I've used Dwarven and Elven, um, and they're they're they're, they're really they, good. They me. behave pretty similarly. I've just found that specifically Viking Gold behaves really nicely with the silvers for yeah. mixing in your highlight stages. Yeah. And also, personally, I just prefer that like slightly bronzier gold hue. Yeah. Like yeah. just my personal taste. I don't yeah, like yeah, a really no. yellowy gold. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's my first one. Right. Technically three. Technically, <laughs> yeah. technically three. Yeah. So I'm going to say the best will last. Yeah. But, well, everyone already knows what that's going to be, so yeah. I think you should do it, and then they don't know what the next one is. <sighs> Spoiling my fun here, Joe. Well, you're doing but, it the wrong way but, around. Just do but, the one that everyone but, already right, knows. Okay, I'm going to say it. So, so I'm a massive fan of the OG white hex lid pots, and um, and and really this bit is specific about one that's my favourite from that range. Um, but in general, all of them, are, I absolutely love them. I still love to this day. So we're going to get out. It's actually empty because I've used all of it. Um, <laughs> But but <laughs> I've got plenty of other ones to, uh, at home. So uh, so we're going to go with Blood Red. Um, now, what year are we talking? We're talking 90, 91, I think. Yeah, like, yeah, I think it'll be on it. It doesn't got a date on there. It's, yeah, no date on it. But um, for anyone that's unfamiliar... It's if older you're than me. That, 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 that paint is significantly <laughs> older than me. If you're, new, if you're new to the hobby, then you probably won't recognise these old pots. But if, you, if, you, if you've been around since second edition, you will definitely... Uh, know this pot and it will hopefully bring back some nostalgia for you they literally are still to this day when you buy it when you get one and it's sealed or even if it's unsealed the, the paint is still ready to go uh, after all those years um the one thing i do like about this is there was, there's a there's a big thing about them not covering very well and, and i think if you look at some of the yellows some of the reds um from it, the the range was a bit diverse in in the quality of the of the of the coverage 100 percent like I, I love the term as well. Diverse, like, diverse in quality. Made what a deflection! Some, some of it yeah. was rubbish. Yeah, that, look, I'm <laughs> that's not, the most political response are, I've ever heard. Diverse, we in all quality. know there is diverse in quality. Yeah, we, so we, like, we, I would we all say know. some of them are rubbish. We all know that um, that still to this day there are paints within various different paint man, ranges of manufacturers that don't cover very well. But we never, there's never no such thing as a bad paint. It's just a paint that's not suitable for a job. So if you want a green that covers better, then you just find one for maybe from another range that that's the same hue that. will cover better for you for the what you're trying to use it for however if you're wanting uh if you're wanting for glazing if you're wanting for doing like really thin wash layers etc like the old range is amazing um now the, the thing is with them as well is that i don't apply the blood red on my models by brush at all whatsoever because they are a bit more viscous and they are a bit more translucent in their coverage they are absolutely amazing for 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 airbrushing which is why in true blue peter fashion we have. Some, He's brought a bottle of ketchup some, for the uh, some, for audio some, listeners. Some, so, <laughs> it just looks like ketchup. So, so the reason why that, that blood red pot is empty is because the whole lot is in a ketchup bottle that's got pre-thinned to. Hang on a minute. The story's changing now. He said he used it all. First, you used it all. Yeah, I used it all. Put it in. Then here. it's perfect for airbrushing, but now it's pre-thinned. Yeah, you have to put a bit thinner into it. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of steps here, Joe. Yeah, yeah so we're missing. So, you're, so you're, they they cover amazingly. Pardon the pun, but you're glazing over a few details. Okay, they they are great for airbrushing, and like with any paint, you dilute it down uh, to using an airbrush. They are absolutely amazing for airbrushing. They give a really smooth coverage over a model. I've used uh, like uh, Lich Purple. Uh, we used Lich Purple on obviously the Hawk Lords that we've done for the Leviathan launch. And the one thing that is really good about the old paint range is that they have such a high vibrancy of saturation so that red is super 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 bright same with all the other colors that are in that range if you think of that some of the older paints like enchanted blue leash purple blood red uh, blazing orange like so they have got amazing amazing saturation of color admittedly they don't go on as well with a brush that's perfectly fine but it's just another tool to use in your arsenal if you want a very very vibrant royal looking red or saturated color blood red for me is the absolute king of 
king of reds. It really is. It's absolutely amazing. Um, there's other manufacturers out there, obviously, um, but it's. I find it just good to use a bit of nostalgia from my from my, from my past and to in the modern day, which is which is why I use it. Um, yeah, and that's that's just blood red. It's just probably the least uh, replicatable for the listeners. Yeah. No, you can The thing is that there, there have been attempts to replicate it. You've got a range of paints called Nostalgia eighty eight, which is uh, which is out there. I've tried it. Um, a lot of the colours are like ninety five percent, so they are very close. Um, I think I got you the. I've, I've tried it. Yeah, yeah. you, you got like me the blood red. Yeah, gift. Yeah, it's like here you go. You love blood red so much. Yeah, it, uh, it, but it's, I did genuinely want your opinion on that as well. Actually, they're, they're very close. I, I like. <laughs> They're very, very close. I wouldn't say they're exactly the same, um, yeah. but but they are very, very close. Um, having said that, upon, about that range, just to touch upon it, I mentioned it when I spoke about 950 Black, but Chaos Black from back in the day, that paint has not changed, in my opinion, the way it covers and the way it performs. Like the old Chaos Black, I use that analogy, covers like tarmac, but it really does. It's phenomenal. Like a really, really good paint, Chaos Black. And if you do want, if you do have it, it's just as good as using 950, in my opinion, like it's good. And same with like Enchanted Blue covers extremely well both with a brush and also with an airbrush so you're going to have your, your your better and worse is within a paint range that old range is no not no different um but yeah blood red in my opinion is the the king of reds so so yeah provided that you thin it and put it in a ketchup bottle yeah you can thin it in the airbrush no i think that, i think bottle. the ketchup bottle probably doesn't change the the behavior the i can't believe after, ease. After, after, ease, I think. after all the preaching i've been doing for dropper bottles he goes out and gets that monstrosity. the, the dropper bottle <laughs> I, I just turned it up to 11 yeah <laughs> Bigger Absolutely. One. It dwarfs them. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, but incidentally, if you are watching this, like, again, think about time being the most important commodity. Like, if you've got, if your army is a red army or a blue army or whatever color your army is, grabbing some ketchup bottles off of Amazon and actually just pre preparing and pre thinning the whole entire pot ready for use saves you so much time. And for consistency, it means that you can continue your army whenever you choose to pick up a new model to add to it. And it will be exactly the same because you've got the paint ready to go. Um, that, yeah, especially I, handy if you're doing a mix as a base. Yeah. Color, oh yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. That is the uh, the downside of the drop bottle is you're probably not going to get thousands and thousands of points out of one bottle. So. Yeah. 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 Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world class team here at Siege Studios with a variety of painting levels to meet your needs and your budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or a full blown gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard in terms of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And in the month of August, new clients can get 5% off of any commission using code AUGUST5. Joe, next one. Um, I'm going to go for a pretty boring one, I think. I, I feel like I've, like I say, I've made a note of, of um, you know, standing up for the unsung heroes and stuff like this on this, heroes. on this podcast with my magnifiers and, and <laughs> So on. So I wanted to shine a light on particularly boring paint. Potentially, I never really see many people talk about boring. it that much. But Rhinox Hide, which I've also put in a rubbish dropper bottle. That is, right. um, I, know, I know I preached about the dropper bottles, Joe, but that is an embarrassment. They, they, <laughs> that, is, that they, is actually. <laughs> they were the first ones I bought, and then they were the second ones I bought. But neither are very good, to be honest. Anyway, Rhinox Hide. Um, for me, it, any lever or anything like that is the go-to. Mm -hmm. It's my go, the go-to basically, yeah, yeah. and then you work off of that. Mm -hmm. On top of that, as well, similar to the camo shade with the versatility angle, um, Rhinox hide as a um, recess shade and things like mm -hmm. that, or mixing into colors for a recess shade. Yeah, yeah. I love mixing Rhinox hide in with the base mix, for like glazing down. Exactly. Yeah, it's like that's why for me, like. Almost any, mo I, I would say actually every model I paint, there's room for something to do with Rhinox Hide in there. Whether it's like just painting the lever like that or even mixing it with something else to paint like wood or whatever. Like there's always something and just the coverage in general on Rhinox Hide for me has always been great. I don't know. How, I don't really see people talk about it, good or bad. So I don't know. What I would the say that over, over dark colors it covers pretty excellently. Yeah. Um, yes. And then uh, over light colors, I'd say it has the same issue that any other dark color has over light colors. Yeah. Not, yeah. not particularly. So bad. I just, uh, when I was thinking, and, and the question was obviously like, what are your must haves or what are your go to's? I don't think there's been a model that I've painted in the last like few years that hasn't had at least something to do with Rhinox Hide on it, whether it's a, a wash or a glaze or a base coat or, or anything. It's, it's, it's a really, really good paint. I think 
for all the things you've said, 100% weathering as well. But if you really want quick weathering on vehicles, a two-stage highlight color of the armor color and then sponge with rhinoxide gives you instantaneous tonal variance with the battle damage or weathering that you do. Um, and, and it just, it, it looks amazing really, really quickly, really subtly, softly adding it on. Um, it, it is, even if you do a lighter, warmer leather, as in maybe Mournfang or um, oh, what's the other brown? I can't remember what it's called, but there's another brown in the GW range. It's really good. Um, but like Gawthor or something? Gawthor, no. It's Dried Bark? No. Oh, we're going to go for all the range now. <laughs> yeah, let's just list every single yeah, Citadel. Every single I, can't, I can't think what one it is, but there's another. It's more already hued. Um, yeah, it's a more already hued one. It's the one that uh, our good friend MK bangs on about all the time. Um, Doomball, bro? Uh, Doomball, there we go. Yeah, we've got there in the end. There we go. Got to um, keep that all in now. Yeah. That's okay. all got to be in. Oh, you wanted God. longer episodes. This is what you're going to have to <laughs> yeah, part with. This yeah. is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. The, the key to the longer episode was that we just didn't edit it. So we were yeah. like, yeah, you wanted... Uh, you a longer, longer episode. episode. There you exactly. go. Here's the full hour that we took to record. Just wait until we take our lunch break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> even even using a lighter, warmer brown for like leather or for whatever it is that you're going to be doing, uh, Rhinox still plays a really good part in, in doing either the soft shade or the dark shade on the brown or toning it or when you do, when you glaze leather or et cetera. So, um, or even like the, the shadow of any scratch damage and stuff like that that's on there. Um, it's really, really good for doing that. So I think it's an, it, it nods back very closely to Scorch Brown from the old range, but I think it's, it's slightly darker if memory serves correct um but it's yeah a phenomenal paint and i i, I quite like you joe I, i've used it in pretty much consistently as one of my browns that i go to every time whenever i do leather or battle damage or any of those things um every single time without fail it's just it's an amazing color um yeah big up rhinox hide big up rhinox hide right i've got magos purple that's my next pick it's a contrast i think it's one of the is that one of the original contrasts from First, first wave, wave, yeah. I'm unsure, but I'll, Should be first I'll wave, go with the majority. Regardless, don't use this one much, but on the theme of like something I couldn't really replace with some, I mean, I'm sure there's something else I could replace with, but I've not found a replacement for or necessarily wanted to. It's quite a specific use case. Love glazing this in shadows mm -hmm. on pretty much any color, actually. Like, I think people generally go for like dark brown or, or black on a shadow, especially when, especially when you're glazing and I guess that makes sense. It works, but just for a, a bit of visual interest, it's quite nice. Catching to have a... strays from my uh, <laughs> why not hide inclusion for glazing into shadows. There. That being said, I actually picked that up from uh, from doing my sons of Horus. I did a bit of a uh, bit of purple glazing in, in for the recesses of those. It's just a really subtle. If you thin it down and use it as a glaze, it's it's so subtle, but it's like really. I don't know. It goes a long way. I think like just for a little bit of visual interest. Really nice over white as well. Like just just glazing that in. Just, just for a shadow. I haven't found a replacement for it. Um, I haven't used it. I don't think I'm. I might have used a different contrast purple for like purity seals. Mm. Um, if you wanted a bit more of a, when well, the wax part, on, on the uh, yeah yeah on the wax part yeah, yeah. when you want a bit more of a pinky purple like scream of pink yeah root mm. to the, to the wax part of it rather than a pure red yeah yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I've used either that contrast or a similar purple one. I can't remember what the other purple one is. Um, but yeah, that, that's the only thing I've really used it for. Today. It's really um, quite like the word I use, like it's quite soft. Like it's not a very heavy, and it's it's quite like desaturated as well. So it doesn't go over like super stainy, like harsh in yeah. terms of pigmentation. It's like I said, I, I like using it over white. Like if you really thin it down, like quite a lot of water, it's it's just a nice soft glaze. You can build it up over a few coats. Haven't found a replacement for it. Cool. I'll have to give it a go on something. Yeah. I've not tried. I've not tried many of the contrasts for for glazing. Being honest, I just don't. I don't really use them very much. I use a lot of inks. Um, but uh, I'll have to give it a go if it's that soft and that delicate to use it with. Do you, do you dye it down quite a lot? Then yeah, what, yeah. What, what, contrast medium or, or no, just water, just water. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like the contrast uh, I, medium, but it makes it basically just makes it a less pigmented contrast paint. It doesn't right, really okay. change the behavior. Oh, okay. Because if you use water and you thin it down, it becomes more like a traditional glaze. Oh, okay. Oh, fine. And right. that kind of goes along with what they said when they launched contrast, because they were encouraging people to use it, obviously, the way that contrast was supposed to be used. So they were also saying, don't thin it down because it will change exactly. how it Which behaves. I like to, yeah, like, I don't like to use contrast in its traditional sense, mm. um, but I, I love them for glazing. Uh, I just, the, the trick for me is just to use, just use water instead of the contrast medium. Fair. Okay. Go nice. on. I know you're itching, James. <sighs> It looks like I'm bringing. I'll tell you what. It looks like I'm bringing all the all the brightness to this to this uh, this this show. Um, uh, no spoilers for my third one, but yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no. Mine, actually, no. It's quite bright. So 
one of my favorite colors just in general and this is more like a general use tool that i i, you, I use it when i'm painting the inherent color but uh, also for boosting other colors um is another model color and it is uh vallejo model color ice yellow a classic pick amongst the uh the painting scene it, it is uh the creme de la creme of brightening paints it is the absolute best um, I, I use this for obviously painting yellow. So highlight stage on yellow. So if you're going to do like, uh, edges and things like that, it's quite good for that. Um, I've used a little bit of that in some occasions on red where I've wanted like dots, corner dots and things like that. Sometimes just putting a tiny little corner dot like that when using orange highlight stages can work quite nicely as well. Um, but where this bad boy really comes into, into power is by boosting other colors. Now, a lot of people put white obviously into paints, uh, which obviously, it brightens to an extent, but it also pastelizes, I find, quite a lot um, because it inherently has uh, a, a yellowish hue and it's a bit more saturated. It actually, you you get the brightness, but it doesn't pastelize the colors. Very similar to ivory, but I still find in some situations, ivory will sometimes pastelize a color because it is closer to white than, than the ice yellow. It's amazing with purples, with reds, with greens, obviously with yellows, um, oranges it's great with. Like most colors you can put ice yellow into and it will add a lot of saturation and color shift really nicely like, along the spectrum of that branch of color. Um, I'm a big fan of obviously picking a brighter color within the same branch of color to boost the color, but the ice yellow is probably the one of the only colors from outside of the inherent branch of color that it is that I will use to then boost that color on many occasions. Um, I just find it gives you a bit really good control over how you're highlighting the, the, the paint if that makes sense um yeah and because obviously it's a model color from vallejo it's uh it, it's it's got loads of pigment in it so you can add incremental tiny little amounts into whatever color you're trying to highlight or boost and it'll make such a substantial change to it because of that concentration of pigment as well which is just great um i didn't say the, the number for anyone who wants it it's 70.858 so it's yeah it's a really that really, is handy on the vallejo yeah. paints isn't it the number I do like that. When someone says to me, "This," if you go the other way, if you don't know the number, right? This is the difficulty with it. Yeah, I got caught out with this. I think it was I was trying to use um, it was like light grayish blue, which yeah. apparently is different to light bluish gray. Yeah, right. That's so, why you need the yeah, number. Yeah, that's but that's, that's because Vallejo have got so many grays. That's because, what I'm because, saying. That's why yeah. the numbers so. Oh good. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because, they, because they come. But from if you don't know the number, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah well, it, you better it, know the number. It helps hugely. Yeah, definitely know the number, but. But um, but yeah, like there's lots of different. I mean, I've, I know the paint's like, good as well. By the way, I didn't mean that wasn't my only takeaway <laughs> from the thing. I, I mean, do like ice yellow as ca, well. Ca, um, AK make an ice yellow as well, so they've got. A, but uh, I've not tried the AK they, one. They they are they are different. Um, they're not exactly the same. So just be conscious of that. I think the AK one's a little bit stronger in its in how bright it is, as in as in the color, um, a bit or the saturation of it. So so I. I I've not tried the AK one. All cards on table. I've seen it in a bot in a pot. Um, but I prefer looking at them in pot. I prefer the ICLA. Um, yeah, I just think it's a better one personally. Cool. So, so yeah, that's um, my last one. Is it me next? It's you. Um, mine's sort of touching on a point that you brought up earlier, George, because mine is uh, Vallejo Model Metallic Air Gunmetal. Oh, this goes back to the Vallejo thing with the names. Model uh, Metallic Well, it's seven, Air. Seven one dot. 072, if you're wondering. Does that clear it up for you? <laughs> oh, well, why didn't you say so? You'll get used to the numbers, but, <laughs> but I'm not talking about airbrushing it. I'm talking about with a brush. With a brush. Mm. Little trick. It's not a hidden gem of a trick. Everyone knows about it, but I do just really like it. It's, it's a nice color in general. It is a darker metallic color, so a darker silver base coat, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Goes on so smooth, like literally not even on the wet palette and don't even really need to thin it down. Like... um it just goes on one coat. That's the, the difficulty time. with using air paints for brush painting is on the upside, they're pre-thinned, but on the downside, they're pre-thinned, if you get what I mean. I get what you mean, but I think with this one specifically, um, I mean, you don't sound like you need to try it because you've got your Holy Trinity on lock. But, uh, <laughs> but for me, it was like, just a trick that I saw someone mention. I don't know if it was someone on the team or if it was just something I saw online. And I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. And um, it's, yeah, it's one of my go-tos for, for base coat and silver now. It's just so easy. Um, goes on so easy. It's easy to highlight because it's a little bit darker than... Um, this is a rival pick. I feel like you're specifically targeting... Yeah. 
Um, I'm, on purpose, I'm putting all the others in front of your <laughs> ones on the on the shrine. Um, yeah, I think I, I've actually got I've got your one as well, and I just haven't haven't revisited it that much, if I'm honest. But um, maybe I need to. They are quite similar as well, actually. <laughs> Look at that. They are a, very gun, similar. Gun, gun metal was a little bit darker, I think. Yeah. A little bit. Um, I mean, I, I I think one of the things that with airbrush metallics is that they do go on very well with a brush, as in the coverage. Like, I, I, whereas sometimes with an airbrush paint, like more uh, more of a, a normal color, acrylic color, they don't cover as well sometimes with the with. It's the, also the like because it's design for the airbrush the flex are like non-existent so you do actually get a bit of a different look mm. um i would yeah. say that the one downside or upside whatever you you know depends what side of the fence you're sitting on um is that the flex aren't very visible yeah so yeah. if you prefer to have a smoother look to your metallics then that's going to help if you like the, the flex they're not really going to be there to be honest and especially once you wash it and varnish it and stuff like that it can look a little bit flat if you don't if you don't varnish it properly yeah um but i do like the finished look of it really so yeah um, i think it was with the scale if you've got such tiny flex on it as well you haven't got like these huge flex on the on the, on the models that are only 28 mil as well yeah that for smaller yeah. flex it just looks more i don't say natural but it looks a bit more a bit more in keeping with the size of the model as well yeah um, i think you could potentially argue yeah because of the the varnish and stuff like that it does end up requiring a little bit more work because you have to do some highlighting and shading yeah, yeah. yourself a little bit more than a, a yeah. flecky metallic paint would yeah. would allow you to to leave off so yeah um yeah but i like it and george's one sucks next <laughs> <laughs> come on george last up no it doesn't really i actually like the scale ones as well the scale ones are phenomenal they are good yeah right my last one then i'm putting up for the everyman sarah from sepia what a paint yeah fair fair I, I to be fair i haven't used it that much recently but it's a it's a legend. It's yeah, it's right up there. Like I said, in terms of paints you can't replace, that's probably GW washes. I don't know what it is about them. It's just something. They've always been phenomenal. Right yeah. back to the days of of um, uh, Griffin Sepia um, and all the old old ones with through. Like their 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 washes, GW washes, always been um, really good. Like before, even before the, in the infamous number of like Bad Ad Black um, wash was amazing as well. So they've just always been phenomenal at producing them. I tell you what, I would have loved to have been around when washes or like shade paints were released for the first time. Do you remember like the first time you used a wash and like how I, mind I remember, it was? Well, one I almost brought in uh, similar along the lines of that was the Army Paint uh, Strong Toe mm. because that's that was a paint that was like I was told about as soon as I started painting and. Um, I believe the the friend that that told me about it basically said um, it doesn't it literally doesn't matter what you've done slap that on it and you'll <laughs> it, it'll look it'll look a lot better which when I was first learning how to paint yeah hundred percent it did as I a beginner that, for sure I slapped yeah. that on it and I was like I'm actually incredible <laughs> um, I remember I remember having a similar moment I remember when I was like a kid doing Warhammer for like the first time I was like just base coating everything like just painting everything like blocking in. And then I remember my uncle, who was, like, who was a model maker at the time, he showed me like washes and he was like, I'll try this. And he like bought me one of the Citadel washes and I put it over the model. I was like, oh. I know, yeah. right? Like, so yeah, I would have loved to have been around and painting and like, you know, maybe a few years into painting when they brought them out for the first time to experience those for the first time. That must have been absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> they, 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 have, they have been around for a long, long, long time. Like, it, what it, like, like this range of paints obviously you've got before the range that they've got currently and just talking about names and stuff like that you had obviously the previous previous paint range to the one we've got currently with games workshop but even before that even back in the og like second ed days you, you did have washes within within those as well so you had like orc wash or orc flesh wash you had flesh wash which is an infamous one as well so they were around but I, what i think it was is that you you the the system as in the base coat wash like highlight that that wasn't as much in place in those days um but yeah like sepia i use it for everything i use it for skin scrolls like materials like everything's phenomenal, phenomenal. good on a bit of parchment that i think yeah, when i was first starting great. i was the yeah. uh use agrax for everything kind of like your uh yeah, strong, strong tone, tone. Yeah. but uh transitioning out of that and uh using the sepia yeah, they're, yeah they're, it's, it's, it's great really really recommended i'm sure everyone watching this has either used it at some point so it's yeah it's brilliant Good little set of paints, really. I don't know what you'd paint with it if you went and got all. Of I, I'm but... actually the thing. The thing that's funniest about this is at the end of that, if you had just that to paint a model, you would 
You'd have a pretty bad time. Yeah. I'm sure you come up with actually something all right. Actually. You'd have to paint a a sort of off looking blood angel, I think. <laughs> I think it's all you'd get out of it. There's a lot of like <laughs> yeah, yeah, washes yeah. and metallics going on there. So basically and what what base paints we've got? We've got ice yellow, we've got black, and we've got the red. That's about all you could use. And the right oxide. So you're either painting a I'd have to do some black templars, maybe. Yeah. Just it's... ice yellow into the yeah, black for your yeah. highlights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised what you can do with it. There'd be quite a lot you can do. Red um, eyes. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Good. Um Good. Yeah, so maybe you do need a few more then <laughs> than, than that. It turns out, uh, yeah, even... It didn't end up being the perfect shopping list I was hoping it ended up being, <laughs> if I was honest. Right, I've got a game for us. Game show time. We've done underrated, overrated. I'm back again. We're doing round two. We should probably keep a tally for like maybe who's winning these. They're not really like a point system. It's not really a winnable thing, but maybe like who... who the, read the best answer. The, or, the best answers are the, who the audience agreed with a lot of the time. Yeah. The plan. We might have to keep this running. Right, I've got a new one. This is the classic Would You Rather. Warhammer Painting Edition, of course. So I've come up with a few Would You Rather questions that you can ponder and we can discuss. I've got a few here for you. Right, are you ready? As ever, always. Number one. This is for the both of you. Would you rather only be able to use a size triple zero brush for one year or only be able to use a size 10 brush for one year? I, I'm I'm going to use the triple zero and I'm just going to dedicate myself to only painting epic scale models. <laughs> and then within a year, I'm going to be the best epic scale painter you've ever seen in your life. I can't believe you've cracked You've like cracked the case for this. Yeah. That's a massive loophole that I was not anticipating. Yeah. And then I'll be like, yeah, I'll be winning it's GDs and everything. Oh. Epic scale. Yeah. Well. So I'm going to answer this understanding that it's the only thing you can paint with. And that's the way that I'm looking at. Mm. So I'm going to He's going to do the opposite. He's going to start gonna, tightening on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with a size 10 um because it should have a really good tip on it which means you can still do detailed stuff but i am not sitting there blocking in models with a triple zero i'm sorry it just is not happening like uh and i don't want to paint a titan army so yeah size size 10 all day long all day long what are you going to paint with that everything all of it all of it i'll paint up you know I'll paint. every Every model. Yeah, every all model, of them. everything. All of the models. I'll paint all the models. Yeah. I mean, that's a challenge waiting to happen, isn't it? I still think you could paint Epic with a size 10. We should do a video, right? I'll do a model with a triple zero only, and you do a model with a size that, 10. That should only. be a face-off. We should have like an equivalent. Uh, we should get an Epic Rhino and a normal size Rhino. Yeah, what I'll if do, he's got the triple zero? <laughs> Wait, while, you're, while you're spending three hours blocking it in with the, with the uh, triple zero. No, no, zero. I'll do an Epic Rhino with my triple zero. Oh, you that, do a normal Rhino with your size 10. That'd be the twist. We could do it the other way around. You've got to paint an Epic Rhino <laughs> with a size 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I reckon, I reckon that'd be fun. Um, no, I'd go size 10 all day long. Okay, right. Next up, this is uh, going along with the theme of things you've got to live without. Oh, God. Would you rather no wet palette or no painting lamp? Um, so the little light on my magnifiers, <laughs> <laughs> does that, oh, that the magnifiers as... will come in handy with a size triple zero epic thing. That's true. Well. No, it's true. Um, true. Does that count as a painting lamp? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there we go. I'll have my wet palette and I'll have my, my light on my No, you know, no, no, like just room. Well, I guess, I guess you could oh, so adapt. it does count as a painting lamp. All right. No, no, I'll no. get rid of the, I'll get rid of the, uh, wet palette then. I need a lamp. I need a lamp. We're opposite ends of the spectrum again. Wet palette. I, I've got uh, daylight bulbs in my room. so uh, James is going to be painting outside in the sun. No, <laughs> yeah. I, I've got spotlights in my painting room. So, and they're, they're white as anything. So I, I will take the, I will take the, the, the wet palette. There, is, there is zero chance that downlighting from the ceiling is going to be as good. It's going to be... It's not going to be as good, but... It's I, not going to be... It's not only not going to be as good. Maybe the dry palette as good as a wet palette. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm going wet palette all day long. I feel like that's going to be atrocious though, because the, the shadows have got to be probably quite extreme, right? No, I think do you know what? I think your eyes get used to used to how much paint you put in a certain area and how you have, uh, do stuff. I think obviously the lighting does obviously help you to see in depth what you're doing. But I, I I think muscle memory and also like the memory of how you paint stuff doesn't really you don't lose your approach to painting because of the light. So I I would to be <laughs> fair, if you look at the paints that I'm using, I kind of need a bit of dark to see them. If you're using this, yeah. I think you'll be all right. Yeah. I love that he said that philosophically as if he's going to paint like a blind man. Yeah. Like you, yeah. you don't even need the light. You can just feel the color. Yeah. 
he's got the false. He's like uh, Donny Yen in the <laughs> Yeah, no, I, no, wet palette. I that is coming with, with the me. paint. The painters with me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. amen. Yeah, no, I, I would go wet palette all day long. Yeah, right. This is going to be uh, this. This is targeted at you too specifically. This might not translate as well for the listeners. But okay. Would you rather never paint another Space Marine again? Yep. Or paint an entire Stormcast army in non-metallic metal? I uh, I think I'd be quite happy to never paint a Space Marine again. I do like them, but there's so much other stuff. I can see the wheels turning in James's yeah, head. Think, James is yeah. much more diehard Space Marine fanboy than yeah, me. Yeah, I'm like. gonna have to. I'm gonna have to say uh, I go for the go for the Stormcast. I I, I love Marines. So yeah. Do you dislike Stormcast? No, but they're just they're just fantasy Marines. I life. actually I actually don't mind Stormcast, but I I couldn't I couldn't. <laughs> A full army of NMM Stormcast. So, so I don't think I could do a full NMM no, I, army of I any. Can't, I don't think I could do. But if you told me I had to just do NMM on the blades of the Stormcast army, I think I'd still, no, I'd still I, say no. I, let alone the full. Or I would, but then the color scheme that I come up with for the Stormcast would hardly have any metal on it. I there's my workaround. I'm dedicated to uh, working around your. Your little games that you have here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a, a, a way out. There's of a plot hole in all of these questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going, I'm going Stormcast. Like irrelevant if it's full NMM or like number one. It's something that for me is something that I've, I've not properly approached or had the, had the sort of confidence to fully do. So it gives me to live by the, what I preach, which is push myself outside my comfort zone. I would dive headfirst into doing it, even though yeah. if they don't look very good, it means I can still paint Marines. I'm just saying bye to. No, nah, I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I, I can't. Would you rather paint a Warlord Titan, full size one, full drop one, but Joe, every single piece, every single piece is in a sub assembly, or paint an Imperial Knight army, but with no spray cans and no airbrush? <laughs> um. So the t- the Titan, every single individual piece. Not it's not actual sub assemblies. It's every piece. You got to paint each piece one by one before gluing anything together. I I mean I'd rather I don't know pay one of you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose if I had to pick one, I would succumb to the sub assembly because at least I have a Titan at the end of that one. I would hate, just to clarify, I would hate either one of those. But uh, yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll pick I'll pick the Titan sub-assembly thing. I will say, a Knight Titan Army, thing. Knight Army, it's not that many models. Yeah, but, but the entire thing, by, uh, so I've got to prime it by brush as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah see, it's not going to happen, is it? I'm going to end up with a, <laughs> with a rubbish Knight Army or I'll end up with a decent Titan. But if, so. you, use, if you use your size 10 brush with a bit of that primer. <laughs> <laughs> no, remember, I'm still using a triple zero at this point. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm taking the Titan. He's been brewing. Look at him. Put put the work in. I put a lot of thought into this. Work. I'm going night army all day long, all day long. So you're priming with a brush, sponge paint, priming sponge. You said priming that? with a sponge. Mm-hmm. Get your paint on the palette, sponge, 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 sponge. You could just dry brush the army, as and well. then you dry brush it all yeah. day long. No, he's got a good one there. All day long. And then you can still paint all the details normally. I didn't realise there were so many plot holes in all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> I love that in the spirit of the question, you're not like, hmm, which one would I rather do? It's how can while, I wriggle out of while, this situation? Yeah. <laughs> while while Joe, Joe was like struggling to stop spontaneously combusting at the thought of sub-assemblies, I was, I was like, I'm going to sponge the crap out of it. Don't worry, Joe, though. You could, you could use your magnifier still. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going, I'm going night army. Right. In a less uh, negative thing you've got to live without, this is on the upswing now. Which would you rather get? An unlimited supply of retro paints or an unlimited... Whatever the next one is. <laughs> or an unlimited supply of retro models. Oh, oh, yeah, definitely that one. Retro models. 100% for me, retro models. Can I... Can I, I just ask- want to say, he has an unlimited supply <laughs> of retro <laughs> paints. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question? It doesn't mean we're going to take that away. No, no, no. Can I ask a question, though, however? Are the models sealed or unsealed? They're sealed, brand new. Oh, the new models all day. You can't sell them though. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's models, isn't it? Models. I've got the paint. 
I want the models. It's only because he's got the paint. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's assume you had no paint. Oh, right? okay. If you had to trade in your paint. Yeah, all of your paints have, have, have burned in a fire. You've got paint. no paint. I was going the paints. Yeah, I'm going paint. Fair. Yeah. Well, there we go. So you can paint my models for me. I wouldn't. No. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't let you. Open We're boxes. doing up on that one. You could. You could team up. Actually, if one oh. of you, if you, if you went in this together, yeah, yeah. one of you said, "Right, you take the paint, I'll take the model." I would, we'll just I do would, some swaps. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't let him open the seal boxes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Would you rather be given the strength of an Astartes or be given the skill of Darren Latham? <laughs> <laughs> Which superpower would you like? I feel like. Uh, for me, the strength of the starters is more attainable naturally than, <laughs> than the, uh, the, to me, the Darren Latham skill level seems so out of reach that I would have to cheat and take that one, I think. I'm going to ask a question. When you say strength of the Astartes, does that mean you get the longevity of an Astartes? No, it says the strength. It's in the question. Just the strength. You don't get the life expectancy then. You're still no. walking around as James Otero, the human being. You're just going to be can... James Otero, the human being, who is still five for eight, but you also happen to be out of deadlift, yeah. like a building. You can just do like jam jars a lot easier and stuff. Or harder. You might actually crack the jam jars. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to go with skill. Because taking, I was hoping taking you, skill. I, I was hoping you were going to say you get the life expectancy because then I'll take that and then I'll just spend every single second of that I still don't think you reach it. I don't think you have a five hundred your life yeah, expectancy. Yeah. You could give me a little time. You, you, I'm could, not you, could, that. you could try at least. I don't yeah, think this yeah. is a time issue. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sitting there going, if only I had more time. <laughs> if only I had more time of the day, it could be just like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. If you've got like a thousand years, it's a long time to practice. No chance, mate. It's not happening. It's not happening. Not for me. Yeah. It's got... Maybe for you, not for me. It's got, yeah, if you don't get the life expense, then I'm just going to say get the skill straight away. Yeah. That really proves what nerds we are, that we would all like, nah, don't you know that strength, don't you be buff. <laughs> yeah, skill. Definitely. Completely thrown out the window, like all the practical life advantages of being like the strongest person yeah. on the planet. Like, don't worry, don't need that. Yeah. Right, brilliant. You could argue better strength does inherently give you better life expectancy but that's a different conversation no I that's suppose. why I asked the question because I was like if, yeah. if you get the life expectancy not the life expectancy of the starties but it would give you better yeah, life no, expectancy no I'd go for skill right. you might get a few more years to, to paint yeah skill skill <laughs> We wanted to let you know that tickets are now on sale for our Sears Studios painting courses, which we'll be running all across the UK in the coming months. For over eight years, Sears Studios have been running in-depth, hands-on classes all across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting proficiency. With a mixture of topics available, all our classes are taught by senior artists and they feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you. We have discussions on theory, an open Q&A session at the end of every course, and you can ask that burning question that you've had on your mind for weeks. You can even bring your models along for feedback. For more information and to book a ticket now, head to seedstudios.co.uk forward slash shop. Right, question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. Please leave a comment below or reply to our Instagram story if you'd like to leave a question for next week's episode. We have this week, what sizes of brushes do we like to use? Quite a general one, that. Yeah, yeah. I've come with a. I've come with props for this question. Okay. Yeah, we weren't told about the props. But yeah, I just want to give it. I was not told I needed to bring right. brushes I, to to redeem the fact of I could. I was supposed to only live about three paints, and I actually yeah. had five. I couldn't narrow it down. I could definitely only live with two sizes of brushes, and I know that for a fact because I literally do that now. Yeah. Right. A two and a zero. Done. I want unlimited size twos, unlimited size zeros. <laughs> yeah. Those two in, com in conjunction, size two, big enough belly that it holds paint, doesn't dry out, but still small enough that I can use it for edge highlighting, Edges use it for fine stuff. detail work. Yeah. And then the zero just for the things that the uh, that the two can't get at in a tight gap or something like that. Paint some eyes on a face. I think I'm I'm similar with a size two. I'll I'll try and use just through pure laziness the same brush for for as much as possible. Um I think probably base coating I'll go a bit larger, but then yeah, majority of the model I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use probably a size two. I think if I could, the thing I struggle with is I, I would want a size three or maybe even a four, but what I tend to find is they don't get like fatter, they mm -hmm. get a bit longer. longer at those sizes. It's not until you get to five, six, they get fatter, maybe four in some brands, but um, in my head, a size three, 
that was fatter than the size two would be perfect. But yeah, mostly a size two. I like that sentiment, I think, actually. Yeah. yeah. Size four to the zero. Size four and a trip. That's the extreme end of those spectrum. Yeah. 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 Size four, triple zero, all day long and twice on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think I really, obviously, to preface for a lot of listeners and stuff as well, I'm definitely not doing as much fine detail work as you two, but I don't think I've really ever touched a triple zero. I haven't found. They dry too quick for me. A use personally for a triple zero. It's literally zero. like, I'm. Um, even though I'm using a wet palette, so I've got my triple zero. And then in the time it takes from moving my hand from the palette to the model, the, the brush is already dry. Yeah, I feel like you have all, to put all, so all much paint on it but all you got for do... it to stay like n not dry yeah. that uh, by the time you put that much paint on it, you and then you, use it. And then you get brush. that tiny little like dried like bead on the end <laughs> on the tip. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think if you, if you just incrementally knock the dilution down a little bit, so it doesn't dry as quick on the on the brush for a smaller brush. Obviously, it's a small brush head. So if you just step the dilution down slightly, as in just really refinely dilute it down, it will stay. It will still stay wet while workable. Um, but yeah, size four. Size four, you're quite right. Some brands have a big, bit more, bit more. Uh, it is inherent to the brand, right? Because like a size yeah. zero from like Rosemary is oh, different all, to a size zero from Windsor. Yeah, right. yeah, they're all different. Like they're all different in that they vary in length and in, yeah. in in thickness of uh, or filled pack of, of of hair in the head. So yeah, they do vary, but. Um, yeah, for me, the size four, size size four, and size triple zero all day long. Like they, they, they just, it just covers the, each end of the spectrum, and the four can, with pressure management, you can control it down to to less work. New uh, newish segment on the on the topic of question of the week. We're going to go through uh, some of the viewers' comments from last week's episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got a bit, uh, got some spicy responses. Yeah, there. we got uh, a few people <laughs> didn't, didn't quite like the clip that we put out on Instagram. A fair, no, few people did, to be fair, but a few people didn't. Uh, what were your What are your thoughts on uh, on the conversation? If you didn't, if you didn't listen to last week's uh, episode, please don't go. Do go and listen to that. That was with uh, Stephen Box from Vanguard Tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a bit about the uh, the competitive play and the painting sort of thing. Um, let's Let's address some of these. Um, Crisis Pro to Paint says. Yeah, nah, we don't need this kind of weird grind the fun out of everything mindset. I, I think with it, so on a, on a personal level, I think you, you would both understand that in general, I kind of agree with that sentiment. Um, and we talk about it all the time and how much I absolutely detest the thing that I think this commenter thinks that Boxy's doing in that comment, which is the the grind set influencer businessy thing. But I don't think so so I agree with that sentiment, but I don't actually think in context of that episode and knowing who Stephen is and knowing what Stephen brings to the community. Yeah. I don't think that's actually what he's doing. So I get I get the 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 sentiment and maybe maybe out of context, not knowing who he is or or not knowing what the conversation was in a broader sense which is natural for, for a clip that we post on Instagram. Um, I can see why people might have got that end of it, mm -hmm. but... Um, I don't think that's invalid either, because like, like you said, I'm sure where you're going, this is, we, we don't want to do that either, right? Like, yeah, exactly. This, yeah. It's a difficult thing because like, obviously we're being professional painters and there are obviously professional gamers and there's a whole spectrum that there is within this hobby. You've got the people that just do it in the evening when they get home from work that, for some fun. That's exactly, and then we, yeah. obviously, it being our jobs, we take it to... The extreme end of that. I mean, we love entering competitions, and but again, I think even even when you're saying we there, like I think I, anyone that thinks that we're pushing grind the fun out of everything, I would highly recommend probably the first two episodes of this podcast where we were really kind of laying down our thoughts on a few things as yeah, an introduction yeah. to people, and I, I feel like I, I actually remember finishing the second episode and I thought that I didn't stop banging on about only doing things for fun. Yeah. And like, so even within this rotation of people on this podcast, obviously Stephen was a guest. He's not part of the podcast and I don't want to start talking for him. I'm sure he'll be back, but we, we all love him. Back in some time. Um, future. So, but, but for me, like the fun is the most important thing. And I've gone over that multiple times. Obviously again, it's a clip, it's a guest. Um, so I get the sentiment of that and I actually agree with it. But I think all we need to do is remember that everyone's goals are different. And well, some people, like... In the context of that conversation, we were talking about succeeding and being the very best and being having the mindset and focus and stuff like that. So those kind of 
conversations lead to to clips like that. I guess. It, it, I think, all I would say is like I, I completely understand where that, where they're coming from, but but at the same time, like within within this industry and within the hobby, you do have completely different approaches to to doing it. That's the beauty of the hobby that we've got. Like you can take you can do it purely for fun. You can do things, but if you do want to push it to an extreme or do something at the, at, you know at the leading curve then then you can and i think that that there's nothing inherently wrong with either approach to it at all whatsoever but the way that steve approaches stuff is, is because of his background and because of the way the things he's always done he's always been in that mindset um, which again i think the context of the episode in full does help that got another one here which is a really positive one thank you very much it's a uh, really enjoyed this episode Hope to see Stephen back as a frequent guest. Uh, such great chemistry chemistry amongst the group. Thank you for that. Uh, this makes me think back to when Stephen ran the Daily Gauntlet during the pandemic to help uh, us all get a moment of joy in the day with a great discussion around the hobby. Uh, it says this format is a real differentia- differentiator for Siege. I mean, thank you very much. What was the yeah. name of the... the... It's uh, Car X or Born. I mean, that's okay, quite good. Cool. Yeah, yeah. give you that. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that... Touching on that last bit there, uh, this being like differentiate for us. Obviously, we did the main the main aim of this podcast is to be. There's a lot of uh, miniature painting podcasts and uh, hobby podcasts. We do want to keep ourselves slightly different to uh, to everyone yeah. else. So obviously, if you do have any suggestions for segments or topics that you want to see, then uh, we really do appreciate your feedback. If you don't want to leave a comment as well. You can always drop a, a DM to to the accounts on Instagram or on social media. Yeah. yeah, I think it was nice as well to get some that kind of exactly touches on the point that I was just talking about about if you know Steve and you know how he is within the community is probably not the what some of those other comments were suggesting um yeah. it's so. like that it's like that iceberg thing like I, i'll say like you see the tip of it you see the top of it you don't see all the stuff underneath and beneath beneath the competitive and beneath the sort of like the hard work drive you know there i've known steve for many years and like he has got a side where he does like to chill out he does like to have a, have a laugh you know like we've spoken about playing lord of the rings like you know just yeah, yeah for, like, for a laugh and stuff so it is there definitely but um but regards to sort of like the podcast and stuff yeah like we, we are trying to do something a bit different um than what we normally do and, and just really sort of give back as much as we physically can i think giving back value is something that we're all really keen on and um if you get something from this then let us know in the comments yeah i'd be curious to know from you as well uh, for the listeners what you're doing while you listen to the podcast yeah, is, this yeah like a, nice. is this a background hobby thing for you are you uh you driving to work listening to this let yeah. us know yeah it's fine i've seen people reference um uh a, whether a, i saw a discussion on someone about whether a podcast is a monitor one podcast or a monitor two podcast <laughs> i like that yeah and i'd like to know whether we're a monitor one as in you have to watch it and sit down and enjoy it maybe you're having a snack or we're a monitor two which means we're off to the side while you're painting or something like Playing that. Playing Baldur's Gate or something. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got one last one here, which is uh, Coma8203 says, still wish the episodes were longer. Well, they are now. Yeah, they I, are now. I hope you made it far <laughs> enough into this to see your comment. Yeah. Um, and like we said earlier, we had a few comments about this and we just thought, you know what? Um, initially, we were keeping them short for just the fact that we didn't know whether people would want them longer or not. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the more we got into it, the more comments we got like that. And we thought, you know what? Also, we enjoy doing it. So, of course. Yeah. Of course. New uh, closing tradition, hopefully. Hobby hacks. Right. This is going to be our last little roundup before the end of the show. Mm-hmm. Quick little uh, quick little tip you might want to share with, uh, with the listeners. I'll, I'll go with my first one. Joe, I thought of this one just for you. This is a tip if you're doing your... That's su- good because I haven't got one. So <laughs> <to do one. laughs> tip for you, Joe, if you're doing your sub-assemblies because I know you're a big fan. Yeah. Well, when I'm painting my Titan. <laughs> when you're painting your Titan, bear this one in mind. Uh, super glue. Use it for its weakness, which is the fact of it's not that strong. Might be called super glue. Unfortunately, on plastic models, it's not very super. This is where sub assemblies possibly get a bad rap, right? Because like when you finish painting the thing, you put it back together, it doesn't necessarily fit perfectly, whatever. What I like to do is if there's, when I'm building a model, and I know there's a part I'm going to want to paint separately. I'll put it together with the tiniest, tiniest dot of super glue, and that way, I, when I can build the model fully, and I can prime it as normal, and then when I'm in the painting process down the line, even when I'm like halfway through, it's not like before I paint, I'll just snap that piece off, and then I can put that on a separate little sub assembly. Now it's out of the way, I can do what I need to do, and then I can plastic glue it back on okay. after the fact. Okay, I might give it a go. Yeah. Maybe I'll give it a go and report back. There you go. Find out um, next week how Joe got on with his uh, Titan. Look, next week? I'm not doing that quick. What, um, what, you're not building your Titan in a week? 
<laughs> well, no, wait, wait, wasn't I? Allowed, I wasn't. Allowed, oh no, I was allowed to use sprays with the Titan. That was the thing of it being. Yeah, okay, yeah you can yeah, use fine. sprays. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone else have got any uh, any hobby hacks? Yeah, I do. I'm gonna add a brother to your one, which is um, if you do use weak super glue, then you need to get mitre bond in your life. Uh, it's a building trade glue uh, that comes with an activator. So you can either have it weak by using a spot weld with the activator, the, the spray can activator, or if you leave it to air dry, the, the mitre bond, uh, it, it literally glues like cement and it will glue anything together. Super, super strong. It literally glues bricks together in the building trade. So um, I would recommend picking up some mitre There's bonds. no way that it literally, there's no way that there are tradesmen there with their <laughs> just spray glue. can of activator with their <laughs> bricks. They're like, don't need them all. Well, no, the <laughs> activator makes it weaker. Yeah. You, but then the 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 actual strength of the mite bond, I don't have an issue with. The thing with me is that the the bottle and everything for for miniatures, I just oh, you know what, John? I'm throwing in another hobby hack, right? They sell little disposable like needle applicators. You love a a, a third party bottle, yeah? Don't you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe does. that's my thing. Yeah, but I always. I always saw those on like Amazon and stuff, and I just assumed that like oh, they probably won't be the right size, or whatever. Apparently, super glue is just like a default industry Universal. standard size. Yeah. So you buy those little uh, those little needle applicators. They're they're brilliant. I don't they're think brilliant. it'll be mitre bond. Mitre bond, no, but big old. Mite, it won't work for mitre bond. I'm saying for the for the yeah. super glue. Yeah. That is why I don't like the mitre bond. It's the uh, it's not yeah, very precise. No, it's not yeah. as precise, but it, it it is mega for glue. Like it's the best super glue on the market. Like yeah, it comes from building trades. So if it can do what it does in building trade, it was fine on. Plastic and metal. Resin I like the uh, while we're all while we're all doing uh, super glue recommendations. I can't remember the exact uh, the exact thing, but there's a a lock type one, which has like a plastic sort of apparatus with it that lets you be a bit more precise. And that one in particular, just like the consistency of the glue and the strength. The strength is quite good, but the consistency of it uh, and the way it applies is like perfect for miniatures. Yeah. Um, I'll maybe drop a comment with the exact thing because I completely can't remember this at all. I'll yeah. put it in the description. We'll put, we'll put some links in for different ones or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You heard about the new Golden Demon categories? Yes. Yeah. I have, yes. It's yes. all talk of the town this week in the, uh, in the hobby space. Yeah, it's a bit of a shake-up, isn't it? It's exciting, I think. Should we, uh, should we read them off? So, for those who don't know, uh, Golden Demon rules for Adepticon 2024 have been announced. Mm hmm and there's some changes to some of the categories, and there's some new ones. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of a mix, really. You've got some categories that have been consolidated into just one, and they've got some that used to be just one broken down into multiple. So category list for Adepticon 24 is for 40K, uh, single miniature, unit, or kill team. So that used to be just unit, or squad, sorry. Uh, we've got Warhammer 40,000, large model or vehicle. Then for AOS, single miniature, unit or Warcry Warband. So that's now one category. Uh, large model or War Machine for AOS as well. Then Middle Earth has got its own category, as it always has. Horus Heresy has now got its own category as an umbrella category. Uh, Underworlds, own category. Necromunda has got its own category. Blood Bowl has got its own category. Epic Scale has got its own category. Uh, then there's Young Bloods and Open, which is the same as before. And now Diorama and Jewel are one category. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, where to start, really? I think it's uh, obviously they've released the, the category list and they haven't released, as far as I'm aware, the rules. I don't yeah. think the new rules pack's been released yet. So the rules so pack hasn't been released. Wrong. So we've been we've been told the, the the category list and not the rules. So it's hard to know exactly what they're angling for with certain things. But it seems to me like like how do you it, it seems like they're just giving themselves a bit more freedom to go, oh, I feel like that actually fits into this other category. Yeah, because, there is that, yeah. Because there's so many models now that could fit into a few different categories, if that makes sense. Mm. Like a Necromunda single model or whatever is still a 40K single model. Or like within Necromunda now, is the rules pack for Necromunda going to be that it needs to be a full team? Or is that going to include single miniatures as well? Not like, sure. It's so... It, uh, the ones with, about the games, like the 
Underworlds, Necromunda, Blood Bowl just seem so like open to me at the minute. Like they, they, I don't know what their rules are going to be. Do I, do you know, I, mean? I, I think it's a bit of a test, really. And I think, I think number one, I think it's actually quite good that they're marrying a lot of the game systems. I think because if you only, if you only say paint Warcry or if you paint Underworlds or whatever, um, you might not be so inclined to want to go into the fantasy squad category or the Age of Sigmar category perhaps because it's so stacked yeah but... yeah so for having your own category for the models that you love and for the game system you play it maybe reduces the barrier to entry a little bit for people potentially um which is another way to look at it I, th I think that obviously GD's been going for a long time uh the categories have obviously grown and diversified as the years have passed and things have moved around we've had changes throughout the competition through the years that I've been into it and through I've known known of it um I think it is actually quite good that certain game systems, because the thing is, I know you could argue, well, a Terminator Praetor is very similar to a Terminator Captain from 40K. And I know that, but I think that it's not so much on the specific model. I think it's more on the the narrative of the, the IP of the game and they're wanting to create a category for each of the different game systems, which makes sense. Um, it's like, for example, the Epic one, you can put in old retro metal epic models. You can put in Adeptus Titanicus. You can put in Battlefleet Gothic. You can put in uh, like loads of different models from loads of different ranges, which is good. And I think it gives every, someone who potentially just paints X game system the opportunity to go, well, I have something for me now. It's just giving that diversity of game system in the competition. Um, so do you think, for example, I mean, it's all guesswork, isn't it? But do you think, Someone who's someone who enters who wants to enter a single model that's from Underworlds, for example. Surely that will get pushed into AOS single potentially, figure, but they don't, rather it, it, than being in the Underworlds category, which seems more like if you're if you're giving bands. a whole category to a game that has small squads. Yeah, surely the but but that's the thing though because you've got some of these game systems are broader than others, right? So Necromunda having its own category, the Necromunda range is much more compressed in what's within it. But if you look at like Horus Heresy, that's anything from a full size Titan to a Mark IV Marine. Yeah, Whereas if you look at Necromunda, it's mostly war bands of a similar size, right? I think I think uh, because obviously I'm, again at the time of recording this, I haven't seen the new rules for the for, for it. But I think once the rules are released and the clarifications are released, I think it will qualm a lot of people's reservations if they've got any. Um, yeah, I think that you thing is is if you don't diversify and try new things, it's it will stagnate over time. I think. I still think, I think, think it. I think it's cool on the whole. Like, there's so many categories now as well. It gives you so many more good. opportunities yeah. to to enter. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I, I think they because at the at first. The the I think there's like a thousand entries. I don't know what exactly the number was, but I think it's like it's the I know it was the most entries I've ever seen at Golden. We've Demon. all guessed roughly a thousand. Yeah, right? like it, it's, the... it was like the most entries I've ever seen, and I think that shows how far the interest in GD and the amount of people that are improving as a painter to to want to enter or pushing themselves to enter competitions. That shows how much it's grown over the last you know three years, even with lockdown and pandemic and stuff. So I think the re rejigging of categories and also opening up of different things has kind of always kind of been on the horizon, I think, with the way that things have happened. Um, if single figures are allowed in some of these broken down categories, I'm intrigued to see if 40K single fig remains the, the toughest well, comp. I, I think it will because when you look at it, those, so 40K single fig, historically, I... I'm not some big like GD buff or anything, but I wouldn't assume that a lot of say like Necromunda models. I, I wouldn't say Necromunda made up a lot of percentage of entries. real estate in the single fig 40k. But do you think that's universe. because it didn't have its own category before? Well, no, no. I'm saying like because I, I don't think I would have seen loads. So I don't think and, and Necromunda is is that the only one that's 40k based that's separated. Well, looking out. at last year's categories. I think like all the smaller game systems like Necromunda and that basically went into the 40k category. That's what I'm saying. So, and I don't, 
I don't think that that made up a huge percentage of the single fig 40k. But do you category, think that's because so they didn't think they could get a look in because that model compared to a 40k model wouldn't compete as well? I Therefore, don't know. I you don't didn't know. see much Necromunda. I don't know. I think it's probably just because if you're going to paint a single figure from 40k, you're going to pick a 40k model. Yeah, I, I, I'm more. I don't, not that it doesn't happen, and there's some really cool models in those other game systems. The one that it benefits most from i think is like, i've always banged on about how the underworlds models are so cool yeah yeah they are good um yeah. so if you can do a single I, I think you'd find more people wanting to enter a single underworlds model into aos single figure I, I, and i don't know whether they're going to be allowed to do that now i don't I no think it, i don't think it will be i think underworlds will be the the, the full warband i think that, that that in my mind that's why i would read it purely because uh, if you if they if they are going down the line of by game system, if you think of it that way, for me that would mean that um, for specifically for that category that you would have to paint the warband, which does make. But the only thing that's missing then, if I look at that, is Horus Heresy has its own cat, whereas it used to be Horus Heresy squad was in forty k squad. Yeah. So that would mean in terms of warbands, you could have one from every single game system as a squad in its own category, other than Horus Heresy. So essentially, there's like six squad cats basically. Yeah, but I'm yeah. saying the interesting thing is that would be but bar, Horus, Heresy, bar Horus Heresy, right? But that, look, they do, they obviously do it by interest in the game system. Like that's why Middle Earth is all in its on its own as well. Like that's not there's not Middle Earth. Well, do you, do you know, that's a really good point. What was it last? Sorry, what was it last year for Middle Earth? Last year was just the the same scenario of Middle Earth. Just had its it was own. just a Middle Earth. Yeah. So this is the thing. So like I can't. I'm trying to scratch my brain and remember, but the last couple of times I've looked in the Middle Earth category at, at fest and also at the gd that was at warhammer world um and thinking right back to other uh, even ones that were uh, in coventry but um before pandemic and stuff um i don't remember whether there were four units or if it was just single figures in i, I think in, i think in lord of the rings it was just single figures but i think that wasn't a stipulation of the category i think that was just what people did i think that's the case yeah so that could point to all it, previous Middle Earth categories then, rules wise, could point towards what they're going to do for Underworlds category, Necromunda category, um, Blood Bowl category. It's interesting though, because I obviously someone's going to turn up with a, a jewel based in, on Blood Bowl or something. That's obviously going to get put in the dual diorama. I would category, guess so. Right? Well, yeah. that's that's yeah. the uh, the elephant in the room. Well, this is dual and diorama are now one category. Well, yeah, so that's, yeah. let's talk about that then. The, the, I I know, like for example, like Mark Lifton, one someone I know, like he 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 he's like prolific at jewels. That's like think his thing. He loves a good jewel, and um, um, and he's won loads, obviously, for how skilled and talented he is. But but the thing is, is like the jewel obviously is quite focused, um, and obviously that's the one that I won my one with in 2018 like it, it's just two two models obviously facing off whereas obviously a diorama is that is that but but magnified but it doesn't really hang on the interaction as much i would say it's more about the scene so from a judging perspective you're then going to be judging against the composition of the piece how the models will interact with each other and the overall look of it and then you're going to be judging almost that but really granular between two models i don't think from a judging perspective, I don't. I know a lot of people love dual and love diorama separately as their things, but I think from a judging perspective, there's not really too much difference in the way that you would look at those two things in my mind, because there's still arguably a scene with models involved engaging each other or doing something. You might have a couple of guardsmen standing by a tank, in, like not doing anything. It does depend it? on the model though, because interestingly, the one they've used for the cover is the Bard's Revenge model. And that's basically... That is basically a jewel. You yeah. think no, of it no. as a single fig, right? But it's a jewel. No, no, no. But I'm saying even as a jewel, that, that I don't think of as a diorama. No, like Some no. jewels you could argue are like diorama-esque. They're on a big base. Uh, I think this, that's is, the, this is the thing. I think that's, that's part of it is that over the years, last few years, um, the lines have been blurred a little bit. Between I think the in two every categories. category, everything's getting more and more diorama, even like single fig, even squad. Now everything's on like one big scenic base. I'm guilty of that, obviously, but... But but yeah, I guess so. I mean, look. I, like, but then you you say that. But then one of the most prolific winner, Angelo Ducello, is is classic gaming base on a plinth. You know, like, and he's got more. more... I don't think it, we're not necessarily saying. Oh, you need to do that to win. No, no, but no. But what I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, in terms of entries, that seems to be the trend 
you're seeing more and more and more in terms of percentage of entries. Things are leaning. Yeah, up. you are. I'm not saying you have to do that to win. No, you no, obviously don't. No, but there's that, that's the same thing with like saying, oh, you have to do NMM to win. You know what I mean? Like it's like that. It's it's you know like it's all about how well the model's painted, plus all the other factors that they look at. You know, the quality of the build. You know, all those kind of things. Like the, the all the things that they look for. I don't think there's like a linear path. Like they even say it, like it's not even about heavy metal style. Like a lot of people used to think that it's just, oh, you've got to paint heavy metal style. I agree you with know, all those factors. I'm know. just saying, if you look at the plethora of entries that you see, you do notice trends and people are. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk more about that. Just the fact that things are. That's what's popular. Things are blurring no, towards being a diorama in every category. And the most of that was definitely dual. Like there was somewhere. You had to like think a minute to tell what the jewel actually was. You know what I mean, like yeah, stuff no, like I that. Get what you mean. So and it just looked more like a diorama. But I it, think it's, I it's, think amalgamating is a good thing. I, I I genuinely do. As much as I know that it probably for people who really like entering jewel like as an individual category, it's going to be frustrating. But there's I think, going to be there's going to be like individual cases in there that are going to be probably some upsets. But I'd say generally on the whole, I'm inclined to agree with you. Your your jewel that you won with, yeah. Would you, ignoring this, ignoring the the categories being smashed together, would you look at it and think, oh, it's diorama? Well, it's still a scene. It's still it's yeah. still like you know, and and uh, yeah, yeah. It's still it's still an environment with models engaging each other. It, the only real difference between a jewel and maybe a diorama is the number of models that are actually on that. Obviously, a jewel has to be one v one typically. Yeah, like that's when you see most. That's what most jewels are. Um, so really when you strip it right back to the core basics of what that thing is, it's an environment it diorama, with yeah. models engaging and models, it's, it's still plural because there's two for a dual, but is there really that much difference between? You could argue, sorry, you could argue that it gives you more freedom on your jewels that you can add a few extra things in or. Well, yeah, cause it could, it could. That's a good point. Actually. It, could, I didn't think it, it, that it could, it could mean that like you, you have one one marine against three orcs or four orcs or something like that so it's it's still a duel to an extent but it just makes more of it i think i think what it does is it it broadens the boundaries of what painters can do for an entry um i think that's something that it, that in my mind it does and i understand yeah the 1v1s are really focused really sort of like ribena strength kind of look at uh, uh ribena ribena strength. strength we're there kicking we go. it off how long are we in how long uh, are we in? We are 15 minutes in. 15 minutes in, Rabina Strength. Sorry. That like, is your Jamesism for so, the I'm, I'm very sorry. Well, it's uh, fine. You should, <laughs> yeah. should, we, should we segue that into the uh, into the viewers' comments then? Because I found this interesting. Uh, JP Kimball 9479 says, I think on the back of your Siege Studios t-shirts, you should have all of the phrases uh, that James says on them. <laughs> We'll Talking about the t-shirts. We'll take, yeah, we'll yeah. take that. Yeah. Where, did you not get the memo, George? Yeah, I didn't get the memo. Yeah, on, like. Still waiting on my merch. Pack. Didn't get yeah. the memo. Didn't get any t-shirts. Didn't get either. t-shirts. Yeah. yeah, we have to sort that, won't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I will take that into consideration. We might do a limited run with some some isms on it. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's like the podcast edition of the t-shirt. It's just got quotes from James. Yeah. 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 No I'm, one will have a clue what you're wearing. I really want to like. I you wish just, I could have some just, sort of insight into your brain, like. You, they're just they're so off the cuff. They're yeah. mental things you've never heard. It's not you, like he's like parroting like classic phrases. There are some classic ones that do come out now and again, but they're, they're you know I don't generally get, speaking, just like, throughout the day, you'll just say something like that, just nonchalant. It, the the ones that do you know what the interesting thing is? The classic ones are the ones that you sort of pause and think about, and then you come out with like the ones that anyone says, and then the ones that just roll out of your mouth are the most insane like ones that no one's I ever showed heard of. you that model this morning. I went, how'd you like that Kipper? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, right. Bit of a bit of, thank you all in the comments for, uh, for coming through for me on the last episode because the support for the refreshers was frankly overwhelming. Right. I want to get some... Go on, do, read your comment. Well, uh, read your little st- stupid little comment. My little propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to swerve it here to, in his favour. But well, I, uh, I, think, I think Joe's got something that 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 that, for that ruins that quite well, quickly. Well, Amy Snugs, uh, member of the team at Siege, says, uh, "I'm with you, George. Love some refreshers. Always get a big bag of retro sweets every Christmas from my nan-in-law. One of the best presents ever." So that is exactly on brand what I said about the Christmas box. Right. That sounds, that does sound lovely. And that is very nice. I put a poll out <laughs> about this. Um, 
I put R refreshers and S tier suite as a grown adult. I don't like that you put at the end of that as a grown adult because you're implying that you're stupid. You've you've intentionally phrased your poll to that, get people into the mindset that, of guilting themselves that, for liking refreshers. That was the question though. I was saying it for children, maybe. <laughs> For like little <laughs> stupid little kids, maybe. No, so, but the... The look, general consensus was... The general consensus, I, I hate to say it, George, it was a landslide victory to <laughs> no. Uh, 76% of people voted no. It's not S tier as an adult. Um, uh, 24% of people voted yes. And one of those people was George. <laughs> 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 trying to sway the numbers there George a little bit um, one, someone messaged me saying it's not even S tier as a kid so they, they, they even then they're saying even as a child I mean, you're getting too caught up on the uh, where you're ranking it that's down to personal taste but whether or not it's acceptable to eat as an adult is undeniably although again like people coming like, the people saying yes seem to be members of the team we've got Ned voted yes I'm not being funny, Joe. Well. You've stacked this question up. You've sowed the seeds in their head before they even answered the question, and then you're surprised that results give you confirmation bias. Yeah, well, I'm just not saying, scientific. This I, not I, scientific. I, I, I'm uh, just, the, I'm just sitting back, li liking this. Well, you said they're for, you said they're for kids, Joe. And uh, Bunyip Studios says my missus eats refreshers, and she's nearly sixty. Right. Look, I'm starting to realise my error in letting you pick the comments. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will say that the the. I'm sorry to, to, who is it? Bunyip Studios. Yeah. Sorry to their missus. That's, I, I don't mean to call them a child, but you've picked the comments and my research says otherwise. Well, I'm, I'm a fair person, Joe. If there were any comments that were saying that refreshers were not... There actually wasn't right. any. There, was, there, weren't, there weren't any comments at all saying that. I've so, not yeah. cherry-picked. I've just picked all of the refreshers-related comments yeah. and they've all been positive in support well, of the refreshers. So, I love the yeah. way that all of that spurred from me just saying... Quick analogy. One of, one of your Jamesisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. one of your Jameses. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, Be on a t-shirt next week. If you week. like strong Ribena, let us know in yeah, the comments. Suppose, yeah. suppose Ribena's S tier as well, is it? No, I hate Ribena. Oh, no, there we go. We're not going to argue about that, so it's fine. No. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, Nyab Stilgar says, you, you actually asked me to include this one, uh, is, the beardest, is the bearded host a part of Contradiction <laughs> Cast or am I crazy? <laughs> right. I have some questions on this. Questions for your questions. So I'm going to answer your question with a question. What is that? I don't know. I'm not that. If that's a real person, then that's one of James's not, burner accounts. That's not me. <laughs> no, there no, are no, no burner not, not the comment being a real person. The person they're asking if oh, I right, am. Right. If that's a real thing. But I didn't know if this was like, if that's a real thing, like contradiction cast. I don't know what that is. I looked it up. I could not find it. If it is. Or if that's like a funny way of saying that I was contradicting myself, because I was, I brought it up in the episode. I think where I was saying like, um, my thing was about painting the same model 10 times or whatever. Mm. But then previously I've said about getting away from space Marines and stuff. And I did try and address that in the, in the, the podcast. I think both of those points could be valid. And I thought maybe that this was a funny way of saying that I was contradicting myself. Um, so just like being referred to as the bearded host. I like that we've got to the point with the podcast where like third party viewers have no idea who we are. Yeah. yeah. I thought, I thought, uh, I also yeah, like the, the bearded, bearded host. host when James has also got the beard going on. I got a more noticeable beard, I would say. Okay. Yeah. No, I've, been, I've been just darker. I've been, I've been cutting the lawn a bit more recently. So, so yeah. And, and actually, yeah, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to, I don't know if it's definitely that episode, but before we recorded... I shaved, I think. You were shaving in yeah, your office. Yeah. yeah. In, his shaved office. His in, in his office, he was shaving his beard. Shaving, yeah. So... Um, in the office? Because you don't have done that in the morning. That was <laughs> like a normal person. I was like, walked I was really in, busy. I was like, you were really going to record? And he was like, yeah. Was Toothbrush busy. hanging out of his mouth. Yeah. Hey, look, when I get delayed by 10 minutes walking the dogs, it, it, it shunts the whole day back. Yeah. You know? so, so I'd be so. interested to know, uh, here's my follow-up questions. If someone else or that person could comment, let me know. Is that a real person you're comparing me to? Because uh, it's not me. <laughs> or is that um, is that just a funny way of saying I was contradicting myself? Um, or both. Or both. Or both. Yeah. Or, both yeah. or is it, yeah, really layered? To be continued. Stay if, tuned. <laughs> if, if I happen to look like someone who's on something called Contradiction Cast and also 
that they're calling me out for contradicting myself. That's a very layered comment and I'll fair play. <laughs> Would you say it's an S tier comment? That's an S tier comment. As a grown adult, that's a grown adult. As a grown adult, not a child. A kid wouldn't understand it. <laughs> Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to accommodate for a variety of needs and budgets. Whether you want a centerpiece character for your army or a full-blown gaming force, we have what you need and we offer well above the industry standard in terms of painting quality and our service. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk and in the month of September new clients can get 5% off of any commission using code SEPTEMBER5 uh, Right, this is a uh, topic for this week. We want to talk about the five common mistakes that beginners make. Yep. James as a seasoned uh, tutor running the siege courses all over the country I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, people from all experience yeah, yeah. painting. Yeah, yeah this is not to call us the experts, obviously, but with a bit of experience under our belts. These yeah, are also just, the things that we personally have uh, have overcome. Yeah, I, I, look, I I've taught a lot of classes over the last eight years, um, and you do you do see a lot of things. Like you do see a lot of uh, things that you try and help people with, um, especially when they're they're new to painting miniatures. Number one, um, I think posture and hand bracing. Uh, I find a lot of people either sit very awkwardly don't sit close enough to the desk don't sit with their elbows or forearms on the desk uh hunch over a lot and there's a big read the biggest contributor to hunching over a desk is lighting um and that reason for that is uh, we obviously massively advocate uh, a, a daylight that's above you on an arm so that you can sit comfortably underneath it raise the height so you're straight backed and then um and obviously you can just sit comfortably with forearms and elbows and hands braced on the desk. It's interesting you say that because I would have guessed that that would have been like due to table height or chair height. It, or... Sometimes it can be table height, but what tends to happen is people will buy a smaller table light that's like just got a base and then it's just got like a little light. That's and, what I had. And, prefer, and, yeah. and what you'll do is you'll lean and crouch down to, to see under the light, if that makes sense. Hmm. Even if you have one of those small lights, like I've, I've done it on classes before where someone's bought like a big carry box or whatever for their gear and their paints and all that. I've literally picked up the carry box, put the carry box on the desk and then just pick the light up from the desk and put it on top of the carry box. And immediately they're like, oh, okay, I can just go under it now. Like it sounds silly, but like, but a big contributor to hunching over is lighting because you have one of those smaller lights and you do lean forward to try and get under it if that makes sense and it's something psychologically you just don't realize you just do it because you're trying to light the model and see what you're doing but so an easy way to solve that then is literally it's not even get a new light it's just put your light no not necessarily yeah yeah not necessarily if you don't you don't need to go and buy one well, what, big arm light what i eventually did obviously we blew your mind with using the lid of the Tupperware for the uh, thing. <laughs> That's a throwback. But when you use the lid of the Tupperware, you have the actual Tupperware spare. Uh -huh. Put your light on that. But now big the Tupperware. I'm joking about TK Maxx now, are you, mate? Yeah. 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 Put a lot on that. That's what yeah. I used to do. Big ups, everyone who's been listening since the, uh, the TK, TK Maxx. Max I've been there since TK Maxx. <laughs> yeah. 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 We actually quite a few people in the comments say like, oh, uh, I hope one there could say, uh, I was here since the refresher days or something <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like, like posture uh, is really important, obviously for obvious reasons. If you're going to be painting for, you know, many, many years in, in you know, painting miniatures in the hobby and, and you know, do it and doing it, then you are going to have uh, posture problems and you can have back <laughs> I problems. love the idea of like Joe sat there putting his Tupperware and his lamp on top and he's like, in six years, this is going to pay dividends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the thing is, it's like, it will it will seriously give you problems down the line if you don't if you don't do it right from day one um you know and i, I you might have a year or two where you 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 you're doing that and it doesn't affect you but you will start getting lower back pain and stuff like that and again i don't advocate anybody straining or being really sort of like firm with a with a hand or holding things really tight when they're painting and that tends to be because of not not bracing and like you should you should be able to comfortably hold the brush um and do pull strokes do push strokes with with comfort rather than strain um posture leads to that and also bracing leads to that massively as well um so so yeah you should be you know chest or stomach to the desk forearms on the table or elbows on the table and also brace with your with your hands together so like the various the thing i love about uh using the shot glasses for example is that because they are conical what it means is you can put your fingers around the top 
and this whole part of your hand becomes the area that you can bridge onto. For any new listeners, he's saying use a shot glass to hold the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Not to get I drunk before you paint the yeah. models. Yeah, sorry, apologies. I should have cave- uh, caveated that. Um, but yeah, with 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 being able that to... Was, ha- sorry, that was something... I can't remember what the episode number was, but we went over that on a previous episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. shot James, glasses, yeah. James did shot Yeah, we can glasses. link it or whatever. I did I, Jenga yeah, pieces and... Yeah, Something we else. spoke about yeah. that. But but yeah, but having having multiple areas of bridging is really important. So being able to bridge your hands together or even bridge directly onto the bit that's around the, the holder that you're using is really important. Um yeah, and, and I would always advocate an overhead light because that will immediately make you sit up straighter and closer to the desk because you can manipulate the arm, etc. So that's the that's, you know what I started doing? I started dropping my chair. That to effectively well, yeah. make the table Slightly taller. Higher. Yeah. Therefore, I can rest Put my you wrists and my elbows. Under the lower. light more. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's really helpful. I mean, if you do have like a, a, a gaming chair or whatever, like a secret lab chair, or if you have like a whatever, blah, blah, blah like being able to adjust it uh, and also still be comfortable and straight back. You don't need a really gaming chair to have high adjust. No, I mean, yeah, you can. Uh, no, I know you can get different can chairs. Get that function but, on other chairs. Yeah, but, but no, gaming chair looks cooler. It looks cooler and it's more comfortable. It's, I find. it is more comfortable. Yeah. To be fair, I used to use just any old chair and like any old office chair or whatever until we got the secret lab chairs in the office, and I was like, oh, okay, that's actually incredibly comfortable. I actually did that a couple before I started at Siege. I got one of the secret lab chairs, and then when I started here, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> they are they are like the thing is whether, whether even in the sitting at a desk and writing emails all day or whether you're painting that it, it posture and comfort comfort are really really important and you know it just allows you to do that thing for longer without potentially causing long-term damage or long-term strains or frustration for, for future when you want to if, you could, it if it's one of those things right where like if you're going to be sat in it for like many many hours and it's going to last you many many years i mean i've gone through i'm not saying necessarily to buy a secret labs chair there's plenty of other companies but I used to get through like I don't know about you like an office chair a year, like just from the it, amount like, of like hundred or... quid chairs I've bought that I've eventually worn through and I'm just sat on bare metal or plywood. Yeah, mm. finally making that I'd say that was probably actually one of the biggest. I wish I thought this before on a previous episode, but probably one of the best investments I've made in my hobby setup was spending some good money and getting a nice chair. Yeah, I mean the thing, the other thing to talk about and the other thing to, to bolt onto this as well is that like I totally understand and this is from conversations I had with hundreds of students on classes like over the years. Like not everybody has a proper painting room or has a a desk set up or has whatever. Like a lot of people do paint at the coffee table or do paint at their dining table, whatever. In there. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand that that there are different situations and circumstances out there for people. But all I would say is that whether you're painting at a coffee table or whether you're painting at a dining table, just trying to make sure that in some shape or form you are sitting comfortably straight backed arms braced on this on the flat surface and whether that's if it's a coffee table sitting on the floor cross cross legged and so that you're at a similar sort of height so you can brace which would probably help you if you've got one of those shorter lights as well because it would lower you and the height light would become higher if you're at a dining table buying a chair that you can store somewhere that when you put it up the table it is more comfortable and allows you to sit in that position that's a better trade-off than than just putting yourself in a situation where you are hurting your back yeah i think there's like um there's a middle ground to be had where like we're not saying you need all this really expensive stuff in no, the fancy station to improve your experience definitely yeah i always get a bit like it's when more, we're recommending stuff especially like we're just talking about like a, casually talking about a 400 pound chair yeah more like, than that in some cases yeah, yeah or like yeah, more yeah. than that like um i always get a bit conscious of it because obviously not everyone can afford a 400 pound chair there's plenty of uh other options um but then i remember like we are also talking to people that spend like hundreds of pounds on models that's interesting (laughs) i find if you are spending this is not to call anyone out obviously but i do find interesting that people i get it to a degree but i do find interesting that people will spend loads of money on a new range of paints or a load of new models that are probably just going to sit and be on the sprues for uh, years and years in a box you it's not so much about spending money on those things it's maybe just considering what you're currently spending on and maybe i'll be honest within the hob within your hobby yeah. budget right i'm saying maybe instead of buying some new models or instead of buying that new paint range you put it towards an investment like a better lamp or a desk that's a bit higher up or i i only bought any of that stuff new lamp new chair um good brushes i only bought any of that 
once my like pile of shame got so much where I was like, I literally should not be buying any more models. Mm. Like if I'm going to, so I was just buying models ahead of all that. I do get it. Like that's, that's the thing that we're all interested in. That's what it's way more appealing to spend a hundred pound on models than save that hundred pound, put it towards a really nice chair mm. or something. It's way more appealing. Depends how into chairs you are. <laughs> yeah. It depends how into chairs. Well, it depends if it's got the function to change the height. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, revolutionary so technology. I do get it yeah so I, it's a bit of a fine line I always get a bit thingy. but what I was going to say is to James's point of not needing the best setup and things like that um, not going to like out them or, or say the full story or anything but we've had people join the team that when you hear different people's painting situations um, and then you see how good they are at painting yeah yeah it will make you realize, oh, what am I doing? Like, I, I it's had a, that it's moment. A, it's the sure. lazy perfectionist thing again. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I I get that with. I've got to make sure the setup's perfect, otherwise I'm not going to be able to paint the perfect model. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll get people join the team, and they'll explain what their setup is, and it's like what I would have, you know, what anyone could have a setup of. Yeah, yeah. Um, in some cases, not even using a table because of like room in the room that's available and stuff. And then painting some of the most incredible models I've ever seen. And it's like... There is clearly okay. zero correlation between your setup and how good of a yeah, painting. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah. It's like I was just going through things of, oh, it must be this why I don't yeah. paint that good. Oh, it must be this. The, the only thing I would I would say, and just just not to counter, but just to say that, is if you have someone who's maybe not in the most comfortable situation for painting, and they're painting amazingly, how much better would they paint if they were? I do agree with it's that. It's not going to hurt. Yeah, I do agree with that. that. That's, why, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's a quality like, of life like, thing. You're spending hours yeah. doing something. So, you know, but, you know, put that benefit yourself. Yeah. By if you're going to be there for hours, exactly. make yourself as comfortable as possible. And we've gone through before as well, like clean space gives you a better mindset and things like that. I don't disagree with all that. I'm just saying you can find some level of, of what we're saying here within your budget and space and whatever. I don't have big space at all to do painting. Um, so I have to, I have to, I have like a, I don't have a painting desk. I have like a multi-use desk yeah. where like I have to, okay, now my painting stuff's on it. Okay. Now my painting stuff's off it. Like yeah. I don't have set up with all the um, racks and everything. Racks and yeah. everything. They're, they're off to the side in a separate thing. And then I just go and get the ones that I need and stuff like that. So um, everyone's got different, different priorities in that stuff, I suppose. But, mm. um, but the, the the fundamental thing is on on that note on that topic is literally just assess where you work and 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 just go right okay is this number one the best function I've got from it and also secondly and most in my opinion most importantly is is it is it comfortable am I straining am I bracing am I bending over like leaning over you know those kind of things are things that you really should you should assess your workspace because it directly affects all the things that you try and do at that painting desk. Um, yeah, I think it's really, that's, that's, that's a really important part. I think it's something that one of the, one of the, I think one of the things that I've instantly seen the most of when teaching are people that are constrained by a light that's very low. They lean over and there you can see them not being able to brace or they sit really far back from the table. And it's like, if you were closer, you'd be able to be way more braced and way more comfortable. And you're that shaky hand potentially that you're experiencing won't happen as much because you you can relax a bit more, you know, um, and that's one of the one of the things. Let's move on from that then. So, what's one of the next things that you see uh, people making as a mistake? Building the models really quickly without thinking of like choices for parts and that, that the painting approach. You get super excited that you're like, oh, I bought, bought this new kit, you know, and you first get into it and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna put the models together, blah blah. blah. And I'm not talking about sub assemblies. I know that's gonna trigger you, Jay, but like, I'm not. <laughs> I'm about, actually but, painting but, in a sub assembly currently. You're painting but, in a sub assembly. You, I'm you're okay. So. Uh, we'll, Do you need to talk? <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it probably in not next episode, probably the episode after or something when the model's done. But I'll uh, there was a reason behind it. I thought it would be funny for me to. Like, I tried to do everyone's, so I thought like, oh, I'll paint in sub assemblies, and I'll I'm using like shot glasses instead of like what Jingo. I would normally <laughs> use and stuff like that. Um, but genuinely, I went from full sub assemblies to within like seconds like a few <laughs> minutes but a few he's minutes on the pallet and he's like no I can't do within it. a few he's minutes he, i just like looked at on the shot glass can't do it i just looked at it and i was like no so i've reduced the amount of sub assemblies but i'm still doing sub assemblies yeah. but yeah so i'm not not triggered have you ever way. done this james have you ever had a sub assembly where bits of it still come off 
As like in, su- it's like I've got a sub assembly arm, but don't worry, I can still take the shoulder pad off. It's blue tacked. <laughs> I have one of those at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, what, what I mean is like um, it is where you 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 get a new kit and you and you've been especially with the way things are now. You see it go up on, on community or you see it go up on a, on a company's website. You get super excited. The pre order date goes up. You pre order it. You go down to the, you pick it up or it arrives or whatever. You get the box. You, you know, you, um, when you combine that with being new into this as well so you've got that excitement of it being this whole new thing that you're getting into and then you've got the excitement of this thing that you've loved from the moment you've seen it and it's been obviously there's been a wait you know of to get it and then you get it and and, and beginners will just put them all together really quickly and then the painting thought begins at that point once it's built whereas taking a second to go all right okay well i really like that shoulder pad or i really like that or i really like this or i really like that oh do you mean in terms of if it's like a multi-part kit yeah yeah even if it's not necessarily a war gear option if it's like decorative right yeah, like a box yeah. Of has loads of different shoulder pads or yeah. different head options or helmets it's things like it's things like uh a lot of models don't come with like purity seals attached for example or they don't come they come with like a, a different topper for the backpack or something like that all those kind of things like it's it's just building the model really quickly getting it built because you want to get it built because you want to get and you want to get onto the painting but not but not taking a second to go right okay before i get through that i'm just going to pick the bits or have a look at the parts and think oh i like this i like this or maybe i don't that that might be a bit more difficult to paint or maybe i don't think my skills at the point where i can paint that yet or i'm not sure on how to paint that like taking a brief second to go right okay and looking at the kit and looking at the parts before rushing through the, the build of it and getting it built I think that helps massively. I think a lot of sometimes new new painters do just build the model really quickly and to get onto the painting because they're super excited to paint. But then once they've built it, they're like, "Oh, I've actually I've stuck that on now." But I, do you know what? I really like that 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 head or that topper or that shoulder pad or or whatever. You know what I mean? And I think having that brief moment of like absorbing what's actually presented to you in the kit, but with a painting mindset and thinking, "Oh, do I want to paint that or do I want to do that?" I think that helps. I know a lot of people will kind of do that during the build but when you when you're new and you're getting into this i think the excitement of getting it built and getting onto that fun painting stage is sometimes blurs the thoughts when it comes to actually how you're going to paint well, sometimes it. what's coolest looking as well isn't necessarily best suited for the paint scheme or yeah yeah, the, yeah. composition if you're doing like a big piece or something like yeah, that yeah definitely yeah yeah Sometimes like law-based reasons yep. that they might, yeah. oh, it's probably better for them to have this than this or. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think, I think just that slight pause to just reflect on what's in the kit and just, and think of it when the painting mindset will, will really help because it just means you can make choices that are more tailored to perhaps where you're at as a painter or make choices which uh, are going to test you or vice versa, you know? So that's, that's kind of like something that I've, I've noticed. I also think it like helps having that mindset helps get you into kind of embracing like the therapeutic nature that building and cleaning can be <laughs> it can yeah. like I some people to, hate building but yeah i used to hate um building and cleaning like i used to you know when i was starting do what you were just saying and like i want to i'll tell you now i never once put an extra purity seal on a model <laughs> not once <laughs> Not once in my life did I ever, um, if I was painting some Marines, put an extra purity seal on because it's more to paint. Are you one of those people who's like building a box of tack Marines and you're like, they don't need belts. They yeah, don't yeah, need yeah. Holsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't need that. They don't need that. Yeah. Um, they lost the pistol in battle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Narrative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely used to be like that. And it's so funny, like looking back, um, when I got back into to Warhammer, um was mostly with barrett who you've met yeah i don't think you've met barrett but um um and we like we were so polar opposite in terms of when it came to building Mm -hmm. in that i would still want to well maybe not polar opposite but like i would want to get through it quickly but i would i would follow the instructions and make sure that i was getting everything right he would literally like just chuck the instructions away just have a look at what parts he's got and go right bang 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 that goes together like that that looks like it goes together there yeah that looks fine whatever done and that i could i could never have done that so i wasn't at that level no, of no. Okay, yeah. but um i love building models because i like i do this like make-believe thing right you know when you see those like videos of like someone like building a watch yeah and they've got like the velvet gloves on yeah and they're, like do everything all precise i like to feel like that <laughs> it's more like escapism i thought you were gonna say <laughs> that you do like 
You know the the animation they released of the um, making a space yeah, yeah. where like the armor's coming on and stuff. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that you have your little model there and you like have the shoulder <laughs> pads coming up. Making you're, like, making you're, making it, it <laughs> you're making all the sounds. You're like, and you're doing it's the like voice. It's like Darth Vader's helmet. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like doing the voiceover to yourself like every single marine um i mean that would take ages to ages to to, to make them but, someone um, but, someone but, must have done like a fan made version of that with like an if not model, it's right? gonna happen so someone's, someone's, gotta, do that. To someone's yeah. gotta do that um yeah i forget the point uh oh the um yeah the building cleaning thing like i always used to be like that and weirdly even just recently like i did obviously starting working here realize the importance of building and cleaning yeah yeah um like I, I always just used to like look past mold lines and stuff like that i don't care like, whatever i wish i did acknowledge that stuff sooner to think it would have improved my painting quicker because it's impossible to get better at painting when the model's not clean properly we spoke about that on a previous episode didn't we it's like yeah, that's yeah. shooting yourself in the foot before you start the race isn't it i mean yeah no good paint job can overcome but it wasn't a mold line. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. until literally this year, like even so, it, acknowledging that it was more important and paying more attention to it and stuff. It wasn't until this year I was talking to um, Liam Dempsey. I think I don't know when. Maybe know at when. Fest. Maybe at Fest, or it might have even been before that when we were in like Gibraltar or something. But I remember him saying like, "Oh, I love building and cleaning. Yeah, like I love just building and cleaning the models." because um, we was obviously talking about painting models for him and he was like yeah I love building and cleaning and I was like oh yeah I suppose it can be enjoyable actually it can be quite nice I have a friend who doesn't paint and doesn't play the games he literally just buys the boxes models puts them together and then that's it I guess that is like the um, like the Gundam stuff yeah, it's yeah. mostly just it's yeah. just building yeah. the models right that's the fun thing it, yeah. for, for me it's, it is I, obviously it's, for me it's, the painting is very important but I think the building and cleaning is on par I think because, and, and I, I think a lot of people hate it because they want to get onto the, the painting, arguably for the right reasons, because they want to get the models painted. But but if you overlook that, um, then then I think it, it's a bit of a shame because there are things that massively detract from a well-painted model if they're not done correctly or not done neatly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but to, to, to touch upon it, like the, the whole thing I was saying is like, not so much obviously the quality if you want to use an analogy, not so much like a painter choosing a, a worn canvas or a pristine canvas, it's more choosing the right size canvas for what they're actually going to render and paint. And that's the way I'm trying to basically explain it. It's like... You're talking more about deciding the options. And deciding stuff, the options, the yeah, yeah. yeah. The quality, build and clean it really well, like either way, respect, irrespective of like whether you're just going, oh, I'm going to build it and get it built, ready to paint, or or take a moment to go, right, okay, well, I'm building the cab, Tim. Comes with a power fist, comes with a sword. Maybe I'm not so good at metallics uh, or I'm not so good at blended blendings for the sword, but the power fist, um, the power fist, I know I can edge fight like that really sharply. So then like making choices. Or equally, you could be like, oh, I was going to do a power fist for this, but actually if I do a sword, I can paint it in a different color that contrasts the armor nicely. Yeah. And that'll make a nicer yeah. color yeah. scheme for the model. Right? Correct. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. It's those, it's those, it's that little pause to literally just go, right, I know I'm going to build this. So I'm going to enjoy building it and have fun building it and do it really well. But rather than just getting it done without any of the of the aforethought for the painting, it's literally just going, right, I'm going to, I'm going to make some choices or have some thought about the parts I'm going to choose and bits and bobs so that, so that I can enjoy the painting aspect even more, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Have you got one final uh, thing that you've noticed beginners doing? Yeah, I think from, from a lot of the airbrush, airbrush classes and uh, the airbrush sections on courses that I've taught over the years, um, I think that the airbrush is this kind of like, pedestal wonder product that a lot of people wonder uh, product, yeah, like that. That, wonder product. That a lot of people think that that you 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 kind of like you get it and it makes you amazing straight away and, and arguably like it it is a very 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 important tool like very important tool when it comes to miniature painting because it does save you time and improve quality of base coats you know we've spoken about you would never paint a tank with a brush again after using an airbrush etc um but it's similar to sort of like when you buy models and you want to get them built and you want to get them get them done straight away I think a lot of people will buy an airbrush the first time they get when they get into it. They see obviously a YouTube video, they, their friend's got an airbrush or whatever the case may be and how they find out about the airbrush in general. And they'll just buy one and pick a model up straight away. And I think that's a huge, huge uh, mistake because it massively makes you think that the tool is, is, a, is, a, is not as good as it's supposed to be or it makes you feel that you're not good enough, if that makes sense. 
spending, or I've literally had classes where someone's come on the class and they've never picked up an airbrush in their life and they've sat there with an airbrush with a bit of cardboard or paper with some water with a bit of ink in it and they've practiced dots, lines, transitions, smooth passes, all that kind of stuff for, for 30 minutes. And then you give them the model and then they get some paint and try and put it on. The difference between the person who's had that half an hour of practice and the person who's super excited to use it and picks it up and goes Shh, and makes a big splodge on the model straight away or layers too thick. Especially or, if, God forbid, it's like an expensive <clears throat> model or one yeah, exactly. or one you've spent ages painting. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that's a big thing that like people who are getting into this and who are getting new into the industry and new into painting miniatures, I think like if you are going, going to go down the route of buying an airbrush, perfect. I advise it to everybody. Like, you know, it's a tool that you should have, you should use if you're looking to be efficient, save time, maximize quality, all those things. But don't just maybe use it straight away on a miniature practice on some cardboard practice on some paper practice on something um you could i suppose practice on a model that you're not that you don't really care about but i, I think practicing those core competencies of trigger control distance from distance from object and obviously i think probably both of those things to be honest i would say practice on 2d paper card what have you and then graduate to a test model or a model you're not happy with potentially and then yeah. go on to yeah or, obviously doing it on a 3d volumetric shape is different than doing it on oh, the paper right yeah yeah but i would say that doing it on a test model even before you go onto your yeah models you are maybe that's paint. the good process then is do it on paper and card first on a 2d so you can just control the trigger learn that the, the biting point of the trigger where paint and air comes out at the same time if you're using a dual, a dual action and all, all those different bits and then maybe progress onto a, a, a volumetric shape because you're not you're not going to pick up on the the directionality of like where you're spraying from and things like that and the volumes because obviously if you've got something blocking in another part of the model when you're spraying it with an airbrush the airbrush only goes it only fires paint in a straight line right? yeah yeah and you're not picking up that technique from testing lines on paper no correct yeah 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 i mean that maybe that's the thing to do maybe it is to do the paper uh, or do card or whatever and then and then maybe get something that maybe maybe a miniature but or maybe even just a volume so like a sphere a cube. I'd say a model. Uh, I mean, everyone's, I'm sure, has got some test models or some models. Yeah, or potentially. You can get yeah. some like, ones. I'm already. talking if you're new and you've literally bought an airbrush and you've got maybe like, you've not got like the, the Aladdin's Cave of Grey Shame, you know? No, but like, even, G, even GW do like the free, like in a sense. I'm saying if, if you're completely new, then I would say just do it on your first models because as I've said before, your first models are going to be rubbish anyway. So teach. Treat your first models as your test. I think most people yeah. get an airbrush later into the hobby as well. Not, not I don't know. Like I, 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 I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, on some classes, I've had I've had painters that have I've had students that have been literally they've been in the industry in the hobby for like a month and they've bought an airbrush straight away. I would so they say, must they must have watched a video or they must have known somebody that has one and they've just got and that's in, the, in that's painting miniatures and has gone. Well, you definitely need an airbrush or you definitely need this. Nothing wrong with getting one if you when you're very new. Hmm. I think just applying that hour, half hour of practice before you even go near a model is is something that you, you should do. Uh, I would in say in terms of practice models, actually, even if you are new, um, just get some like ones that are already painted really badly going for cheap on eBay or something. Yeah, that can work, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I have the same, I have a Rhino that's one of the first models I ever bought Um and I, God knows how many coats of paint that's had. That is literally that is literally my like just test. I just test the consistency on it before I like um, go onto the model. go onto the model. rhinos are like a dime a dozen. I think it's on Paul Hammer podcast. They said like rhinos are free. People don't know this, but everyone has got <laughs> yeah. rhinos. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I just it's one of the first models I've got, and it's just been caked in paint just from that initially. So old, they're just everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. initially everywhere. practicing it, but. Um, now it's like I just test out different paints on it and stuff. So yeah, getting some old models and just you don't want them to look good at the end of the yeah. day. Would, so it's gonna doesn't matter. Just keep going over. I mean, GW have the the intro magazine thing. You can get they're yeah, really cheap, and they also have. I'm pretty sure you get free model in store if you go in. I think they do that like now. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. That's it's yeah. A different model every month. I do think, however, depending on how how chill your local <laughs> store manager is, I think you do have to build them in store. That's to fine. walk away with them. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. 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 But just, I mean, you can't just pop in and go, can I have one of them? Yep. Cool. No, no, I get that. I'm just saying in terms of accessibility for a, for a test model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you have to build them in store. It's yeah. obviously to get people in the stores and stuff. It's a really cool idea, actually. Yeah. That, that's the only thing. That's the only thing that I've seen that a few people do is they, they, they buy an airbrush very early on um, and they don't do that. They grab a model and start painting it and start using it. And then they're, they're, one of the first things they were saying when they come to the class in the airbrush section is, yeah, I bought it. I tried a model and I didn't pick it up because I made such a mistake on it. And it's like, 
it's kind of like the expectation compared to the execution is very far because of because of not doing that practice well this is the that. the youtube doesn't tell you the whole story thing isn't it yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah so i think yours was uh yours was a bit similar wasn't it your uh, painting mistake on the uh, the airbrush front or spraying models kind of front? yeah it wasn't wasn't quite the airbrush front it was before the airbrush days but i think i just didn't um i i, I didn't really take into consideration that about like spraying too much primer on Mm. like and it's not until you see like pro I, I think i just used to just cake models in it because i would have missed like a little spot and then you're trying to get that little spot and you end up just like flooding the model in in more spray you mean like primer. when you've got like a little bit under the armpit that's like still showing yeah, through exactly. so you go i'm going to spray the whole front of the model again yeah, yeah. i do think since having uh, i've touched on it before where i'll prime with um color forge black mm -hmm. and then i'll if the model's going to be black, obviously I'll spray with black after yeah. still, or I'll airbrush the main color for whatever the model is. And I just think being okay with some of the primer, not covering like little details, as long as the base coat does cover it, that's not done me any wrong now. And I wish I kind of was a bit more less liberal with the primer than I was originally. I think within reason. Like, providing it's not like a massive area. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm talking, it's hard to describe, right? I do know what you mean. Though. It's like, it's almost like a color gradient rather than like a. It's more noticeable because I've been painting with the Warhammer Heroes, their, uh, their blue plastic. Hmm. And obviously, you know, I've sprayed black over it. So that's more noticeable. You can see it coming through. Yeah. Um, what I'm getting at is obviously by the end of you doing your first base coat, you don't want any of the plastic showing through. Yeah. I'm not saying leave plastic showing through. Just, yeah, just I'm saying it. what you can't get with the prime. Sometimes it's worth, if you've missed a little bit with a primer, I wish I was more okay with just leaving that because I'll get it with a base coat and nothing's, you if mean, you've seen a little armpit or something, nothing's going to actually be touching that to take You're saying leaving a bit of off. bare plastic is worse than the alternative of spraying primer over it again and gunking up all the details better than the alternative that's what yeah. I'm saying yeah. I yeah, think yeah. that leads on to a, 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 an issue that does happen with new people that do get do get into this they buy the spray can and spray cans are obviously used in all manner of different ways as in like for different things and I think with miniatures the delicacy of how you apply it is 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 way higher than say for example if you were spraying a bit of metal outside or spraying something like you that the, the use of the can is what i'm talking about so a lot of people that i've seen using cans like that are very new into the hobby will hold down the the percussion cap on the top and they'll hold that down constantly while spraying and that is completely uncontrolled and you're doing passes with the can and putting on lots of layers of individual passes Whereas really one of the first things I'll say to people in classes about primer with a can is that you should use the percussion cap or you should use the, the trigger on the, on the, on the spray can exactly the same as how you would use the trigger on an airbrush and burst fire whilst moving. It's because what that does is it gives you a control of application. So you're doing the individual passes, the push down and movement at the same time. And also you can split your attention between angling the model whilst you're doing the individual bursts to to cover all those areas and hopefully by doing that you will then have be able to you'll, get every, you'll get every area of it and give it a solid base coat if that, a solid uh, undercoat if that makes sense but i think the one of the big mistakes is that and this is what happens because prime like spray cans have obviously pigment they have propellant and they have medium in them so they've got way more than just putting a paint into an airbrush and diluting it if that makes sense so the layers that you're going to put on, and because it is designed to be an undercoat, the Chaos Black or the Color Forge Black or whatever primer that you use, um, if you do hold it down and just go like this, you're gonna you're gonna gunk up details with very thick paint very quickly, um, and I think that's one of the mistakes that a lot of new, new painters do or new hobbyists do do is they buy a spray can and they'll just hold that hold that trigger down and go like this and it just you, you you're completely uncontrolled in the execution if that makes sense yeah um, i mean I, I was never doing that i feel like I, I know people do that but i think instinctively for whatever reason it just felt right to do like bursts yeah i think and george will like this i think it does say it on the instructions of most spray cans do love reading the especially when they're tailored to miniature painting i think it tells you to do bursts yeah um but yeah, I think for me, it would just be like, 
obviously now more experienced more controlled like you say i am able to fully cover the model yeah 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 in a controlled fashion with a thin primer yeah yeah but back then I used to just like see a tiny little bit and think, oh, I've got to get rid of it. And then just end up putting loads more Whack coats of primer on <laughs> yeah. to get rid of this tiny little bit that you can just, I could have just covered with a base coat yeah. and it wouldn't have rubbed off because it's inside, it's in an armpit or whatever. And in turn, you wouldn't have gone cut. In turn, I wouldn't have had this really thick primer. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think that that was a, a mistake that, that I think it it's, Sign- it stands out as a mistake for me it's because it was something that I just never even addressed as a mistake I just used to be like oh this primer's thick isn't it just, just like well no yeah because I'm putting it on like that so on that note as well I've also got something that is going to tie in directly to this week's hobby hack at the end of the episode so stick around for that but the can's distance from the object as well is actually really crucial because there is and again touching on your point on, on labels I think it does say on most cans the, the optimal distance that you should hold the can so it can read a spray can instructions but he can't read only when he wants to so i'm going to assume this is because he wants to disprove that are you going to no, go no, against no, no, the no, label no, no i'm not going against oh, okay. it actually right. but i, I thought got, it was going to be good, he got, only reads them when he wants to go against them but i've got a valid point as to why there's loads of warning symbols on the cans george there's there is, none on the yeah. vallejo ones yeah so yeah, that's, well that's we, we won't get into the international law of the <laughs> european <laughs> Union. there's no big red 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 uh skull and crossbone symbols on yeah. uh on the on the thinner and um, cleaner but anyway um so distance from, from the object or distance from target when using the can is also really crucial distance because from target. what it is from he's target. locking in yeah, yeah. <laughs> steady I don't know. distance from target yeah. steady <laughs> steady <laughs> so the, the the distance that you hold the can from the object as well is really crucial purely because obviously as the paint atomizes when it leaves the nozzle of the can it's drying in that distance from, from the can to the object obviously it's, it's been atomized so if you are further away from the object there's more distance for that paint and medium to travel which means it's going to be drying more over that distance when it hits the object um if, it, if it's further away you will get a more powdery finish as well not to overcomplicate it as well but the distance thing is weather dependent and temperature so dependent i was about well. to say it this is, yeah. i i always thought that that was way too granular way to think about it it's not going to make that much of a difference it does but the distance mixed with the weather genuinely makes so much of a difference the same, in the same way that with the airbrush your paint thinness and consistency versus the distance from the model Correct. that's the same effect yeah. so if that's something you're familiar with apply that to yeah. your spray cans it, do you know what like even though they're very different they're used for very different purposes as in like undercoating maybe priming if you're using the color can like your Mephiston reds or McCray blues or whatever blah blah go straight to Mephiston red Joe. Uh, <laughs> obviously <laughs> yeah don't get don't trigger me please um, but but the 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 the, the way that the can works and the functionality is actually very similar to an airbrush in, in a lot of a lot of extents. Obviously, you know, the paint being put through it is very different in the way that the makeup and stuff. But but yeah, I think distance from, from the object or target is uh is uh is is really, really crucial. Um so do read the can and do follow the optimal distance. I'm not gonna um, be able to help myself next time I come to spray a model now. I'm just gonna be like stay on target. target can, we, <laughs> can we have target <laughs> slide? Can someone edit the uh, the trench run from uh, a yeah. new home? <laughs> and as he's locking on to the yeah. to the death star, <laughs> it's just a space marine. <laughs> that's a space it. Space marine yeah. with a spray. Gun. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so yeah, so I think that's really important. But the hobby hack will, that we're going to give this week will help in Ooh, case a little that tease is, for the hobby hack. Is, a yeah, little tease for it. I'll yeah. uh, I'll round out the topic then with uh with my mistake that I made, which was I was so obsessed with blending as smooth as possible. Yep. That I would kill all of the contrast on my models Mm -hmm. because the more you try to blend something naturally the smaller the change in value is going to be and all my models for the longest time it's like yeah they're smooth but they have no contrast on them whatsoever and that's why i struggle with nmm in the like couple of times i've tried it my brain can't comprehend out the truth (laughs) comes out that's why Ten episodes later yeah i can't bring myself to like leave with the NMN thing. I can't bring myself to leave like a harsh line on something. My brain is like, well, I have to blend it out. And then you blend it out and then it's you basically it. yeah. gone. It's like, it's you know, done smooth, it. But then yeah. the thing is, like, I think the way to immediately stamp that out is have a look at real life reference of gold, silvers, like like like, like candelabras or like door handles. Oh, it's obviously like apparent. That. It's just yeah. that thing in my brain yeah. of like on the blending thing. I mean, it, I'm not, I don't really struggle with it now so much. No, 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 no. But no. that being okay with 
bigger value jumps obviously brings out more and more details in the model, which is why like the box art style was like very edge highlighted, very heavy on that front. Yeah. That was something that I'm not sure how applicable that necessarily is to other people. That's definitely something that I was uh, struggling with. I know a lot of people say like, oh, the model needs more contrast and that can be for a myriad of reasons. But for me, it was the smoothness thing mm -hmm. that... Yeah, Take I think mind. I'm the same. I just hate when my blends are so smooth. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'll finish the model and I'll be like, this is the smoothest blends I've ever seen. It's so like, smooth. It looks like one, one color. color. Yeah, it, is. Like, <laughs> it is. It is one color. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, like, I'll spray the model that we were just talking about. I'll, you know, target acquired. And then I'll just be like, damn, these blends. Like, they're so, <laughs> I don't know what to, yeah. No, I do get what you're saying. Uh, we interesting that you say like you don't know how applicable it is to other people we've had multiple conversations with team over the years who are like still here or not here and, and i remember at one point at one stage one of the biggest tips that we were having to give to people were like don't be scared that to jump, jump. your final edge highlight is going to be a stark mm -hmm. edge highlight like it, it is a common thing where it's like you do get a bit wary of the color jump the stark jump but the, the it's very much trust the process isn't it and then the end product is going to look better for it, it it's almost like muscle memory because you do you do get to a point where you look where you start selecting colors when you're trying to do either transitions or maybe even for highlight stages on the model and things like that like it doesn't necessarily just have to translate just to blending but like edge highlighting when you're doing the chunky the, the first thin the next part of the thin the the next bit of the thin then the dot highlight or whatever like Bear in mind it's on a 28 mil model and to visually see all those stages, you do need to have a greater scope of color jump to allow that. And also that's before we even talk about color desaturating one, a little bit once it dries, because it does desaturate a tiny bit as obviously- Especially when you start mixing as well. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So so I think obviously you can go too crazy and the jump be like a blooming long jump, blooming jump, if that makes sense. But like, you long know- jump, it, jump. Jump, Long jump, 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 Yeah, long, long jump, jump, blooming jump. jump. Yeah. Thanks, James. But uh, yeah, we won't clip that one. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel for you there because I would know what to call, what to say. It's no Ribena. It's yeah, no Ribena. Yeah, yeah. It's no Ribena. Um, but the, 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 what I'm trying to get at is you can go too far. Like yeah. you can, the jump that you make can be so extreme that it does look like the edges are literally on fire or glowing. You the, know? the classic is... Um, highlighting black with white yeah that yeah. being yeah it's on the same scale but like that's too far yeah yeah um, i think it's too, it's too much like so 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 yeah I, I would i would just say like you that kind of color muscle memory if you want to call it anything i think that comes with just experimenting and again as a as a beginner you're you're not going to have that so so you probably are going to be a bit more restricted in or oh, if i use this green i'm only going to use this green to highlight it. Whereas most likely you probably need to go three or four colors higher to, to make a sizable disparity in difference of color to visually see if that makes sense. So, so yeah. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions in the uh, comment section for question of the week. If you have something that you'd like to ask us and have us answer on the show, please do leave a comment on the YouTube version of this podcast. Got a good one this week. Love this username. Uh, Pretzelmeister. <laughs> solid name says uh i'm having trouble finding the motivation to paint do you have any advice all right this is like a hot it's like a hotline this isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. i think please it's, help i, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's situ it's situational because obviously we like, so i'm going to address him by the formal name so pretzel my stuff um obviously we're going to take it as a generalist question because there's no specific like i'm painting this and i'm struggling with this or whatever but i think in my opinion, I, I would paint something different to what you're painting. And I know we've touched upon it on other episodes before, but I do really think that when you paint something that's so different from the thing that you paint all the time, be it color, be it model, be it faction, be it game system, be it whatever, that's going to help you to kind of hit the reset button on motivation because it just gives you something different to focus on. I'm going to throw something into that because people always think like, oh, I'm painting Space Marines, try painting a different faction. I'm going to rule that out. Try painting like a scale model car yeah, or yeah, yeah. a bust yeah. or a 75 mil yeah. fantasy figure based on a movie. Like go completely off base. Yeah, it's, it's having um, multiple things on your kind of whip shelf at once, isn't it? Like Variety. And I think going, going, on, <laughs> going on the um, topic of the episodes, 
almost. Um, talking about the building and cleaning thing. If you start treating building and cleaning as as an activity in in itself, something to focus on. If you're not motivated to paint this evening, but you've got six boxes of models that need building, just kind of be okay with the fact that like, I don't really fancy painting, but I'm going to build them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put some effort into building them. Yeah. And as we've also touched on, nothing gets you pumped to paint like building new models because yeah, you just want to rush and get paint on them. Mm. So having a little break from it while still working on a different skill, or if you want to start maybe learning sculpting, so things like that you can still Definitely. benefit your hobby progress without having to paint if you have to force the motivation it's it's not always going to work out i think but also i would recommend i think episode one of this podcast we spoke about inspirational painting mm -hmm. moments and things yeah, things yeah. that really got us like rare into paint um and uh, we go over a few things in there. And I think if you are near, I don't know where Mr. Meister lives, <laughs> but um, if you're near somewhere that has, you know, a shop with a, a really nice selection of models on show, if you happen to be in the UK and you can get to Warhammer World, do the exhibition, not, nothing will get you motivated to paint like going through that exhibition yeah, at 100%. Warhammer World. Like, I'm, you know, God knows where, where this person lives. They might not be able to do that. But um, if it turns out they live in Nottingham, then they've probably been too much and it doesn't have been <laughs> um, Desensitized to the, uh, yeah, to the exhibition. Yeah. But just just uh, seeing amazing models in person. I agree, yeah. Well, Warhammer World is worth motivated. like a significant pilgrimage. That's that is traveled. the right word to just call it. It is worth it. Because it. it is that, been, yeah. I went Warhammer World. I was, it wasn't even on my radar, really. And then we went for a, for a staff event siege. Nuts, nuts place. Had you, ever, would, had would, you ever been before? Never been before. Yeah, okay. But like that had was... you ever, you'd probably, I, I guarantee because I was the same, not before then, but before I went, were you ever actually that bothered about going or were you like... Oh, not that bothered and I didn't yeah. think as well. I didn't realise that the like museum exhibition thing was like multiple rooms, like oh. a couple of hours to get through. I was thinking it'd be like a little room with some like box art models in it. Huge dioramas. Yeah. Massive slash, stuff. You've got to do slash it. Jewels. Like, Massive if, stuff. If you're watching this. Like stuff you have to be. climb stairs to look at. Like. Yeah. And, and it's majority of it is, it's the box art models. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. the models that are on the box. The box art models. Yeah. In like, a cabinet. Yeah. In yeah. front of your face. Yeah. Like, and I think I spoke about it before. I don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast, but there was that old tower ethereal that I was painting. Yeah. And you can't find any, pictures of it anywhere because mm. it never actually had box art in terms of like it didn't come in a box was it the army box special edition it was one? the army yeah, box yeah. special edition yeah. one it's a metal model yeah um and i could not for the life of me find a picture of the back of it and i had no reference on how to paint the back of this model and then i go to i, I go given up pretty much um on a separate point went to warhammer wells um They've got the box art model because obviously it, they had an heavy metal version of the model to have in magazines and stuff, but you only had the, the front image. Um, and it's on a display that has a mirror behind it. Brilliant. And I literally zoomed in on my phone on the mirror, <laughs> got a picture of the back of the model. Um, and unless anyone else has done that, I think I must have the only picture that exists of the back of that model. <laughs> um, and it really helped. So, like, there's the, it's insane the models that you can see going there. It's worth traveling, like, yeah. even if you're elsewhere in the UK and it's, like, multiple hours I'm to drive, like, do Next it. week, I'm going up to Sheffield on the Saturday and I am planning an extra couple of hours just to stop off in Nottingham and just, like, go in there just because I've been in a little while, like, just yeah. to get a bit it's, of it, like, it motivation. Is, it is really, really, really worth it. Like, if you, even if you're not in the UK and you're coming over to the UK, uh, it, like, England's not the biggest country in the world. You can pretty much get anywhere in England for within a day. Um, not within a day within like six hours yeah <laughs> so there's 24 hours in a day George it's, yeah it's, it's, well he's got you there he's technically, got you there. technically he's within a day yeah. so uh, how much sleep do you want yeah. like, <laughs> like, you know, um, like uh, but no you can you can pretty much get if you're in the UK you can get there within within a day and, and I would strongly advise like if you're into this and you've never been like um, yeah to go because the, 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 do you know the funniest thing obviously for me is I've seen Warhammer World change massively over the years when I started. I went when I was very young and the 
I remember seeing like the siege of the Emperor's Palace. That was a display. It was a fireplace they converted into the into the gate with like a titan, like titans. Uh, that's all obviously not there anymore now. But but I've seen it gone from a really tiny little museum all the way through to this crazy thing that you, that you experienced as the first time when we done that siege Christmas too, and we were all up there. Um, so to see that progression of it, it, I was like you back then in the day when it was a fireplace and 300, 400 models, whatever it was. But to, to really how it is now is like the most incredible. I think there's 400 models in the first cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Do you know what I'll say as well? First time I went was 2017, I think. And been, you know, sporadically since then. The exhibition, first of all, you can go in there. You can go in the shops. You can use the game hall. You can go to Bugman's Bar all free. Mm. You just walk in. Don't need to book anything. And then the exhibition, which is the only thing really you have to pay for, mm -hmm other than all the models you're going to be buying when you're there, <laughs> is, I think it, it's like seven pounds or something. It is, it's yeah. like seven quid. 100% yeah. worth it. And it's it. been seven quid since I have went the first time. So, so with inflation, like, you're making money. Do you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and if you find the assassin, then you're laughing. You find the assassin in Ticket that little, for, that little yeah. game thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's honestly... They also have uh, a... They're turned into a bit of an advert for Warhammer World, but yeah, yeah it's, it's... They have Forge World there as well. You can see all the Forge World stuff. If this if this conversation doesn't show you how much of a mo like motivational place for painting Warhammer World is, I don't know. I only mentioned it. We've gone off on a whole conversation well, about how good it is. Pretzel Meister, if you can't make it to Warhammer World, don't be disheartened. Please refer to uh, the first the few, other points. So even not, like there be other places, local stores, whatever that have models on that show almost, sometimes just seeing other people's models there's lots person. of model expos like all yeah. over the world as well not yeah, just specific yeah. to warhammer yeah, that's yeah. i remember have you ever been to like like a model train show or something but like they're nuts no How crazy no. yeah but well, you eat like refreshers that. there <laughs> <laughs> well it was full of mostly old people to be fair yeah i was gonna say spectrum, model but... trains is like it's more of a werther's market <laughs> yeah. than a, <laughs> than a refreshers. <laughs> it's <original>. yeah oh, <laughs> Right, James, you've alluded to it. Hobby hacks. This yes. is our closing segment on the show where we share a hobby hack with you. If you have one, please leave it in the comments. James, far away. So this one is uh, is a, a freak discovery that um, saved my bacon on a, on a numerous occasions. Um, so so yeah. Um, <laughs> do you want... It was the way you said it. It was the way you said it. Save my bacon isn't even that outlandish but the way you said it just made me laugh sorry oh it's okay it's all right save so, my bacon so, <laughs> so anyway um so with we're talking about spray cans obviously using them at a decent distance and all of that so when i was a lot younger um i used to spray can too far away and it was too cold and you can imagine the the the, the model was more texturized than the surface of the moon it was literally like full of craters divots all those kind of things and obviously back then once that you've done that you can't really do much to the to the to the model that's it you know I have to strip them and take that off and restart again um so it always bugged me and i was like how can i if i if i don't have a really bad finish as in like maybe it's a little bit rougher and that can happen if the can's sitting for a long time on a shelf and you don't shake it too much before you use it, it comes out way more powdery just well if you read the instructions on the can it does say to shake it for two to three minutes yes and correct. if you're a real freak like me you will sit there and start a stopwatch on your phone <laughs> I, mean, I mean olympic can can shaking times have never been sort of like a topic or thing that i want to do but <laughs> but 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 with that being said if the can has been sitting on a shelf for quite a considerable period of time and you don't shake it to enough or for example the temperature is, is not correct or whatever or the distance from the object is not correct. long story short if you get some form of subtle texture from the spray can then i have the tool for you um i used to get a, either a soft or firm, cheap 39p boots toothbrush that like you wouldn't put near your gums because it would rip into shreds. Not just yeah. any toothbrush, a toothbrush specifically from boots that yeah. specifically costs yeah, yeah. 39p. Hey, you can, specifically you can will go rip your gums Poundland, to Savers, Superdrug, wherever your, your, your retailer of choice. Your drugstore yeah, of choice. Your drugs, yeah. well, not a drugstore, George. Yeah. Uh, but like, you can get, call it a drugstore. It is a drugstore. Pharmacy, yeah. but yeah, okay. It's, but, <laughs> He's straight edge, he calls it a pharmacy. It's a pharmacy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you can go the to- The American viewers, drugstore. But you can go to any of those and- and uh, get yourself a really cheap toothbrush that you wouldn't like, you know, you know, if you go on holiday and you forget your toothbrush, you go to shops and you just find like the one you can just use because you need one really quickly. The one from like the hotel lobby. Yeah, the hotel lobby, yeah. Next to like some charm that, bracelets. That, that, is the, that is the toothbrush that you want to acquire. Um, and and uh, what you can do with it is you can lightly buff the model. And, it, and if it's a soft 
toothbrush, it won't scratch like cause like scratching on the model. But what it will do is the is the is the movement of the brush. Any of those little particles that are like almost stuck to the paint, but they're not properly secured, it will just take them off and actually smooth the finish of the model. Where this goes up to eleven is when you buy an electric toothbrush. Oh my god! Yeah. Okay. And then you do it with an electric toothbrush, and it almost polishes the roughness off of that badly primed or uh, I'm just imagining model. you there with like your car washing it with like a buffing wheel and you're like hang on a minute this is a light bulb moment <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was a very very big light bulb moment it works I love the idea of him using the toothbrush on the car that just is funny I mean, the they, and he gets the buffing wheel for his model so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the wall just explodes yeah um, no but you can use uh, either a, a, a really cheap uh, soft or firm toothbrush whichever you prefer and whichever you want to use but when you use an, uh, uh, an old electric toothbrush, because what happens is an old electric toothbrush runs out of battery or the battery doesn't last as long. So you can just literally use, keep your old one, don't throw it away or get rid of it. And then whenever you need to, you have that mistake or, or problem, you just get that out, stick it. You know stick what? You can change the head on a toothbrush. I was going to say, yeah, you yeah. can change the head well, on a toothbrush. Well, you can do electric. that, yeah. I'm use just your saying. main one. Use your main, your main one. You're getting dual use out. Use your Oral-B toothbrush that you got for Christmas. Just get a separate head. Quid. Don't confuse the heads though. Don't do <laughs> one... <laughs> Get like red teeth. Yeah, yeah. Like, Especially if you yeah. use like, well, if you're one of those people that uses like the charcoal toothpaste and it's like already black. Yeah, you're like, yeah. you're looking at the two, <laughs> you're looking at the two heads and you're like, is it, is it Abaddon black or is it charcoal toothpaste? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, but no, it, do, it does work. And the thing is, because, because um, it's, you're not going to be f- physically scrubbing it with the, with the hand action yourself, obviously, if the electric toothbrush is doing it, then only really you've got to just move it without putting force on it. Um, and it does actually work. Cool. Right? Have you experimented with different compounds in this? Uh, this no. I'm, You're just going in raw with get, the toothbrush? Don't get that, that into it, George. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining like, we're like, he's like, hmm, what if the toothpaste is slightly abrasive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God, what if you've got charcoal toothpaste and <laughs> used it on the model? I bet that would work. Uh, uh, find out in future episodes. No. We're not, we're not, we're <laughs> I'm going to test we're, that. We're no, no, no. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back next week. Yeah. But, that. but as a really good hobby, uh, electric toothbrush, if you do get a slightly, slightly rough finish on there. Get some it, turtle wax. It, 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 well, you don't have to put wax on it. But like, you literally, you literally can buff the model and it does work and uh, yeah I, I've it's it's saved me a few times when I've used that so so yeah so I, I didn't think he was it. going when he said the toothbrush thing I didn't I didn't know where he was going to be honest but yeah fair, I thought fair it, I, I, it the only thing I could logically think of was it was going to like flick paint at the model or something Oh, well, well, you, like can, blood, you can, blood, yeah, yeah. you can do that, I suppose. Yeah, but I prefer it's an extra use that you toothbrush. I'll tell you what, if you, maybe one. if you're doing like Angron or something, you use the electric toothbrush to do that. Oh yeah, you like just put it goes near everywhere. It, yeah, it just splats it everywhere. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, right, fine. I go away for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the feeling this was coming, Joe. I don't know about you. <laughs> an absolute carnage and shit ensues. It's like it's like leaving Mr. Bean in charge of your china. <laughs> Like, you know, it's it's, right. it's that we are uh, seconds into the episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, so like I'm going to tell you this now. Like this preamble is going is to Mr. be Mr. Bean. This, this, known for... Hang on, let's not gloss over. <laughs> hang that. on a second. No, no. Let's right. not gloss over that. Is Mr. Bean known for destroying China? I don't he, know. He, he's the clumsiest. Like, have you ever oh, watched he's Mr. Clumsy, Bean? Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. But it's not like Bull in the China Shop. It's like Mr. Bean Mr. in Bean your in China cabinet. I'd probably <laughs> say that Mr. Bean's worse than a Bull in the China Shop. Yeah. But anyway. This preamble is going to be spicier than Del Boy's Vindaloo from Star of Bengal. All right, okay. Like, I, I, I go away for a week. week. I go away for a week. There's a reference for the anyone over over thirty five. If you don't watch Only Fools and Horses, you you need to. Um, but yeah. So so I don't know what happened in the week that I went away or why you decided to turn on every. 90s nostalgia fanboy in existence but I'm going to fly the flag and fight that fight because it's it's it, it, it needs to be feel, fought this feels like a like a WWE promo <laughs> I feel like Hulk Hogan's coming for me I told you that you've been saying like, my first holiday in a long time so yeah. so I, I came back and I'm I'm recharged so yeah. so yeah but he's been sat there on the beach like thinking of like little Jamesism he's, like, he's right been sat down. there on the beach he's gone Del Boy's Vindaloo write that down Mr. Bean trying to shop Mr. Bean <laughs> I, I've got to say that I watched the episodes. It was good. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. The I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Thanks, James. <laughs> on to the topic for this week. I agree. I agree with a lot of a lot of bits and bobs here and there. However, on certain things, you were more you were wrong on more levels than a skyscraper in Dubai. Okay, so so you've got to understand that there are a lot of people out there that their experience of this is only relatively new, which I understand. And then you're not going to look at like an old bit of artwork. He's one of them. Yeah. That's he, one of them, right he, there. He, well, he eats refreshes, doesn't he? What do you expect? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that's what that was the was the point of the the podcast. I, I get it. However, there have been more references to the refreshes, by the way. How, <laughs> however, 
there are a lot of people which this red boxes, old paint, uh, red handle brushes. I could go on. All those things are super, super important to the to the history of how they got into this and where they come from. And 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 I think that you touched on some very good points in the episode, definitely. However, I think and that doesn't feel genuine was, if I'm honest. I think it was it was <laughs> Not swayed, feeling that. swayed a tiny bit in favor of because there are a lot of people that maybe haven't experienced those things. It, it's 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 the heritage of where our hobby comes from. And and I think that 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 was the point of the podcast though, was that we hear from the people that did experience those things all of the time. And we get told by those people, you must you must prefer You must this. be nostalgic for this thing that was around it's ten years case, before yeah, you were yeah, born. Yeah. You it's, must be. You must it's love not it. Case, it's not a case of must. It's just, you know, I guess it's like it's history. It's it's where where this all started. I did say I did from, say that. We know. did say on the episode as well, like we yeah. like a bit of vintage Warhammer. Like, yeah, I'm into yeah. the retro stuff. I think it's fun. And I did say the reason I, I kind of came to the conclusion that the reason why um, people are more nostalgic for that than than what I would be nostalgic for is because it's part of the history of yeah. the of the, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a uh, I think a good position to be in to have a fine balance of both. I think, in all honesty and, and just transparency, yeah. I think. Doing a bit of research, finding out a bit about the past is also really helpful because it's, as we always talk about, it's nice to add in those little flares into new stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really good way of complementing both. Um, you know, and, and again, there's nothing to say it's wrong with, with just you get into it and you don't know any other stuff. But if you're as crazy passionate as 99.9% .9 of our community are into this, finding out a bit about the past is, is also really interesting as well. Um, yeah, I don't you know, think anyone's disputing that. Yeah, but, no um, argument. But no, yeah, yeah you don't. Yeah, good. It was good. Good episode. I'm not gonna lie. I yeah. thought, it was, thought it was good. I just had to yeah. fight the fight for. I could see it. It was seething. I it was getting pretty yeah. pretty rolled up before we started I went, filming. I went. <laughs> I went. Did you watch the episode? And he went. I've got notes. I've got notes. <laughs> I've got notes. Yeah. No, it was good. It was really good. And uh, yeah, no, I had a good holiday. It's good to 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 get away. I haven't had a proper holiday in a very long time. Um, like going to events and going to like SN GT like. Um, but, um, but yeah, me and Reeve hadn't had a proper holiday like away for a long time. So it was good. Um, didn't get a tan as you can see, like, you know, <laughs> I could go on a tour. Well, at one go... point you were telling me you were going to take all your painting stuff. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And you were going to just be painting. That, that weren't going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you did that. I think it's good to take a break from, from painting for a while. Yeah. Uh, not just painting in general. Like, yeah, I, I, you know, uh, I, I really needed some time off after such a long time, but, um, but, but yeah. like specifically on the mini painting thing, like the focus of the show, like I think taking it seems like a bad idea because you're like, oh, I'd like, I'm away from the brushes. I'm going to like come back a bit rusty or whatever. But I think like you need that because I think if you just keep on, it's, it's surprising how you're like better after a break than if you'd just been powering through, if you get what I mean. I find that I could like be painting all week and like go really, really hard and I'd burn myself out. But if like, if I'd done five days, I probably would have got more done. If you get what I mean? Like yeah. you yeah. come back refreshed. Uh, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, even with work, like I took my laptop, but I didn't, I literally turned it on once to do one thing. Um, at, but yeah, I didn't use it at all while I was out there. So it was, it was, it was, and I do feel massively refreshed coming back like for work and also for the thing. And I think I've neglected that. Like I've, for anyone who knows me, like I, I am pretty full on with, with work and stuff and, and like, and I, I kind of neglected, neglected having a holiday uh, for a very long time. And I kind of like forgotten the virtues of, of having one and how much yeah. better you feel coming if back. If only you had someone in the office with you who continued to take a holiday for about the last three years. Yeah. If only that if only yeah. you had Yeah. If only you had someone like that around. Yeah, if only. Yeah. Yeah. But as I said, didn't tan. I went to some really hot places. You know, I, I could go on a tour of a leather factory and still not get tanned, you know, it's just like you know, <laughs> so so um <laughs> That one was so smooth, it just sort of skipped by. That was good. I was just going along I, that's with what the we, I, I had to buffer for that. Yeah. I took yeah. some time to process. Yeah, they yeah. tan leather in a factory. Thank no, you, James. No, we got for, the, yeah, yeah, we got that. that. Yeah. It we just got rolled out so just, smooth. Yeah, it was, just, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, uh, yeah. So it was good. Um, really enjoyable. So yeah. So, what are you uh, looking forward to getting back to most in regards to painting? uh so i what's got, next on your what's next on your so i've got so i'm doing a bit of a skills swap with one of the cs team 
they've made me a model. Uh, CS, and, by the way, custom Yeah, service. with custom service, yeah. So there's a character, which I'm not going to say now. I'm going to keep it a bit aloof. Um, but uh, there's a character that I've always wanted my own version of um, to match some artwork that I love. Um, you obviously know which which chapter it's from. I wonder uh, what uh, faction... If you was James and you was going to get a custom model made for you by a sculptor, yeah. I couldn't possibly think what yeah. faction you would pick. Yeah. I mean, even if you chose a Marine, there's so many chapters, yeah, yeah, There's so many I chapters to choose from. I could be doing the, be, the best bluff ever right now, but unfortunately you two... Already Spoiler alert, it. zero <laughs> chance. I mean, then, <laughs> all I will say is it better not be a model that there's already a retro model for, because obviously we all know how good retro was. Retro is, is so good. Why would you ever yeah. want to remake a model that still exists? <laughs> there isn't a retro model for. So, okay, okay. So, okay. yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So, I've done a bit of a, uh, a skills kind of trade with one of the custom service team. Uh, they've made an awesome case chaos lord uh that's that is a modernization of a retro model uh and i'm going to paint that for them and then they've made me the the model so um, that's the, the the chaos model which i've already put on my personal Insta painting instagram is, is already uh is the next thing i'm gonna i'm gonna do painting. yeah i'm really i've got Fine. some really good ideas for it so so yeah um i think they're good but yeah um so yeah, yeah that's, the, that's did you feel like the the painting withdrawal I did actually, yeah, because I, I saw obviously I, some of the stuff for, for the main topic obviously today, some of the stuff that got painted I, I hadn't seen yet because I've been away and I think Ad was still finishing it up or working on it. And um, so, yeah, so I saw that started going up and I was like, yeah, I, I really want to get back and get painting. So, so yeah, but no, it was good. Yeah, it was really good. Joe, how's your week been? Yeah, not too, well, last time we spoke, I uh, basically had a meltdown. When I was painting, this has been going on the, ongoing for a while. I've probably been here. No, no, about that was like, that was last week. Yeah, but last like week. the saga of this model has been going back now. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't get much time in on it, do I? So it's like a, f it's a few hours a week. So it's, it's like it's every like weekly episode like, they get their one hour update. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but after we um, spoke on the last episode, I kind of took the night off and then did like half hour, an hour of like just the next day, like just full clean up get the model, get rid of every problem. Mm. Um, and then eventually the next night did like, I think some of my best painting I've ever done on it. I'm going to so. jump in here because I saw you post. I saw the whip. I saw the good. whip and yeah. I was like, I've seen your painting from when you joined here yeah. to, to where you are now. And, that's a big jump. It's probably yeah, because yeah. he listens to a podcast every week where they just paint <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally like, it is like, I have like, it's almost like I have no excuse to do certain things that I would have used to skimp out on or something. You know what I mean? Because I have the conversation every day with well, like either you two or like other people or painters or whatever. So I can't bring myself to skim power. I like to something. think that me and James live like rent free in your head like the devil on your shoulder. <laughs> Literally like I'm about to do something and it's like or like I'm about to paint like a bolter or something I just hear it's a lens. Paint it as a lens <laughs> yeah. or something like that. So yeah um, it's not finished so it probably won't actually you'll probably be able to see There's no time constraint on it though. I think we, No you'll you probably yeah. see pictures of it this weekend maybe but it's not going to be in the episode. But. No. I'm, I'm going to take your advice. This is my little update for the week. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna kick off some Warhammer Underworlds. I think. Yeah, you mm, you said you were interested yeah. in a bit of those models. Big. Yeah, they're great. I've been looking for an excuse to get into Kill Team. Sort of fell a bit flat for me. Not gonna lie, and I'm looking for like a new a new in for like a sort of gateway game. I don't want to do an army game. Skirmish game is even a bit much sometimes. It's like especially because I'm the sort of uh, the banner bearer for my friends. Right, I'm trying to get them into it. So if I'm Taking it on board to paint like three war bands. I mean, I'm basically doing like an army at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Underworlds, you sold me, not gonna lie. The one, the models are sick. Mm -hmm. Two, there's like the new starter sets and stuff that they've revealed like yep. the last couple of weeks. So there's only one choice. Feels Which, like the perfect time to get into it. There's only yeah. one choice. The army of dogs. <laughs> yeah, there is one there choice. is the no, dogs. There's not, no, the, the one with the dogs is War Cry. No, 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 no. That's there's underworlds are also that. The Hexbane Hunters, I think it is. No, uh, oh, I don't know. The new Warcry thing has like five dogs in it. So I was thinking Oh, okay. No, there is, there is there a is Underworld one dogs. with a couple of dogs in it. Yeah. 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 So that's... Um, army of dogs. That's up there. Yeah. And a man. But yeah. yeah. Looks good fun. Don't have watched a few videos on it. It's a solid game. Like um, I think I'm going to reluctantly not paint them to start and just build the models and learn to play the game. Because I always do this thing where I'm like, oh, the models need to be like perfectly well painted because that's yeah. my thing. And then inevitably I never play the game. Because yeah. the models never it's, get uh, finished. I think I think you'll want to paint them more if you play a few games with them. That's a well. good point. Yeah. That's a good point. I think you will. I think you'll be like, oh, these are amazing. Especially if you're running the dogs. I'm biased to the dogs, but yeah. Yeah, there's um 
I've only played with a couple of different teams, so I haven't um, got like a huge experience. But I did find that in terms of learning the rules and stuff, um, any of the like Stormcast ones are just so like straightforward. That's good. I think the start set comes with Stormcast. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and they're, they're cool. They're all cool. Like even they're the coolest Stormcast models. <laughs> like they're all cool. Fun fact, Stormcast, first models I painted as, a, as an army project. Oh, well, there you go. So that's nostalgic for you. I think they're good. All the though. way back to two years ago. <laughs> yeah. They are pretty much like, like, they are the poster boys of Age of Sigmar as well. So they're good models to have. A, a, I think they're, yeah. I don't know about the new starter sets. I think they're the older armor. I'm still, you know, everyone like lost their mind when like the new, I don't know what the armor's called, like the new sleeker like Stormcast refresh. Like they're almost like they're know, Primaris yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. I'm kind of into the old ones. I'm not going to lie. I prefer the newer ones. I'm not going to lie. I like the poses and the like models better. I felt like the armor was cool before. Yeah, I don't even chunkier. think I've noticed enough of a difference in it to even acknowledge that. The original ones are really nice. They're cool models, but I I, I genuinely I just prefer... don't, don't think I was paying enough attention to Age of Sigmar. That's fair. They're more originally. like... They're more like a... A bit sleek, Roman. aren't they? Yeah. 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 I think it's really good though because you've got the you've got the heavier ones of the new ones that are bigger. They are like the Terminator esque uh Stormcast, if you want to call them anything. But um and I think that the difference between those two, whereas with the older stuff, they were all very similar in size and proportion and all that kind of stuff. So I think visually when you've got an army, like with Marines, you can see an aggressor unit, you can see a Terminator unit, you can see like that was what I struggled with. Like when that was my first like army project, I got the big AOS starter box. That was like yeah. after I painted a couple of Marines getting into the hobby, I was like, right, I'll buy like a starter box. And I got the the starter box for AOS, which was obviously like all the Stormcast. This is before the new the new ones that we're talking about. And that was what I found the most boring about them was like basically no matter what unit it was, they all looked like basically the same. Yeah. Um but that does seem alleviated now. But the war the what the sorry, not war cry, the uh, the underworld model is really cool. Yeah. 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 Looking forward to that. Should we do some uh, viewers' comments? Yes. Chris uh, Mini Paints says, uh, this is in regards to the nostalgia episode last week, uh, have to agree, as someone who's only been painting for a couple of years and has still never played a game, I have no nostalgia for older stuff. I think some of it looks uh, okay, but the newer stuff has way more character, in my opinion. True, this is kind of what I was going over in the episode as well. Like, these old heads trying to tell me that second edition Marine has more character than some of the new kits. It's just not... Not true is it i think it depends on how you look at it because when you it, there wasn't the internet or as, as much of an opportunity to find out stuff and just word of mouth and groups and things like that back then so you would read it into the books read into the read into sort of like the, the old codexes um i think because of that there is a lot of not to to just to give an alternate opinion i think when you when you didn't have all the things that we have now, like Wikipedia or Lexicanum or all this kind of stuff, you, you kind of had to read the books to find out more about the models. And I think because of that, you did have a greater sense of of interest for the models and things because of that, I think. More of a connection. Yeah, more it? of a connection to it, I think. Yeah. Um, that's just my opinion, but there's, there's no right or wrong. It's just, yeah. you know. Uh, Necker Loves Cake, old fan, I believe, I remember this name. Uh, I'm massively nostalgic for the late 80s pricing. First time I bought Space Marines was the uh, RTB001 box, and you got 30 plastic multi-part Space Marines for $9.99. I'm 41. I was painting models when I was eight years old. They were awful compared to what we have now. Metal models are an abomination. Everything is so much better now. And just quickly on that, I did a little bit of uh, research on this on the uh, Bank of England. $9.99 in uh, 1987 is still £27.50 today. So I feel like everyone here is like, oh, Marines used to be so cheap. Like, I know they are that a bit more from, expensive than that That was for 30 now. of them, though, did he say? That was 30. Of, I would much rather have 10 of the new plastic ones for similar money. Yeah, but that's still, that was the newest thing at the time. So it's still cheap compared to now. I, I recognize that it was cheaper, but... I like, mean, you're paying they're like different 90 things, quid right? now. I don't think it's fair to compare the two, though. Like, the quality is... They're, they're very different. I think you've got to think of the times and think of, obviously, the process that was involved. Like, plastics, back then, the, a lot of the range, plastics were very... Mainly tanks and mainly things like that, with, obviously, metal additional components. A lot of your infantry in second ed was metal because of the casting process and because of... Just because of the nature of the cost of metal moulds... Uh, sorry, uh, plastic moulds, if that makes sense. Um, and, and the technology has come on leagues, like, literally leagues... I just don't then. think you can compare pricing for something that even then wasn't great detail. 
co compared to what we have now. No, you know correct. I mean? uh, there's a, there's, there's not. There's more than just the inherent detail on the actual miniatures now. It's it's everything that goes into it's it behind the, the scenes process, that you don't see. Because you can still buy cheap miniatures of that similar quality, and they're very cheap for a reason. Because compared to the competition, they're nowhere near as good, right? Yeah, yeah, there is that. But I think it's probably you, more a flippant comment on the fact that that was the newest. Oh yeah, thing for sure. Get at the time, yeah, yeah. And it was obviously way cheaper. The thing is, I remember lots of models when they first came out, like metal models, and I was blown away by them. Like even, even like, in, like for example, like the the old Inquisitor game. The bigger, the bigger size model. Oh yeah, I remember. So when when they <laughs> George used to love that. He played it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, those when those models came out, like the diff, the quality of those models for the size that they are in AC metal was amazing. I thought when I was when I was younger. Are they the bigger scale ones? They're, they're the bigger like the scale ones. Mil. Yeah, like they're, they're much bigger. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, like Captain Artemis, the Mortar Factors, Death Watch Captain, like you know all that kind of stuff. Um, I think. You, there was there was progression with that material as well, like metal. It did get better, but and um, but pricing as well. I, yeah, look, we all look at the back of old white dwarfs. If you've got old white dwarfs kicking around and see some of the prices in there, the old prices are 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 crazy. But then inflation. And this this might there. sound a bit cliche, but do you think like they're going to get that much better in the future, like than where we are now? But uh, but you uh, you, know, you say that, but like. I see, the same thing applies to painting competitions and painting quality and all this kind of stuff. You think that you're at the precipice and then someone else does something and someone else does something and someone it's, else um, does something. So It's similar to just technology in general, I guess, because it's technology behind the process is what's going to lead to them being better. I just but think like that technology in general feels like the last 20 years has been an insane jump and then if you actually look at the last five years it's like but I feel million. like if like a marine for example if it got any more detailed for the scale all of that detail would have to be smaller and I just don't see either one even being able to see it with your eyes holding the model and let alone being able to paint it like, I just don't know how much more detail they can get yeah I don't know if it's necessarily about you know, like crispness people, mate, like they're so sharp already people were saying that about 720p TV, yeah, exactly. right. it's so like real there's, life. There's always something. Yeah, yeah. I think true. I think you're always going to see that. You're always going to see progression, especially with again, look, the, the the cost inside of stuff. Back then, there wasn't such a big design department in Games Workshop that there is now. There wasn't the machinery, the the, 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 the computers, the, the the software, all that kind of stuff. It was very different. Obviously, a lot was hand traditional sculpting back then, but and because of that the costing obviously was sort of substantially different but but you can't you kind of kind of can't have these super crisp amazing miniatures and then not have all of that overhead and all that costing to to facilitate it yeah. um a lot of people just look at the inherent pro product and go oh that's amazing but th there's no thought process to a lot of the stuff that goes into it in my mind sometimes. even down to the point of like if the actual product is cheap to make which it probably is yeah 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 people just look at that yeah the r&d oh the markup must be up. like yeah so much but it's like yeah there's a lot of work that went into getting yeah. that product to be able to be and made. also now because so many people are into it they've got to make thousands and thousands of them yeah so yeah just yeah. cost economy of scale like exactly yeah. yeah yeah although to the comment commenter's point i wouldn't turn down 30 in assessors for a tenner if they wanted to go back to that i mean fair yeah fair yeah. uh chris country says oh sorry chris courty says uh, you will not know Hoppy Pain until you try to build a second edition land speeder. <laughs> oh, well, I've never tried. So they are uh, they are a little bit uh, a little bit um, difficult. James not not holding James up, looks, really, James. You're James not looking looks, great. James looks scarred from thinking about it. Yeah, your uh, your comments at the start of the episode about how amazing all the uh, the old retro stuff is not standing the uh, the test of this conversation. Amazing can have lots of, lots of connotations. The look of it, the feel of it, the way it paints building is a connotation of that it doesn't mean it's a good thing so you know um yeah if, if you're the say joe amazing can mean terrible too yeah yeah if 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 anyone remembers the very first thunderhawk that they made the metal one you needed like a a, a, a nasa degree to to, to 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 build it and and more more metal pin than you can imagine i don't think so, my uh, mr bean skills would uh yeah quite don't, give, don't give one to mr bean It'll, i think quite, um no you called us you say not we're mr bean yeah oh. i think uh Chris might actually be a, a previous Siege client as well. I feel okay. like I, I've spoken to him before, if that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, name so good, good to see him listening to the, the podcast. Tezza B says, Absolutely love the slow increase of Blood Angels being added to the background over the course of each episode. By episode 40, we should have James in a full Dante kit. Keep going, <laughs> lads. 
Uh, well, uh, a bit different, bit of a different dress today. We've had a bit of a ultramarine overhaul. Yeah, yeah. But in general, yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, a little bit of an ultramarine overhaul, and the, the walls are blue, so it's appropriate for the episode as well. So, yeah. yeah, there you go. So yeah, I did actually need to. I forgot to do something uh, earlier on, which I do need to do because otherwise, it's gonna. I, I'm gonna feel very guilty for not doing it. When I was coming back from holiday, I got on the plane to come back, and as I was going up the stairs, a member of cabin crew stopped and went. Are you James from Siege? So, Frankie, I have to give you a shout out for the phenomenal <laughs> flight. Um, I'm big so, ups, Frankie. Uh, Frank, I've got to say uh, a, a big thank you for for being so kind, and, and it was really nice to meet you on the flight. Um, uh, he, he collected knights and was showing me like all the knights and tower and stuff that he was he was. Uh, That's collecting. actually so amazing. I That's have mad. To, I have yeah. to I have to just stop and say a big thank you to him because I it was I I re- remember to obviously do it, but I I kind of went off on a tangent at the beginning. So yeah, yeah. you were so like. Fired up on Worked second edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry to chuck that in, but I have to do that. Well, cause, cause, I'm, sure, um, I'm sure Frankie will understand. Yeah, but, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. So we painted uh, some new Marines Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as the topic for this week. Yeah, a few people might have picked up as we were dropping them what the theme was on these latest releases that we were going for. Yep. So uh, all the new Space Marines that were revealed by GW, we fortunately got to uh, preview for the article. Uh, and we set a bit of a challenge for ourselves amongst the team. So rather than normally when there's a release like this, we'd be like, oh, what chapter should we paint them as? What scheme should we do them as? And we thought it was really good fun when we'd done the, the challenge for the Tyranids of doing all the different schemes. We thought, oh, let's do a bunch of different schemes. But to tie them in, we've done all Ultramarine successes. So uh, the miniatures that we painted were uh, the new... Um... Well, yeah, we got through some of the company heroes. Um, we got through... We added in, we still had some of the Warhammer heroes um, yep. to paint as well, the um, the blind box thing. Mm-hmm. So we added some of those in. Um, and the jump pack intercessors we had in there as well. So between a mix of all of those, um, we kind of all just picked a model or two that yep. we wanted I'll to paint. I'll throw, uh, if you're watching the video version of the podcast on YouTube, I'll have those on screen for you now. Uh, the chapters we chose were Scythes of the Emperor, uh, Marines Errant, Castellans of the Rift, Genesis chapter, definitely not Blood Angels. Brazen consoles, Aurora chapter, Iron Snakes, and Black consoles. Yeah. James, you misunderstood the assignment. <laughs> no, I was skillful. Actually, I just want to point out that I didn't choose Genesis chapter. Joe chose it, and I conveniently yeah. looked at it and went, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no. I chose it because you were going to paint it as a Blood Angel. Yeah. So I was like, we're doing the ultramarines thing. Like, yeah. There's this ultramarine successor that basically looks like Blood Angels. Yeah. Do you want to just paint this successor? Pre- predating that conversation, there was no like negotiation. James was like, the new captain's out. I'm painting it as a Blood Angel, obviously. Yeah. I, know I don't paint for the company, but I'm taking that model and painting <laughs> yeah, it as a Blood Angel. Yeah. So, which is like, fair enough. I did. Was, I, d- I did. He was like in love with that captain as soon as he saw it. So fair yeah. enough. But we come up with that. I feel like it's a good compromise. Here's we can still do it as the ultramarine no, successor. It's, ju- it's just called tactful painting. That's yeah. that's what it. Well, no, brought it in. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're not going to do this because not. Oh, we was like, okay, well, we can do it as as the Genesis chapter, and we'll do like the shoulder pads for it and everything. And if down the line you want to change to a Blood Angel, that's up to you. You didn't do that. You put blood drops on the the purity seals yeah. for one, right? Who's to say he didn't fight with yeah. Blood Angels? He's an assault. You captain. changed the head to look like the most Blood Angel man I've ever seen in my life. And then and you painted seconds. the Aquila so the wrong Gen- colour. Genesis chapter can't have blonde, blonde hair? No. Okay. They All also right. can't have like vampire teeth and blood hanging out of yeah. yeah. Number but one, he doesn't have vampire teeth for a start. That's, that's, he might that as well head, have. Vampire, that, vampire teeth. Vampire, vampire, yeah, vampire teeth. Yeah, vampire teeth. That head is from the limited edition captain with the outstretched plasma and power fist. So it's not even a blood angel head. All I'm saying is the Aquila then was painted the wrong colour. So that it didn't was, do the shoulder pads. It was blood angels instead of. So it was a it was a misunderstood assignment. But I've got it. I've got it. You were I, so close to getting away with it. Yeah. It was the perfect crime. Yeah. If you'd have if you'd have 
done one of those things. I tried to sneak the we blood might drops have on not, the, on We the, might have not even noticed. Yeah. yeah. The blood I, drops, we might have not even noticed. I, I wouldn't have noticed that, that was a cheeky little, little If the rest of it was done detail. properly. He wasn't trying to get away with you. He pointed them out to me. I yeah, didn't even see them. He was exactly. like, oh, did you see here? I've done the, the blood drops. I'm like, yeah. brilliant. Hey, look, he could have, he could have said so, that. So, yeah, James so. misunderstood the assignment. The model did look very nice, though. The model was... The see, what I then conveniently... I told you I needed a new Lord of Skyfall. So then what I basically did is I just... Once the project was completed, I then added on all the bits that are Blood Angel and turned him from Varro, which is what we named him as a random captain from the Genesis chapter, into Lord of Skyfall Matano, Eighth Company captain. Do you know what was funny so, about that? You know how James had the the little rant about the, uh, the the cape being fireproof when that model was revealed? Yeah. Did you see that Darren Latham commented on that video <laughs> yeah. and confirmed yeah. that it was fireproof? Yeah. <laughs> Look, as I mentioned, when you see the model 2D, Things don't always look the way they do in hand. When I got the model and built it, the cape was well out of the way of any jump pad exhaust Yeah, but it doesn't matter that whether it was out of the way, it's fireproof. It's fireproof. Darren Latham said so. Okay. Yeah. You got called out by the designer. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. I'm more Not than happy. Not called out, corrected. I'm more corrected. Than, I am more than happy. Put in your be, place, some would say, John. I, I am more than happy to be humbled completely by it. But, yes. um, but the model itself is, uh, is, is phenomenal. And the cape, I can confirm the cape does not get in the way of the jump pack. Um, yeah, no, really good. Enjoyed it hugely. Uh, obviously, painting red and uh, and yeah, like I, I I genuinely think it's one of my favourite models I've painted. Yeah, genuinely. So that it does that whole conversation, as funny as it is, does highlight one of the points that I wanted to make in this style of video, which is that it, if you want to pick a certain chapter, there is almost I I. I would encourage people not to only be drawn in by the color scheme because you could love um, the lore of the Ultramarines, for example, but love the look of the Blood Angels. And there's a chapter for you. There is probably a successor chapter for whatever chapter you want to pick that looks like the other one that you prefer the look of. So like, if, if you want to if you wanted your army to be to do with Ultramarines, we're kind of showcasing how many I mean, none of the others off the top of my head really look. I mean, there's arguably the Aurora one kind of salamandery, but not like full on salamanders. Mm -hmm. But like James's one in particular, like you don't just because you want to paint red, don't just automatically go, oh, I suppose I've got to do Blood Angels. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, yeah, you can, can do Ultramarines, and there's a successor chapter there with some lore, with all this oh. stuff, with some notable characters, I think, that are actually named in, in the, some of the books. In some books, yeah. So there's a lot of lore there for a successor chapter that looks like Blood Angels, and you can still paint your red and have a, an Ultramarine. It's amazing successor. how many. I like to think of myself as someone who knows like quite a lot of the Marine chapters, quite a big Space Marine fan. It's amazing how if you just go down a lexicon and rabbit hole, how mm -hmm. many like. Chapters come out. Not, not to mention, you can make your own. Obviously. Yeah, there is that there as well. Is that as well. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to point out, just to go on it, I actually was committed to painting him as a non blood angel because I actually was going to paint him as a Sons of Aura. So it's still a blood, uh, a, still a red chapter, but it would have had white pads. But conveniently, Joe pointed out that the Genesis chapter. Yeah, but the, the plan was still. So that you could eventually turn it into a blood angel. Yeah, yeah. So it was the I was same going, thing. I yeah. just thought I'd point you towards one that would make that a bit easier. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So, and you spat in our face. Yeah, none of the none of the others I think are particularly reminiscent. The the one none of the ones that we did are particularly reminiscent of um, any other chapter. Like really. any other first founding chapter. Yeah. Although, I would say the one that I'm working on, which you don't have completed images of right now, but the, there should be pictures up at the weekend. After this episode, they'll be on out. the uh, Siege Instagram at Siege Studios. Yeah, but they won't be probably on this episode. Um, it's it's Black Legion colors. It's literally Black Legion. It's also colors. it's just black with with uh, gold trim. It could kind of be whatever, like yeah. black space marine. It could be black. Yeah, but like if you specifically, wanted, like... it's like because of the gold trim. I think it was just instant. It it's red like, we're, we're it looks... uh, red weapons. Yeah. It's like instantly reminiscent of Black Legion. Yeah. Me. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's been. I, I had the, one of the Warhammer Heroes models for mine, and um, it's the one throwing the grenade, which it's great also, uh, incidentally, I've never. I, I realised I'd never actually painted smoke before. No, oh, really, I've never had a model that had smoke. You don't get a lot of smoke, weirdly. No, no. Like yeah. even when I was doing my Death Guard stuff, I remember. I think Typhus has like a load of smoke, but you cannot put that on. I just didn't put that on. Does that go back to your comments about how when you're building the models? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Extra stuff like, on. Why would I put this whole thing of smoke with like flies on it? I'll just leave that off. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's that's been fun. Um, obviously, 
like I said, I, I it, it does go back to the comment of what you were saying about being able to take a break and reset rather than push through all the time. Yeah, yeah. Because we had that conversation and I thought that I'd like messed everything up and it was with the edge highlights. And then once I just, I took a night and I, I just didn't paint at all. I didn't even look at it. And then the next day, like I said, I went back addressed all the issues, just cleaned it up, basically took it back a step or two and then went back in with a bit of more of a fresh mindset and I think did, I've done... It's the hardest thing to try and convince yourself to do, but it always works. Like, it always works. I'm just kind of... I almost like... I get to that point a lot in models and, I, and I'm sort of sick of it. Like I'm sick of getting to a certain point and going, oh, I don't, I've messed it up. I don't want to paint it now. Like, so it was, it's one of the first times where I've like pushed through... Um, that kind of thing and obviously I'm, I'm benefiting from it now because it looks a lot better than most other stuff that I've painted yeah I mean part of why I'm preaching that so much now is I've gone from like I'm now probably at like the healthiest point in the hobby where I'm like spending like an appropriate amount of time on it because mm. I was commission painting full time for a couple of years and I'm a bit like you James a bit of a workaholic like I went way too far like the wrong way I was painting like 12 hours a day most days like 6 days a week which is way too much and you Forget the burnout. Like not I don't, sustainable. It's not, but it's not even just that. It's like you don't improve. Everyone says like the 10,000 hour thing. It's like, yeah, but what are you spending those 10,000 hours doing? Because if you're just like doing the same sort of thing all the time, I've got to you're not on. actually really going to improve. I've got to say that like you could work 12 hours a day, but you could be in, in, uh, inefficient in those 12 hours. Exactly. And it's about being efficient and doing things that maximize quality and also time investment. Yeah. Um, so you're efficient with your time, but you're hitting the best quality. There is a fine balance. Um, I mean, yeah. I started dialing it back to like towards the end of doing that. I started dialing yeah. back to like five days a week and I was found that I was getting more done even yeah. though I was spending less hours doing it because having that mental break, like you come back just way more efficient, you realize you're making mistakes. And then on the flip side of that now, working here full time, I'm back to like, I guess more average hobbyists, like just painting in the evenings. Yeah. And I only do that like probably three, four nights four a week. week. Or four weekends mm-hmm. and bits and bobs. Like but that. in that downtime, like one, like I said, you get kind of the withdrawal. So I'm more excited to paint now because yeah. I don't, get to do it as much and you spend like just in the back of your mind you're like having more thoughts about it right so because you've been you've only say i've only painted like two hours the evening the night before i didn't finish the thing i was working on i'm sat spending the next day like in the back of your mind like on your lunch break you're like oh actually i thought of another idea for that because you've had that time away from it you've got these like fresh ideas on how you're approaching things or mm. other ideas concepts things you could be doing yeah 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 it's definitely i mean even in a really scaled down version of that obviously i benefited from that on on this model um, I'm, I'm like actually it got to a point where I'm like actually looking forward to oh what am I going to paint next rather than yeah, yeah. I don't even want to look at it tonight do you know what I mean yeah um, so yeah it's it's. I mean black is easy enough to paint I've it, I just went down the normal kind of um, I went with the 950 as the, the thing which we've kind of spoke about briefly on here before um and then, luckily enough, you only really have to then tackle the edge highlights because it's black and I haven't done like a Zenith or anything. So went straight f- to Incubi. Didn't, I haven't really done any mixes. I've just went like Incubi, then Thunderhawk. Um, Femories. And then, yeah, uh, George has bullied me into doing uh, <laughs> bullied, an, an extra. <laughs> every, time I post a, every time I post it, like mentioned it. Um, uh, yeah, like an extra little, like just corners and dots. And I said stuff this to you, right? You put all the work in for doing the two stages of the highlights. You've done the hard bit. Yeah. yeah. Add the third stage. It's such a dots, small yeah. thing to do when yeah, you've laid yeah, that yeah. groundwork. Yeah. And it I, makes I, I, such I, a difference yeah. to the and finish. I, and the dots as well. So, yeah. like adding the, like the last stage. But that will take, yeah. doing well. those final two stages of highlights will probably take like half less than time. half the time you're doing the first two And it adds so much. Yeah. But that's where the difference happens. That's the good bit. Yeah. I'm going up to, to, Femerizian and then Blue Horror Blue Horror Dots yeah. probably. fun fact but. that is literally the Black Leech recipe from GW well there we go yeah. so that's what I said I told you yeah. although where I would have deviated from whatever they use is I went down your route of the scale golds yeah um, the gold the doing the gold trim is has been interesting because it's like which gold are you using so I Started with the base coat was the dwarven one, which is not yeah, your dwarven not has your, trash coverage, not your one, which yeah. isn't wasn't bad though. It's it, not it bad. It's few, be- dwarven yeah. over another better covering metal is yeah, is yeah. yeah. It dwarven's a, a really nice color. I love dwarven, dwarven, and but Elven. it's not. It's great. The reason I like the scale color 
ones specifically that I mentioned on that episode was because they cover super, yeah. super quick. The the issue that I'm having with that is like, I just hate edge highlighting metallics. I can never make it look, I can, can never get it. I spoke about it on the, the Tyranids thing. I just can't like get it looking fine enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, if it Do you gets, mean like the actual thickness of the lines? Yeah, yeah. Like it's so, even when they're on like corners, I feel like I just struggle to get the right consistency, I guess, with the paint. I mean, metallics it, but... behave do you, do you know different. What? Yeah, the, exactly. not, ne not necessarily because they're metallic, but I find that there's more variety in the consistency of a metallic paint out of the pot Amen, yeah. than there is yeah. from yeah. most other acrylics. Yeah. Like so even, think... even within the scale color range, like I said, like Viking Gold is like reasonably thick, covers super, like, one two coats really dwarven gold is like a lot thinner yeah goes on a lot more watery tends to separate on the palette you and just, I, you I just also... need to mix mix the metallics to get the consistency right so that it behaves the same as a normal acrylic in the way that you can do the edge yeah um, some paints as well really the wet palette's fighting you it might be worth using a dry palette yeah I agree. oh with metallics i, agree. I tend to I use a dry palette because yeah. anyway. yeah. i'll use a wet palette for metallics still I, i'm not someone who's like against that but it does depend on the paint for me like Correct, yeah. i'll just go case by case yeah, there's yeah. way more variety in paint consistency with metallics yeah. as yeah. a rule I, um i'm definitely leaning more into i'm just kind of trying to do a more shading mm. and then i'm just going to try one really thin uh edge on them but yeah it's been been fun to paint by the end of it um and again what chapter I is it it's black consoles okay which yeah. again has uh, it's uh the symbols like the raptors symbol basically yeah yeah um and um which uh, handily enough um, is on the transfer sheet now in the jump pack intercessors yeah it is yeah yeah box, which is really nice cool transfer sheet the new one yeah I've yeah. got to say that's one thing that I think that it, it, you, I've got to say that the Games Workshop was really rectified you used to just get ultramarines in there which don't get me wrong it's all well and good everyone's got a draw for everyone's got transfers. thousands yeah. of ultramarine transfers but to have people it, that have clicked on this probably do quite enjoy having a draw full of ultramarines transfer yeah. so we, we yeah. won't go there's, too negative on there's it nothing, but... there's nothing too bad with having them but what, what I was trying to get at is just adding a sheet which allows the option of choice to either create your own chapter using a potential icon or having a few more uh, different chapters you know there. my favourite thing is with the transfer sheet you've got loads of Roman numerals on there now yeah, yeah, yeah. which are just universally useful like not even just on marines right like, yeah. that's just that's just useful to have and there's a uh, purity seal uh, text which is oh, glossed cool. over. Yeah. I don't think people uh, people take too much note of them. I love them. Like, I, think, I, I quite enjoy freehand in the text, but if you're someone who's like not got the best brush control, like a nice, well, like made transfer for some purity seal text is yeah. tremendous. Just yeah. cut out a tiny little bit, put it on purity seal. Yeah, hair dryer. No, I agree. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Happy days. That's good. Yeah, I tell you what was funny actually. I was, obviously the the weapon casing's red, and I thought. I'm not going to go down the step like I would normally just go straight in, my fist yeah. and like whatever. I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try. I've got a few other red paints I'm going to try. I tried like Vallejo bloody red or something. Mm -hmm. Just like horrible. <laughs> just like, the just coverage. like, just the worst, like just, yeah, the coverage wasn't nice. And then like, it was just, it felt really glossy. Yeah, it was like, normally a pretty like safe I know. bet for acrylics. They yeah, are yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know whether I just had a dodgy pot or whatever, but I did like a few coats. I was like, Oh, I've get had them, get them a fist and it's, it's better through get the airbrush I know it went straight over the, the yeah it did seem like it would be something bloody red be, is better through the airbrush be maybe yeah. better through the air, airbrush well but, um, speaking of bloody red I'm guessing you used blood red on yours you win bingo yeah. you win can you not price. tell from needing sunglasses to look yeah, at can you not tell from the fact that you went blind after <laughs> yeah. looking at the model yeah I told you it's it's, it's a very we great... did tell on that episode that I, I did give the you a bit of cred still, for, yeah. uh, for the blood red yeah, yeah. the vibrancy yeah. is uh, it's just amazing. It's got such a rich, warm, vibrant finish when you airbrush it. it I just, uh, I can't, put, I, I've, I haven't changed it because it's such a good red. Um, yeah. It looks like, do you know what it looks like? You know when you're like driving in the dark and there's a stop sign and your headlights like reflect off of them? It's like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But interesting, interestingly enough, there used to be, there used to be a, 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 a hex pot called Blood Angels Red and, there, and then that one is way more orangey than blood red blood red mm. is a red like it is a vibrant super rich <laughs> blood red is a red no what Thank i mean you. that's <laughs> the sort of stuff you're tuning in for yeah that's the sort of what insight. i saw things that the listeners really can rely us for what week I, after week they I come back mean, for the go, knowledge yeah. dump what what i mean is that it's some some reds tend to have a bit of an orangey hue in them yeah. like for example yeah. wild rider it's, it's called wild rider red but it, it's got an orangey hue to it 
your... Do you like Wild Rider Red? I do, yeah. yeah. I don't like Wild Rider yeah. Red. Yeah. First it saturates well, your models. Yeah. So I... first stage, because the because Blood Red is so vibrant for the edges, because it's I, I literally edge with Wild Rider first. That's the first stage highlight on Blood Red. That's like my third stage on doing a Blood Angel with mm. the current metallic... Uh, current... Metallics? Sorry. With current the current, metallics. With the current <laughs> range of reds. <laughs> metallics? What are you on about? Yeah, call yourself a blood angel. George fan. exposed yeah. <laughs> for just doing contrast over metallics. Yeah. All of his is the angels. new is the new contrast that you call blood red. There is a blood red. It's blood uh, angels red. Blood angels red. Blood angels red. Yeah. yeah, the name is back in back in back in service. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. It's good good paint for the airbrush as well. So yeah, or well, the blood red or the blood angels both red. Both of them. Yeah, both of them are good. Yeah. How does so, the yeah. color compare with the the new stuff? Uh, it's not as vibrant. Uh, obviously, if you put it over a white base, the contrast is quite punchy. But but I, I still think blood red trumps it. So, so yeah, still horrible to use. <laughs> We're not with an airbrush. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a piece of point. That was the discussion though, because I said you can airbrush it on, and then you go in with the brush, and it's like a different color. It yeah. doesn't make sense. Well, George, you don't have a nail. Just stop making mistakes. Just stop making mistakes. You don't have a nail. Just be better. Like, you know, just be better. Yeah. You, you don't, I said you use different tools with different jobs. So, so yeah. yeah. Anyway, can you use your little kiddie paints where you're allowed to make mistakes so yeah. you're a freshers yeah we let the big boys airbrush their <laughs> their, blood, their blood red just to carry i never said that so so yeah uh i did the uh company champion, company yeah. champion. Yeah. yeah company champion everyone kenobi he's not everyone kenobi he, he looks a bit we've like had this discussion well, we had an argument in the office about yeah. this james kept calling it obi-wan kenobi I think adam pointed out that it's more like aragorn literally it's looks more, like aragorn from... maybe more aragorn yeah. but yeah I, um, I think of Obi Wan as like the, the sword facing forward. Yeah, there is a yeah, pose where yeah. he is like that, but still. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I painted that one. Model was sick. What's the, the uh, chapter name? Castellans of the Rift. Great, Love great it. chapter, and the color scheme is. I is... found out about that chapter through uh, following some of the heavy metal guys on Instagram. Kieran. No, so I've seen a few of them do it before, but a few months ago, um, Gavin Garza, who won. Uh, Slayer with his skink model a few years ago. He yeah. paints for Heavy Metal now. And he posted one of the new Terminators painted in uh, Castellans of the Rift scheme. Yeah. And he had a recipe for it in the description of his post. And I had that sort of like bookmarked like on my page. I was like, there'll be a day when this <laughs> when this when this happens. And then you said we was doing Ultramarine successes and I'm like, brilliant. Phone rings, op opened up that, went straight to it. It was zero thought in my mind. I was like, instantly I'm doing that. Uh, so I used that recipe. It's a really cool color scheme. Like the my girlfriend called it a pistachio marine. <laughs> it's very yeah, I get it. Yeah, I it is a very it. pistachio kind of green, but it is it's cool. I, I think the red accent. It's got red accents on I it. Had, memory, so it's correct, on that, it? I had yeah. pistachio ice cream for the first time the other day, and it what? was that exact time. Hang on a color. sec. Hang on. Now this is hang on. Wait the a sec. First time. Wait a second. I've never had pistachio ice cream. What? How was it? It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it, it was. It was. It's weird that it does. This is gonna sound. I'm going to try and you not say, say green. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's weird how much it literally does just taste the same as pistachios. Because like, normally if something's like, oh, strawberry flavoured, it doesn't taste the same as eating a strawberry. I think that's because like, you know they I mean? have to actually use pistachios in it. Yeah. Because yeah. there's just it no way to replicate was that flavor. Just, it, Yeah, so it's, it's a bit weird. It was a bit of a weird sensory thing because I was like, it's cold, but it's pistachios. Do you know did, what I mean? It's weird. Did you like it? Um, he's undecided. He I came, in with, he came in with this. I was thinking he was going to have like a rage review. He was like, oh, I tried pistachio ice cream for the first time. It's no, 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 no. The, the point was that it was the same colour as that armour. So she's got, so Pearl's got a good Pearl's point. right, is yeah. Is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's all right. I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to recommend it. I'm disappointed. I'm not gonna I think, you're not going to recommend good. it? No, pistachio is nah, nah. pretty good as an pistachio ice cream. Pistachio is solid. Yeah. yeah, pistachios, brilliant. Pistachio ice cream, like, does everything need? Pistachio no. ice cream, solid. Oh, pistachio ice cream, solid. That's great. I don't know, I wasn't a fan. Leave your opinion in the comments. <laughs> too too <laughs> pistachio y. How do you feel about <laughs> other nuts in ice cream? Hazelnut? Hazelnut's good. It's fine. Oh, Almond. hazelnut gets a pass, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Almond. Almond's good. But pistachio specifically? Just too. I don't know. Yeah, just too strong. Yeah. But, but more importantly, the hue was the same as, uh, as the armor enough. of your, your marine. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. It has well, got. Well, I'm, I'm, well. It's driving me nuts. It has got red trims, isn't it? No, not true. Red accents. Red accents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. 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 Um, a couple of things to note. Is it black trims? It's gold. It's gold. Cloth is black. Backpack's black. Am cool. I going insane? There are red parts on it though, aren't there? 
There's in, like in the, the red lightning on the, on yeah. the sword. In okay. the, in the, um, in the, the lenses are red on the And on the, the chapter symbol. And, and the on lenses the lens, are red yeah. on the, yeah. Okay, That's because yeah. I'm a colour theory genius and I listen to our podcast episode and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. red is the opposite of green. Yeah. 4D chess I'm playing up here. Mm. Yeah, no. Bones pick with Gavin Garza. Uh, that recipe, nightmare. <laughs> um, looks tremendous. Great fun to paint. Um, the base mix is three colours. <laughs> and it's like four to two to one. It's it's a bit much. A poor... Yeah, uh, but this look, poor, you, poor Whiteman blames his tool George. Yeah, come you, on, you got to put on, the work in. Come to on, get, you've just the, you've just said on. how good the result you, is. You can't. It looks sick, right? Do you know what the problem is? Because I was painting because <laughs> I was painting one model. I only did the mix like one. If I was painting like an army, I'd obviously That's like a match like a, a big pre mix. But I made I made a little mix on my palette. and I didn't make enough. <laughs> it's when I it's when I like when you get into hearing about those kind of mixes for like box art models or just what the high level painters are doing. That is one of the things where I'm like, oh, they're so far ahead. Like I couldn't Do you know why sit it is, there though? and work out these complicated mixes. Do you know why it is though? It's because when you're shading, you can use colors within that mix and you don't get the staining because it's already got that hue in it. Yeah, it's, right. like, it's okay. So perfect. say for example, you're going to say you took, we'll do a Blood Angel. I know. You don't have to. We'll is do it, a Blood is, Angel. Is, 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 say you painted Mephist and Red, right? As a base coat and you're going to glaze down and shade it with say like Corn Red, which for, would work quite well because the red's cover nicely but you're more likely to get staining with that right whereas if you start with a base mix of say 50 50 mephiston red and corn red and then you glaze it down with the corn red because it's already got that in it the, it, the, the transition is support. super smooth and then you can start building that up you can go dark you could add some black whatever and then build up on top of that you could start highlighting the same with the highlights so because your base mix is 50 50 corn and mephiston it's a you can highlight it with mephiston yeah it's so with this I mean, it makes more. perfect sense but i mean to sit there and work it out as and have it oh, be that so I perfect. can't compute. How it's you come such, up with that is yeah. well beyond me. We've had it before with some painters doing like certain things, whether they've done it for tutorials or for jobs. And I'm like, that looks incredible. How on earth did you come up with that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no part of me would think like, oh, this grey colour that doesn't exist. The, I know, I'll mix. The, the Retributor, yeah. <laughs> Retributor armour colour. That's the kit. That's a, yeah, that's a classic one. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've, we've, done, we've done a lot of projects in the past where we've had some crazy mixes on things uh, that, that you think, well, how the hell does that work? And then you see it on the model and you're like, it's, yeah. it's mental. So, that, but I guess, also, like, you won't believe, like, I'll, I'll pull up a recipe form and be like, oh, this is the wrong recipe form. Oh, oh no, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it... There are obviously, if someone doesn't want to put all of that effort in, you're obviously trying to mimic a higher level thing. Sure. But there are some paints you can substitute and yeah. there are probably easier ways to do it. Um, Should we talk about the Marines that uh, Adam did? Yeah. Yeah. So Adam got through quite, quite, a, few. quite a few of them. So Showing us up. Yeah. He did um, the two. The Scythe so Emperor, the Marines Errant, he done the Aurora chapter and the Iron Snake, and also he done the Brazen, Brazen, consoles. Brazen consoles. Which Yeah, so the two from the Company Heroes. Yeah. Like, I, I said on here, my favourite model from that Company Heroes thing is the Ancient, mm -hmm. and I think he's done an incredible job. Oh, he's, he's smashed it, yeah. Like, such yeah. a good paint skit. Like, split schemes on, like, Ancients, with something with a banner, mm. always just looks so good. Because well, the banner split. Because the banner split as well. Yeah. Like, it just amplifies it all i don't know if this is like right or wrong but i i wonder how i would feel about if the yeah you're gonna say well, i think the color was flipped yeah 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 the only I've, thing with that is that the with chapters they are specifically split it's left it's and right supposed to be specific. one specific well the thing like, is the yeah. flipped could be a different chapter i figured that you know might I mean? be part of the reason that the the banner is the effigy of the chapter so it, it wouldn't make sense it being a different to the color scheme of the marine. The interesting true? thing about it is that because of how the symbol is, the symbol has a white bit on the bottom left as you're yeah. looking at it. And obviously, usually the symbol's on the left shoulder pad, which is completely blue, mm -hmm. so you can see it all. Mm -hmm. But then obviously what we've found with that is that the bottom left of the symbol, which is white, mm. is on the white half of the uh, yeah. yeah of the thing, which isn't which is a bit unfortunate. But don't really know if there's a a way around that you could do. But color scheme looks great, I think. Yeah, and it's it's I do like when um, successor chapters have at least something calling back to, to the, the original to chapter. the original chapter. So there's some it's blue and mm -hmm. white, like blue and white is in the Ultramarines color scheme as yeah, it is. Yeah. I like when it's a different version of 
the original. And you get that a lot with Dark Angels. That's one of the things I love about the, a lot of the Dark Angels successes is there's a lot of them that are like variations of green and bone and black. Um, I feel like, you, whereas as we've explained on this, you can get some wild ones on a. I think because of the size of the Ultra Marines, Ultra Marines. As, a, as, a, as a chapter, of like, obviously them having a lot of Marines when they broke down into chapters from Legion, um, it, it gives such a wide variety of opportunity for as a painter. Like you, like we rightly said, you maybe you like the rules for Ultra Marines, or you like the, the heritage or the background of it, but you maybe don't like the color scheme. And, and do, this shows obviously that. But I like the fact that, like you said, I like the fact that you do have that nod to the original mm. thing which i think is good my, my my favorite i've got to say this like there's two for me which i absolutely loved scythe of the emperor 100 the the that 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 dude with the bionic arm the, the choice of lining up the the part with the history of the chapter and how he's a veteran he's fought nids he's lost his arm etc like he's got all these bionics with obviously painting it scythe of the emperor as well it's just a great use of the thing we talk about the uh the, the the heritage of the chapter plus also using that and overlaying that onto the model so it adds that nuance of of history to it as well which i think is really really good but um but yeah i've done an amazing job on it and using the red the saturated red on the casing on the rifle so you've got the you've actually got a, um, a primary color trial on there you've got the yellow the desaturated red and the blue for the little lenses and dials and things so it's still got a primary color triad but it, it's, it's like a skewed version, a skewed of that. version of it, it's yeah. A very with, subtle with, version of that, yeah. Which I think is really good, and obviously black, not not being. Yeah, the gun is like, I think it looks so cool. Such a nice red. Yeah, yeah. loads of people commented on that as well when they saw it on the article, and and we posted it and everything. Yeah, um, just it just looks great. Adds a bit of interest to to that as well. And the other has to be the Iron Snake because I read a load of the Iron Snake books when I was when I was younger. Um, Don't got anything to do with the bright green base. No, actually, I'd done that all by himself. So, uh, me and me and yeah, no, I was going to say, the, is that one the, of the, the reasons fellow, you love it? Because it no, looks, uh, looks fairly retro. Adam, Adam, playing a game of Blood Bowl. Adam, Adam, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd win the game on his own. So, yeah. um, but uh, but yeah, so it's having having a model for uh, of, of the Iron Snakes, the Sons of Ithaca, I think, is a really good um, a really good uh, choice. Plus, also it's silver as well, and like from a from, from a painting perspective um, of of creating a project and using uh, a paint which is quite easy to to apply and to add the accents of color to as well silver like if you look at paul norton's chapter i can't remember for for, for love nor money what they're called but um uh it like iron, iron raven iron raven that's it yeah iron ravens yeah so paul's done a really good way of of um uh paul's done a really good way of of using silver as the main color which is easy to execute as in, i say easy you get it on you can get an army done really quickly by adding colors to metallics which is great um, and the sun, the iron snakes, iron snakes have that as well, which I think is a really good, a really good thing. That that white and blue uh, and red, I think, just really works extremely well for, as a as a color color colorway. Um, we've got it. We have we have actually not mentioned one of the marines on there as well, which I think we need to mention. There's a couple a couple left to talk about. Yeah, Paul from stores. Uh, he does a lot of our packing and a lot of our uh, store work and stuff. Obviously, in the room. he he joined the company and. He, he enjoys painting, obviously he's done it, and so but he's not really painted loads of marines, and and so we tasked him obviously with painting one of the one of the heroes marines for the, for this sort of for this podcast, and also just the, and I've got to say this like it's amazing to see his progression as a painter from from when he first started. He, he, uh, people would have seen uh, the tyranny that he did as well. Yeah, on yeah, those yeah. posts. Yeah, so he 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 painted a mortifactor, which again is a really awesome. Uh, chapter with great backstory um and picked these, another like quite complicated scheme it really. is like, yeah yeah it's, it's not even i get that it's not obviously like a split down the middle you don't have to actually no, draw a straight line but to to have to pick out all these like different random armor panels i always find that is a more complicated college trim as well yeah as well yeah. color trim yeah yeah um, but like different just like trim. Yeah. an extra bit of work yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah, it's yeah. kind of a Dark Angels vibes, isn't it? Sort of Deathwing almost. It is all, well. all kind of uh, Dark Angels colors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like again, seeing him progress as a painter and just like uh, like things like the stripes on the chainsaw, the, like the, the the staggered helmet colorization as well, all that kind of stuff is is it's really cool to see. So I've got to give him big props for for dipping his toe into the ultramarine pond for this one and uh, and, and producing a really fantastic model. I love. I don't know if this is on the box art or if Paul's just done this off like the of his own accord but the on the chain sword having like the casing kind of weathered no the casing's like blending into the the colors of the chapter Mm. and then 
the actual like there's like the red like hub bit on top of it yeah yeah it just makes it look so cool i've never really seen that before i don't know if, what the box art is like on that because the box art is obviously an ultramarine yeah i don't know if the chain sword is like blue or not or I if it's just painted because i would red. i would instantly just paint that all as the same all as red yeah yeah um but the fact that he's kind of worked it into including the the chapter colors on there and then put the stripes on and then done the little the little red bit um yeah, so the the it's all painted black on the, yeah. the thing, and then the the bit that's red on this is done as 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 metallics. So I think I, I really like. I've never really even considered working like chapter colors into weapon casing. It's always just like one color. Yeah, I mean, but I think that looks really cool. So if you're into ultramarines and want to learn how to paint them, we've got some great options for you. We've got some PDFs on our web store and we also have some tutorials on our Patreon. Follow the links in the description of this video to go and check those out. So what's next? We've got a couple of others. We've got the uh, the other metallic one is the brazen consoles. Yeah, really cool again. Which is... Um, Do you know what my favourite part about that one is? Purple lenses. Yeah. yeah. They look sick. Yeah. Wouldn't have picked purple personally. Just wouldn't have wouldn't have occurred to me. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It looks fantastic. Yeah. Really pops against like the black as well. A few, there's only a few schemes where that's going to work because even, even colours that go with purple I feel like purple lenses would look weird. Like if you, you did a red, if you did red marines and did purple lenses, sure that, that goes. I mean even like, but it would look even like weird. Imperial Fist though, like yellow, that would technically make sense but it looks better with blue. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, because, in my opinion. Because the bronze is like a, it, essentially, obviously it's metallic but because the bronze is like a brown, it's not, it's not really like a, 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 a colour that does appear on the colour wheel. So, so, it, it's almost like it's kind of in like the orangey camp, I suppose. Kind, of, yeah, kind of, I suppose. But but it just lives nowhere, but, doesn't but, it? But I mean, the, yeah. the use the the the, the purple lens is is really good because it works really well with the blue uh, energy glow on the sword and the lightning on the sword. So you've got that really nice comp, uh, complementary uh, sort of colours together, which I think works quite nicely. Um, but also just like the way he's painted it. Yeah, it's he's really done a great nice. job. It's yeah. really clean. I like the the, the 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 lid or the helmet being painted in black as well. I think that's 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 really good. Um, to match the trim as well. Yeah, it's um, always cool to like, gives you a couple of options for metallic marines to do as well if you're looking to do some ultramarine stuff because you can get, as we we're saying about like, like for example, Paul Norton's uh, Iron Ravens, like for example, like the, the Sons of Ithaca or the, the Iron Snake, sorry. Like having a metallic painted army, as in like the armor color being metallic, I think it gives you so many options to then just use spot colors quite effectively, quite quickly. Um, you can kind of like theoretically break it down a lot easier in terms of squads. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Like if you want different units to have different colors, it's not really going to clash too much. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah and the and other one was the Aurora chapter. Now, now Ad wanted to do something a bit special with this one because he'd seen the box art and seen them all obviously on the tactical rocks or the, or the poses that they were in, etc. And he just wanted to see what one looked like on a flight stand. Obviously, this isn't, if you're seeing it on screen now, this isn't something that the kit comes with just want to caveat that it's something that i had done off his from own from the back. uh the interceptors kit yeah it is yeah so ad basically just made a bit of a pilot hole um and then just obviously made a connection point for the flight stand just to see what one looks like as if it was jumping as in actually lifting off or landing for example or like but not touching the ground so he didn't make a pilot hole that fits perfectly does it fit perfectly oh i thought there was a pilot hole yeah. no there's the yeah. slot because it's got like a, a little sort of curve it's just yeah. perfectly into the slot oh, the right. okay I didn't he actually that. showed me when he put that together he didn't even glue it at first it just balanced perfectly it just oh, that's sat. amazing yeah that's really good um I didn't so they that. so they fit better to the jump pack intercessors than they do to the uh I couldn't comment then. on that <laughs> because because like the interceptors I always found was a bit of a nightmare even just to glue in place. Yeah, I mean or... I don't know if that's necessarily stronger. It the just, weight of it the model, the weight of the model is less. I think one thing with the interceptors is you could glue it and you put them on and gradually it will it will turn. Yeah. The well, the, the thing model. is when you look at that model, it's like tilting forward, so its legs are back. Yeah. Whereas the interceptors are the entire model. The entire is like model is in front of it. Yeah. yeah. So it's like sticking his arms and legs out in front of it. Yeah. It's probably going to depend on the pose. Like that model specifically fits quite well on it. But for yeah. example, like the brazen consoles model, I don't think would fit very well on a flight stand at all. No. Uh, no, um, potentially not. Because also of... part of the difficulty that you mentioned is obviously if you are going to cut the tactical rocks off the feet, depending on how it's sculpted, some are going to suit that better than others. Yeah. Um, yeah. You might have to get some great. But stuff I think out. that I think that's good though, because then you have variation within the unit. You could have some that are landing, some that are flying, some that are, you there's you could make a really interesting looking unit for your army by fitting the pose to the different types of 
of way that they connect to the base as well. I think you could do away with the rock as well. What I see a lot of the time people doing with flying models is like a bit of scenery on yeah. the base. Yeah, yeah. And just sort of strategically do it in such a way that it looks like they're maybe like flying over it or they've just yeah. come down to land on it. Yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, there's entire models that are actually sculpted like that, aren't there? There's like, yeah. yeah. Um, or even like, um, oh, what's the huge Lumineth thing? The character, the main character where it's got like the big, Oh, the big uh, uh, like wing techless, techless. Yeah. So techless, yeah, is basically supposed to be like flying or jumping or something. Yeah, yeah. has the lightest connection to the wings of like the the monster that he's mm. with, and so you get that anyway on models. Um, so it's obviously a technique you can do on your own with your base, I suppose. Um, is that all of them? We that is all, all of them. them. Yeah, that's everything. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot of different ways that you can paint your ultramarines. Um, and how I mean they, they all fit these new models really well like you know when you see some models and you're like like you obviously saw that captain you were like that has to be a blood angel or that's a very biased view though or like part, Genesis, so. Genesis yeah but it chapter. just suits it just suits better like jump yeah. packs blood angels fair yeah angel. yeah and I think I feel like they all look good in, in the, the chosen colour schemes yeah I did notice one difference between the captain and the normal jump infantry he's got some some extra additional like guidance sort of flaps on his legs compared to their normal uh, assault marines hmm. uh, which I, think I didn't realise as well they've all got like little uh, little rocket boosters in the feet yeah back of the feet yeah <laughs> which you don't really see from the front I, I just assumed that there was like a normal intercessor with a jump pack but they are actually different legs touching upon that I think you, I think a lot, what some people will do is they'll to make com like different units they'll get those jump packs and put them on assault intercessor legs as well because then you can have running running ones on, the, on I mean if you bought a box of assault intercessors and a box of them you've you can have fun all day just yeah, yeah. smashing yeah. kits together. I mean, to be fair, the way that they're posed, you if you cut the rocks off or whatever, then they would just look like they were running. Mm -hmm. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. you might not even need to do that. And then that way you still get the the, the, the boosters on boosters the back of the, the leg. back of legs. Yeah, yeah it's quite cool. Yeah. Should we do a question of the week? Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have something that you would like us to answer on the podcast, please leave it in the comments section of the video version of the podcast on YouTube. Uh, Macintosh Rowan says with big panels such as an Imperial Knight what is a good way of keeping detail so when you when he says about keeping detail I'm going to take that as uh, putting paint on thinner mm -hmm. not obscuring detail I think that's there's the lots way. of ways you could uh, yeah I, I'm not I, I just want to try and think of all different ways that that could be determined but but I, I I think when you're painting something like that I would definitely approach it with the airbrush 100% um, purely because brush painting an object that large is going to lead to brush marks is going to lead to probably in irregular inconsistent paint thickness um let's say you don't have an airbrush spray can spray can your main day. color yeah like, all day long all day yeah. yeah um base coating in the metallics of the night yeah while a tedious task is probably going to be a better end result in terms of worrying about brush marks on big yeah. panels texture things like that yeah keeping panels separate to the exoskeleton of the model as well whether you're doing a night a titan or whatever I always forget you can do that. I've never built one. Yeah. But in my head, I'm just like, oh, you're going to have to do one or the other. But yeah, I guess you would build the skeleton and then you've put the panels got to on keep after. The, keep the panel separate as much as possible because then it, it gives you two separate painting projects, essentially, where you're working with different colors. Well, I guess you could spray both then, couldn't you? You could spray the undersuit with your lead belt, just spray or whatever, and then spray the armor panels. If you if you stuck all the panels on, then yes, you can, but it. But it no, I'm saying if you kept everything separate, yeah. you could definitely spray all the armor panels. A different color than you did the yeah yeah screen. yeah that's what I did on my night night armor yeah yeah um, um, one thing I would say to as well it's like that I see beginners often doing is don't use a wash on a big flat surface pin shade all day long yeah you're gonna have to yeah. go around good time to learn some brush control go around the edges you've got to love painting rivets as well so um, yeah but but yeah I wouldn't just put wash all over it like it it you're going to cause a lot of problems by doing that. If, if I mean that, and it does also obscure details as well. If you put on a lot of wash, like if you, whether you're whichever me method of washing the model you're doing, whether you're just putting loads on with a brush, or if you're dunking it into one of those quick dip things or whatever, like you know, um, you are going to gun cut details massively. Um, so yeah, one right. two things I would advocate for: if you are going to use any washes on any of the metallics or anything like that, as you probably would with a night with the undersuit and whatever. Uh, don't be tempted to use a hairdryer to speed up the drying because you're way more likely to get push tie marks stuff, and yeah. push the it around and where it dries you might get those like sort of like pool, pooling is more visible yeah because it's drying quicker than it it's because you're should. putting on so much more material onto the object as well like yeah yeah you're 
just don't want to overflow air. And it's secondly, because it's a big model like that, this would apply to like vehicles and tanks and stuff as well, is a gloss varnish the model before you start doing all of your shading. Yeah, yeah. Because your research shaders are going to, one, flow much nicer into the into the crevices of the model. And two, it's going to be just smoother and quicker to go across. You can make it after. It's not, it's not like you've got to have a gloss model at the end of it. Uh, matte varnish over gloss varnish will just leave you the matte finish. Cool. Hobby Hacks, this is our uh, closing tradition. We, we do weekly. We share I, a little... Uh, I've been away, so I've not been thinking of hobby. So not been thinking of the hobby? Well, don't worry, James, because week after week, I'm here to save the day <laughs> for the Hobby Hacks. Where do you store your spray cans? I want to give you the answer that I think you want to make your point. <laughs> In the garage, where I do my spraying. Spoil a lot of people do the spraying. That's why I do my spraying. Mm -hmm. don't want to spray my, you're not going to spray in your house. I'm not an no. absolute madman. Yeah. I'm not going to spray in the garden. I, I don't, don't have a booth, so I do my, do my spray can no, no behavior. I don't, want to get, the I don't want to get my Mephiston spray all over the grass in the garden. Right. Right? I'm not a heathen. So I uh, might, might do it in the garage. You might leave your spray can in there. It yeah. might get cold. We live in the UK. It tends to be cold 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. We spoke about it before. What are the problems with spray cans? Weather, conditions, temperature, all factors in. Mm -hmm. You might be thinking, George, just store your spray cans in the house. And while you might be correct, if it's warmer, it generally behaves a bit better, right? Say it's freezing cold outside, you've got a room temperature spray can. Yeah. You're still going to be kind of testing the waters a little bit. You might mm -hmm. be uh, raising the risk profile. Here's my little hobby hack for you, right? In your sink, fill up with like lukewarm-ish, warm not hot water. Leave a spray can in there for uh, like five minutes, bring the temperature of the can up. When you go outside and it's freezing cold, because the can's kind of like preheated a little bit, I find that it doesn't cool down in the air as much. I don't struggle with mm -hmm. getting the, the sandy texture, the dusty texture. Yeah. this is. I do this every time. Mm -hmm. And there is one problem to watch out for. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, if you don't say it, I'm going to say it. Which I experienced. Uh -huh. I heated it up too much. Uh -huh. And when you heat it up too much... It, problems it can like the the bottom basically like popped popped like the bottom of the can like popped out like, like exploded the, like or like bulged out like bulged out like it would have exploded if it if it broken it would have just gone everywhere like it's like it like built up too much pressure uh -huh. so there is a middle ground that, that wasn't really was going to want to yeah. i go for like barely like warm like not yeah yeah. Like you wouldn't wash the dishes in, like not hot water. Yeah. Like, but yeah. above room temp. So I did, uh, when I first did it, I did it too much and it just mm. went, and like, I was like, oh my God. And then I looked down and it hadn't gone anywhere. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> so I'm going to add on to this. Say, so doing it in water is all well and good and it does work 100%, like you, like you said. A lot of people don't dry the cans properly after they've put them in the water, which I don't, just, just to preface this, do not get the top. No, no, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the bottom. I'm okay. Talking about the, so, the, the can is made out of, uh, of metal that's folded into, into a, a cylinder. Yeah, so there's obviously a seam line down, uh -huh. that, down that can. Um, that's what I'm talking about, pop yeah. out. Yeah, so what, what happens is whether you heat it in, well, if you heat it in water, if you don't dry the cans properly with the towel afterwards as in get all the water off, that seal um, on some cans, I don't believe it's, it's welded. I believe it's just got some kind of like uh, crimp. bond, yeah. like a crimp and a bonding agent or something. The hot water, the bonding agent, it can... It can perish the bonding agent and that's when you get like uh, hemorrhaging the paint out of the bottom of the can sometimes um or the worst thing which is rust as well so mm. cans do rust so do dry them like in a towel so to marry onto your hobby hack i have got something which which i would like to add on if you don't want to put them in water put them in your airing cupboard for about 10 15 minutes because your airing cupboard is naturally warmer anyway because it's got your boiler in it <laughs> this you know what this reminds me of you know when you like put a beer in the freezer because you don't want to wait for it to get yeah. cold and you forget about yeah, it yeah. Like... It's, it's, yeah yeah the thing is is it, I don't, it, how common are, are airing cupboards like a, a lot of houses they, do have I don't cupboards. have one but are they like is that a common thing uh, I've, I've both tip, had them and not had them tip, yeah. Tip, yeah. Well, if you do have an airing cupboard yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd recommend doing that because uh, uh, to, again just to give as much value as possible for the hobby hack I actually use airing cupboard for warming cans, like you said, and I also use it for when I put my PVA on the bases and put sand on. I put the models in the airing cupboard, and they dry really quick because of the because of the. I love I love the idea of like 
where you're going to get a towel. That's what I was just been like full of space for it. <laughs> yeah, it's happened. I feel like yeah. most of your house is like that, to be fair. Yeah, you can just go in any cupboard. Can there'll be some like, blood angels there. Yeah. You like come out of the shower, you've forgotten a towel, you're like, don't worry, quickly grab one from the airing cupboard, and then yeah. just like the sand everywhere, yeah. there's models of yeah. spray cans. No, I've got a tray, mate. I've got the tray in, on the shelf. Treat it like a pizza oven. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> he's got like a big it's, pizza it's, bill when yeah, he's like putting a tray of cans in. Getting the tight and out the airing cupboard. models in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, but your airing cupboard does really works really well for that as well. In um, summary, spray cans are a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, warm them a little bit before you use them in, in the winter. Yeah, depths of winter. Solid, uh, solid hack. Joe's gone. Yeah, yeah. And we done the whole Blood Angels free episode, mm -hmm. but this is just the Blood Angels episode now. We're in control. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> Finally excommunicated that dark angel from the codex. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. So we can we can flap our gums about blood angels till the cows come home. So yeah. Christmas boxes? Uh, Christmas boxes. Yeah. Good ones. Uh, I'm very excited. As I think anybody who likes uh, assault marines uh, has seen the uh, marine one and is uh, super, super excited at, at that. It's all new um, stuff as well. Pretty yeah, much. it's really good. I, I think it's actually quite good. That I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the first one that has got a Primark in it? Uh, no, they've done Primarks before. They've done like Mortarian and that before. What, in a Christmas box? Yeah. Did they? Pretty sure they've done like Mortarian last year. And oh, well, right, because I, I genuinely thought, when I saw the corn one, I was like, oh, wow, they put a Primark in it. I genuinely thought that they'd, that they'd, um, that this was the first time that no, they'd... No, I think there's precedent for that, but uh, they're pretty cool boxes though. Yeah. Marines, um, probably more of the one, the blander ones for me, but it's obviously taken your fancy as a Blood Angels, uh, Blood Angels boy. Yeah, I'm very keen on getting myself 15 jump jump assault intercessors with jump packs and yeah. In, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, <laughs> assault marines. <laughs> yeah, assault marines. Yeah, very keen. Uh, very keen on that. Um, yeah, so it'll be good. What are you going to do with the second captain? Um, oh, that's a good one. I might, I might just, because I'm going to make some new death company. Uh, I might just use that model as like a, as a death company model. Just in a leaping pose. And, I, and what I also am going to do is I'm going to switch. I'm going to half and half boxes. So I'm going to do like half assault incessors with the jump packs and half with the with the landing legs. So the units are varied. So it looks like okay. you've got ones that are running, ones that are landed, ones that are like... So yeah, so the captain on the... Or the extra captain body on the flying base will um will 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 fit in fit in really well, like a glove in the words of Jim Carrey. So <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, he'll be good. Um, Yeah. So that's that's my plan. I'm actually quite excited by the uh, the guard one. I was going to say the guard one. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, yeah, that's good, isn't it? Twenty five infantry and two massive tanks. Two tanks. Yeah, it's the two tanks. <laughs> Not one, but you two. Can't, you can't go can't go wrong. Can't go wrong with that. And again, newer tanks, the Rogue Dawns. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good little set. The Orc one's pretty cool. Pretty funny. Got lots of lots yep. of uh, They've lots got a of kill rig in a Christmas box. Well, I was surprised. That's a massive put, kit. I, I was surprised they put anger on in a Christmas box. I I gen I know to say it again, but I genuinely thought that you that this. This was the first time they'd done it because I was like, "Wow, that's awesome!" And looking at the Tyranny's one, you have got the Norn emissary as well, which is yeah, again a new model, model and a massive that, model. That model is incredible. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's pretty good. Is that Botan one as well? It is a Botan one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Botan one's pretty cool. Again, you got two. Uh, you got Hecaton and Fortress, haven't you? Um, and then you got the little Sagittar as well. So again, all the all the heavy infantry as well in that one, which is quite good. So yeah, yeah it's a good box. I think I always like the Christmas boxes. I think because they. Because you get a nice variation of models, and and a lot of the time you'll always find use for them as well. So, so yeah, they're, they're quite they're, they're really good. Use for them like you need more space marines in your life, James. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Is this going to be the start of your uh, your blood angels primary? I've thing? already got I've already got four boxes of assault incest. It's ready to go. I have got the captain obviously. Four which, boxes. Yeah, and you're all, adding three boxes. How much infantry do you need? I'm going all infantry. All infantry. All infantry. Yeah. No. No dreads. No. Tanks. Oh yeah, we will have a few dreads. Yeah, a few redemptors just to uh, see. I'm holding out for the redemptor because I'm really hoping that we get some flavoured <laughs> redemptor dreadnoughts down the line. That's the thing I'm really looking forward to. Um, there's nothing that's tastier than a death company death company redemptor. Dreadnought. I wonder if they'll just do like an upgrade sprue for it, like they do for the normal Primaris Marines. See, I think they've been very very clever with the design of that kit because a lot of the armor panels are separate like the mm. shoulders uh the kneecaps and things like that so i think that you could easily get some sculpted pads some like that just clip on i think that'd be quite cool um and the sock and, the, and that lifting plate the front plate that just lifts up you've got yeah, the sarcophagus yeah. that bit as well being separate is is screaming to have some chapter specific parts so yeah uh, so yeah i don't know if disappointed is the word i'd use for space marines but i feel like this is like i don't want to say bland like if you've if you're into the new assault marines then it's definitely for you but if you're not then it's 
definitely not for you. you know no, what I mean? no, potentially. So, so here's a question. You're just getting into 40K. Mm. You've gone down your local club or you've been introduced to it or someone's bought your model or whatever, blah, blah. You, Christmas is coming. Mm-hmm. So everyone's excited. Christmas, candy canes. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and, uh, and um, you've got to choose one of those. Which one are you going for? What's your, what's your, what's your parents' parents' hard-earned cash going on? I think Guard is the coolest in terms of like aesthetic I like. However, in terms of what's most realistic in my life that I would ever actually get finished would definitely be the corn. Because yeah, cool. uh, you've got, I like, do you know why I like that one? It's quite balanced because you've got one massive model that you can like go all out on, but then there's not that much else in the box. Like it's not, it's, it's not waves and waves of infantry. Like there's only 17 models in there. So you've, yeah. only, got, you've only got a handful of like of troops to paint. It's yeah. not like you're going to be sitting there. I mean, if you pick the Tyranids one, I mean, you're going to be batch painting for, it's 34 for a long old time. It's du- nearly double. Yeah. 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 So that's a lot of models. Um, and the guard one's a lot as well. It's 27. Yeah. That's a lot of models in there. I'm still going Marines. Still going Marines. <laughs> yeah. Straight down the middle. Straight down the middle. Yeah. yeah. Actually, no, to be fair, the Votan, Votan's quite good. I do actually like it. Um, and I, and for me as well, adding some more Votan to, to the Orange Army I've got would be quite cool. It's a good box. because I've got you done those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got, um, I've got a couple of, of I've got a Hecatan, I've got a Sagittar, I've got two Sagittars, but I haven't, I haven't painted them yet. But um, the big infantry, I'm, I'm a big, big, big fan of those. They look great. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's probably, probably my, my Christmas choice if I was, if I was, uh, wet behind the ears when it comes to 40 gay. <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't pick orcs, uh, even though, uh, Octo- October is among us. Yeah. Well, I say among us, it's like, it's like, we've got six oh, days, well, seven days left. That's what like, I was going to say. Yeah, so you know, I've seven. decided a bit, probably a bit too late, but I've decided, uh, the October bug has finally hit me. I spoke about this with Joe, uh, a are few you, weeks Are ago. you going to get it done in time though? I'm going to start it in time. You sound like me. It. You I sound like it. me. Yeah. So I bought, we had a, we had a commission in for some of the, well, we've had a couple of commissions through actually that I've done media for, for the Orc Commandos box. And Gaz as well. And I Gaz. painted Gaz as well Gaz. a couple of months back. Big man. But uh, seeing those commandos uh, really tickled me. So I bought, uh, bought a box of them. Well, when you get, are you do, painting one of them? I'm just going to paint the knob like as a display model. It's a great model. So I've got him, got him plinthed up. Great model. Uh, as is tradition. Uh-huh. You know, I get on. I'm not sure if I'll have it done. In time, I, I absolutely but. love the commandos. I think they're phenomenal. Like the the bomb squig is just such a cool little model. Um, and the, well, it's a little like commando grot. It's like the best. It's, it's such a cheeky little model. It's really really cool. They're just so like varied as well. Like, it's yeah, like, they it's are. like they're not quite characters, but like it's not like just a box where like all the models are the same. If you know what I mean, either. No, exactly. It's kind of like treading a nice middle ground. Yeah, no, they are good. I, I I would have loved to have had something done for October. I've got a uh, start collecting orc box with the uh, war boss with the grot in the little sort of mm-hmm. pirate pirate turret thing, like you know. Um, um, I've always wanted to paint that model, so that that might be my Christmas Christmas chill model. I think like, Christmas chill model. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. Is that a thing? I just said it. So I guess, I guess, <laughs> I guess, I guess, it, I guess, so it, I guess it, it is. It is. Yeah, today. Tell yeah. us what your Christmas chill See, model is going to yeah. be in the comments. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically spend Christmas when I'm not um, watching the same films on TV like every other year, um, painting, kind of painting the York. I think from that the or boss from that kick. Because I, I absolutely love it. I think it's, a fun, it's really, really cool. Have um, you painted many Orcs? Yeah, I did. I had an Orc army back in the day, so I had, a, I had like a. a what big, do I ask? Yeah, about every army. Loads of mega knobs and mega armor um, and trucks, and they used to just jump out and just crunch stuff um but uh but yeah i just really fancy and i actually had a death skulls army many 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 moons ago that had loads of conversion in it with like loads of imperial weapons and things like that so it'll either be uh a classic goth orc war boss or i'll probably go death skulls and just try and convert it maybe give the grot like an imperial stubber or something like that so it's a bit different but but yeah that's my thought process i just want to do something a little bit different with it i just fancied Little painting project for the Christmas. Super late for October. I'm never going to get it done in time, obviously. So I'm not even going to throw myself into that gauntlet. Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I saw, uh, speaking of October, uh, if we go into the, uh, the listeners' comments, me and Joe spoke about uh, on the episode that we did, uh, just us two. And we said, like, why are there not other months? So, like, you've got March from a crag and they've got October. Yeah. It was like, what about some other months? And uh, Kerry Little 2951 says, uh, Dark Angels December. Christmas has angels and a long-haired bearded guy who died and came back to life. That's fair. It's fitting. It's fitting. That's so, fair. Uh, we'll have to come up with some more of them. Yeah. That's a good one, though. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a one off the cuff, but I can't. No, but uh, there's a Jamesism in there somewhere. There was one somewhere, but I, 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 that one's going to take a bit of a time to brew. Yeah. Yeah, like Should a good we... stew. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> let's, do, let's do some more of these. Uh, Pete Wilco says, uh, you've given me thoughts on re-evaluating rattle cans. 
Uh, but weather in the British Isles can be fairly humid at times. Yes, it can. Uh, are there any times of year here that you found in practice rattle cans don't really work, uh, bearing in mind the current storms and rain? Ooh, um, I mean, obviously, if it's raining, yeah, not happening. Yeah. That is the massive advantage of the airbrush in that regard of, yeah, you're indoors. So weather is not really... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes, like, it's like I don't sound silly, but... Um, like for example, we want in my old house, like the kitchen was very cold. Uh, it's like an extension. So like certain parts of the house could be, I don't sound silly, but it could be colder than others. Typically I'd always store the cans in a warmer place or a warm part of the house. I mean, we spoke um, about the hobby hack of obviously uh, in a previous episode, you can yeah. heat the cans up yeah, uh, yeah, using warm water. But it, I've found generally that like, if you're doing that, if you're only going outside for like a brief moment to spray, don't get me wrong, like it's not ideal and you can still have problems, but if you're warming the can up in some water and you're going outside, providing it's not like hammering down with the snow or rain. Yeah, yeah. Even if it is cold, if you're spraying the models, if you're out there and you're, you know, times of the essence, if you're quick, you're not, you know, wasting time hanging around and you bring the models inside to dry. I've generally had like reasonable success. I've not really had any catastrophes that I can think of. That's that's why I'm, I've been known to frequent the garden with a massive extension lead and a hairdryer before. So you use the hairdryer outside. Yeah, Do you not bring them in first. No, when it's, if it's snowing, I'm I'm using I'm getting that spray on the can. Like you try and spray a spray can, even if it's well shaken. You go outside, the temperature drop from when it atomizes to hitting the model. It, it happens pretty quick, especially when it's really cold. I mean. Well, think, yeah. think about when you're breathing. So when you breathe yeah, in winter, you can see your breath. Yeah. So your hot, warm breath is super cooling really quickly as it exits the, as it exits the mouth. And it's obviously, that's what, because of the temperature difference in obviously the air that's inside you to what's outside. We've entered James's science corner. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so, yeah. So if I've really been desperate to, to undercoat a model during winter, um, then yeah, I'll be, I'll get an extension lead out with a hairdryer in the garden spray dry spray dry spray I mean if it's that cold I'm going to sit there with my warm fuzzy slippers on and I'm going to use the airbrush but you know to each their own yeah you know you've got to you've got to got to muscle up on those uh, those undercoating was sessions it, was it uh, improvise adapt overcome yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kate Bedlam says in regards to uh, you saying about how many water pots you use for cleaning brushes says uh, three water pots just triples the chance that I'll drink from one yeah there is that yeah <laughs> there is that, that as well just, you ever done uh, that I, do you know what? I never have. I've never done that. I've never have. Do you know what I have done? I've had a coffee, my coffee mug next to my water pot and I've not been looking and I've dipped my paintbrush I've, I've and done that in my before. coffee. I've, I've done that I've, 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 many a time, but I have never, ever... Um, I'm worried that it. I've done that and not noticed that I've done that and then drank the coffee. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I can understand why, especially if you've got like a tea and you're using maybe like, I don't know, like... like Fang Brown or something like that, yeah. maybe or a coffee. Oh yeah, I can understand that definitely. But um, but yeah, no, I haven't. No, touch wood. So yeah. <laughs> uh, Mini Craft says, if I wanted to level up, would it be better to do ten or twenty tabletop standard minis, or really push my limits on one? Uh, I'm presuming in this scenario that they're spending the same amount of time, regardless. Yeah, I'm, I I I don't see any disparity between the two. They're both different exercises. One is about consistency and process, and the other one is about focus and attention and consistent quality. Um, like batch painting 20 models is a, is a hard task in itself, especially if you're trying to paint them to a high standard, um, doing a character individually and focusing on it and putting as much effort as you can into it is a task in itself. I don't know that they're necessarily batch painting them either because they've said tabletop standard. So do they mean just the practice of doing it? Like even if you're doing them one by one, right? Of like, I'm going to paint oh, the okay. same thing over and over and over again to like a mid-level standard. Potentially. I, I see. I was reading that. I was literally reading that as like, I'm painting 20 models in a batch. Yeah. I mean, it could um, go either way. Um, I don't really think that's a right or wrong there. I think, like you said, you're just sort of exercising different muscles really in that it scenario. It is. They're, they're different, different horses for different courses. They're literally yeah. like, you know, one's going to teach you focus attention and, and real sort of like refining those really sort of like little details and bits and bobs on the models and really pushing yourself to make that because it's a character you know you want to make it look better than maybe your rank and file or whatever um the the batch painting will teach you repetition and consistency it depends what your output is as well because like if you're someone who's just wanting to paint armies then batch painting is probably more important for you because at the end of the day people aren't looking at your one character up close they're looking at your army as a whole so that's probably going to be something that improving on is going to have better output for you but that being said if you just want to paint display models and you want to put nice stuff in a cabinet then Batch painting a big squad of models isn't really going to help you either because you're like they're well, they're kind of different things in my mind. Yes and no. I mean, pers the thing is, you could get five models, like maybe buy a, a box of like more elite infantry, like for, uh, orc knobs, assault marines, or whatever it is, blah blah, and you could try and paint the unit 
like a character individually, each of them, but in a batch. And that's combining both of those things then. So you will be leveling up because you'll be pushing yourself harder. And whilst trying to maintain the consistency of that, pushing yourself harder across five rather than one. Um, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at either of those exercises as a right or wrong or better or worse. I'd just go, they're different things for different skill sets and to push myself in different directions. That's, that's kind of how I would look at it. I think at the end of the day as well, as long as you're doing something, like you're going to get better. Like yeah, course, time on yeah. the brushes is time on the brushes. And Amen. fair yeah. enough, there are more efficient ways you can go about that. But the more time you sit and thinking about trying to like hyper efficient and min max like your output on, yeah. on your hobby time, like the more time you're spending thinking about doing it rather than doing it is more of a waste to me i'd right, much rather agree. you just sat and did one of those two things rather than procrastinate and try and worry yeah. about which one's right or wrong exactly yeah 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 it really is just a quick one I wanted to let you know that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at siege studios we offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience you can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk and just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off your first commission with us here at Siege using the code PAINT5. Now back to the show. So our topic for this week was going to be some more paints, as the viewers know, from clicking on this episode. When we discussed this yesterday, James, I said, should we do like another five paints each? I kind of know you've got a lot more than five. Yeah. See, I, I've tried to offer quite a lot of value in this in this one. I know we said a specific number. Value. <laughs> yeah, I know we said a specific value, and I'm going to caveat this right away with that, like, I understand that I have a certain vintage to some of my paints and that's not easily accessible to everybody. And I understand that because I've had messages from people saying, oh, like you mentioned this color, blah, blah, blah. I can't, it's hard to get or I can't get it. What color would you recommend instead? It's close to it, whatever. So with that in mind. I was fully expecting you to rock up with like a case of vintage paint. And in fairness, you have not done no, that. No, I've not. I've, do you know what? I've, I've but you have that. instead shown up with a case of paint rather than five Yeah, paints. I did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought what I thought would be really good would be to show you some ones that I really like and really mm -hmm. think are great. Um, and then in in sort of like if, if if you try to get them or whatever, maybe if you don't find them, they're a really good sign of a kind of alternative. So so um so that's kind of like what I've tried to do with with uh, with the ones that I've chosen. Um, um so just for the listeners, these are gonna be the paints that we can't live without. And the reason we say that is these are paints that fill a specific use case yeah. that maybe could not be used by another paint. It's not a I really like this color because it's my favorite color. It's I really like this paint because it has great coverage or I like this paint because it's good for this one specific application. Or as a technical benefit. So exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So go on then. What's your, what's your first one? Oh God, do you know what? Like, I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. I don't know which one to pick <laughs> first. Um, do you know what? I think we're going to go with, uh, uh, let's go with uh, the wash to start off with. So um, I don't really use a lot of uh, this brand or manufacturer's paints, being honest. It's just not, then it's, you know what I've I grew up on Citadel, so um, the first one is going to be uh, the Army Painter Quick Shade Strong Tone. That's the first one. Now um, I do use the Citadel one, so I do use like uh, Sepia, Reichland, etc., etc., etc. But um, I was kind of pointing in the direction of this one when uh, I was looking for something just a it kind of like a little bit more viscous and a little bit more sort of like the, it's not as strong as as Agrax but it's a little bit more diluted than that in the way it covers and the way it tones. Ironically it's called strong tone. It is, it is called strong <laughs> tone yeah but like when you compare this to like Agrax I don't I don't really find it like um, I find with, with this you can you can use it and it and it really does give a nice desaturated look to certain colors when you put it over the top. Um, and whereas Agrax does does tone dark to an extent, um, I think you can put a thinner layer of this on. And it just it it does push the contrast a little bit more. I think sometimes, uh, and that's depending obviously what color you put it over the top of. But yeah, I, I, it's literally one of the only paints I think I use for my painter, um, uh, and that's not through sort of not not sort of wanting to use a range or anything. It's just it's just I got sort of like pointed in its direction quite a, quite a while ago. Tried a bit for a certain, for a couple of bits and bobs. Really liked it, and then just have always grabbed it as and when I wanted to do a certain thing when I was painting. Um, I, I assume that the, the I think there's a red tone. And, and there's uh, so like, many yeah, washes. I, 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 I'm a painter of a massive wash range. Yeah, I, I, I've I've always I'm, I've always been Citadel through and through from when I started. Obviously, um, so I've been really familiar with all the Citadel washes and stuff. So, but that's one of the only ones I've used. I think that's one of the ones that Joe spoke about, where he was like, when he first started painting, it was the uh, use it for everything, and it would just make it, make it look better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I think that they came after. So when you know, 
this is my knowledge of eye paints, but when, when they first released their, like, their quick dip kind of thing, mm. these came very, very after that, I believe. All their washes, they developed all their wash range after that. But again, I could be wrong. I'm not massively knowledgeable on, on eye paint as a range and as, as a company. But um, but um, but yeah, like I, I, I do use it as, as and when, when I need something a little bit that's got just finishes and looks a little bit different than maybe Agrax or Reichland, for example. But yeah, that's, I tend to use it a fair amount. I use them for uh, some bolt action minis. Okay. Which I actually thought that was brilliant for. Oh yeah, I think they're suited to that, yeah. I haven't really, I don't think I've used them on much 40k stuff at all really, but for something in that sort of setting, especially for terrain, yep. like especially if, if you're one of those people who's like concerned about price and things as well, yeah, like yeah, getting yeah. one of those bottles and just slapping it like over your terrain or, or even like ground cover like texture if you're one of those people who puts like sand on your base and whatnot. I, I've, I've put it for an airbrush as well. Okay. Uh, it's really good, the airbrush. Like, really, really good. A lot of like washes. You think it's like, like a tint? Or? Yeah, yeah, like a tint just to desaturate sort of stuff. If you don't want it like, because obviously when you put it on with a brush, you put on quite a bit on the model mm-hmm. um, and it does change the tone of the, of the piece quite massively. But if you just give it a small little subtle pass with the airbrush, it will just it'll give you in, more incremental changes in tone, which is quite good. Um, See, so yeah, I've used it for the airbrush as well on some tanks and things, which has been quite good. Uh, but yes, that's, that's... I think people overlook like using them on bigger surfaces, like massively. Yeah, d- definitely. I do agree. I think that you... you, you I know, mean, I'm not one for like putting washes over big flat surfaces. That's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. But yeah. like... Like I said, terrain. Well, with the like airbrush, you can, effects. and it doesn't do the pooling. That's the yeah. thing I'm saying. You put it through the airbrush, it atomizes it, and then it allows you to put like that tint filter over the whole entire thing. So you get no brush marks, but it gives you a real soft kind of tonal variance to the, to the surface and just changes the tone. Do you find that using a wash for that behaves different than using an ink for that? Uh, it depends. Some inks can look quite shiny once they go on through the airbrush. Mm. They've got quite a lot. They've got quite a lot of, I don't know if it's like, gloss varnish but they have quite a lot of gloss sort of like finished property to them um whereas i find that that and all the citadel ones are quite matte when they go through the airbrush um it's like contrast like when you put contrast on they they tend to be quite matte i genuinely never thought of that because i've used yeah. a lot of inks before through the airbrush they're really the shine good. is they're, they, the shine is a concern what washes through the airbrush is phenomenal you should especially on metallics because the thing is like let's just say you're doing a night like when i done my nights for example I had the I had the, the all the exoskeletons all separate to the armor panels, and I'd painted them. Obviously, I'd rattle canned them all. The silvers I've done two silvers, so I've done like a silver all over, and then like a, a forty five mid forty five to ninety for with like a brighter silver. And um, the the brighter silver was quite strong, so so I just literally was like, right, well, I want to tone it all down. If I get a brush and put like null oil or whatever all over it, it's just gonna gonna leave loads of tie marks, pull marks, etc., etc., etc. So um, so so what I decided to do is literally just put put the different shades I use through the airbrush and um and, and it really gives you a lovely soft uh sort of tinting of the metal work but it's not nowhere near as strong as when you just put it on with a brush obviously it just works really well so yeah I consider putting the washes through we'll the airbrush it's yeah. really good okay well speaking of inks uh I'll fire off with my first one then uh that's Liquitex Naphthol Crimson I've seen a lot of those they're quite good I like the Liquitex inks. I think a lot of people like the, the Liquitex inks. They're great, yeah. I know uh, these and like the Dollar Rowney ones, I think are probably the most popular. Yeah. Um, this is, anyone who's been following me for a while, this is the OG of my uh, my Blood Angels recipe. Uh, I remember you telling me this. Yeah. yeah. So my old school quick and dirty uh, methodology was the classic white. spray the whole <laughs> spray the whole model black, <laughs> do the white volumetric highlighting with the airbrush. Yeah. And then this is super transparent. It's got more punch than Rocky Balboa. It's really transparent, so it goes over the black and it doesn't really do anything. But when it goes over the white, the great. vibrancy is... It's really good. Not quite blood red, James, don't get me wrong. But it's sort of a different like no, colour anyway. No Ray-Bans with that one. No yeah. Ray-Bans with that one. Yeah, yeah no. Um, inks as well. Like I've started to try and dip my toe into a bit more with like brushwork, like just glazing them in. Yeah, they're great. Um, I, I used a lot of the old Citadel black ink, brown ink... Um, chestnut ink uh, or metals and stuff like that, like oil and grime and stuff like that. And because they do finish, like I mentioned, uh, a bit glossier, works really well, um, works really well on metals, but they are phenomenal for adding tint colors onto things. Uh, like you literally get a tiny, tiny little bit of that on a palette, add water into it, and you've got the most amazing glaze that you can exactly. use on that. Yeah. And if anyone's not used inks before, like one of the amazing things with using inks instead of just normal acrylics that is the, the key selling point is they don't like stain over yeah. surfaces. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if you've got... A color, and you're adding you're adding like a filter layer. Mm-hmm. If you've got like black and then white, and then you glaze like a, a red acrylic over it, you're going to end up with that distinct difference, and yeah. you're going to end up with a finished difference. If you do it with an ink, it's literally just a filter over the whole top. It's it transparent, like to the nth degree. You you got to be careful with them though. They obviously come with a really good applicator as well, so you can like 
a bit of pit. Like a just little pit yeah, thing, a little yeah. squeezy They're thing. really good. They're really good for that. But the, the, the other thing as well is like, you've got to be careful with them because they do stain. Like if you drop, I've dropped one of those on a carpet before, it's not a good day. <laughs> It's not a good day. <laughs> I've actually, uh, because it's such a big lid, I've actually spilled uh, a yeah. few of these. Yeah, you, you think you've got problems with the null oil, the null oil being tipped over. You're, you're having a holiday compared to dropping that on the floor. Yeah. One of the downsides, I will say, because uh, they go on so thin with the airbrush, mm. they are easy to chip off. So normally what I would do is as soon as I've airbrushed them on, and they also take a while to dry. Yeah, they do. So it's one of those things where they're quick to do and they're quick to use, but the the downside is it's, it's not really time you're doing anything, but it's like a leave it overnight sort of yeah, situation. Yeah. Yeah. So when I would do my blood angels, for example, spray the whole models black, do the zenithal, spray them with the ink, and then they're getting left until the next day. Then they're getting varnished. Varnish then you got to wait yeah. for the varnish to say, dry. You, with inks and stuff like that, I, felt, I find that even though they've really, they've got loads of punch and saturation and color, depending on which one you're using, obviously. But but the um, they do come off quite easy if you're careful, if you're not careful. So yeah, varnish them in once they're, once they're fully dry. Uh, and then, yeah, you're right. Leave them over 24 hours. And they're very, very shiny. And if yeah. you're going to varnish them and you don't want them to be shiny anymore, <laughs> look at that segue. It's like I queued it up. It's like I've done it on purpose. It's like, it's like you planned for this. It's like I planned for yeah. this one. Yeah. I've got here uh, AK Interactive's uh, Ultra Matte Varnish. That's great. This stuff yeah. is absolutely yeah. mental. You know when people always talk about like, oh, this was like a game changer for me. And like someone always says that and like, you kind of like disregard it, right? Because it it's, is good. Th this is like the first hobby product in a long old time, probably since I like discovered washes that actually like blew my mind. Like, and I'm, I, I'm not exaggerating with that. Like putting this on over a blend is nuts what it does for the finish. Yeah. I, I do like it a lot. I think it ha it is sometimes can be a bit strong personally. It's yeah. It's called ultra yeah. matte for a reason. Like, yeah. It's it very, very, matte. very matte. Um, I have tried it and I've got it. I've used it. I actually used it on my nights um, on the sort of like, because I use Mr. Hobby, which is obviously that. Uh, is Mr. Hobby. Mr. Hobby, bringing it up again. But yeah, um, because obviously that's a totally different. It's not an acrylic paint that what I used. It had such a sharp. Was it like an enamel? It's an enamel, yeah. Well, it's not an enamel. It's like, it's the same as like a Tamiya paints. Right. Okay. Like Tamiya clears and things like that. It's got a lot of, it's got, it, it's just very shiny when it goes on first. Um, so to, to, to bring it back down. It was great for putting transfers on, obviously, because when I gloss varnished it, it was still really shiny. But then to 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 put that over the top, it really does help just obviously just keep the saturation of colour, but at the same time, it just gives you a lovely matte finish. Um, I have also used, on a little bit of a segue, uh, the Vallejo Mecca range, mm. which is very similar in the sense of its potency and strength of of, of matte finish. The Mecca matte is, is just like that. As well. My gripe with the Vallejo not, varnishes is oh, I'm always faffing around with them to get them the right consistency in my airbrush. Yeah. This out of the bottle is Oh, it's perfect. great. It's great out of the bottle. Yeah, obviously. That's a pre-airbrush designed uh, varnish. Generally speaking, like a 50-50 is, is about right for, for most varnishes with airbrush thinner. It can be, but like, you, you know, if you let it sit in there, the thinner separates, it can be a bit, yeah, no, a bit I, marish yeah, at times. No, I, I get that. Yeah. It's also just like extra time. Do you know what I mean? It is, yeah. Yeah. Especially if what I, what my favorite use case for this for is it's not putting over a whole model. My favorite thing for this is when you've been blending on like say a cape, for example, on like a marine. Yeah. When you build up layer after layer of glazing, yeah, yeah. you end up with a lot of shine mm -hmm. and that that refraction of light stops you from seeing the smoothness of the blend. Yeah, it does. And I like using this just selectively, not not to its full opacity to like super, super, super flatten it. Yeah, yeah. But putting some of this over the top of that just instantly reveals like one, how smooth the blend is. And two, that can that can do one or two things. It gives you a better finish, like on finish result, or it can also help you to see mistakes that you didn't realize were there. Mm. But using it selectively is perfect for that. And because it's pre-thinned and it's just the right consistency out of the bottle, I can just put like two drops of this in my airbrush, spray it on the cape, call it done. Yeah, it is good. I, I really do rate it. The Mecca one as well is actually is, is awesome. But that, I think, because of the ease of using it straight out of the bottle, we don't have to thin it or anything like that. I think it is... It trumps it a little bit, I think. Is the Mecca like you go to sort of all round earth? No, I use the normal, normal the polyurethane normal, one. Polyurethane, yeah, I've always yeah. used a polyurethane, but I, I actually mix matte, matte and satin fifty fifty. So I do in in one of my big. I don't catches. find that the matte one's that matte. The poly, it's, yeah, but I, yeah, it's not. Um, it's not nowhere near as matte as obviously like an, an ultra matte or like the Mecca. But but I like the way that the old purity seal rattle can used to look. It had, it's it's kind of like somewhere in between matte and satin. So you got a little bit of sheen, but it does have like a matte matte-ish kind of finish now obviously i'm not a big fan of the cans uh, can varnish because you get that like, marbling sometimes you don't shake it enough and like it's just i don't really rate 
aerosol uh, varnishes personally. I've never tried any aerosol varnishes for mini painting stuff. I've used it for like other DIY projects and whatnot, but from what I've heard, it's something that I've... Yeah, I've had, some, a... I've had some bad experiences previously, and I'm sure anyone watching this has probably had a bad experience with one misting up or whatever. Blah, blah. I mean, even airbrush varnish can be a... It can be, yeah. Be I think the, 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 the level of risk is less with an airbrush, but but yeah, I've just got one of my ketchup bottles mixed fi- uh, with... with <laughs> you and your ketchup yeah, bottles. I have. I've got one mixed with 50% thinner, so it's half of it's thinner. 25% satin, 25% matte. And that's what that's what I use as a mix. Um, like 25 matte, 25 satin, and 50% thinner. Um, Adam, me, we, we in the office, we use a very similar sort of varnish. So we, we just call it matting because it's like half matte, half satin, oh, basically. Right. So, so we use that all the time. Um, and it's very similar to the old classic purity seal in the way that it looks, um, which is which is quite good. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, but that overall the AK, the AK Ultramat is, is, is a phenomenal, phenomenal varnish. It's really good. Do you want to, uh, fire off something else here? So you got, you're going to get a lot to get through. <laughs> so yeah. So to condense it down, you're going to get five for the price of two. Five for the price of two. Everyone knows that classic saying when yeah. you walk into the supermarket, what five, do they always five, say? Five, five, five they always the, say five for the price of two. Five for the price of two. So, uh, so this, that I'm going to get some of the, some of the older paints out of the way first. So I'm a huge lover of the old, uh, Gaines Workshop, uh, metallics. Um, going to start How with, old? <laughs> no, well, it's been around a long time, but, the, but this is the, this, this is the last iteration of the, of the pot that they used to do. So the good old bolt gun metal. How is that different to the current pots? Uh, it's different lid. hasn't got the hasn't got the quick quick release bit on the on. It's the, basically the same. It, right? It's basically basically the same. Like you know, essentially the same. Um, but uh, but yeah, like it's basically the same. But um, but bolt gun metal, the old metallics, they are like silk. They the the the, the, the micro flakes in them are tiny, um, and I I just find lead belcher personally for me as an opinionated statement. I find it a little bit thicker, a bit chunkier. Um, this, like the old metallics, like my, the the three that I'll say are bulk of metal. I've then got my absolute favourite. This is my, this is probably bold statement. This is probably my favourite metallic paint ever. Is the old Citadel Chainmail. I don't think I've ever even seen that one. I love Chainmail. It's so good. Like it is uh, uh, literally amazing. Um, so they're the, the kind of two metallics that I use. So the way I said about getting extra value for listeners is that um, is that like. Uh, if you can't get those, the Vallejo, uh, the Vallejo Air Range, mm-hmm. the the gunmetal is not, it isn't the same, but it's the closest that I've found to bulk gunmetal because right. it flows really well. Is that the one that's in like the pot, like the air ones? It's in a dropper bottle. You'll love it. Oh great! Um, yeah. So so and those other ones are good as well. The metallic, the air metallics in the bigger pots, they are good as well. But the but the chain mail, the the gunmetal in the dropper bottle or even the, the airbrush pot one, that is also very, 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 very good. Um, so, and then obviously for chain mail, there's, I think there's one called aluminium. I think it is. Yep. Aluminium is very similar to chain mail. Chain mail's, chain mail's got more of a bluish hue to it. When you look at it, um, it when, when it's, if, if you leave it for long enough and it separates on a palette, it's, it's got, got like that blue ink. It's got a blue ink. Blue ink yeah. It's really, really good. Um, so that, if they're from my, some of my favorite metallics that I always tend to use, so it's always bulk gun metal shade. And I always shade it with like nine, five Oh black, like watered down. So you get a nice matte kind of metallic kind of finish. Um, and then I'll highlight with chain mail. And then this is where you get the bonus, the Brucey bonus. So pro acryl, everyone's been raving about pro acryl recently. So I got some to try out. Cause I was like, I'll give them a go. Cause I, you know, I've I, not I, tried them yet. Yeah. So I straight away have wanted something. So like with a lot of the acrylics that we do, we always do like dot highlights on corners and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I was reaching a point where I was highlighting metallics and I was struggling to be able to do the dot highlights. You're running out of, uh, running out of brightness. Running out of brightness, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I then- That just, looks to me immediately like the scale color uh, speed metal from a, well, from a distance. So this is, is Pro Acryl Metallic Medium. So that's what it is. So it is a metallic paint. Oh. However- However, this is designed to basically add, to mix. add in, yeah, add in to make things have a fleck. I've not seen this. This is so, brilliant. So this is amazing. Okay. So you can make any like metallic color, basically. You can make lots of metallic colors. Yeah. Which is great uh, as a, as a, as a specific, uh, that's what the tool is. So it's great. So if you want to make a metallic color that you're unsure about, like Pro Acryl, uh, and we'll do some photos so you can have a look at the pots and stuff. Um, but metallic medium is great for that. But where it really shines, to use the oh pun, God. Uh, snuck that in, um, is uh, is 
for my corner dots on, on, on chain mail, like when you look at the saturation, the colors next to each other, and again, we'll take a photo so you can see, uh, this thing is like uh, a bright white searchlight on the, on the horizon. It's so, it's so, <laughs> it's so, it's so vibrant. So I literally, my, my process for dim metallics is literally bolt gun metal, shade it, um, do my highlight, do my highlight stage with chain mail. And if you want to do several stages of highlighting on metallic, you get your metallic medium and you, you mix it in. mix it into your chain mail as a 50 50 stage. And then right. you, it's, it's There's layers to this onion it is phenomenal. So that's kind of like a, a bit of a, that's the four out of five. What do you mix with it for? Like, say you're going to do like a color, like say you're just going to do alpha lesion or something. Put ink in it. I was going to say, would you put ink in it? Or would you put acrylic in it? Yeah, in because it? if you put ink in it, what happens is it, it, it retains the metallic pigmentation. And what actually happens is that you get, uh, you get a metallic paint, but t- t- toned. So you could get your, red ink mm. drop a bit into that and you'd make the most amazing vibrant red metallic i like this we're, yeah. we're crossing our uh, we're crossing <laughs> we're the streams, crossing the streams. like streams. ghostbusters <laughs> yeah uh, so that's really good but but just for, for for listeners as well we want to give as much value on the podcast as possible for you and like the thing is is there's a really good scale 75 metallic set um which has essentially got all different tones of metallics now you could theoretically make those using the the, the procrural medium with with like a, a different inks or even contrast or things like that um so yeah so that's kind of like the, the the metallics that i wanted to bring to the table but there are there is another one which which is probably one of my favorite metallics ever like absolutely ever. I've got a feeling it's going to be an old one, James. It is an old one. Yeah. But I've, I've, I've brought, I've brought a little new, a bit of modernity. I've brought something that's very similar. Um, so tin bits. And if anyone who's watching this, who remembers tin bits, it is such a good paint. Tin bits sounds like if you was in like the Warhammer universe, that would be like a kid's morning TV show. <sighs> Like for the orcs? Potentially, yeah. That, that, that could work, yeah. That could it's work. like a Saturday morning yeah. cartoon. We're not doing a parody. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. But no, um, Tim Bits is phenomenal. And I and I absolutely love it. For when I'm doing like um, metals and metallic. So let's just say like, there's a case example. If I'm doing like golden armor or whatever, I will uh, use this as my, my deep shadow color. So it's got this really lovely, got like almost golden copper kind of tone to it. But it's, is, that, is that sealed? Uh, no, it's, it's, I've got to see this. It's, it's, We're doing this live on air. It's live on air. Yeah. So I can't so, let the air get to it for long, George. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I've got like a time limit. You've got a time limit. It's like countdown. Din, din, din. I'm not going to do the sound thing. It's very dark. It's very it? dark. It's like yeah. charcoal. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. So make sure that's on tight, George. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, uh, but like Timbits is one of my favorite, favorite old paints. Like, I don't know how you describe that color. I've, I'm baffled. It's like purpley, but it's also dark. So when you let it separate, it's got it's got a bit of purple pigment in it, which I absolutely love. And incidentally, that ties really good to uh, another of the old ones, which I absolutely love, which is Brazen Brass. So Brazen Brass um, uh, has got a lot of purple hue in it. And as it moves and shimmers, you've got this lovely etheric kind of purplish kind of hue to it. But Timbits does trumpet a little bit. It's so, kind of like Balthasar Gold, but a lot darker. It's better. It's no, way, no, I mean, in terms of like better. closest thing I can think of, it's like a darker Balthasar Gold. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's like a darker Balthasar Gold for those of you that use the, the modern uh, GW range quite a lot. Um, but fear not, because I have got a backup for that if you can't get hold of Timbits. Um, I love that your loophole for being able to recommend old paints is just recommend an equivalent that isn't as good. It's not that it's not as good. It's just, it's just, I understand it's harder to get hold of. I get that totally. So, uh, scale color, scale I'm color. you won me over James. George's, George, I'll take it back. George's hooked hook like a kipper. Um, so, uh, so the, uh, the best equivalent that I, that I found and that I was recommended to by various people, uh, before I managed to buy up the last remaining stock of Timbits in existence, hopefully. Uh, is, 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 uh, is, if you're uh, trying to buy some Timbits and someone's outbidding you, it's probably James. It's probably me, yeah. Um, it is uh, Decayed Metal from Scale 75. Like, it is, it's not the same, as in it's not got the dark, it's not exactly the same darkness of, 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 of colour, but Decayed Metal from Scale 75 um, is a phenomenal paint. And if you are looking for something very similar to Timbits, Decayed Metal is the way to go. It's great for doing like bronze kind of things. If you're looking to do statues or scenery, it's amazing to put that on. Um, you know, if you want to make a very close equivalent to to tin bits, a little bit of black into decayed metal, and you're very, very, very close. Um, yeah, it's a it's a phenomenal a phenomenal paint. So there, you get five metallics for the price of two. So, so yeah, it's, I, it's, it's I don't know that that's in the spirit of 
of the show, but I'll let it go. Excuse me, you did I'll this. You did this on the last paint episode. You brought the you brought the royal, oh, fam- yeah, royal family of scale. <laughs> <laughs> so so, and by that you mean I brought like one extra paint. You've got an array here. Yeah, I know. Um, right, go on then. What are your greens? My greens. Uh, so again, I like I like very old scorpion green. So that's one of my very favourite old paints. Uh, why why that one? Because it has. A very, very, it's got the perfect yellow green balance for when you're doing like final highlight stages on like green lenses, green gems, all those kind of things. It's a really, really, it like, I always find that I'm needing to put a little bit more ice yellow or a little bit more of a really. I mix with moot green normally. Yeah. yeah. So, like, input something in it to boost it. For example, like, Scorpion Green has just got like the perfect, the perfect vibrancy. It's just like, it's, it's really good. Um, you know, and, and again, a lot of the older paints do have a very high saturation of color because they do come from that era where it was, things were always very bright right if that makes sense mm. um so so again really good paint if you still got it i always I, I would always say probably use that over some of the more modern brighter greens that are out there and like when you do hold it up next to like sort of other paints like you know if you look for example um from 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 vallejo we've got the equivalent color which i'm going to recommend which is escorpina from vallejo game color which again is a really really good green um the scorpion just just is slightly more saturated as you'll see hopefully on camera and it's very close it's it's very close yeah it's a very 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 close that i mean escorpina in spanish essentially means scorpion uh scorpion green so um so it's very close but it is a little bit more desaturated just a tiny bit Mm. um but the good thing is i bet you could mix a bit of ice yellow in that though you can which is the thing that i do or the extra little bonus the little brucey bonus paints that we've got you've got livery green which is the next uh next color in the range is a really good booster if you want to boost that brighter. Because that's like a bit past. It's, it's like, past, It's yeah. like the previous it's, one is a bit darker and that one's a bit brighter. Yeah. So your Scorpion's a great bridge kind of the bridge in the gap, but the livery green is great. But if you do want to boost even even higher, my, the actual paint I wanted to bring to this, which is the one that I use all the time for like when I'm doing green gems, green lenses, or if I'm doing final dots on it, green armor, like things like that, is uh, yellow green for model color. And obviously because it's model color, it's got a very dense pigmentation being obviously the model colour paint that it is. <laughs> I love Vallejo's just no nonsense naming schemes. Yellow green. That's what it is. Like, what should we call it? It's a bit yellow. It's a bit it's green. Not, it's not we'll ye- call it yellow green. It's not yellow. We'll call it yellow. And it's not green. <laughs> it's yellow green. So 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 yeah. Um but it's it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. Uh and it's it's like if you're looking to do like dot dot highlights on like green armor, like the, the on your like dark angels or like on uh, whatever the case may be that's got green armor, like it's it's really, really good. Um, so yeah, so if you can get Scorpion Green, I recommend it because it's a really good paint. Uh, if not, then that triad uh, of uh, of Escorpina, Livery Green, and then Yellow Green from Vallejo will uh, will fill your boots, basically. Do you find you get burned a lot when you buy uh, the old paints online? Or do you have a pretty good success rate with that? Um it varies. I ask uh, that they, they, you, a lot of people will have photos of, of what it's like. So that, that does happen quite a bit. You do get to see a bit of a photo of how it's actually, uh, how it is actually in the pot. But yeah, I've been, I've, 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 I've bought job lots before and out of 20 paints, there's only been two that have been alive, you know, it's a, uh, you know, but I, I, but I think that's, it's part of the luck of the draw really. Like it's what makes it a bit fun, you know? Is that like the fun? The yeah. Cause the you get it, you're like, you. Oh my God, the tin bits is like brand new or like, Oh, oh it's, it's drier than the Sahara, you know? So like it, it just, you're playing like Russian roulette with your paints. Like you, your order comes in the mail and you're all excited and you open it up. It, it's because you can't go down to the shops anymore and get them obviously. Yeah. Like, you know, but like, yeah, like, Part for me, that's part of the fun of it as well. It's like, you know, being able to find an old paint that's still really usable is, is, is great. Cause like, it's like number one, like a biggest tip I, I, I advise is obviously just in general for paints, as we said, it's quite, quite obviously about paints quite a lot. Like I, I see a lot of people that literally just open the pot while they're painting and leave the pot open. Hmm. That's horrendous for the paint. Like it's horrendous leaving it, especially if you're quite a Oh, for the paint. Yeah, like as in you leave the pot, the pot open while you're painting. So you take the pot out, yeah, you yeah. the palette, and then you just leave the lid open. Like I think like that's one of my golden rules when I'm painting. And if I don't, it's something that I've always done. Like I, I've always got the paint out of the pot, close the pot, made sure it's sealed. And and a lot of pots get left open. I love that, dry. that you're not like worried about their models. You're like the poor paint. <laughs> yeah, I know. I do. I do. I do. Yeah, especially when you can't. Get- I really <laughs> thought he was going to say like, "Oh, and they leave the pot open, and I see them getting paint from the pot, and they're going to ruin the models." He's like, "No, you're concerned about, I'm concerned about the paint. If they want to, if they want to, yeah, if they want to put it straight on a model, then fair. But no, but like, uh, yeah, but like, I, I just, yeah, I think, um, yeah, you have got to look after your paints as well as anything else. It's like anything that like we say, like you know, 
it, it, they're going to dry out if you leave the lid open. Um, and uh, and yeah, like especially when you're using older paints that you can't get you can't get as easily. Like if you if you do that, you just well you just, that's that's why of course I put all of my paints into a dropper bottle. One of the dropper bottles. Yeah, I know. You, I've got here. Uh, this is a spicy one, James. I've got the correct color for a base rim, and that is still Legion Drab. Okay, right in the comments right now. If you're watching this, get a comment in. Black base rim or steel legion drab or brown base rim. What do you prefer and why? Put it in the comments. We need to. We, we, everyone who's on team black base rim, you need to get a comment in now because that that steel legion drab. As much as it looks, please good tell on, us but, why you're wrong. If you uh, <laughs> if you like a black base rim, as much as as much as uh, as as much as uh, um, it looks good on the box art, definitely. Um, I just have always personally preferred. Me and Peachy had this. We had this conversation where it was like, you know, he prefers about racing, but I will still argue the fact that if you do handle your models by the base which is the correct model etiquette if you're gaming um i couldn't care less about like scratching the paint off or chipping the base rim i don't like most of my bases that i do and most bases that you see are like ground cover they are natural elements yeah I, you don't yeah. see black like unless there unless it's like asphalt like fair enough but that's man-made like there's no natural like brown that's going to contrast. With the, it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense to me. You can. I don't. I don't like that the model, and then it's got like the nice basing on it, and then you've got this harsh line of like the black. I want it to blend that's in. That's because the, the base room, the base the rooms like the base rooms like. Right. Um, think about it this way, right? When you cut a cake open, yeah. Right. It's not the color of the icing on the inside, James, is it? It depends. You might put a layer of icing in there. Oh, give me a break. Right. <laughs> It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's distracting. So I'm thick, not into so it. When you have a big thick layer of icing on top of the cake and you cut through, it's got at least like half an inch. Well, I like of... to imagine that it's like the cross section of the earth. Right? Oh, I want yeah. it to like blend in. Nah, but it's a frame. It's a frame. It's a frame for the base of the model. No, so, not having it. Yeah. No, having so, yeah. it. You know, so, I especially so, don't it... like it. I especially don't like it when the model is a black scheme or it's got a lot of black in the model or it's a dark model. Yeah, I, maybe, potentially. Team, team black base for him. Back me up in the I comments I actually now, saw please. someone in the comments crying that the uh, the new Strike and Scorpions have black base rims. I mean, that, that would have been way too much green. It would have been way too much green, but never mind. What's what's your, what's what's what else do you like about it? Is that is that purely? Is it just for base rooms? Is that all you like it for? Um, yeah, feel feel where empty the spot was. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's pretty much just base rooms. Uh, I mean, it's a good color. It's, it's brown. Isn't I it? like it for leather. I think leather is is quite good. I don't use it in like many of my leather recipes. Not from like lack of it being good for that it's just I think it's a really good colour because what you often see is a lot of people just paint all the leather the same brown mm. I think sometimes especially if you've got like maybe not so much sci-fi maybe more like sort of like fantasy or like D&D &D models when you've got like different colour like warmer colour. richer browns normally it's quite yeah. it's desaturated it's quite desaturated yeah. Uh, yeah. it's mostly used for base rims if I'm being honest but it's, yeah. it's it would be good enough for, for anything else yeah yeah. probably use it as like a highlight stage if I was going to do it for leather but it'd have yeah. to be quite pale yeah yeah if you're enjoying this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you could please do us a huge favor and leave us a rating or review on whatever platform you're using. It would really, really help us out. And please also choose to follow or subscribe. It allows us to continue to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the show. Well, my next one is absolutely leagues away from that in, in, <laughs> in contrast. Um, uh, I've always struggled to find really decent oranges, like a really good saturated orange that... Um, it's punchy when it dries, it doesn't desaturate too much. Um, and, uh, it's a, it's a paint, which it's, it's, well, it's named red highlight, but, but, um, Kador red highlight from P3. P3. Yeah, I know. It's a I wild card, isn't it? I know. It? I'm bringing out, bringing out all the golden oldies here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really good orange. Can you still get that? I'm not hundred percent sure if you can or not. Uh, you'd have, you'd have to correct me if I am wrong on that, but. Yeah, no, it looks like you can, you can still get it. Yeah. So I wanted to do like a prisoner army, like from from forty k, and um, and uh, obviously orange jumpsuits are pretty pretty the in thing I've heard in, in sort of prison colonies guy armies. Well, and like stuff. a necromunda kind of yeah, thing. yeah, kind of. I wanted to do something a little bit like that. Um, so finding a really good orange uh, to to sort of uh, remain vibrant, obviously for the jumpsuits, um, whilst obviously being able to edge it with a slightly brighter color, but covering really well. Um, yeah, P three P three K or red highlight is. is I'm not familiar with the range, so it's highlight. Is that part of the paint formula or is that just the name of the No, color? it's just the name. So, okay. so it's just, a, you've got Kador Red uh, and then you've got this as a, as, as a highlight. Right, okay. I thought it might be like the Citadel layer based No, situation. no, no. It's just done, it's just done so, that, uh, so that it's like a highlight color, if that makes sense. Uh, as in like it's a brighter, brighter gotcha. version. But the name is literally just highlight. So um, so yeah, but I, I, I really rate this orange. Like I actually went from just using it to do a couple of testers for the army, which never actually, I made all the models, spent ages making them. And then just when you look at 100 conscripts you're like uh maybe not um 
but then I actually started using it to uh, to, to edge uh, red armor quite a lot, like for some of the higher stages. And then this with ivory. What put, would you be doing red armor for? Um, just just a little little known chapter. Um, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> but but um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to sit there and, um, and, uh, and, and bang on about it for ages. But, uh, but yeah, so, so essentially, um, so essentially, yeah, he, I use this all the time for edging reds, capes. Um, it's really good with a brush. Like it goes on really well with a brush. It covers quite well. Um, yeah, it's really good for, for doing lots of, lots of uh, myriad of different, um, of different uh, sort of highlight stages and bits and bobs like that. Um, but if you're looking for a really good orange that covers really well, it's great for the airbrush, dilutes really well. It's quite matte in finish as well, which is quite nice. Um, then yeah, P3, uh, Kador Red Highlight is, is, is. And you found that, why is that different to other oranges that you've tried? Just because it's really saturated. Like it's really, really bright. And, and like often a lot of paint ranges, the scope of the, the scope of the, um, the, the, the oranges in like a range will be quite, the, the, the jumps will be quite substantial. Um, and towards the brighter end of the spectrum, you only really end up with like maybe one or two, which which are really, really good. Cadal Red Highlight for me is is a really, really vibrant color that you can always boost again with ice yellow. But at the same time, it's it's great for just blocking in color well. Um, a lot of oranges I find to block in, if you're looking at Jakara Orange from Citadel, it's very desaturated. Like it's not got a high, high saturation at all whatsoever. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely rate rate it as, as that kind of color okay well speaking of saturated got uh got another classic of mine uh this is i never know what to call this this is the vallejo fluorescent green um i think there's a couple like in a similar range this is the one that's like literally uv reactive the fluoro range yeah 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 i like this couple of specific things plasma and lenses and this never used it this in conjunction with this it's a good little match. So, 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 do you put like white on first, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah. I wonder it's, what it is. Uh, the consistency is horrendous. Being honest, it's very thick, not in a good way. It's kind of like it's usable. It's quite jelly. So uh, you got to go. In, it goes over white, great, right. You want to thin it down a lot and kind of build up the layers, but that's kind of why it works so well because, like, obviously, the more white that you're showing underneath, the brighter the color is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it airbrushes like fantastically over white. Yeah. Um, I used to use trick I used to do with like the blood angel that I did because I really like the 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 stark contrast because you got such a punchy, like bright red. Yeah, yeah. And having that contrasty, like punchy bright green. And this is like so great for like the, those like quick and easy like lighting effects and whatnot. Yeah, so if you like doing it, these on like a lens on like a model with with that red ink, like it stands out, it looks really powerful. And yeah. you can literally just do like a black uh, I like lens on a helmet. Yeah, you can just sort of put a wash in there of white, so you've got that sort of like tint over the middle, but oh, it pulls in the bottom. Oh, right, okay. And then, and then you go in with the with the green. The black? Yeah, and then you go black. in with the green, Sorry. and you sort of glaze it in, and you've got that really nice like bright white line. Looks like they're glowing. So easy. Yeah, yeah. Seconds takes seconds. To and do. they they do fluoros in lots of different colors, don't they? they do yellow, yeah. they do orange, they do pink. I think don't they as yeah. well? The is, orange there, is there one, a purple? There's a few. The orange one well, is okay. Magenta. The orange one is okay. The blue is pretty crap being honest i haven't i've not i've, I've it, got two of them but they're I've not just used like them. because they're fluorescent and they're uv reactive like I are think you are they uv reactive yeah as well? i didn't realize that yeah so if you like want to have if you want to have a rave of your with your warhammer armor you can put on a black light i thought the the fluoro dictated that it just it i don't sound it obviously stands for fluorescent but mm. i didn't realize that it was uv i didn't realize I yeah you shine, you shine like a uv light on this they're, they're glow. yeah right okay i didn't realize that Oh, like only under the black light. It's not like glow yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, didn't I think it. it's just a like a physics thing of like some fluorescent colors just work better than others. I don't think yeah. it's necessarily a problem with the paints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the green works fantastic. And then my second favorite, probably the orange, but I don't really use that for much, being honest. Okay. This for like plasma effects, lenses, like anything like that. Just so a small little You pop. said there's a blue one. Like, is it like a dark blue? Is it like a light blue? Is it like... It's not dark. It's not bright either. It's just sort of a, a, mid, a mid-tone a mid blue that you, you sort of expect sort of... Like like this sort of color on like the okay. blonde helmet, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just not that bright. Being honest, like I don't really understand. I've I've not found that it being fluorescent is of benefit to that blue. Yeah. Um, but with the green, like using this, it's a different effect at the end of the day. Like, yeah, well, you can really see at the bottom of the pot, like yeah, the, yeah. When it separates out, that yeah. is crazy. The difference in the bottom of the pot to the top. Yeah, it needs a good shake, but uh, yeah, that is, yeah, that is crazy how bright that is. Yeah, they're yeah. fun to use though. Like it, they're they're pretty affordable as well. Um, yeah, well, it's, and it does, it's a model color, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. I didn't know if it was a model color or not, but yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't use it for like painting a model. I'd use it for like a plasma gun, 
like glowing lens, maybe like a some other weapon effect, like in or you know, like a jetpack or something. Fair, like, whatever, yeah. whatever you want to use it for, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, fair. It's up to you. Even on fantasy stuff, I guess if you had like a wizard or doing some sort of something glowing fire in a hand, I don't know. But yeah. anything like that, I think it works well. Less is probably more. No, of course, yeah. I think with anything like that, you don't want it to look like you, you, you're a disco or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, so. it works especially well when you've got like really heavy contrast. So if you've got like a darker scheme yeah. or a darker model, or it's used in shadow, uh, then it really punches through. Yeah, good kit. That can't find anything else that has might replace it because it's, it's a pretty unique product. Yeah. I have to give them a try. Like I said, I've got two of them sitting on my shelf and I'm li- I literally never use the fluoro paints. Just haven't used them. Just put it on your, your little painting journal. Just put it in there. I have to give it, give it a swatch in my book. Yeah. It'll be glummy. It'll be like that scene, but in green out of Indiana Jones where it's yeah, exactly. it'll be like, yeah. Um, so what you yeah. got for us? I have two paints, but it's for one entry. Um, we we always get, I'm offering value here, George. We have five for two and now we've got two for one. Two for one, yeah. Deals are getting better. <laughs> I'm not sure that worse. Worse. <laughs> worse. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the deals are getting worse. Yeah, we're not getting five for three or five for two. We're getting two for one now. But it's, it's still a very, very good deal. <laughs> it's a very, very good deal. Uh, we always get asked about white and uh, the best way to paint white. Um, I think one of the bigger problems that a lot of people do struggle with when it comes to white is, is like... Um, is is being able to uh, to highlight it, and I think the big prob- the trick to paint white is to not paint white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you can. Yeah, um, like I think a lot of whites uh, in in many ranges of paint. It's not inherently like a specific manufacturer or anything like that. There aren't like lots of whites mm. to choose from, and they all tend to have the same vibrancy or saturation. They tend to all be in and around the same sort of point when you think of just white, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, one of my favourites um, is a, uh, well, it's a combination of two, as I mentioned. So you're getting two for the price of one here. But to block in white, a lot of people will go with a very bright, stark white to start off with. Problem with that is that then, yes, you can th- obviously shade that. You can add various degrees of shade into white and add contrast onto model really nicely. But it's all the parts that you want to be brighter or show where the light is catching. Once you've gone to that, that bright white for your main white when you put it on first also the brighter the white like the thicker the paint just inherently because like the pigment is bigger yeah I, yeah i think I, when you see a lot of like gobby textured models it's on white especially like white is especially prone to that i think that's why it's got the, the negative stigma that it has um but I, I think that again like trying various different brands and manufacturers you'll find one which which is more suited to the way you paint or what you're looking for etc um so I've got two for you, which are my staple when it comes to painting any form of white at all whatsoever. Um, so I always base paint uh, base paint uh, models with uh, with a paint called uh, White Grey. So you can get this as a... Again, Vallejo, a banger of a name, that. Yeah. White what gray. should we call it? Should we call it like ethereal white? Should we call it's it not like... Gray. White? It's, it's not white. It's not grey. It's, it's not quite gray. white. White, white grey. Gray. Yeah. So uh, 71.119 white grey. That is the air version of it there is a uh, model color version of it that is thicker and not designed to go through the airbrush is that the same paint like the model color one yeah it, the tone is exactly the same well the colors are the same i prefer this because when i'm painting wings on a certain red chapter uh and i'm painting them white uh I, this is the color that i use to block them in with start off with um because and this is my white main base color basically um, you don't use that through the brush though right yeah i do Oh, okay. Brushing a hair dry. It, it dries super, super. Do you not find it's too thin to work with? Nope. Covers okay. covers like a dream. It's really good. Um, I find that the model color version, which is more designed for brush work with a with a with a thicker pigment or more thicker pigment, more pigment. Um, I find that that um, that that tends to that tends to uh, create more of a texture when you're working it quite 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 rigorously, trying to get white on the surface. So once you've base coated it with this, you can shade it with whatever, whatever color you want. Obviously, if you're going for a cooler color, you might use blues, you might use purple, you might use a mix of purple and, purple and blue. If you're going warmer, you might use grays, etc. cetera. Um, but when it comes to highlighting that, the beauty of it, and this is where the real, it has its real virtue, is that I use probably one of the brightest whites I've found through various whites that I've uh, purchased and tried and then stopped using because they're not bright enough. Um, which is uh, cold white, which is a model color. Uh, model color cold white, really good. Seven oh point nine one nine. So is that not quite white again? This no, this is this is super bright. 
this is like when you look at it. So if you compare the white, gray, and the and so how does that com cold white compare to just a normal? Was it nine five one? It's white? brighter, even brighter. It's brighter. Yeah, yeah. You can put it on the palette, and they are brighter. Have you got one here, George? No, amazing. Let's do let's do an, an on the camera test uh, and see what they're like. Yeah, I've used it several times, and uh, it is super. So let's see if I can get any out of it. The end's dried. Uh, See, dropper bottles are really good, George, aren't they? Like well, the, end, see, the, end, the end dries and then you have to lift, lift Well, if you the look after out. your paint bottles, then you don't have this problem, James. Yeah. yeah see, I had with me... I no, was, already I can see it's brighter and I'm just looking. I was considering whether to suggest uh, 951 white because that's one of my favourite whites. But I went, oh no, I've already got five paints. No. I'll have to substitute it, one out. Give it here. But if Come you're on. in here bringing like 30 paints in... Give it, give it here. Go on then, what we got? You, that's got, you can't say that's not brighter. Yeah, it's brighter, yeah. It is vibrant as hell. It's really good. There, there I was assuming that white was the ceiling of white, it's not. but Vallejo so what, were there what with we'll cold do, white. What we'll do, I'll hold these up so you can see them next to each other. So the cold white is at the top here and the uh, whatever other white is. The, 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 it's just called white. Just, <laughs> just, 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 just called white. The white is here. But we'll do, a, we'll do a photo on screen and put it on screen so you can see and we'll show you just how, how, how much more vibrant the cold white is. It's, it's really good. So the, the beauty of the cold white is because it's so saturated in colour and so bright. What it does for you is it allows you to put on crisp kind of edge highlights on white armor really, really well. And especially if you shaded down your 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 white and if you've if you've like sort of pin shaded bits and bobs. But cold white is is the one to go for. And using white gray air or white gray uh the model color, if you want to use the model color, and then highlighting it with cold white, it's it's the way to go, definitely. Um yeah, it's a phenomenal duo of white that you can that you can use to your heart's content and paint lovely white armor. I'm a bit sad now. I've been thinking this whole time that the white hat was as bright as it got. Nope. It's colder, so it's whiter. It's colder, so it's whiter. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, right. I've got my last one. What you got? I've got, uh, I don't know if this is a classic or not, uh, Citadel Shade, Karaberg Crimson. Why I like this, right? Big ups, Matt Kennedy, friend of the show. He showed me using this as a recess shade on gold. Yeah, man. Good Lord. Yeah. That is the way forward. It's great. I I didn't really get... The coloured washes from Citadel didn't really get much of a look in from me previously. I don't know so, why, George, because they're phenomenal. Well, I say previously. I mean, like, I'm going back a fair bit now, but, you know, you've got your Nuln Oil, you've got your Agrax, Seraphim Sepia, whatever, because they're so, like, usable in so many colours. Whereas... I guess in my mind, I was like, oh, like Caraba Crimson, like that's only used for shading red, right? But using this on golds for like a second stage of shading, I normally do a uh, like shade of like Reichland over or something like that. And then I'll use this in very, very thinned down either glazes or very, very carefully applied into like the deepest recesses on models. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal. It has this like extra depth, but it keeps the richness of the gold. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in. Mm. So... Shading gold armor with Reichland because it's got that reddy, orangey, mm -hmm. browny kind of hue. Looks really great when you do that as the deep shade color. Mm -hmm. As in, like you can even mix that half with Reichland to mm -hmm. boost the Reichland into a bit more of a reddy hue, and then you do the tiniest, deepest parts just with that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah. So you, what I'm saying is, you add another stage. So you, mm. you, you, you do Reichland as you normally would. You do a half and half as like the in between shade between the soft and the, and the deep, so it transitions a bit, a bit smoother. And then you use that in the absolute tiniest depths on its own, just literally tiny little bit. And it just forces the eye and the visualization of the shadow into that recess a bit more. It's really good. Yeah. I mean, it's quite like a, it's quite a dark red, sort of like burgundy almost sort of color. You can um, use it with, um, what's the purple one? Magos purple? No, the shade, not the contrast. Oh. Um, Drucci. Drucci Violet. Drucci, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Drucci Violet and that is also great. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'll have to experiment with that because that seems the way for, I mean, like the contrast of kind of in this weird sort of spot with the Citadel range at the minute where like one paint can be replaced by another in the sense of you've got the contrast range and you've got the shade range. I mean, obviously they're doing a similar job, but like with the new shades, yeah. now they're so much more similar to contrast. There's kind of an argument for if you're going to not use a wash as a wash and you're going to thin it down and use it for glazing, you could probably be using a contrast paint instead. I don't know. I haven't really got a uh, much experience either way or much of a preference either really i mean they've obviously got their own separate properties but yeah like starting to use stuff like this for for glazing has just been a bit of an eye-opener for me I, I really love glazing metallics with the citadel washes like for example uh sepia reichland uh Agra agrax um 
and 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 Carisberg and and also Drew, uh, Drucci. I think all of those have really got a good place when it comes to glazing on. on I think as well, gold. like using like not just one of those, not just being like, right, I've got my gold and I'm going to shade it with Reichland. And that's the shading done. It's like, you can do multiple stages of yeah, shading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. Even with the same paint, you could do like a, as long as you're thinning it down and diluting it first, you could do your first like sort of pass at the model to get like a softer yeah. stage. The beauty of them is every time you do a layer, mm. as in you do a, a little bit of a tint, it increases the saturation of that hue. Mm -hmm. So you can, you're quite right. So imagine you had the top of like a, the arch of a foot, like an armored marine, for example or your storm cast near the foot and you've got that upside down U kind of shape. You can do one layer first and then on the lower side you do second and then again and again you force the eye to, and it just, each little pass just tones that that recess darker towards where the shadow would be where night light is naturally coming from. So yeah, it's, it's they're, they're, they have such a good use when it comes to shading and obviously if you gloss varnish as well, really helps obviously to just make the fluidity of the liquid allow it to flow better on the surface of the model. Um, yeah. Um, it's fun. It's great. Cool. That's a lot, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's all of them. Yeah. Nice, nice selection there. So you actually got, let's see how many we got. We've got six, nine, 12, 15, 18. You've got 19 paints for 10. 19, pa 19 I mean, paints for the price of 10. 19 <laughs> paints for the price of 10. That's a deal. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. If you're a fan of the podcast and want to support the show, then what better way than with our exclusive Siege Studios merchandise? We have a bunch of high quality apparel available, as well as an assortment of painting accessories and equipment to help you while you paint. Head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop to order now. Question of the week time. Uh, thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, if you are watching on YouTube, please leave a comment. Uh, if you're listening on audio platforms, then uh, head over to our Instagram, shoot us a DM or wait for the story that we uh, do every so often and you can submit your questions there. Uh, <laughs> Big Blue Luke says, uh, as a recently returning hobbyist, the idea of a painting journal is really interesting to me. Could you maybe go into what is in each of yours? I know Paint Swatches was mentioned. What else would you recommend? I'm going to chime in here quickly. Uh, you bought one recently. I only just bought one recently. So I'm actually also keen to learn what you're putting in yours, James. I bought mine really because I needed some art paper to, to practice some 2D art. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm going to sort of do two birds, one stone here. I'm yeah, going to buy yeah. the art book. Knowing future tense, I'm going to start using it as a painting journal. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm keen to know what's, uh, what's in your painting journal, James. So I, I mentioned like when you, the best way for me to explain it is like specifically with the, the swatches. Um, you don't have visual access to all the paint in the pot in front of you all the time, if that makes sense, because they're sealed, they're on racks or they're in like a drawer or whatever the case may be. So formulating them into one place and having them on a, on a, a on paint swatch pages in the back with notes about each paint. So you write, you do the swatch, you write the manufacturer, how it finishes, as in, is it satin? Is it matte? Is it gloss? You know, what's the coverage like? You know, uh, but you can even write a little note of what you typically use it for, things like that. Just so it gives you a little, like, almost like a little bit of a recipe page where you've got all your different paint swatches and things like that. One of the real virtues of it is like, let's just say you, you go on holiday and you, you're going to start a new project when you come back. You can take your paint journal with you and you can start basically planning the project because you've got your full paint range there with you. As a, in those swatches. Oh, okay. It's, it's really good. You know, I've been on holiday before whenever I've taken one, like, you know, and, and, and I've taken a journal with me and I might go, right, I'm going to start uh, Necron's army. So, uh, you know, what, what paints am I going to use? What, what am I thinking? Am I going ceramic? Am I going metal? Am I going rusted? Am I going clean? Am I going, and you can start. Not just on holiday. I guess you can kind of sit in like a, a separate environment from your painting space. Like you can, you know, sit yeah, on the sofa exactly. with your book and just sort of. I think, I think one of the things that uh, we all, because when we do, we have our go-to, right, I'm going to paint silver. So I'm going to choose this color going back to today, bulk gun metal and chain mail for me or whatever. Like, but I think that when you, when you have, imagine going into a library and each topic in each, on each shelf was, was one book. And that's the book that you constantly read for that specific thing. It'd be quite boring and it would give, wouldn't give you the opportunity of choice. And I think when you, when you do the swatch pages and you've got all your paints from your paint collection swatched out in tiny little one centimeter squares or little, little round circles or whatever with some notes next to it, it means that you just learn like a good painter, in my mind, it's not only about ability and the way that you paint and how consistent and precise you are. Your knowledge of paint as well is really important. That's something that I think can often be overlooked. So like the ability to go, right, I'm painting some leather. I need a black, I'm going to paint black leather. I know that leather is, is satin in finish. So you might always use 950 black as your black go-to black. So if you have like a black gun casing and you have a black pouch on the model, you might paint both those things with 950, but then the material that that item is made out of are completely different. So the way that they would be as a finish 
should theoretically be very different. So going, actually, I know Abaddon because I've got my pad and I've got my black paints in, uh, in an amalgamation of swatches. I know that 950 is matte, covers really well, but Abaddon black still covers fairly well and also dry satin in finish. If I'm doing a gun casing, I'll pick the 950. And if I'm doing leather, I'll pick the, I'll pick the Abaddon because then that way they, the finished property it takes that they're different materials and they look slightly different. Mm. So it, it starts teaching you about those paints and then it gives you a more uh, informed way of choosing specific paints to then emulate materials, which is a whole another layer of depth when it comes to your models. Um, so that's what the rear is. It's a, switch, a, a swatch pad and you can do like five, six, seven pages and you know, blah, blah. I really recommend you do it whenever you buy a new paint. One of the first things you do, put it on the palette, brush, swatch, write the notes, leave it to dry, write the notes. You know, I, I and mean, if you get in the habit of doing that, those pages will fill up very quickly at the back and you'll have five, six, seven, eight, nine sides. It doesn't have to be pages. You can do on each side, obviously. And you can have loads of sides. And that what that does is it's filling up that shelf in the library for you so that you can literally make informed choices for what you're painting and what it's trying to resemble and what the things are. And I think that's one of the things that's really important when it comes to that specific part of the painting journal. At the front, a project per page. So... We've all been there. I said it on a lot when it was mentioned in the previous episode, like you painted a specific army, you paint 2000 points, you, you follow a process, you forget half the paints, you try a new next new cool model comes out. One of the Christmas boxes comes out and you're like, wow, I want to add that to my collection or to my army, blah, blah, blah. You forget half the paints that you've been done on your, on your first phase or the first set of the army. So being able to have a page in your painting journal that you can go, right, there's all my paints. And you can put swatches on those front pages as well that corroborate the ones that are in the back. You can put a swatch down and see all those colors in little swatches next to each other. If you're planning a new art, new color scheme, you go, actually, that color doesn't work with that one that well. You actually get like a visual swatch kind of like matrix of, of colors. So you can see visually all the things that are going to be on that army, that new army that you're painting. And at that point, you can flick to the back, go, actually, I need a brighter green because that green looks a little bit dark when it's next to that orange or next to that red or blah, blah. And it allows you to flick between the front and the back and you can make some really informed choices without needing to put any paint on the palette at all whatsoever saving you time and a lot of time that we waste as painters is in choosing colors or in doing processes which are maximized for efficiency and for quality and you'll sit there for ages and just go right um you know i, I need a green okay well i always use caliban green but then i've got this other one that potentially covers better or finishes more satin which could emulate the thing the plant that i'm painting on there because it's got a bit more of a satin finish or whatever like it just helps you have a much more level of depth when it comes to the things that you're painting and informs choices for colors i guess it also incentivizes you to use colors that you wouldn't normally use rather than just defaulting into your normal exactly recipe. Yeah. yeah exactly like you you your pre-programmed recipe obviously there's a there's a difference between a pre-programmed recipe because that's the color that you always use and this is the color that i love using because it looks like this that's a very they're two very different things that doesn't mean that like the color that you love and that you always use has to be the singular color that you use for that thing or for that process. You can always have other things that complement that, you know, and then that's really what the journal's for. Um, you know, it's, it's really good. You can, you know, you can write pages talking about, about your project. You can write notes to yourself about what you found hard notes to yourself about where you, you saw improvement in your painting. You know, it's really good if you're doing like high end pieces, you can write down, you can go through the normal process of planning the project, writing the colors down, writing what they're used for, blah, blah. And then you can put, put yourself notes next time it comes to using, using that or trying to do that technique or trying to do that. You can write yourself some notes that benefit you the next time you try and do it. Do you ever do anything like retrospective of like the end of a project, like writing down maybe things that you struggled with or things that you found that's, easy? That's what I'm talking about, yeah. the notes. Yeah, it yeah. really helps because then you can next up, because let's just say you have painted an army and let's just say um, you've done a specific technique on there and you've done a test model first and you way overkilled it with a certain effect or a certain thing. Writing yourself a note on how you achieve that and the errors that you've made or the mistakes that you've made, the next time it comes to adding to that and you need to do the thing again, you'll read that and go, right, I know I need to be careful when I'm using this paint because last time I overclocked it too much or I done this or I done this. Yeah, because so I guess I, I paint quite a lot of models and I find that at the end of the process, I'll often have like loads of like feedback in my head in the sense of like things that I thought went well and things that, I, things that didn't. But before I know it, I'm onto the next model and I've long forgotten like yeah. by the time it comes around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's really helpful. Like I, I massively, massively recommend buying one and using it. And as a, just as a final note to add on to that, buy a proper art book. I'm not talking a pad down WH Smith's or like from your, from your uh, stationary supplier. I'm talking a proper gray toned acrylic mixed medium pad or book that ha that is designed for painting with acrylics 
because the acrylics will bond to that paper way better than they will on, on a piece of paper that's got a bit of a satin finish and the paint will crack off after some time because obviously acrylic is plastic. Um, I said on a previous episode, like I picked one up recently. They're actually like way cheaper, more affordable than I thought. Yeah. I went to the range, got one. They're yeah. a few quid. Yeah. Yeah. Like just to get a proper art one, I can't, I can't push for that enough. Don't just go in, don't watch this and just go buy a pad. Spend a little bit more. It is worth it and it will last you a lot longer and serve you better as well. Hobby Hacks, this is our uh, weekly closing tradition uh, where we share a little hobby hack with you. Uh, if you have any hobby hacks yourself, please leave them in the comments. Uh, James, I believe you have one for this week. Yes, it's uh, it, it's it's a little bit, um, it's not so much a physical painting thing, it's more an equipment thing. So if you have a airbrush, if you, for any of you that airbrush, and I'm sure a lot of you do, um, if you have a compressor that's got a tank, which is the bit underneath that holds all the air that's got the sensor where it fills up, it cuts off, the, the motor cuts off when it fills up and then it, as it depletes, the motor engages, the, 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 the sensor engages the motor and it refills up the tank again. On the underside, there is a bolt on the underside. Oh, I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so many moons ago, uh, uh, I discovered this bolt <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm done it and found a load of rust and, and stuff that came out of uh, water, uh, I'm the, guessing. Yeah, the water out of the tank. So obviously, oxygen has water in it or it has moisture in it. It's O2. Um, uh, We're back to change the science. If you, if, you, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you leave that in there, even if you vacate all the air from the tank uh, at the end of a session, if you leave that bolt in there, any air that is left in there will condensate, creating water. Um, it just uh, depends on the time of the year as well. Like if it's it humid, does, yeah. like you're pulling, you're, 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 pulling right. you're pulling air that is in the room and you're putting it into a small little tank and yeah. you're compressing well, you're it. You're compressing it. Yeah. So it, it, yeah. And that motor does heat up the tank as well. Exactly. Bear that in mind because it is, yeah. it's a two straight motor. It warms yeah. up. The, so what you're talking about is on the bottom of the tank, turn, there is, there's a com- little, yeah. Turn yeah. your compressor upside down and on the underside of the tank, there's a, normally it's brass. It could be silver. There's a, there's like a, like a, a nut that under unscrews. Get in the habit of taking that out at the end of a painting session. Obviously, use the dump valve on the side of the of the of the compressor to vacate all the air, or just take the line off so you can just get all the air out of it. Um, obviously, don't do that while it's full up with air. But that, of course, maximum pressurized. But that, of course, won't get any water out because that will sit in the bottom of the tank. Correct. So that nut. Get yourself a bit of blitz, yeah, oh, cheeky, cheeky blitz plug. Get yourself a bit of blitz or really absorbent paper. Stick that underneath. Stick that underneath the the the, the compressor once you've taken that night out and leave it for like 15, 20 minutes. And what you'll find is when you come back is you'll find that you'll either have a very brown, rusty mark on the paper. Or if, or <laughs> we if, had we or had if, very <laughs> different experiences because I also discovered this uh, this little brass yeah. nut on the bottom. Um, I wouldn't say that Blitz would have been adequate. I would have needed a five gallon bucket because yeah. I was thinking, oh, I, I was occasionally starting to get a bit of water spraying through my yeah. airbrush. Yeah. Like with not, when it was empty. I was like, oh, there must be a bit of, wa- a bad, a bit of water in there. That's a bad sign. The, because the moisture trap I would empty. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, there must be a bit in there. I I, I literally, it's like a comedy sketch. I've got it like upside down and I, like, I pull the valve thing off and it just, poof, just yeah. fires water out. Lovely brown, like, brownie orangey liquid. Cup, yeah. All yeah. rust. All yeah. over your carpet. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So it can be quite bad. I actually had, so I, I knew this for about a year or two and it was like many years ago when I was first started teaching and I went on a class, uh, I taught class and um, on the first day I, I mentioned about the nut yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, one of the students was like, "Oh yeah, like uh, you know, their their moisture trap on their compressor it literally looked like a Tango swimming pool because it had oh. like, it as like it was like half of it was like sloshing with like this rusty. So oh, he was, was going to take it out. He was going to undo it on, on uh, at that point when I mentioned it. I was like, please don't undo it. Like please <laughs> just just don't do it. Like do not do it. Um and. Uh, on the day two, at the end of the day two class, he was like, oh yeah, I'm going to take that nut out before I go home. I was like, cool. Yeah. Okay, fine. It was so rusted that he couldn't get it undone with his hands. So he had like, <laughs> a pair, he had like a pair of pliers, um, put the pliers around this nut, tried to undo it. Obviously it gave some resistance. It went like that. And the whole entire plate around the nut came off. Oh, because it had rusted so much. Oh, yeah. So like, um, if you've never seen that bolt or the nut underneath a tanked compressor, I really recommend at the end of a painting session, use the red valve, dump valve on the side to get all the air out or take the, take the hose off at the, at the contact point of the compressor, take that off. 
and then and then obviously just get the paper paper towel and undo that bolt at the bottom of the compressor. And I promise you, like you can get that bolt, put it on your desk, put it in a little Tupperware with your airbrush and some pieces after the session or whatever, just so that you always remember to put that back in. Obviously, if you don't put that nut, back I think in. you can do it a bit more like periodically than that. I don't you think can you just do, do it like every single time. I'm, I'm I'm all about building up building up repetition and building up building yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, you could make it like a weekly or monthly yeah. it's going to depend on your climate as well because like at the end of the day if you if, if you're in the states you're in like a really dry yeah, yeah. dry hot state you're yeah. not probably going to have this issue if you're no, in the uk where it's constantly wet yeah then and it's cold more and concern. Damp. Yeah. yeah i had once where my moisture trap was so full i thought it was empty because it was clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good george <laughs> it's not good yeah, but now you've got to think of it this way those compressors look they're made they're made they make thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of them they're not made from like state of the art you know no they're the, still the, the, it's it's yeah. still it's going to rust quite easily like you know they're powder coated when they're sprayed so like they're not they're not i don't like, even know if they're powder coated on the inside but no they won't be on the inside no. on the outside they will be but on the inside it will just be the metal so so again like that will rust very very quickly maybe every day's overkill but i definitely if you get in that habit of taking that out at the end of a session it's that it's that first thing you do that that at the beginning of the next painting session and for the sake of bending down putting it on screwing it back up tight it, it just it will help that compressor last a lot longer just because you spent 50 60 pounds 60 bucks on it whatever blah blah just you spent a little bit of money on it doesn't mean you shouldn't look after it you know and it will serve you a lot longer and you won't have a tango swimming pool in your, in your moisture <laughs> trap or, or make a massive stain on the carpet so so yeah that's All my right. hobby hack for the week he's back by popular demand Mr. Steven Box of Vanguard Tactics. Hey. Hey. The pro gamer returns. Thank you. We've heard your outcry for the return of the pro gamer. <laughs> yeah, we thought we'd get him back for another episode. We wanted to talk to you uh, this week about the overlaps of the fitness industry and uh, the Warhammer industry. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Very, very similar. On paper, I've though, seen... that's basically the same thing. Right? Basically. I've seen you lifting dumbbells at the gaming table. What are you on about? Right. Yeah. Literally the same thing. Well, I thought process was like, obviously, I mean, I don't have a background in fitness like yourself, but if I was to speculate, I would have thought that maybe the lessons of discipline and regimen probably do have a lot of overlap with, at the very least, like building a, a brand around board gaming or maybe even competitive play. But yeah, it's probably worth starting off with what I did in the fitness industry, right? So um, originally I started off as basically playing full-time volleyball. That was my thing. University, played volleyball, played to a good level, national level. Um, I was part of the or well, training squad with the GB team when I was at Bath University. That was my whole thing. And I started going to the gym simply to try and compete with basically trying to jump higher. That was simply it. So how can I jump higher? And I ended up falling in love with just this pursuit of excellence, this pursuit of just evolution and trying to improve and i just dedicated everything to going to the gym that my mates i was with at the time they were playing rugby they had the same sort of ethos was just how can they get bigger and stronger um and that's literally what we tried to do was just get as big and as strong as you possibly could and then um after that i left university got a job uh, i actually started working for the national governing body of volleyball worked there for a year so that was really good because it actually gave me a really good insight into how participation works. But then also I was working as at the elite end coaching the GB junior team for beach volleyball. So I was working and situated in the participation level in the grassroots of the game, but then also coaching at the top. So it gave me a really nice sort of idea of how infrastructure should work for a national governing body. Left there, became a teacher, um, trained to be a PE teacher, literally not too far away from here, funny enough, mm -hmm. um, in lovely Essex. And um, did that <laughs> well, for you a year. Well, <laughs> oh, you didn't stay here. I know, it was tough. It was tough, it was tough. But uh, yeah, anyway, left there. Um, and I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. I knew that was, not that I didn't enjoy teaching. I didn't really enjoy the school I was at and the rest of it anyway. Long story short, I knew that wasn't for me. Um, but throughout my time at university and stuff, I had been given quite a fair few opportunities to model, whether it was catwalk, fashion, um, and then obviously the the bigger I got, the leaner I got, it was more and more, I suppose, opportunities to do that. Fitness modeling came about as a thing, like you had bodybuilding, but then also fitness modeling became a little bit more popular. Um, 
you know, I get got an agency, they would put me forward for work and stuff. So um, I always had to stay in this like unbelievable condition. I look back and I, I actually am quite impressed by the condition that I was able to keep um, because it was a case of, right, you need to be photo shoot ready tomorrow. You know, you need to be ready to potentially go to London for a casting for men's health. That was always like the, the level I to, need to maintain at. So it was a lot of like short notice. Yeah. I had to be ready. Tomorrow. Yeah. You or are you free today, Steve? Yeah. Can so it's like to... maintaining that constantly. Then. Yeah. You can't like, you don't know, oh, I need a week to, you know, tighten up a bit. It, yeah. No, no, you need to be ready right now. And if you're not ready right now, you're not going to get the work. Hmm. It's pretty cutthroat. Um, if that were me, I'd be like halfway through a mouthful of Ben and Jerry's. And phone would ring. <laughs> <laughs> right, George, if you're not ready for this men's health uh, shoot tomorrow, you can't do it. <laughs> oh, girl, look another one. <laughs> yeah. And so it is cutthroat. It really, really is. Um, but through that, I ended up with this kind of sheer dedication. And in order to be that focused on the pursuit of essentially excellence, everything 100% needs to be geared around that lifestyle. So for a time, I was sponsored by a fashion label where they would pay me a salary just to train because they knew that I need to be ready for them at any you know beck and call to do a photo shoot, whatever. Um, and then after that kind of period of teaching, my entire dedication was simply this pursuit of excellence, whatever it was. And to have a physique that is show like winning worthy from the day or from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, everything needs to be focused around it. Yeah. There's no, you know, everything relies around, okay, cool. How much water do I need to drink? Okay, cool. So I need to drink four liters a day four liters a day so what does that work out per hour in order for me to consume and when am i going to get my meals in what time am i going to train how long do i need to leave it between eating and training you know even setting an alarm um, and obviously there's a lot of things that you do that you don't need to do necessarily but you do it because you believe you should and there's that whole kind of like bridging the gap between the two but um you know setting the alarm so i could wake up and have a protein shake at three o'clock in the morning just so i could have another protein feeding throughout that cycle okay um but yeah so what i think i learned from that is and this is kind of i was asked this question yesterday they were they asked me what mindset do i teach people when they come on my academy how do i give someone a winning mindset but i don't help people win at the game i help people become a great opponent what i can help people do is learn the skills to require them to receive an outcome. So I use the example of like, okay, in one hand, I can give you the blue pill. In the blue pill, I can give you a mental health cover model physique. Okay? You can just have it right now. Brilliant. Great, right? Let's sort that out. You've sold me. Yeah. D don't need another second one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the red pill is 10 years of graft ahead of you. 10 years of training five times a week, making sure you prepare all your own food, Sometimes you just eat chicken and rice or whatever that might, you know, I'm just picking a very boring base meal, but sometimes you have to do it. What one do you want? I think it's the, the classic thing of where the real true answer of what you'll be happy with is the, the graft, right? Yeah. You're not going to feel the same get getting something instantly as I mean you it's are. gonna look great. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. gonna look real yeah. good. Can you I'm half, not saying I wouldn't enjoy half. it. I'm just saying I'm can, just saying it can you half and half the pills. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can we it's half one or the half. other. <laughs> Give me <laughs> half the body. Just I'll get, have the upper just, body now yeah. and I'll yeah. do five years of graft. <laughs> <laughs> but we so, see that we see that overlap with painting all the time because like when we're when we're speaking to beginners and new painters, it's like everyone wants that instant gratification. Yeah correct. Like you just said. Correct. People want to know that secret hack how they can become a great painter now. And the reality is you need to spend, like you said, years grafting. My point is it's the same reason that if I was to give you, if I had it, a million pounds right now versus the graft of 10 years to get you there, which one are you going to be able to maintain? Well, yeah, so exactly. a, a result yeah. that is earned is a result that is maintainable. Mm. A result that is given is not. It's because you learn all the nuances of how to achieve that result. Yeah. That's the thing. Like you, you could instantly get it. Like, uh, but every every step and every failure and everything that's pushed you onto that point, you're 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 just not going to have. So yeah. you'll never be able to recreate that success. Yeah. Whereas if you put the graft in, it's it's scalable. Yeah. Always. Yeah. So so yeah. I think in where the parallels lie to forty k is that 
and this will be the same for painting, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. the, every single brush stroke that you put in, every single roll of the dice, every single move of a model, you either do one or two things. You either do the action and never consider it, or you do the action and you critically think about it. And the, the difference between greatness and stagnation, greatness will come from those people that critically think about every action they make. Mm -hmm. Was that the right brush stroke to make? Was that the right way to move my model? Versus stagnation, I moved it without no thought. And you get to the end result and you think, well, here's the result, but they've got nothing to, to take away from that, which is why people will spend eight years of their life and they'll never improve at the game because they're never once sitting down to think, could I have done something different? Are they able to think for themselves? And I think we're even more so now in a culture where everything needs to be spoon fed to us. Our intention span is so little. Um, and this is even happening in such a short period of time. But there's this ever growing essence of, oh, what's your list, Steve? Who cares what my list is? Because you didn't write it. You'll never know how to use it yeah, as we well as I do. Same conversation where I mentioned a few episodes ago about people asking for paint recipes. Yeah. Kind of the same thing. I'm sure, sure you'll find some use to it if I told you the paint recipe, but you're not going to be able to paint it exactly yeah. the same as what you're looking at. And it's also not the key to being a better painter, as I'm sure having Stephen Box's list isn't the key to being a better gamer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I see this all the time. I see... The amount of times I go to a tournament and I play someone and I look at their list and I'm like, yeah, of course, I've seen that before. I've even played against people with my list and I'm running the same. I'm still running my list. <laughs> it's and like then, that Spider-Man meme where they're pointing at each other. <laughs> and they're running it too. And then they're like, oh, yeah, Steve, I've been really inspired by your list. And I can go, I can see. I mean, I think, I think like in being inspired by it and building something else off the back of it is one thing. Sure. But copying it, um, I guess, obviously, as I said, many times I don't really game and I haven't been in tournaments and things. Does it get like boring when people all have the same kind of lists? And is that that kind of culture of getting the best list and copying each other's list and there being maybe four lists in rotation that everyone's using, does that water the tournament experience down a little bit? Yeah, I think 100%. Do you remember the days of Skyhammer Annihilation? Everyone was running yeah. against Skyhammer. <laughs> now, luckily, I think I only played two tournaments of seventh edition. <laughs> yeah. But... um. It was, and it is like, it, it makes it stale. Um, and it's funny when people go to me, uh, they'll see who I'm paired against, like the, the people in my group or whatever, or people nearby, and they'll see who I'm paired against in the next round. They go, oh, Steve, you'll smash that. I'm like, no, no, I won't. I'll probably lose. I'll probably lose my next game. Because what if they do this with that unit? And what if this, and, I, and I'm, they're looking at, yeah, but it doesn't do anything. Look, it's a weird random list. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly why I might lose there's, this. There's thought, behind, there's thought behind it, essentially. Yeah, because yeah. the unknown. Yeah. This person could be absolutely off their rocker, and I might not even understand what's going on. Yeah. You know, they I've could be the... a genius. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I always give my opponent the most ultimate respect. And oh, then if they I don't. I actually love that so much, the thought process that, like, I could slap a list together not having a the clue. The most unhinged I accidental yeah. genius. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I come up against Stephen Box and he's looking at me going, What's this guy know that I don't know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then if you start playing it like a turnip, then I'll be like, Oh, it's actually fine. <laughs> <I'll take> it <laughs> <wrong>. Like, <laughs> Five minutes into the first turn, you'll be like, "Oh, I got this. Don't yeah. worry." <laughs> yeah. So, but, what 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 things from from fitness have you directly? Do you find that you like from from obviously having that long long time that you've been in, obviously in that industry and been involved with that, and obviously running a business within that? What what things for you have have you directly f taken or used? Because because I'm just saying from my perspective. So, from my like recruitment industry, there's a lot of stuff that I've taken and invest and put into into like siege and obviously the recruitment and, and yeah. the things. So what things directly do you find that have been transferable and how did you find delivery delivering it? And how yeah. did you find it convert into a different industry? Yeah. So delivery is key, right? So, um, I think, you know, I've had people try to like teach me how to play 40 K or whatever. Um, you know, recently, um, obviously I witnessed a lot of teaching of Warhammer happen, mm -hmm. um, with 10th edition with the launch of 10th edition. But the thing that I've known to be, very powerful when it comes to coaching sport, sport, fitness, whatever you want to call it, is number one, you've got to understand the people's motivation that you're trying to help. That's key. 
Number two is how do you take something very complex and make it sound super simple? So I'm going to show you what it looks like. Cool. If that is now their motivation, do they want what I'm showing you? Brilliant. Okay, now we're going to break this down. And I'm going to give it to you in small, digestible chunks or bits and pieces that you are successful at. Like when I coach somebody for fitness, for example, I want every single week the conversation to be, Steve, I've done that. What next? Right. Okay. Yeah. I want them to feel like I haven't given them enough to do because when they come back every single week, they've achieved success. They've achieved the mission outcome. They've achieved everything I've required them to do. And then I give them one more thing to do. Steve, is that it? Yeah. That's all you're going to do this week. But each and every week they're seeing the result they want. Yet everything is hundred percent attainable. Whereas if you give someone, right, okay, so what I need you to do is walk 10,000 steps a day. I need to do four sessions of cardio. You need to go to the gym, do this rep range, this many drop sets. I need you to hit this many calories at this time. You need to have this meal split and you need to have this much fiber in your diet. Oh, and you should probably supplement with this, this, and that. And oh, make sure you get good sleep and rest on these days. And someone's looking at you like, sorry, you what? Whereas I'm and, like, and you have to do it for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, right, okay. Blue so, pill, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take the men's health body that you mentioned earlier. Please. What is the low hanging fruit? So how do we tackle that? Let's get people some quick results, quick wins. Um, and yeah, I think I tried to use that same methodology. And you know, I could probably teach anything, providing that I had a, a reasonable knowledge of that area. Okay, cool. How do you break it down and make it simple? Um, and that is kind of my ethos is kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid, right? That's, I am, I perceive myself as a stupid person. So how do I, if I can keep it simple for myself, then hopefully I can help others keep it simple too. Yeah. Um, and that's really my methodology behind it. Um, so does it, is there much translation from fitness into helping people to become a great 40 K player? Well, sure. There might be some crossover with the better fitness levels you have, the better endurance you'll have over the course of the game. Like my back doesn't hurt when we play. Yeah, cool. My feet are slightly leadened after standing up for nine hours, but I'm not sat down. And this is where I, I can see a physical difference in myself compared to some of my opponents when we play. They are not engaged because I can see they're physically and mentally exhausted, whereas I'm not. I didn't even think about the actual literal Fitness, benefits man. of fitness when it comes to tournament games. I was when, thinking in terms of mindset. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you think about it, it makes perfect sense because, you know, even though we haven't done tournaments and stuff and James has, but not, not for a while, we've oh, done God. plenty of conventions and things and we just did Warhammer Fest for four days. Yeah. You know, standing up at those things for a long amount of time it can get a that bit... That was exhausting. Can get Best pretty exhausting. exhausting. So if you're doing it while you're... You're also trying to play Warhammer three games a day is yep. it or something nine hours a, nine hours a day you're playing so if you're you. having nine hours of standing up playing warhammer having to have be like mentally switched on but, yeah all the physical benefits you can get probably do help you actually so, me and you had a brief conversation about that at fest i think when we was walking past the gaming tables so i was like wow i've got a lot of admiration for these people because this is not an environment where i could Just, focus and dial in yeah you know i want to walk around the table and see where your models are behind terrain so I know that, okay, if I go over there, this model could heroically intervene or whatever, you know, I'm keeping it basic, but I want to be an active participant of this game. I do not want to be sat down inactive. I'm just like coasting through it. Yeah, yeah. because I'm not going to be mentally engaged. In, in order for me to be mentally engaged, I need to be physically engaged. That directly translates though. If you, if you, 100%. If, you, yeah. 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 if one of them's sort of on the blink, the other one, uh, the other one will follow shortly. Yeah, exactly. So there are, you know, I suppose I do have an advantage at the table if you have a higher level of fitness than your opponent, especially in those later rounds or by the time you get to day three, um, because you are you are going to mentally fatigue. Like I know that dehydration will cause uh, a performance drop of around you know, 60, 70 percent or whatever over the course of a three day event. Right. It happens in all forms of sport and it happens men due to mental like lack of focus i can't think of the word but yeah good lack of focus um and if that's happening in physical sport it's also going to be happening at the gaming table as well so when some people are drinking alcohol cool i'm drinking water you know how can i make sure i drink enough caffeine before the game to get focused quickly enough so that the initial aspect of the game isn't taken away from me because i deployed badly when do i need optimal amount of focus it's at the beginning of that game 
I know, do I, am I picking the right secondary mission objectives? Have I tuned in? Have I, you know, removed all the background noise and everything else? Like, and that is no different than if I was, you know, stepping up to, you know, play against the, you know, the best team in the league at volleyball, for example. I'm tuned in, I'm listening to my headphones, I'm getting my mind in the right place. So physically and mentally, I'm prepared for what's about to come. You know, I'm watching my opponents to think, right, okay, so this person always uses their right arm. They always hit to this spot on the court. Okay, cool. So I'm looking at the way that they're deploying their models. I'm looking at the way that they talk about their army list. I'm trying to gather how much information they know about their army. Um, so absolutely everything. I'm trying to, you know, absorb that information. And that's going to happen in those first you know, 30 minutes of the game. Am I asking the right questions? What information are they giving, et cetera? So all of that is like you're you're reading their body language. Are they tired? Are they fatigued? Are they, you know, are they focused as well? Um, and then you can kind of match accordingly because you don't want to, you've, you can only make so many decisions in a period of time. So when I teach people to play, I'm like, right, okay, well, let's remove as many decisions that we don't need to make. So for example, this might sound really stupid, but I typically wear the same clothes every day because then I never need to worry about what I'm wearing. Yeah, that is a decision point in my day I don't need to focus on. It's why, you know, when you rock up in your team jersey, normally you play sport, your team jersey is already there for you. It's already washed. It's ready. You put it on. You don't need to think about what you're wearing, yeah. right? Everything has a very strict structure. Your warm up should be the same in training as it is on the pitch. Right, that should remain exactly the same. So there's no if, buts, and maybe. So how can we take those same core concepts to playing 40K? Well, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to practice my deployment, which is essentially my warm up, And I'm going to practice it over and over again. So when we get to the table, I don't even need to look where you put your models. I'm just going to deploy my army. And sometimes I'll be like, right, I've deployed. I've gone to the bathroom. And they're thinking, oh, we shouldn't we be alternating? And I'm like, yeah, but I need to use the bathroom. And I don't care where you put your models because it makes zero difference to me. And that can, people, mm. people are caught off by, you know, can be a bit caught off by that. And they're like, mm. oh, hang. what does he know that I don't? But you get so practiced with your army, which is why I'm f solely focused on repetition, repetition of your army, repetition of your units. And I think we, you know, like you hear of the term spam, All right? Spam is typically, I would say a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. oh, if, if a unit spammed, yeah, yeah. it's typically uh, used in a ne in a negative sense. Spamming a unit is the best way that you're going to learn about it, right? Whether you use it for the desired outcome or not, the best way to get good at bench press is to bench press, right? So repetition after repetition, you bench press because you'll you'll grease the groove, you'll feel exactly how it should feel. So if you're looking to use a unit on the table in all your practice games, you want to use it six times. Right. Even if the rules don't allow you to, let's say my favorite units like striking scorpions. OK, so if I use a unit of five striking scorpions, I might move them once before they die. Right. I'll be lucky to move them once, shoot them once, charge them once, fight them once. OK, cool. That's one repetition I got with that. Well, what if I took six units? Well, now I'm going to move them at least six times in turn one, shoot them six times and fight with them six times. OK, well, over the course of the game, I've now got the potential of five turns doing that. And there's also two combat phases per player. So that is a potential of, well, that would be 30 repetitions in total for, you know, moving, a lot shooting, of practice charging. With one unit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's potentially up to 65 phases. If my math's correct, it could be wrong. But anyway, it's a lot of numbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's more numbers than I can count right now, but it's a lot more than just one. Yeah. yeah. It's better chance than just taking one unit. Right. So now I know exactly what that unit can do. People talk about Math Hammer, but now I've seen the extremes. I've seen the bell curve, yeah? I've seen of what its maximum output is, and I've seen the minimum. And then I can go, cool, averagely, I know that this unit is great into that. I know exactly the role that I can use for this unit. And I know when the bell curve of performance, if it's going to be terrible, I know I've got other utilizations for this unit now, right? So then, okay, cool. Got that lock unit locked in my head. What's the next unit I'm now going to bring in? Yeah? Okay, cool. So I'll keep... What do I think is optimal with Strike and Scorpions? Okay, maybe two units. Maybe it's unit of five, another unit of five, unit of 10. Okay, cool, because I can use this combo with the 10. I can't do it with the five, so this is the right combination for my army. Right, next unit, what is it? What does that look like? Repetition after repetition. Before you know it, you'll become a fantastic player with your army. And you often see this like friction point with people where 
they they get okay with an army and it's at that point they give up they switch armies they find out the and it's because a new a new things entered the meta right but the only way you and for me in fitness that's a plateau so how do you when you hit a certain point on bench press and you can't lift anymore maybe it's like you're trying to bench 100 kilos or you know 220 pounds and you can't do it what do you do well you could just keep bench pressing and that might do it but we need to look at some of the other variables. Is it the speed in which you're lifting? Is it a depth? Is it, you know, are you failing at the bottom? Are you failing at the top? You know, can we accommodate resistance by using bands? Can we change up the rep scheme? Can we add in additional exercises? Is it a particular part of the chest that's slightly weaker physically when we look at it? Okay, so, so let's critically look at what's going wrong and then develop a strategy in order to overcome it. But that's being lost from people. And instead they are, I think it's like pain avoidance is what they seek is that they don't want to be in pain anymore. They don't want to lose any so more. It's just games. a quick change. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you get to the, the thing that isn't the desired outcome, need to, need to move, need to move on to something else because it's not increasing anymore. But yeah. the only thing you'll learn from is the pain of going through it. Mm. That is what will really make the difference with people. And I think when it comes to like my mindset, there's nothing that I really fear. Because I've often been in a situation where, you know, I'm staring at a 230 kilo barbell and I'm thinking, I need to pick that thing up. <laughs> this could break me. And it, I'm, I think it's often that, that fear factor of I'm going to overcome this is incredibly powerful. Because if you can apply that to, you know, like weight training or anything else, and I think that physical pursuit of performance and going to the gym and putting yourself and it might be whether you like MMA or you like martial arts or whatever sort of discipline it is, any type of place where you can put yourself in an uncomfortable position, you'll grow and learn from it. Hmm. And then you can apply that to business. So if something go, doesn't go well in my business, I work through that plateau. Yeah. It'd be easy for me to give up and quit. Of course. Yeah. The option yeah. is always the easy option. Isn't always the best option. No, um, but when it comes to like hard work and just sheer, like output that is where i probably am you know i might not always take the most efficient path but <laughs> i'm just going to go through it yeah. so one way or another like adapt and overcome and just sheer go through that whatever that wall is you have to go through it so mm. i think that's where those parallels really cross start to cross over just a quick one we wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at siege studios we offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army we offer well above the industry standard in both quality and experience you can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk and in the month of august new clients can get five percent off any commission by using the code august5 back to the show right question of the week time Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions for Question of the Week. Please leave a comment below if you'd like us to answer it on the next episode. This week we have got, how do you balance painting and gaming in the hobby? So how do you find that perfect mix of uh, not spending all weekend painting and then barely ever playing a game, or you've got this unpainted army that you really want to game with, but you just haven't got the time? Well, I think it'd be rude to not have Steve answer that one first. Yeah, I think um, uh, we've got the, the perfect person to answer this one. Yeah. yeah. Let's get a pro gamer's uh, perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's balance is a really, it's very difficult, right? I think I've come to the conclusion that I will never be the best player in the world when it comes to 40K. Not because I don't have the necessary potential or the ability or the skill or the knowledge. But I do not have the level of practice required in order to achieve that, right? Just as I will never be a golden demon winner, right? They are two pursuits that require too much time, energy, effort, and emotion to have any other purpose. So how do I do it? Well, I can be a good gamer and I'm probably above average painter. So how do I do it? Well, I think it's being very disciplined with your time. You know, if people have got families or I've got, for example, I don't have a family that I need to look after, but I do have a very demanding job um, and requires me to be very busy. I think one thing you need to worry about is burnout. If you are constantly playing and painting and the same thing, burnout is definitely there and, and, and a thing that you need to consider. 
But yeah, it is about being disciplined, knowing, okay, what what is my potential output in a given week? And then how much of my thing is a priority to me? So if I have a tournament coming up, well, probably the priority there is my gameplay. Yeah. So how can I just get my army painted to a very minimum standard? So for example, when we play, um, you know, you need to have three colors, right? That's three colors and base is typically the tournament standard. So I recently took Gene Sealer Cult to a tournament and um, yeah, I put like six or seven reps in with the army uh, in the lead up to that event. But I had a unit of the uh, uh, Acolytes? The bikes? Oh, uh, uh, jackals. Yeah, jackals, well, yeah, the bike, bike boys, yeah, biker boys. boys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, the one that people use for rough rider conversions yeah, is yeah. basically the way that I know them. I don't yeah. know the actual name. Yeah. So for me, I basically got my airbrush out, uh, primed them black, um, airbrushed them grey, airbrushed them a lighter grey, dry brushed them like a white colour. Cool. Right. Well, that's all the grey armor of the bike done. And they were like, right, there's some dynamite sticks on there, painted with all them red. <laughs> um, I paint all their faces, like the, un- the, the the first undercoat, which is going to be a light purple color that went on. Did all their like clothes purple. And that was it. I didn't even paint the bikes. I based them, but to some, and oh, and I did all the leather pouches. So I painted enough of the model so that I can go back and I haven't ruined anything. Right, yeah. But I also, if you looked at it from, you know, across the table, I'm not proud of that at all, but it was enough to get it over the standard of painting. Um, and is that something that you want to do for every tournament? No. Is that something that I would recommend you do? Absolutely not. But you do have to balance that. And, you know, you are typically an, um, you know, you are as only good as your average. So if my average paint job is out there 8% of the time looking really good, great. I'm happy with a unit going on the table that I'm not particularly proud of because next week it'll be, you know, it'll be there when next week I don't have a competition and I can put more hours into painting it right to the standard. So it is about looking at, I think, what your output is in whether it's, okay, cool, I can paint a model a night. Maybe that's enough for people. Or whether it's, you know, you, you write down your stages and you go, okay, cool. So I'm going to just get all their bases done today. Tomorrow I'll look at all the, I'll do all the contrast black or whatever, or um, yeah. stage it out and then allocate yourself, you know, days or times. And actually, I think the best time if you ever want to get any painting done is have a if-then statement. Okay, and this is a really powerful thing you can do of any sort of habit that you want to implement is if insert happens, then do the following action. Okay, so if I put my laptop down when I finish work, then I'll get the paintbrush out and I'll paint for half an hour. So you're putting a very dedicated time amount uh, of an action to a particular result in what that ends up happening is then habit stacking, right? So you can also then say, right, well, I'm not going to paint any longer than an hour because maybe then it will become more of a chore. Um, It's the same for like, if you've ever done, like try to do journaling or something only, you know, you only want to write until you're bored, right? Just before that point hits or, you know, you've got to do cardio. You want to stop before it becomes a chore, right? Painting's exactly the same. So that would be my, um, is my tips. I think it's it's one that's especially touching on the, the, um, a lot in time thing. I think a lot of people, myself included, would sometimes look at it as like, I'm not going to bother painting tonight because I could probably only get like half hour in. So I'm not going to bother. I, I only want to paint if I can get two, three hours in or something like that. And then when you get to the end of the week of doing that, you're like, well, I could have had two, three hours done by the end of the week. But yeah. now I've done nothing because every night I've been like, oh, I can't do it tonight. I can only do half hour. So I think uh, allowing yourself to allot that small amount of time each week is, is a really good way to, to balance it. I, I can definitely attest to the time thing. It's the whole reason, as we've spoken about previously, why I, I, I pulled away from, from the gaming side because balancing that around work and everything is, is both doing both of those things or rushing those things is just not how I want to do stuff. And yeah. I think focusing on the one thing that I enjoy the most is actually psychologically and also just reward wise, it's actually been a lot more beneficial for me. I think, um, yeah, like that's why I stepped away from the gaming side massively. It's just so I can invest more time into the painting. Uh, it's extremely hard to juggle both. Like, I guess that's the key is as well. Like not everyone is even going to want to juggle both. Yeah. Yep. But I just thought, yeah, I think it is an interesting question, especially with you. Cause I think I was saying to you earlier that, um, I think, perception based on especially because your whole brand is based around game uh gaming and teaching i never even thought you would 
have half as much of an interest in painting as you do, let alone fit the time in to do the painting that you do. Yeah. And and you know get models out at the level that you do. I thought it was a it was an interesting thing to to yeah. ask you definitely. So yeah. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for returning to the Paint Perspective podcast. Where can everybody find all of your wonderful content? Well, you can find us on YouTube, Vanguard Tactics. We've got loads of different battle reports, live streams, how-to videos, you name it. Uh, and if you want to check out any of our educational courses, we've got the discount code SEED10 that you could use at, the, at checkout. Uh, and you can find out all of our courses or one-to-one -one coaching, um, all different options. So if you want a little bit of help with your gameplay, then check out www.vanguardtactics.com. So we've uh, we've painted a, a night army for you. Yeah, pretty significant one actually. <laughs> yeah, what's the background on that for the uh, for the listeners? Um, the background for it was that years ago I discovered that actually there is a planet in 40k called the Luton Necropolis, which was pretty astonishing. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I decided to sort of obviously explore this. It's from the uh, story Death Wolf, uh, which deals with uh, the Space Wolves dealing with some Drakari on the planet there. It's like an incursion on the planet. But there's not much uh, expansion on what actually the world is or the hive specifically and the details there. There is some world building, but it's like a short, it's like a, a Space Marine Battles, so it's quite a short one. I remember those books. They're really good. Yeah. And uh, so I just thought it'd be fun to have some headcanon to that, some, some sort of fan fictional element to it to sort of just imagine. Um, and the vehicle for doing that will be through the House Luton Knights. So that's. I'm that's sure the Space Wolves will be very appreciative of a night, <laughs> a night house to fight some, some, some tricksy Dark Elder. So, yeah. Sure, sure. How convenient for that to just be like stumbling across some lawyers. Like, oh, it turns out my name's just uh, yeah. very conveniently already written in. It is literally like winning the 40K lottery. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. It was very weird. I cross referenced a lot to try and <laughs> make sure it wasn't an error or something. It was very strange. <laughs> the only annoying thing is in the, like with so many audio dramas, like trying to pronounce Robute uh, Gilliman, yeah. um, it, it, they don't pronounce it quite. Luton it's he does go with like a, a Luton or something yeah. curious like that oh, but I'm yeah. used to people getting my name wrong anyway so it's fine <laughs> yeah. you know so. <laughs> that's, that's so well, good. It's, and so obviously the color scheme is is that just to fit your uh your channel it fits the logo yeah, so yeah black and gold and then some white elements in there but I tried to design it so that it led more with a color a specific like sort of unifying color because it's obviously close to Hawk Shroud and yeah. I didn't want to, you know, if you looked at it offhand, you think, "Oh, it's a nice hawk shroud army." But it's <laughs> yeah. like I did get confused because we actually had a, a, hawk, shroud a, a hawk shroud army that we was painting for a client in at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And I was looking at them both on the shelf, and I was like, "Wait, is this the no?" It's the Luton one. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a slightly more gold, like uh, a more yellow to orange gradient, and I got some custom decals done as well. Yeah, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. Lovely those decals. They're really, they, uh, they really good yeah. actually. Yeah, the little spires are quite cool. customs. Yeah, they're quite good. Yeah, they're really. <laughs> it was really funny good. on the with the mix up of the two. Like we had the the Hawkshard army, and we had the your ones because we were like obviously working to a bit more. We wanted to work with you in terms of like when we were going to post them, and it was we we're very careful about that. Whereas with our client ones, it's just like once they're done, we post them. So it was like putting two almost exactly the same armies next to each other on a tray in front of George and going, you're not allowed to post these ones. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mix, <laughs> them, don't up. mix yeah. them up. You're not allowed to post these ones. You can post these ones. It was just like yeah. a bit of a test, but we, uh, the, we thing, done it. the thing is the perfect harmony will be because they are your own custom night house. You can use whatever night house rules you want when the, yeah. the codex. Yeah, exactly. But conveniently. I when, usually when, don't do that, but in this instance, it no, you can't, right. but, but when Hawk Shroud is top of the meta, you're mm. laughing. It's bad enough then. It's a night army to start with, let alone <laughs> yeah. worrying about meta at all. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. What about the, we done previously, we've done Necron army. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Necron right. army was the biggest one you guys have done. Other than that, it's been like specific smaller things. Smaller like, bits and like bobs. Like yeah. Inquisitor and stuff. But yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, the Necron force is another, actually, yeah, I was saying I don't do a custom army, but the Necrons is another custom Isn't army. It? I was going to say, well, that's kind of what I was going to go into because like, where did the thought process behind that custom scheme come from? Was that purely visuals or is there It was mainly visuals. Of... I, I do have like a rough, uh, draft of like a head canon law with that and i think i will get into doing that because i do want to do a big video which shows off the necrons and so forth but there's a few other models that i want to get done myself before i do that yeah um but they will have like yeah custom law for themselves like head canon law that i just that i've put together um but that was mainly a visual thing i really as much as like the green the black the silver is so um you know classic for the necrons because it's their main sort of color scheme um 
some of the others are really interesting. And I think the Necrons uh, as a force are so visually interesting. Like, you know, it, it's worth doing other things with it. And that's why I wanted to go with, you know, the orange energy crystals instead of the green and yeah, and yeah. just try and have like a different color scheme going across the body. And they're kind of like tinted my force, you know? That's, yeah, yeah. It's some of the Necron, they, 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 they have very straight patterns, very clear markings and stuff. Mine, I wanted to have more gradation and tint to them, which they do in that force. And it works really well. It was difficult to work. We were, out. I was going to say we, we went we went through several iterations. We went back and forth. Obviously, I think we had, you had loads of ideas and stuff, and and I, you had some great ideas with colours and ways to shift them and stuff like that. And I think when getting to the orange to blue worked really well because they because they complement each other really well. It's really similar. So this, this seems like it's going to be the night episode by the looks of it, but that orange and blue is exactly the same reason why I chose those for my night army because they contrast so well. Yeah. So, but but the thing is, is you've got that lovely metallic, which sort of like just adds obviously that metallic effect to the orange and blue as well. So it's a nice combination of those those glazed on colours and then obviously the metallic underneath as well. Um, so it's really it was really fun actually. We actually I think we have we have on the channel an old showcase of those Necrons. We do, yeah. and see them. It's, what, it's still one of our most most viewed videos i think yeah everyone kind of was uh loves this game wowed by some that. of the it's color scheme. i think the biggest model wasn't it the uh, triarch the triarch yeah. yeah that's the most i think impressive was that one it's that really was, was that standing really on the rhino good. that was a second did we do a second yeah. lot yeah. So that, yeah i i don't think that's in that video potentially no. but there might be another video with it yeah but yeah it was like stepping over a rhino yeah, or stepping on a, black, on a rhino black, or something black like that rhino. Black that is rhino. that was a particularly cool really uh, cool way of doing that i think yeah no, yeah, good. That was and really I think cool. that force, the more I got, but I wanted it to be quite infantry heavy because often Necron forces, you can go in on really specific powerful units because that's what they are. But I wanted to have that feel of, you know, the Necron warriors coming out of a tomb and, and, and more. The Undying was, Legion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, it may not be that obviously if you were building a list, you would necessarily go with that, but it just looks visually interesting as a force. And then you can pick and choose what you want to use, you know. Yeah, it gives you a scope to do lots of things of it if you do a game with it as well. Which yeah, is good. and that scheme was quite forgiving, I think, as well mm -hmm. with the gradations and stuff like, you know, when you're doing lots and lots of warriors, it's, you know, it doesn't have to all be the same. And you can get through it quite quickly, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you're on a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission using the code PAINT5. Back to the show. Do you do a lot of gaming then, I'm guessing? Basically? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> This is my big thing. Every year I say, right, this is the year I'm going to get back into it. You know, I did obviously used to years ago when I first started getting into 40K, played loads for many years and really enjoyed. And then over time, you know, just took a break from it, really got into other areas, took a break from 40K for some years. Um, As everyone does. Everyone that's, the, that's like the tradition yeah, when we get tradition. a guest on is they yeah. tell us about the gap they took. The gap, yeah. might, that the gap. might as well be the first question we ask a guest. Any How long? When was the gap? When was the gap? Yeah. yeah. How old were you? How long did it last? It was usually when I, when I, uh, I guess when I first got my, my first sort of proper job and I'd moved away from home and I was like, I'm focused on doing this now. Mm. I didn't really have time for other things. And you're sort of in that kind of, you know, in your twenties going out and doing stuff and, you know. Mm. Or was it Adam um, Skinner said he discovered beer and women? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it is. It's, yeah. And then you get to 30 and you're like, oh, there's time for some hobbies now. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess everyone knows you for for the law side of things mostly. Um, yeah. What what was your sort of intro into, into 40K then? Was it just the gaming or was it the painting miniatures? The intro to 40K for me was the miniatures um, because I was quite young. I guess I was 10 maybe. Uh, and I remember at school, people were just swapping around models, these little models, you know, I don't know. I don't even remember why people were swapping them, but it was, <laughs> it, I, I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it was from like, a, yeah, it would have been similar to that. Yeah. And it, and it was like the Space Crusade models and yeah, some yeah. of the very early um, white metal miniatures, some Terminators and stuff. And the other guys had these models. I didn't know what they were, um, but I was like, damn, these are really cool. I really interested in these. And, you know, and from there, and I think some people would just kind of give me a few models. And I think I've said before, like, there's a sort of nostalgia in the um, Space Marine Terminator with a Cyclone Missile Launcher. Great model. It just triggers like an endorphin release in my brain <laughs> every time I see a Space Marine Terminator with a Cyclone Missile Launcher. It's just embedded in me yeah. uh, from that age. And I, I, there's something super awesome about that model. It just looks really cool. I'm pretty know. sure even 
me as we've like we've we've discussed many times in this podcast how me and George don't necessarily fall into the nineties nostalgia the way that James does. However, I'm pretty sure even I have one of those Terminators <laughs> yeah. at home somewhere. I'm actually glad you're here, Luton, because I, I've needed some serious OG backup. Yeah. Because <laughs> they, they to, I, if you've watched recent episodes, I've been I've been fighting that fight on the hill. No, my own. I've been getting a fair amount of flack lately, yeah. so it's your turn. <laughs> so, so I'm you glad you're to, here. You need to understand what it was like playing back in those days when you would touch the edge of the table, half your models would fall over. And because they were so heavy, every single arm would break off. That yeah. is the it real. is still actually a shock to me because now and then we do get like some of the older models in like the white metal ones especially and like when mm. i when i pick them up it, i'm like it, it's jarring you could kill somebody with it's, a dreadnought i'm pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um yeah the metal ones do bring back a lot of um nostalgia especially when they come in mm. um but it just shows how it shows how sort of like how how people still hugely value them like and yeah. people still want to get them painted which i think is mm. great so what was um, your first sort of army that you got into them it would have been space marines mm. because of course. of course because of course um <laughs> But, Why but, do I ask? <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing, though, is, and um, we've thought about this so much, the way people get into and learn the hobby now is so significantly different from back then, um, mainly because, you know, there was no internet, really. You know, nobody's doing that kind of thing. Uh, there's no resources for painting other than White Dwarf. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck reading a few paragraphs of, yeah. you know, how to thin your paints and brush control and this, you know, that's written very vaguely. And you're trying as a kid who has no experience in painting models, you've got a couple of paragraphs in White Dwarf and that's it, basically. Mm. And then there's no, there's a process of like, you know, base, layer, but again, very, very rough. You didn't even really fully understand what that meant when no, you read it. Yeah. No, you could see it, but somehow you didn't we've process kind of, it. Um, we've kind of touched on that before. I'll put a link to the episode that we did, but we, because all three of us, got into painting at different times mm. um and george only started painting for the first time and got into warhammer within the last like what five four, four or five years four years or something so if you get into warhammer for the first time four years ago yeah it is so drastically different well i remember getting into warhammer listening to listening to your videos for years <laughs> <laughs> i think you see it i see people on social media who are brand new to painting the models and obviously stuff like contrast and systems and stuff like my little cousin who was seven or eight years old his mum took him into games uh, games workshop a warhammer shop um and he painted his first space marine and i was like bloody hell like he's painted that really well but he used contrast and, he did, da, 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 and they got they guided him through it in the store well yeah. when i was a kid they didn't really do yeah, that and no. some of those systems were less forgiving with the paints they were yeah know? definitely and they and you definitely looked up to store managers like, like they hit, they'd have like their own models of stuff in the cabinets and stuff and you'd like oh wow like i really want to yeah. really want to kind of paint like that and stuff yeah. so so yeah it's it's it I didn't understand how to do edge highlighting. No. I would always go to the Games Workshop store and look in the window and I'd see, you know, you think like, well, logically you would just think, well, you draw a line there. Somehow that never clicked in my head as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Like I never understood like, oh, I just need to draw a little line on the I models. I was always like, how have they done this? Yeah. I remember thinking like, no, it can't just be that. And there's no way I can ever yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. If it was just as simple as just drawing a line, surely everyone would be doing it. It can't be that. But yeah. then it turns out it is that. It's just you got to be very, Which is, very refined with the, it. The interesting thing as well was that my original Ultramarines, Space Marines, uh, because I my force was Ultramarines. But as I've had, I got a lot of stick for that is when I wrong with that? when I when I told no, people you know that what? on the channel. I actually, I actually like respect it if people are just. Un unashamedly I'm going with the poster boys the thing I'm is going though, with the poster boys I respect it when I got into 40k they were not the poster boys no actually you're right at the time in the second edition 40k if you go back and look at the material go back and look at the white dwarf the ultramarines were not on everything then no they weren't it, maybe they leaned a little bit more but yeah it, well, it, it, it was there was as much blood angels i remember there was yeah. a lot of blood angels it, it, but back then like i do agree you totally like i think there's a there's a there were a lot in between sort of like rogue trader and second edition there was a lot of like individual box releases there was like uh like a space marine box there was like a all the yeah dark millennium but all those boxes had different kind of cover arts and and even if you remember the uh the the, the scarface uh the scarface one that it's their dark angels in that so um so there's 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 a lot and you mentioned dark millennium that was dark angels on the front of that as well so they they did they did. Um, they did use a lot of chapters back then. I don't. I, I can't remember. I think obviously second was was Blood Angels, but I can't remember when. Like Templars after. Yeah, that, Black I Templars think. was third, third edition. So I, I, it must be around about fourth. That 
Nobody I, I knew had imperial fists. Because <laughs> trying to paint, <laughs> trying to paint uh, imperial fists yeah. with sunburst yellow. Yeah, no. not, not. It's funny the things like you maybe. I wonder if that's something to explore. Like the the myths that you hear when you start painting. Uh, I reckon they're different now. Yeah, to what yeah. they used to be because it used to be like. I think oh, yellow is stuck oh, around. Don't want to don't want to paint white. You don't want to paint yeah. yellow stuff like that. But I feel like that's a bit more doable and accessible. I feel now. like it's not as true now, but the rumor is stuck. The rumor stayed there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. people the other, just scared of it for no reason. The other reason I had Ultramarines was very straightforward. My brother did angels, so he had blood angels and dark angels. My other mate had space wolves, and nobody wanted to do imperial fists ever. So I was like, well, I'll do Ultramarines. So what, <laughs> that was it. what you're saying is when you. Got the, you got the short straw, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I Although in the long run, you ended up with like the most the most. My, my Ultramarines one. army is kind of bonkers. It's not finished because obviously nothing is finished when it comes to 40k. I've got plenty on the shelf. <laughs> but of the painted models, it's like 7,000 points or something like, like you that. You've got region a lot of ultras. It's, it's, yeah, you, know. you have a lot of ultras. I'm interested then. How, how did the shift go from like the miniatures and the painting to the law? Again, after I'd had that break, but I was always really immersed in the lore, even as a kid. Like the second edition rule book and the war gear book and the Imperialist book. I love those Codex books. And those, yeah. The artwork in those, it was all the classic artwork, you know, the sort of black and white, you know, illustrations. And they really were pulling. I think one of them was like a really interesting changer of the ways mm -hmm. or at least a sort of space marine demon. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's that one where it's this guy has kind of like a, looks almost like an animal skull as a head and he's sort of standing to the side and uh, that image and it's got like all this scrying sort of demon symbols all over him uh, that just really pulled me in as, as a kid like a lot of that artwork as well again you know I think I've had conversations with people about sort of you know especially with YouTube as well sort of what is appropriate in terms of horror and stuff like that you know because 40k is pretty can be pretty horrific yeah um but conversations i've had with youtube in the past is like look a kid can go into a warhammer store and look at these books like you know yeah. Like, yeah. and and as a kid I, you know kids kids love that sort of dark side of things you know like when i was a kid reading those books you really pulled into the you yeah know, learn reading the 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 descriptions of the harlequin's kiss and you're like that's pretty horrifying like <laughs> yeah. it's i love that as a kid i was like yeah liquidized them on the inside <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so I was really into the law even as a kid, but again, I think what pulls you in when I was first getting to 40 K when I was like 11, 12 years old, something like this, again, that we didn't have all the resources we had now. So what did you have? Just white dwarf. Mm -hmm. I had like three or four white dwarves initially, and I used to pour over those. I would reread them constantly. And so some of the law would just really you know pull you in and immerse you completely and, and stay with you um was that and, from like the book like the the lore and sort of fluff in the codexes or was you sort of drawn to novels like early on or? there wasn't really novels early on there weren't a black library like it wasn't around i don't, I don't even remember when black library started you, you had what you had when you yeah i don't remember no when actually I, black library started with the uh with the um the Warhammer, do you remember the cartoons, the uh, the cartoon magazines they used to release on all oh, yeah. the weekly? Black yeah. Library started with that and, then they, and then they released full books yeah. of the of the of all the cartoons in one book. What was they? the year of the first heresy book? I can't remember what the first was. Heresy book. Uh, I can't remember what the first it's not that long ago. Is it the first yeah. heresy book? First, no, the first heresy book well, isn't ages, but they used to do, they used to do uh, Warhammer Monthly, which was a... I think it was once a month they used to release uh Horse a... Rising 2006. Wow, okay. I was alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so but one monthly was yeah, like Don't a, you remember, was, George? Come on. Yeah. It was uh it was a a monthly almost comic book and it used to have like two three pages for each story and then that was Black Library. That's what I was so Inferno. Uh Inferno was out at the same time. I think Inferno was out before. And I don't know if that was marked as Black Library. Someone, someone in the comments can congrat me on that if I'm wrong. But um, but I remember Warhammer Monthly was the first thing because from Warhammer Monthly they made they took all the stories once they've been released and made individual books. Yeah, so but, did like an omnibus. Right? Well, but it was like it was the full story just in one book. Like yeah. Blood Quest was like well, obviously Blood St Quest still was even now though, and this is my thing always with like going back and like cross referencing stuff. There are a lot of references to things, whether it's Titans, for example. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to the White Dwarfs when they were talking about like epic Armageddon and stuff like this. And the only reference to some of the details about Titans is still in the white dwarfs. They haven't really brought it forward. Mm. So you have to go back 
to all those white dwarves, which is helpful if you have them. So, <laughs> I do, yeah. So he's looking at me like, oh, yeah. I've seen the archive. Yeah, 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 library. The same, isn't yeah. It? yeah. The library downstairs. Yeah. But yeah, they used to in white dwarf tell a lot of the lore. So I think in one of the white dwarves I had, they really laid out the whole lore of the Ultramarines from Rabuti Gilliman and where it started and all that stuff. And yeah, pages and pages and pages of the lore went into white dwarf. Um, I remember the, I remember the, there was a series of white dwarfs in a row where they covered all the assassins. Yeah. So there was all the different assassins. They'd have two, three pages describing all the assassins. And actually, even now, that is pretty much the most substantial source of the assassins' lore, really. You know, yeah. I don't know where else you would find it other than those old white dwarfs, really. No, you're right. Yeah. And and like even do you remember the series Index Astartes where yeah. they talk about individual chapters in White Dwarfs? Yeah. I always yeah. thought that was a great little was, uh, they were including that the information about the chapters in there as well, like the heraldry and like maybe yeah. the odd character or or whatever. And there was always a little story about a specific yeah. thing as They'd well. They'd often write short stories, little narrative elements within that stuff. And there's a lot of that stuff that I don't think has been brought forward from those old white dwarfs. You know, there's still I think there's still a lot of value in those white dwarfs. And I think the only place you could, you know, you can obviously find the white dwarves on, can I say eBay or anything yeah, like that? You can, you can say find eBay, yeah. But um, other than that, it's Warhammer Plus because they've been steadily releasing. I was going to say about that. Yeah, they're going to, they're like sort of backdating, releasing it, the yeah. archives, aren't they? Scanning yeah. them in or whatever. So yeah. that's one good way to I, go I, through I, old them. I love having, I mean, look, I've got a massive white dwarf collection, but I, I love having that because being able to look back and then see all those things from the childhood. And then like, you, you'll see like, the, you'll find like a page with the first instance of something now that's very prominent and everywhere, if mm. that makes sense. Like, like Admech, for example, Admech, when they yeah. came out, like it was this massive thing. And then you, the only place to find anything about Mechanicum was 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 back in the day in white dwarfs and stuff before there was even a range for it. The, the other problem you used to have painting stuff, and this was a big problem I remember now, was they didn't used to be a resource where it would show you a model in different variations. So from what I remember, the Cyclone Missile Launcher Terminator in White Dwarves, because I think I looked it up a few months back, I think in the old White Dwarves, it's only shown in Blood Angels and nothing else. Yeah, I, th I think So you right. have to kind of guesstimate like what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, only, yeah. the only time you'd see it in different colors is when they had like staff member armies as like yeah. articles and then you'd see how they painted the models yeah um because they did that big one in one of the white doors where they did like the whole ultramarines chapter yeah chapter well that was from when they done a games day where they got all mm. the shops to paint models for it yeah that's right um, I remember. but uh but yeah that was this yeah right right like, so it? trying to find a lot of stuff back in the day was you would go off the artwork mainly mm. you'd look at artwork like you know some of the, the the classic pictures the box art and stuff like that for orcs and things like this you know you just kind of have to guesstimate it, basically. So. Yeah, yeah. So you're into it when you're young, and then you see how to gap, like you say. So when you got back into it, how does that segue into starting this YouTube channel that you've become now? When I first started doing YouTube, it was really for just for fun as a hobby, um, trying to help out other friends of mine who were doing gaming and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'll just make some guides about this or about that. Really sort of sharing gameplay with each other and that kind of thing. And over time, it gained some traction and it did better and better. And I thought, oh, you know, some people are liking this. I guess I'll just keep making it, you know, with no real idea of an end goal or anything like that. Um, and then over time, there were sort of different communities which sort of reached out to me. There were, they used to be sort of like basically middle managers for YouTube channels. So you don't need that now, but they used to be, it was a big thing. And so they would try and find creators and bring them on board because that's how the, the process used to work. And so that kind of introduced me. They kind of like guided you towards where you were going, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like some big goal that I had. And, um, you know, I think these days many people start with the intention of, I want this to be a full-time situation. Same with streaming, you know, a lot of people, you know, some people do that for fun but a lot of people do go into it because they want to do it as a thing you know um and for myself uh, over the years i mainly was doing video games that's what i enjoyed that's what i spent all my time doing and warhammer was a thing that you know i'd done previously and i still did do it you know i still but it was for fun i wasn't were, getting were you back in were you back in the hobby by then when you was doing these gaming videos yeah i guess so but not in a public way sure. it would have been just painting for myself just by i was going back to models that i had from years ago and thinking oh i never finished this i should get back on that and then i started reading back through all the old books and i did go to like warhammer shops and i bought like the new edition. I think it would have been like the uh, seventh edition uh, box That's of rule dark, books and stuff. Dark, dark Angels, Dark and, Angels uh, and Chaos. Yeah, yep. yeah. Dark yeah. Vengeance. Yeah. So I did that, um, and then I think it was when Eighth came along because eighth was such a big deal. And I had been sort of, I think that's what triggered me. I, I'd, I'm curious, I'd need to go back and look at the time where I made my Emperor video. That was the first video I did, um, and. 
when eighth came along, it was such a significant thing. It's such a huge change. It kind of re-inspired me to sort of revisit 40K and want to kind of get back into it in a bigger way. I'd sort of been, you know, just tootling along doing it myself in my own time. And I was like, oh, this thing is happening. I think it blew me away, actually, because 40K had been always so stagnant, not not meaning that in a negative way. No, no, I know. It just know. sort of the law didn't really move forward for a long, long, long time. And when eighth came along, suddenly it was like, wow. Things are happening. Primaris, it yeah. kind of blew my mind. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So that that it wasn't just Primaris. It was just the fact that it was moving forward at all. It was like know? a whole new step yeah. forward in the story, wasn't it? Because obviously, yeah. when Primaris came along at the beginning, it was a very split opinion. You know. Yeah, yeah. These days, people seem much more fine with it. But when it first happened, like people were obviously, whoa, this is too much. You know. Um, but 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 I was just happy that anything was happening with the law. Um, but the, the the reason I started doing uh, the videos for Forty K was. Um, I really, I'd reached a point on the channel where I've been doing video games for a long time and it was all fine, but I thought, oh, it would be fun to introduce something that I've always enjoyed, mm -hmm. always known about. And this will be a great way to sort of share that and, and see what kind of response I get. And also just kind of open people to it maybe because at the time I think I was like aware or you could feel that many people sort of didn't really know what Warhammer was, you know. They'd, they'd seen the Games Workshop and walked by and seen stuff, but they didn't, you know. Well, I think now, like, with especially with your videos and channels like yours, that's how a lot of people, and, like, you've got the TV shows and the, and the video games, obviously, as well. I think a lot of people now, like, surely more so than ever, just enjoy 40K in that way. I'm sure there's a lot of people who just watch your videos and listen to the law, sure. and that's it. They'll never pick up a paintbrush. I think there are always many avenues, though, and mm. I think whatever route you find into 40k or warhammer or sigma or whatever it is whatever route you find yourself in whether you start with the law or start with the painting or you know you got a friend who plays the games and he's like oh come along and check this out you know whatever route you find yourself in that's your primary thing for a good amount of time but then you inevitably end up branching off whether it's two three four years down the line you know Everybody ends up with an army, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whether they thought they would or not. You know? like, not it might not be painted. It might be big, it might, <laughs> yeah, but, might be in the boxes still the boxes on the shelf. Yeah. I, always, that yeah. I always see the comments on the channel that are like, "I'm really into the law, but I'm never going to get an army." I'm like, "Yeah, come back to me in three or four <laughs> years." <laughs> I'm quite good at remembering sort of people's usernames and stuff, and I swear I've seen people say that. And then two years later, they leave a comment like, "I just bought my first army." I'm like, "I remember this guy." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually it's funny now because YouTube allows you to. If you click on a comment and view any comments that that channel's like previously left on your channel. Yeah, you so can you can literally check. track that. You could screenshot yeah. uh, two years ago. Oh, they've got to pay to two years later. Like, oh, I've just bought my full for army. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say like you mentioned it, but that, that Emperor video, like I think that is a, I've got to say this, like that's one of the things that I really, really in the early days before we kind of got to know each other really well. Like I think that's one of the things that really, kind of really interested me about your channel because like you picked a topic which as a character like there's not really like a unifying kind of bit of information other than maybe the bit in the imperialist book from second edition um there's that famous photo of him on the hill where he looks very young and he's not in yeah. his, you know that 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 kind of stuff and like that as a topic like the first video it's quite a quite a it's quite a everest of topics to Undertake. Did you say that was your first that, that video vi as well? That video was seven years ago. I think I did do a short video before that where it was just about sort of what are space marines or something, uh, just as a kind of abstract, you know, discussion. But that was seven years ago, the Emperor video, which makes it 2016. How established was the channel as a video gaming channel at that point? I think I was at 100K or something over. So it was a so fairly established. I think like, I was doing all right. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean... I had, I think I had, yeah, 2016, yeah. So I think uh, it was around a year after that that I left my job or something. So yeah. I think it was but a significant enough I, audience that you it was like a consideration to introduce like another topic that was sort of concern of yeah, the fan base. And that's, that's kind of what I was going to get at was like, if the audience is big enough, it then becomes, it's almost like it's, it's riskier to change the yeah. bigger the audience is because the more chance you've got of people going, what the hell is this? I don't, I'm not interested in this. I, I talked to many, many, many friends and just other people I know in the gaming space or YouTube or Twitch or whatever. And people always just kind of, you know, some, some peers who have like got already established channels that are very big and, you know, you chat about this and about that and other people that are coming up. And I always want to be like, talk to people that are, you know, 
starting and getting into things and try and just give some advice if you can because when I started doing it there was nobody like yeah. I just had to try and find my way which is why it took me such a long time <laughs> to like get any get anywhere with the channel but but even then you know looking back to my own thoughts about um decisions I made and it's like I think I had for the longest time in my mind this idea that well I'm I feel good about the content that I'm making so you know if I just keep chomping away at it eventually it will sort of do better and better. Mm-hmm. You know, it will just, you, you'll eventually just find more and more of an audience. But I think sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not true. Like I remember getting stuck on a thousand views per video for years. Like it was just, and I probably at the time should have thought more about how can I expand out? Mm-hmm. But like I say, it wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really too concerned about it. I wasn't looking to like push myself to grow at that time very early on with the channel because I was just doing it for fun on the side. So it didn't really matter to me whether the channel was you mm. know, growing super strong or anything. I didn't really have that drive. You know? How big was the initial sort of reaction to that improv video when it launched? Yeah. It, 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 it went caught, nuts from what I remember. It caught me off guard a little bit. I think it was more of a slow burn to begin with, but over time, you know. But again, I think there wasn't so many channels around doing that kind of thing at that time. There was a, maybe three or four, I guess, on YouTube that I remember. Um, but... I think again, it wasn't really. Again, it was just, it was just an experiment for me on the channel um, because you do that from time to time. It's a good thing to do on a YouTube channel or a live stream. You have to change things up from time to time. Throw in another live stream is much more so. You know, you can have a live stream channel where they're focused on one game, but most often they're kind of more variety. They'll play a game for sort of a month or two and then move on to another thing. And YouTube channels do tend to be more focused on one thing. Um, but I've spoken to people at YouTube who are like, it's quite interesting how you move from video games to this. And they're like, we haven't seen too many people do that. It's not very common that you have a, a YouTube channel which changes completely. Like the sort of whole content. genre shift. I've like, done it yeah. like three times because I started doing just FPS gameplay, like with Battlefield. Then I switched to Armor, which was like military sim, tactical and kind of... But there's a narrative element to the to the sort of missions I used to do in Armor. I used to really enjoy the narrative element. Mm-hmm. I think over time I've just become more interested in stories and that kind of thing and narrative and you know that's Mm. where i'm going with myself now i just find i find telling stories interesting i like telling stories so Uh, the one thing i would say is that 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 emperor video obviously got a lot of attention because it was i don't think it's just the topic but i also think it's the way that you you do your videos which is something that i've always from 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 obviously we work together now but like before we did and before obviously we we knew each other etc like watching your videos that it's clear the effort and the sort of like the 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 fact finding that you do to get your make your videos what they are like it's not like you're just taking something that's on lexicanum or whatever and you're just you know just dictating that or whatever it's literally you go in and you look at the you find the source material which i think personally shows the the, the, the respect and the care and attention that you put to the law and narrative as well which i think Wik- really wikis important. are really good they're like a, a helpful tool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but like Really, you need to go and find the source material yeah. because it's surprising how often like context doesn't come across properly mm-hmm. or very, very small details, which can be relevant or not correct or whatever. So you have to go back and really look at it to check. But, you know, when you're making a video that's like an hour, an hour and a half, like you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> it happens. You know, How much prep goes into a video like that? Like in terms of with that one, especially, I guess, as, as it was one of your first ones, ones doing that. That that Okay. The Emperor video took me like a very long time because it was the first one I did. And I, I just did it on the side. I was obviously working full time, I think at the time as well. So I was just, it took me like six months probably, but that wow. was just like six yeah, months. But, 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 it wasn't but, like one afternoon. You was like, oh, fancy making an yeah. Emperor video. <laughs> <I> <laughs> right, just, quick yeah, script. <laughs> it was on the side of other things. So I was just doing a little bit here, a little bit there, just sort of coming back to it time and again and just thinking, oh, you know, how can I do this or whatever. I, so, I actually, in fairness, there's like, I feel like that is a genre on YouTube within itself of these like long form videos where like you get certain channels, you you actually do upload fairly regularly, but you get <laughs> well, certain. Some people would disagree about that. <laughs> I, I would, I they would love say, what you do, I, I would say for what you put out and the types of videos that you do, that is actually, you are fairly regular. I would say at this point, like it usually takes me like a week to do a script and then a, three or four days to edit i mean well, what, what i'm getting at is like how many how, how many videos a month do you upload roughly like two a couple yeah like two <laughs> something like that like to me for heavily scripted long form youtube videos there are plenty of channels out there that literally release one video every six months because that's the amount of effort that goes into making that video so like i think 
you say in six months on the the emperor one especially as it being like the first one it's not that much of a oh my god especially you were doing it part-time like even that sounds like i don't know it just tracks to me like it's like oh yeah fair enough for how good the video is i think with youtube there are different formats that work and trying to just go in on long form videos straight out the gate i don't know if that would work i sort of transitioned to it you know like i was doing two three four five videos a week when i was doing more video games content and that's generally how those channels kind of work you upload every day you know it's 15 20 minute video and you showcase whatever and you're talking about whatever that's kind of how that works and that's the cycle you know you keep on that that's how you ha that's how the channel works um transitioning to a channel where you're doing one or two videos or three videos a month that's kind of tricky because it's also a big investment like if one of your videos falls flat and doesn't do well i mean that's that's, yeah. not good. that's not good you know uh, whereas if you're churning out like five six videos a week well if one of them absolutely falls flat and doesn't do well or it just does kind of mid it's not the end of the world because you just keep banging out content um but if it's one or two videos per month you need to make sure it hits and that can be really stressful you know the time investment is you know mm. if it doesn't work out um then yeah it's not the best but i suppose um, for people who love your videos as well and like obviously they want to see more i suppose because they only see those like one video that pops up every couple of weeks in their inbox they don't necessarily think about the amount of time that you're actively working on the next one yeah i try i try not to sort of stress too much with the channel as well like it just is at this point like youtube sort of is what it is and you kind of get used to the fact that things go up and down that's just kind of how it goes um Something I learned ages ago, uh, a peer rec said to me when we were talking about things is, you know, don't don't look around at other channels, just focus on what you're doing. Don't worry what anybody else is doing. And it's really true because, you know, a lot of, um, you can get into your own head about sort of how your channel does or whatever. And the thing is, at the end of the day, different audiences are different for different channels and there's always overlap. But what works for one channel is not what works for another and those audiences will never cross over so one person may grow very strong uh, very quickly because they have a different format a different style and it may appeal to a broader audience than another channel um so you know i've seen i've seen channels within the video gaming sphere because they focused on a specific format they grew super fast and they overtook channels that were way bigger than them in the past so it, it just you know things come and go and wax and wane with channels like that and it's just uh I find the best thing is to just not stress about this. So if it, whenever I post out a video, because they're long form as well, you have to understand if you drop like a 90 minute video, somebody might look at that, but they're having a busy day. They're not going to just immediately watch that video. So maybe that people don't watch your video two or three days. So I often will find that when I post a video, um, it may only be four or five days later where I sort of really get a feel for whether it's doing pretty decently or not. You know, mm. um, I think the one thing with YouTube is I did find that uh, they sort of change things around a bit and uh, how a video does in the first sort of 24 hours does matter. You know, it, it will get recommended more if it does very well because YouTube obviously thinks, wow, this video is doing great. We'll recommend it more. But even then, you'll be surprised if things just kind of go along and people are continuously watching that video, YouTube will notice that as well. They'll notice like, oh, there is actually an audience that's retained for this this video and stuff like that. So, yeah, we've seen the same sort of things echoed with the podcast episodes. We've had some that have even someone posted a few weeks ago that will yeah. be outperforming. I'd say, all day uh, like, luckily, for, like our baseline views are just steadily going up. But then mm -hmm. every three or four episodes, there'll be one that just like spikes. Like, yeah. And we've had the one a couple of episodes ago that just like quadrupled what we would have expected it to do, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, which, uh, or even more, I think, probably now. Yeah. I haven't even looked. But like, um, so it's interesting. Yeah, the thing's getting like sucked into the algorithm and, and and spat back out yeah i mean we're not without getting too heavily into talking just about like youtube and stuff like that i think there are so many variables and honestly at the end of the day the best thing is just do the best you can and then just see where it goes and mm. you know try yeah. and make decisions as you go along you know i think if you want to grow a youtube channel the best thing you can do is focus in on one specific thing and push that as hard as possible but at the same time if it's sort of just going along and it's not doing the best or it's not growing how you thought maybe experiment try something else you know it's it's the, yeah. you just got to keep trying things until you find a way forward really big news tickets are now on sale for the siege studios painting classes for 2024
For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. So let's uh, dig our teeth into the, the main topic then. So we wanted to talk about, uh, with all of your law knowledge, where someone who's not as familiar with the law might find an entryway into that, maybe with some specific stories. Obviously, the Black Library is absolutely massive now, and there's so many entry points. If you're someone who's maybe been painting for a while, or you're looking for some sort of entry point, maybe you're new to this like entirely, uh, Warhammer in its entirety, what do you think are some good entry points for people to start, maybe some some book series that they can look into or maybe some like law videos of yours that are best places to start. I think it'd be interesting as well. I was well. going to say, yeah, you're not allowed to just say go and watch your channel. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't just, I can't just self No, promo, do it, so. do it. Yeah. Although I would recommend it, you're not allowed to use yeah. that as your answer. But I would be interested as well if it differs for like, maybe if you're someone who's a painter, if there's like something that might be more suited to them or maybe for someone who's really into gaming, maybe there's a story that's more about, you know, battle strategy or something. Mm. Well, I think... If you are absolutely brand new to Warhammer, like maybe you've got a friend who just sort of plays it or recommends or that you should check it out or whatever. Um, unpopular opinion, actually, but I do think probably one of the best places to start is actually just the rule book for 40K. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe White Dwarf, because White Dwarf's fairly inexpensive, so you can just pick up a White Dwarf and you'll get like a general feel of things, usually in White Dwarf. Now, they tend to cover a lot of different things mm -hmm. and you might find elements there that are interesting to you. Um, but the rule book uh, really contains the best summary of the law. Um, it obviously touches on the factions in a fairly brief overview way, but it also talks more broadly about what 40K is. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only thing with recommending the rule book is obviously it's not the most inexpensive place to start. No. Um, and I've always thought it would be a good idea if they did like a sort of law summary like a sort of supplementary book that you could buy that was just an overview summary for sort of beginners or something like this. Well, that's, but, what, that's what they used to have, isn't it? In second Ed, second Ed yeah. had the three books. You had the War that's Gear it. one, the yeah. rules, and then you had the awesome, it was the, it was the Imperialis Plus, yeah, yeah. book that was the one which was... I suppose it's not very sexy to like want to start with a rule book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, and the other thing is, is obviously there's different areas to 40k you've got the game you've got the painting you've got the law so somebody might not be at all interested in the you know so so the rule book is in some ways uh, it's like yeah from a just a objective point of view like it contains the best summary of where things are at uh, but yes you could go to youtube and you could just look at a law video you know there's there's many beginner guides i've got a beginner guide most channels that do law have a 40k where to start what is 40k beginner's guide and that will give you the sort of bare bones of what it's all about you know mm. but from there i always say it depends you know it depends if you're a big reader i mean some people coming into the law or coming into just 40k in general you know whether you are a painter, whether you're a tabletop player, most people will get some book at some point. But mm -hmm. again, it depends whether you're a big reader or not. You know, some people are not. But it's good. That's why we have audiobooks as well now. So, do you find that some books translate better to audio than others? Yes, I think so. Definitely. I think sometimes I, I think character-driven stuff translates much better than just sort of. Uh, event-based stories which focus more on sort of you know what is occurring and i, th I think that's because the voice actors like they yeah. they, they 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 feel the the the, the, the persona <laughs> of the character and they feel the emotion of the situation or, or, or what's happening in that specific scene i think that conveys better in an audio rather than you just assuming it from reading the paragraph i think i think yeah. sometimes having i found the, i found the opposite true right. sometimes though because some of the audio books i've been listening to and i've not been able to really get into it right i've i've got a potentially controversial opinion <laughs> when I'm like listening to an audio book, I don't really want them to do like character voices and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just want to read the book. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want like, I don't want do you know like, why I like different it? voices to keep track of. Do like. you know why I like that though? Because it, I find it easier to, keep, if I forget someone's name, remember the voice. I remember oh, the, the voice. voice. Yeah. yeah, but sometimes like the voices are funny. And they're not supposed <laughs> to be funny. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it I, just I think what off. I prefer is for them to. I, for me, just personally, for audiobooks, I prefer if they just adjust the tone of their own voice to be like higher, That's lower perfect. things, yeah. that rather perfect, than yeah. specific voices. I also have found it slightly off-putting sometimes where, you know, they will have like various characters 
and they, you know, one's got like a Yorkshire accent, one's got an East End accent, <laughs> yeah. and I just, I don't know, it just feels. I found that in the, uh, in the Heresy audio books when they do the um, the Space Wolves, the sort of like Nordic accent comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it's a bit too on the nose. I'm not even necessarily but... talking just about the no, Warhammer no, no. books. But yeah, I'm sure. just talking in general audio books. But yeah, they do it a lot in the Heresy books, and they like the voices and the things like that. Yeah. I think, you know, just a small tangent, because I'm famous for tangents. Um, we were talking earlier about sort of how did I get into doing like, you know, the law videos and, and sort of stories. And and yeah, so often people say to me, like the sort of pacing actually of the way I talk in the videos and so forth. That is something that people like the sort of pacing of how mm. I space out between words or telling things or or the emphasis that I put onto words, you know, choosing, you know. And um, I think I've thought about that a lot and it brings me back to actually, I think where that comes from or the sort of enjoyment I get with that was from um, Tony Robinson mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And Tony Robinson, he was, very, he was, is very good at telling stories and mm -hmm. speaking. And I remember as a kid, there were many TV series where he would just be telling stories on the TV, but he did it always, Tony Robinson, in a very animated way. Yeah. And he'd come in and he'd be like, the, the man came down from the cliff and he went through the things and, you know, and he had that kind of really animated vocal way of speaking. But his pacing, you know, he knew when to sort of go quiet, yeah, yeah. to push it forward, not just the man came along and then he went to the thing and then this happened and then this happened. You know, he would sort of emphasize elements and it's like that really helps convey a story. You know? That's exactly, yeah. It, it conveys that emotion or sentiment of that scene or, or however it is. And I think that's the thing that I really like. Without doing audience. character voices. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, personally, I, I, I listen to any audio book. I guess it saves me having to obviously read it mm. specifically. But, um, but, uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I do think that I've read a lot of the books but I do prefer listening to the audio books, I think, personally. I think it's a really good way to absorb it and all the lore and everything whilst being able to do painting. Well, with, that's to... what, with the pillar thing. Like, if you're a painter and you want to start picking up the lore, audio, audio is fantastic because yeah. you can keep doing the thing you already like and, like, introduce this other pillar of the hobby. Yeah. But I would say, also, they some people don't like short stories, which is fine. It's just a personal preference. Some people don't like short stories, novellas, anthologies. People don't like that. But I always think it is a good place to start uh, if you're new, because trying to like slog your way into a heresy book, if you're brand new to it, it, it can work for some people. No, you know, no, the first right. four, the first four books in the heresy series are known as being very, very solid books. I um, think Joe actually spoke about that last week. I said that um, I first tried to pick them up really early on, and I. Could there was a, there was an assumed level of knowledge that I didn't have. Usually, it's, people usually exact, people hear about from others, and they, you know, people ranting about it, talking about heresy. It's this big thing, and yeah, so you feel like, oh, this is the place to start. You get into it, and yes, th this is the big problem with forty k, and this is why I often repeat stuff in my videos. I get a lot of comments sometimes from people being like, oh, you've told us this like ten times. Yeah, but if you're watching that video for the first time and you've never heard about this before, you don't know that detail. Exactly. And yeah. I actually think it's actually very beneficial to go back and refresh yourself with, because there's so much law. It's very easy to forget things and it's worth going back and refreshing your memory and re reinstate, restating stuff to your, you know, your memory just again and again. No, exactly. And then the perfect example, like I gave, like my, my dad, I tried to get my dad to read the books and like he, he was like yeah, getting through the first one and there came to a bit where it was like, oh, and the, and the Space Marine or whoever spoke into the Vox, and my dad was like, "What the hell's Vox?" Like, you know, that, and, it was little and, things and, like that. And, and, yeah. it was, and he was like, "But, but they're not." Uh, so, but it, it the good, the good thing about them is that it does, as you read through them, stuff then start you, you from the way that it's written or the way that it's conveyed in the audio book. You then start lining the dots up and going, oh, "It must be like radio, or it must be like your communications, or whatever." You do you do kind of pick that up as you go through. But I think you you are quite right. Like, it's I a think, bit of a chore though if you like have not enough going in. Like I found, no, that no, I could, yeah, I yeah. agree. But but the, the short stories are really good. Like like you're, like you're saying is it's like it gives you that snapshot um, about a certain situation or faction or character, or whatever, and it has a nice beginning, nice middle, nice end. That's really concise. Gives you a real good insight into that faction or that specific character or whatever. Um, and they almost tie back to the little short story things in that used to be in White Dwarf or used yeah. to be in articles. You you can imagine one of those as like a really quick snippet of that yeah. specific. Uh, character or whatever blah blah yeah but um but they yeah. also again see it's different now for me than it would have been years ago because in the second edition and also like for example the third edition the rule book third edition rule book had a lot of law mm -hmm. like and i think fourth as well fourth edition um because years later i bought those as like just for myself like 
found the special editions of them. And those third, third edition, fourth edition rule books have got a stack of law in, like really law heavy. Um, so if you had those, if you were just into 40K or Warhammer at the time and you're just reading those, you could learn a lot. The modern rule books, they do have that stuff in there, but not quite so much detail. But um, yeah, whenever people ask me like, where's the best place to start if you're new to it? I often say there is no best place and people hate that answer, but it's true. <laughs> no, but, you you know, when I started, when a lot of people I know started, they just would, you know, here's, here's a white dwarf yeah. or, you know, and, and they just have to find your own way. It's a puzzle. You just you know, sort of start wherever you have to start or wherever, whatever you had to Yeah, have. And, and also for, for many years, like I was trying to sort of find my way in how do I order stuff? How do I organize things? Now I don't, I don't consider spoilers a thing in 40K. Like, I just don't. I don't care. I, I will happily learn the end of a story first. It doesn't matter to me at all. And, and some people hate that, understandably. <laughs> I don't care at all. I don't consider there are spoilers in 40K. To me, it's just a big puzzle of information. And you find out different bits at different times and you put them in the right place. And it's just a big sort of, you know, jigsaw puzzle, basically. Do you think is that's because you can kind of almost like view its history? I think that's like... Well, yeah, yeah. 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 That goes so like if you're going to go, and, if you're a kid and you're learning about World War Two. You're not going to be like, don't spoil it. Yeah, don't spoil the end. That that, that leads exactly to what you were saying the other week, how like 40K is like, it is like science fiction, historical information. It's it's almost got the same amount of of detail and depth as actual history. But there's also like a significant timeline as well, right? Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But think about it. You know, technically the story is up to where Gilliman is on his crusade at the moment, you know, in M41. And that's, that's what's happening. But then at the same time, we have just had the second book in The End of the Death, which is 10,000 years previous. Yeah. So that's the thing. With 40K, the story is all over the place. It could be told in the middle, at the end, things. And so it's there's a lot happening all at the same time. So again, it's just a personal thing for me. I don't really care. Like I'll read it anywhere. But that also may be because I'm so focused on the lore and the stories. Other people want to read it in a different way. Not chronologically. Um, like, yeah. yeah. But yeah. like you're saying, with trying to recommend books to people, you have to preface it with, don't worry if some of it doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. It will eventually. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one thing. Obviously, the first three or four books in in the in the Heresy sort of series, you, you they are obviously in order, and you can read them. I'd I'd recommend you read them in order. But but that, I think they are designed in that way that like you can pick up a specific individual book and be like like yeah, I was reading through, and then like I think I was about four or five books behind, and then they dropped Nemesis, and I'm super into Assassin, so I'd like I was like right, I'm going to read the Nemesis book, um, you know, and you can do that with them, which I think is quite good, and it someone new to it can theoretically do that, but like you said, you know, yeah. there are going to be things that people are going to be like, what, 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 what is that? You know, don't, like don't start with Master of Mankind. No. <laughs> <laughs> with that, then, what is one of your other recommendations that you've got on your list then? So, I mean, I would go with, for the short stories, the anthologies, they just released the other day was the Galaxy of Horrors. Um, Lord of Dark Millennium was a good anthology. There was, so there are many different sort of anthologies. And again, easy ways to just go to Black Library and type in like anthology or, you know, well, the novellas are good. Some of the mm-hmm. novellas like, uh, but again, some of the novellas can be very specific, like the Garrow one recently. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't recommend like the Garrow novella. You know, it's way too specific and it happens at this key moment and you have all the narrative first. It's like, again, I'm not caring about it from a spoiler point of view. It just will be better if you knew the other stuff first. Yeah, you know, yeah. You'll enjoy it more. That's, I think that's one of the things that not puts me off or has put me off, but like it definitely does feel like a barrier. The kind of um, the, the requirements have quite a lot of like pretense to some of the stuff yeah. or like certain things like, for example, I remember quite early on um, when I, once I got back into painting as a, a as an adult, um, I thought, oh, I better start like reading or listening to the audio books or whatever. Started the Horus Rising thing, and I was like, I didn't even really fully understand that there was a thirty k and a forty k yet. Yeah, like, yeah. I'd just gotten back into forty k, and then I was listening to this book, and I was like, well, you know, where's the Tyranids and stuff. Like, what's going on? Like, what, what is this? They're, like, they're on murder. It was so like, yeah. So certain things, like even within that, like I didn't even really know what thirty k was or Horus Heresy or whatever. I just got told that was where to start. That's the first book or that's whatever. I also think uh, talking about anthology stuff, uh, things like Sanction and Sin from the Warhammer Crime series. That's interesting. The Warhammer Crime series does deal with like specific. Uh, it's it's set in one planet, 
but it bleeds into the wider Imperium. It's more human focused. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily have like space means dropping in everywhere, but it does sort of focus in and you get the feel for the Imperium. It could be an interesting point for somebody to start with because you're coming at it from a completely different perspective. So I think there's no right or wrong place. You'll find your own way eventually. And I, I think the reason why I recommend shorts to people more is because if you didn't like one story, you can try the next one and the next mm. one, the next one. Whereas if you go straight in with a big heavy book and you don't get on well with it, you might... Think, it's going to oh, put you off. Yeah, yeah there's not yeah. for me, you know, so. Um, it's also quite an investment as well, isn't it? I suppose you, you're more likely to persevere through a short story and get to the end and move on to the next one. Also, just think about how busy people are. You're going to work, you're dealing with a family at home, you don't have like, you know, you can read a short story in half an hour. You know, yeah. it's like going out, you can get on the train to go to work and you can read it and be done. You can read another one coming back, you know, it's much more digestible. Whereas a massive book, like, yeah, it's, plus you've got to carry it around. Or <laughs> then you go to e-reader or whatever, you know, so. <laughs> What's one of your favorite sort of uh, topics that the books explore, like in terms of not necessarily faction, but like, is there a specific type of story that like pulls you in personally? I like stuff which deal, obviously people will know that I like stuff which deals with the duality of the Imperium. Um, so one of my recommends always for people is Valdor, Birth of the Imperium. Mm -hmm. One, because it's a novella length, it's not super long, so it's quite digestible. It deals with a lot of different concepts and elements and story and characters in it um again i can't like spoil it too much but it does deal with sort of the beginning of the imperium it has some stuff to do with the emperor and uh, the custodies and the sort of the beginnings of what is i guess like the administratum and the imperium in there and the sort of bureaucratic structure of the imperium and how it kind of fundamentally doesn't really work even right from the start um and it deals with the sort of hypocrisy of of the emperor and the characters in there and sort of the imperium and yeah, it's, it's a really interesting story. It deals with some pretty big things which are applicable just to the wider lore. So you get a lot in that one story. Um, and again, you can't really go into it too hard, but obviously Valdor is a character which comes back again later in other stories. And so you can always try to connect the dots and be like, well, was it this event which made him feel like this, this, this? And, you know, something. but yeah, it, it gives you a good overall feel about lots of different elements that are within 40K and the Imperium. So yeah, Valdor is a good one. Um, so is there any others other than Valdor that you would put forward? I think to sort of mix it up again, if you were coming in new, because again, I think there's no real perfect place to start. So you could really throw things in the mix. Um, brutal Cunning, because it's fun and mad. And <laughs> it's orcs. <laughs> I think there's like, I, I, it's been a while since I've read it, but I think, I think an orc like crashes his, uh, buggy straight into a titan head and then they like <laughs> take, so i was just spoiling it a little bit but like i again I, I, I sometimes when i'm talking about 40k i forget that spoilers i think completely. <laughs> yeah. so i just start telling people stuff and they're like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Like, you know. but um now brutal cunning it's a really good book because it has sort of you know, human world, like the Mechanicus planet, it's a forge world and the orcs coming in. So you have like the orc perspective. There's a lot of sort of orc politics involved, as I remember. Orc politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah there's, there's a bit of orc politics involved. And then you have the Mechanicus point of view. So, it, it, you know, literally a POV from the Mechanicus. So going from that to orcs is quite hilarious. So there's sort of the <laughs> yeah. order versus chaos. Like it's it's really interesting. But it, it does give you a little snapshot also more into the Mechanicus and sort of how they operate and what they do and and it you know it shows them it fighting in combat which is really interesting with like mechadendrites and how powerful they are and what they're capable of so it's a really interesting one just from giving you different perspectives and it does give a real 40k feel even though you don't have like space marines going on and all sorts of stuff like that yeah it's really it's a, it's a good one the criticism i hear a lot is that like the space marines are one of the less interesting uh sort of chapters to explore that's something that I've, i'm not sure how popular that opinion is but that's that nice sort of here thrown around a lot do you find that like some of the, because obviously they get a lot of attention, like both in terms of miniatures and in terms of stories. Do you find that the other factions are maybe a bit more interesting to digest? I think, I think other factions can be interesting to digest. I think comically, uh, even the space Marines, some of the space Marines themselves can be critical of the space Marines and how boring <laughs> they like how they can be sort of objectively boring. Um, because I think I recall like in the, um, I think it's the white scars Primark book, when Jakarti Khan and his sort of uh, aides, when they're first learning uh, that they have the access to 
being in charge of the space marines and, and uh, the Khan is sort of speaking to his entourage and saying like what do you think about these space marines and they're basically saying to them yeah they're just sort of lumbering and they rely too heavily on their armor and they just sort of plow forward the legion they're, you know basically describing how the space marines just sort of charge forward and they rely on their armor and then when they get close they blow everything apart and the Khan is like right we're going to stop that right now <laughs> you guys need to do my plan and we're going to be fast i'm going to attack and it's going to be blades and it's like you know he completely reshapes things um i think there's a great bit in that primark book of jagati khan as well when uh, they're presenting him with like a gloriana battleship and um the mechanicus representative is like yes this beautiful ship that we've spent you know five five percent of mars's resources constructing it or whatever and then jagati khan turns around and goes it's shit. this is what you need to do he's like strip out these drives it's too slow i don't care about this go back and i want it done in this period of time and the mechanicus is like having a breakdown because they, they're like i think the mechanicus even says to him like it's impossible and he's like make it happen like it's, it's a really really good so yeah even the space means can be critical of space means but yeah it, it is a frustrating thing actually that the xenos don't get so much airtime. um i'm sure everybody has like a specific xenos i really want a story told from a tyranid point of view <laughs> why don't we have that like i want the sort of a hive mind it's always i remember that they're always it could be really abstract it would be just fun to do you do. think it'd be yeah. hard to do though in the sense yeah. of like yeah. language <laughs> it'd be no, really they, hard they, i remember whenever you had i remember specifically like in one of the old tyranid uh codexes there was a a set, little short story about the red terror and it wasn't written from the red terrorist perspective it was written about the red terror so they, they always seem to be because they are a hive mind and all collective you don't really have it always seems like it's a third person telling the yeah. story of what they did. I remember a short, it may not have been a short story. It might have been just even like a little narrative element within like the war gear or I can't, I can't remember where it was from. Oh God, people are going to go out on me now. Cause I always say to people like, show your re reference. Like, yeah. I can't remember. I'm sorry. But, but it's this short, it's this short where I think for the first time they're discovering tyranid weapons and it's like a flesh bore or something. And they think it's just this organic weapon. And they're saying, and I think the, 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 the tyranid weapon starts psychically controlling them. And the characters involved end up like he starts killing other humans because the weapon is like psychically creature, controlling him. Yeah, yeah. It, it, although it's a weapon, it's still like a part of the Tyranid and it has its own independent sort of psychic ability. And so they realize, no, it's it's part of a bigger whole. I think that's when they first realize the concept of sort of synapse. Yeah. I think that's when they discover that. Yeah, that's awesome. I never even knew that about that short. I yeah, I can't remember where it is. After. You know I'll look it, it up. If you know where it is, put it in the comments. Yeah, <laughs> I'll look it up. It's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other one that I would go for is always, uh, I've said so many times, Belisarius Call, The Great Work. Um, it, it does throw you in the deep end a bit as a beginner, especially when you especially when you get into Call and what's going on with him and his backstory. And it does also jump around the timelines, which is super confusing. A lot yeah. of 40K books do that. A lot of 40K books start with a character in the sort of more contemporary time, and then they jump back like 8,000, 10,000 years to when a different character was doing something which relates to it. And that is actually a pretty jarring concept. It is, it? yeah. I've, re I've read that one. I think it, it's... They do it in many books. It's, it's a great it's a great book and because obviously Belisarius has been alive mm. so long. It, it, that book, it, you've got 30K aspects, 40K aspects. You've got like loads of different bits in it that, yeah. without spoiling it too much. But it, it, it does jump around a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's good. It's, it's good because it gives you a feel of things, how they were in the past mm. and where they get to and then the contemporary time. Um, and Call is just an interesting character. So yeah, there is, there is a lot to it, but that is a great, a great book. Again, it's one of those ones where if you don't mind just being thrown into it mm. and you just sort of let it come as it does, then you know, you'll get on well with it. All, all I'll say as a teaser is, is Alpha, Alpha Primus is what every Space Marine should be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's indeed. all I'm going to say. <laughs> Read the book and you'll but see yeah. what I mean. Yeah, Belisarius yeah. Call cool, the Great Work. It's it's like you really need to check it out. And if you haven't already, you do need to check it out. It's a really good one. Bit of a bit of a curve for just tack on the end of that. Obviously, the the purpose of this topic is for beginners or people who aren't as familiar with the law to get into it. Have you got just to provide value for some people who are maybe a bit deeper in the law? Maybe they're sort of a intermediate sort of a law follower. If there's some, they've watched all your videos. Yeah, <laughs> they know what they're talking about. But I, I think a deep like cut or something. I think if you are established into the law, then going for like an omnibus series is really good. Mm. Word bearers, 
uh, Night Lords or Mobius series, any of these kind of things, or just like the Oriole Ventress series and stuff like that. I mean, those are all sort of obviously Space Marine heavy, you know, but, you know, any any of the very well-established series, whether you go to like Gaunts or something like that as well, you know, they're all very different. Some people don't like Gaunts Ghosts. It's too character driven for some people. You know, they don't feel like there's enough events going on. I suppose it depends on the type of book you like in general as well. Yeah, I mean, that's you touched the other on this thing. earlier, but like what sort of reader are you? Like maybe you're someone yeah. who like really likes crime novels or like mystery or Yeah. I I, I just want to say that the the uh the Abaddon one, uh Talon Horus yeah. and the other one, that for me was amazing. I mean Aaron Dempsey Bowden's a great great writer anyway, but um but the way that you see that's the first time you properly see the other side of 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 like the whole thing with Imperium and Chaos. It's the first time you see well, Chaos Space Marines aren't just aren't just evil. They actually are individuals, and they all have things they don't like. The, the character side of it's amazing in that. So the omnibus I demons think, have feelings too. Yeah, demons have feelings. Sounds, that should be a bumper so. sticker. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Bumper sticker. Yeah, for the rhino. <laughs> for, for the, the rhino. rhino. Yeah. The people, uh, I've just thought of this, but like, there's no way it's not a thing, but there must be bumper stickers. People like, we'll must have put bumper, bumper stickers. stickers. Yeah. yeah, on, on rhinos. Oh, yeah, rhinos. on rhinos. Yeah. 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 There's no way someone hasn't done that. That is definitely on the back of a T Sun's rhino. Demons are feeling <laughs> safe. It's got to be. I think another good one, if you are maybe, again, if you've read like Chaos Space Marines or just Space Marine books and like the Heresy series, and you're like, where do we go from here? Again, omnibuses are good, but you know what would be a really good one is Path of the Eldar. Mm -hmm. Path of the Eldar, you can't go wrong with that. It's Path of the Warrior, Path of the Seer, Path of the Outcast, and they do it as an omnibus series. Um, really highly recommend from Gav Thorpe. Gav Thorpe writes a lot of the Eldar stuff. Um, and again, like we're saying, you know, obviously there is a focus on the Imperium a lot in a lot of the stories. It's a shame that some of the Xenos stuff doesn't get really pushed harder um i think we know why but it's a shame uh because again the, the story of the inari this is why my eldar force is inari because i don't care how it is on the tabletop they are the most interesting faction to me like the story of what is going on with the inari is super amazing mm. um and again the the inari books like wild rider which came out around eighth oh, edition uh, I believe, yeah it was when the codex it was when the codex came out i think it was wasn't it? yeah they, they could change 40k forever if they push that series forward. So I recommend the Inari books as well, like really interesting. 